Talmud, Masseb Kim ACHAPTERI mission all sacrifices slaughtered not in their own name are valid save that they do not free their owners of their obligation with the exception of the Passover offering and the sin offering this holds good of the Passover offering in its proper time and a sin offering at all times are Elizar said also the guilt offering is invalid and the law holds good of the Passover offering in its proper time and a sin offering and a guilt offering at all times are Elizar argued the sin offering comes on account of sin and the guilt offering comes on account of sin as a sin offering slaughtered not in its own name is invalid so is the guilt offering invalid slaughtered not in its own name Jose BHO and I said sacrifices slaughtered in the name of a Passover offering or a sin offering are invalid Simeon the brother of Ezra said if one slaughtered them under a higher designation than their own they are valid under a lower designation than their own they are invalid how so if one slaughtered most sacred sacrifices under the designation of lesser sacrifices they are invalid if one slaughtered lesser sacrifices under the designation of most sacred sacrifices they are valid if one slaughtered the firstling or tithe in the name of a peace offering it is valid if one slaughtered a peace offering in the name of the firstling or tithe it is invalid tomorrow why must the Tanah teach save that they do not free their owners of their obligation let him teach and they do not free their owners of their obligation he informs us this they merely do not free their owners of their obligation yet they retain their original sanctity and no alteration therein is permitted in accordance with Rabbah's dictum for Rabbah said if a burnt offering was slaughtered under a different designation its blood must not be sprinkled under a different designation if you wish I can say this follows from reason and if you wish I can say from scripture if you wish I can say this follows from reason because he made an alteration therein once is he to go on making alterations therein and if you wish I can say it follows from scripture that which is gone out of thy lips thou shalt observe and do according as thou hast vowed a freewill offering unto the Lord thy God etc. Is this a freewill offering Talmud, Mas Sebekim be surely it is a vow the meaning however is this if you have acted in accordance with your vow let it be the fulfillment of your vow but if not let it count as a freewill offering now as a freewill offering is it permitted to make a change in it Rabbah said to our Papa you were not with us in the evening within the Sabbath limit of the Harmak when Rabbah pointed out a contradiction in two important laws and then reconciled them what are these important laws we learned all sacrifices slaughtered not in their own name etc. Thus it is only when they are slaughtered for another purpose but if no purpose is defined they even acquit there. Owners of their obligation, which proves that an undefined purpose is the same as its own purpose defined, but the following contradicts it. Every get which was written not in the name of the woman for whom it is intended is invalid, and in point of fact, if it is written with an undefined purpose, it is also invalid. And he answered, it sacrifices where no purpose is defined stand to be slaughtered for their own purpose, whereas a woman, if nothing is defined, does not stand to be divorced. Now, how do we know that sacrifices slaughtered with undefined purpose are valid? Shall we say because we learned all sacrifices slaughtered not in their own name, etc. While he the Tana does not teach which were not slaughtered under their own designation, but surely in the case of the get too, he also teaches every get which was written not in the name of the woman is invalid, and does not teach which was not written in the name of the woman is invalid. Rather, it follows from what we learned how is. In its own name and not in its own name meant in the name of the Passover offering and in the name of the peace offering thus it is invalid only because he stated in the name of the Passover offering and in the name of the peace offering but if he slaughtered it in the name of the Passover offering and sprinkled its blood with undefined purpose it is fit which proves that with purpose undefined it is as in its own name perhaps it is different there because one may argue whoever does anything does it with the original expressed intention rather it follows from the second clause how is not in its own name and in its own name meant in the name of the peace offering first and then in the name of the Passover offering thus it is invalid only because he stated in the name of the peace offering and in the name of the Passover offering but if he slaughtered it without a defined purpose and sprinkled the blood in the name of the Passover offering it is valid perhaps it is Different there because we say the end eliminates the beginning alternatively perhaps because he teaches in its own name and not in its own name in the first clause he also teaches not in its own name and in its own name in the second clause rather it follows from this a sacrifice is slaughtered for the sake of six things for the sake of the sacrifice for the sake of the sacrificer for the sake of the divine name for the sake of fire offerings for the sake of a saver for the sake of pleasing and a sin offering and a guilt offering for the sake of sin our Jose said even if one did not have any of these purposes in his heart he is valid because it is a regulation of the Beth Din thus the Beth Din made a regulation that one should not state its purpose lest he come to state a different purpose now if you think that an undefined purpose renders it invalid would the Beth Din arise and make a regulation which would invalidate it now how do we know in the case of a get that an Undefined purpose renders it invalid shall we say from what we learned if one was passing through the street and heard the voice of scribes dictating so and so divorced so and so of such a place whereupon he exclaimed that is my name and my wife's name if the get so written is invalid for divorcing therewith yet perhaps that is to be explained as did our papa for our papa said we are discussing scribes engaged in practicing so that it was not written for the purpose of divorcement at all. Rather it follows from this Talmud, Mas Sebekim even more if he wrote a get to divorce his wife and then changed his mind and a fellow citizen met him and said to him my name is the same as yours and my wife's name is the same as yours if the get is invalid for divorcing therewith yet perhaps it is different there because it had been designated for that particular person's divorce rather from the following even more if he had two wives of the same name and he wrote a get to Divorce the elder therewith he cannot divorce the younger with it perhaps it is different there as it had been designated for that particular wife's divorce rather from the following even more if he said to the writer write it and I will then divorce whichever I desire it is invalid for divorcing therewith perhaps it is different there because selection is not retrospective rather from this he who writes formulas of get it must leave blanks for the name of the husband and the name of it. Wipe the names of the witnesses and the day Rab Judah said in Samuel's name he must also leave a blank for the passage behold thou art permitted unto all men he Rabba pointed out a further contradiction did then Rab Judah say in Rab's name if one slaughtered a sin offering under the designation of a burnt offering it is invalid if one slaughtered it under the designation of Hullin it is valid this proves that its own kind destroys it while a different kind does not destroy it but the Following contradicts it every get written not in the name of the woman for whom it is intended is invalid and in point of fact even if written in the name of a Gentile woman it is still invalid and he answered in the case of a get disregard the Gentile woman altogether and it is then written without defined purpose which is invalid but as for sacrifices disregard the Holland and it is a sacrifice slaughtered without defined purpose which is valid he pointed out another contradiction did then Rab Judah say in Rab's name if one slaughtered a sin offering under the designation of a burnt offering it is invalid if he slaughtered it under the designation of Holland it is valid this proves that its own kind destroys it while a different kind does not destroy it but it was taught in every earthen vessel into whose inside any of them falleth whatsoever is in it shall be unclean and it yet shall break but not the inside of the inside and even an unearthen vessel Saves it and he answered it that the rabbis treated Hullin in respect to consecrated animals as a partition in respect to an oven just as a partition in respect to an oven has no effect at all so Hullin in respect to consecrated animals has no effect at all for we learned if an oven is partitioned with boards or curtains and a reptile is found in one compartment the hole is unclean if a defective receptacle which is stuffed with straw is lowered into the airspace of an oven and a reptile is in it the oven becomes unclean if a reptile is in the oven the foot stuffs in it the receptacle become unclean while our Eliezer declares it clean said our Eliezer it follows a fortiori if it protects in the case of a corpse which is stringent shall it not protect it in the case of an earthen vessel which is less stringent not so they replied Talmud, Ma Sevakim B if it protects in the case of a corpse which is stringent that is because it is divided into tents shall it therefore protect in it. Case of earthen vessels which are less stringent but which are not divided into tents now this is well according to the rabbis but what can be said on our Eliezer's view our Eliezer argues a fortiori if so here too we can argue a fortiori of sacred animals profane sacred animals how much more does Hullin rather Rab's reason is in accordance with our Eliezer for our Eliezer said what
Yet surely Rab said if a sin offering is slaughtered on behalf of one who is liable to a sin offering it is unfit on behalf of one who is liable to a burnt offering it is fit this proves that a person of the same category as the offender destroys it whereas one of a different category does not destroy it and he answered in the former case the divine law states and he shall kill it for a sin offering and lo a sin offering has been slaughtered as a sin offering but in the latter case it is written and the priest shall make atonement for him which intimates for him but not for his fellow and his fellow implies one like himself who stands in need of atonement just as he does our have a shoot a contradiction between the law of change of intention in respect of owners and that of the inside of the inside and then answered it did then Rab say if a sin offering is slaughtered on behalf of one who is liable to a sin offering it is unfit on behalf of one who is liable to a burnt Offering it is fit this then proves that its own kind destroys it whereas a different kind does not destroy it yet surely it was taught its inside but not the inside of it inside and even an unearthed vessel protects it and he answered its inside is written four times the inside talk its inside toko the inside talk its inside toko one is required for its essential law another for its irishal wife intimates the inside of this but not the inside of another and finally to teach its inside but not the inside of its inside and even an unearthed vessel protects Talmud, Ma Sebekim Talmud, Ma Sebekim how do we know that the slaughtering must be in its own name because scripture says and if its offering be a Zeba slaughtering of peace offerings this teaches that its slaughtering must be in the name of a peace offering but perhaps that is their name since it is written he that offered the blood of the peace offerings and he that dashed the blood of it. Peace offerings against the altar and Ziba is not written whereas here Ziba is written you may infer from it that the slaughtering must be in the name of a peace offering we have thus learned it of slaughtering how do we know it of the other sacrificial services and if you say let us learn and from slaughtering by analogy then it may be objected as for slaughtering the reason is because it disqualifies in the case of a Passover sacrifice if done on behalf of those who cannot eat. It rather scripture says he that offered the blood of the peace offerings which teaches that the reception of its blood must be in the name of peace offerings then let the divine law stated of the reception of the blood whence the slaughtering too could be derived that is not done because the analogy can be refuted as for the reception of the blood the reason is because it is unfit if done by a Israelite or a woman we have thus learned it of slaughtering and receiving. How do we know it of sprinkling and if you answer let us learn it from the former by analogy then it may be argued as for the former the reason is because they require the north and are practiced in the case of the inner sin offerings rather scripture says he that dash it the blood of the peace offerings which teaches that the sprinkling dashing must be in the name of peace offerings then let the divine law write it in respect to sprinkling whence the others could be derived that is impossible because the analogy can be refuted as for sprinkling that is because a Israelite is liable to death on its account we have thus found it of all rights whence do we know it of carrying and if you say let us learn it from all the others then it may be argued as for all the others that is because they are rights which cannot be dispensed with will you say the same of carrying which can be dispensed with rather scripture says and the priest shall bring near the whole to it. Altar and the master said this refers to the carrying of the limbs to the altar ascent while it was also taught and Aaron's son shall present the blood this refers to the receiving of the blood now scripture expresses this by a term denoting carrying in order to teach that carrying cannot be excluded from the scope of receiving now we have thus found it of change of intention in respect of sanctity once do we know it of change of intention in respect of owner said Arphinehas. The son of Rmi scripture says and the flesh of the slaughtering of his peace offerings for thanksgiving etc which teaches that the slaughtering must be in the name of a thanks offering now since this is superfluous for change in respect of sanctity for that is deduced from the other text transfer its teaching to change in respect of owners but is that the purpose of this verse surely it is required for what was taught is and the flesh of the Zeba slaughtering of his peace offerings. For thanksgiving Abahanin said on our Eliezer's authority this comes to teach that if a thanks offering is slaughtered in the name of a peace offering it is valid if a peace offering is slaughtered in the name of a thanks offering it is invalid what is the difference between these two cases a thanks offering is designated a peace offering but a peace offering is not designated a thanks offering we state our deduction from the word slaughtering yet it is still needed thus how do we know it of a sin offering and a guilt offering from the word slaughtering if so let scripture write and the flesh of his peace offerings for thanksgiving slaughtering shall be eaten etc why state the slaughtering of his peace offerings for thanksgiving so that both laws may be inferred from it we have thus found it of slaughtering once do we know it of other services and if you say let us learn them from slaughtering then it may be objected as for slaughtering the reason is because it Disqualifies in the case of a Passover offering when it is done for the sake of those who cannot eat it. Slaughtering is stated in reference to change of intention in respect of sanctity, and slaughtering is stated in reference to change of intention in respect of owner. As in the case of the slaughtering stated in reference to change in respect of sanctity, you do not differentiate between slaughtering and other services. So also in the case of the slaughtering which stated in reference to change of owners, you must not differentiate between slaughtering and other rights. This can be refuted as for change in respect of sanctity. That is because its disqualification is intrinsic and it is operative in respect of the four services, and it is operative after death, and it is operative in the case of the community, as in the case of an individual Talmud. Ma Sevakim be now, although two of these refutations are not exact, two at all events are for how is change in respect of owner. Different that it is not an intrinsic disqualification surely because it is a mere intention and change in respect of sanctity too is a mere intention but what you must say is that since he intended it for a wrongful purpose he disqualified it then here too since he intended it for a different owner he disqualified it furthermore according to our Phinehas the son of Armari who maintained change in respect of owner does operate after death on two points at least you can refute it rather. Said Arashi scripture says and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him implying but not for his fellow but does it come for this purpose surely it is required for what was taught and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him our Simeon said where the sacrifice is a liability upon him he is responsible for its loss where it is not a liability upon him he is not responsible for its loss and our Isaac B. of Demi said what is the reason since he declared I take upon. Myself to bring an offering it is as though he carried it on his shoulder or as he makes his deduction from it it shall be accepted for him to make atonement we have now learned it of slaughtering and sprinkling how do we know it of the receiving of the blood and if you say let us learn it from slaughtering and sprinkling it can be objected as for slaughtering and sprinkling the reason is because each is a service which involves culpability if performed without the temple court. Rather said Arashi it is deduced from the Nazarite's ram for it is written and he shall offer the ram for a slaughtering of peace offerings which teaches that it must be offered specifically as a peace offering now since this teaching is superfluous regarding change in respect of sanctity as that is deduced from the other text apply its teaching to change in respect of owner or Ahabi Abbas said to Rabba let us say he shall offer as a general proposition slaughtering is a particularization now. Where we have a general proposition followed by a particularization the rule is the general proposition includes only what is contained in the particularization hence slaughtering is so but every other service is not so if scripture wrote he shall offer a peace offering as a slaughtering it would be as you say since however it writes he shall offer for a slaughtering of peace offerings it is an incomplete general proposition and an incomplete general proposition is not treated as a case. Of a general proposition followed by a particularization Robin has said in truth we do treat it as such but unto the Lord is another general proposition or aha of dipti said to Robin but the first generalization is dissimilar from the last generalization for the first includes sacrificial acts but nothing more whereas the last one implies everything that is unto the Lord even the pouring out of the residue of the blood and the burning of the emir and behold the tana of the school of our Ishmael. Even in the case of a general proposition and particularization of this nature applies the rule that in a general proposition followed by a particularization and followed again by a general proposition you must be guided by the particularization just as that is explicitly a sacrificial service and we require rightful intention so in the case of every sacrificial service we require rightful intention if so you may argue just as the particularization is explicitly a service which involves culpability if it is performed without its legitimate boundary so is every service included which involves culpability if performed without hence slaughtering and sprinkling are indeed included but not
The breast and shoulder rather scripture says this is the law of the burnt offering of the meal offering and of the sin offering and of the guilt offering and of the consecration offering and of the sacrifice of peace offerings thus scripture assimilates them to peace offerings just as we require peace offerings to be offered for their own sake thus forbidding both change in respect of sanctity and change in respect of owner so do we require all sacrifices to be offered for their own sake. Thus forbidding both change in respect of sanctity and change in respect of owner let us say that if one slaughtered them in a different name they are invalid scripture says that which is gone out of thy lips thou shalt observe and do as thou hast vowed in of free will offering etc is this a free will offering surely it is about the meaning however is this if you acted in accordance with your vow let it be the fulfillment of your vow but if not let it count as a free will offering now. Both texts is that which is gone out of thy lips and this is the law etc are required for if the divine lord that which is gone out of thy lips only I would say Talmud, Ma Sebekime I do not know to what this refers therefore the divine lord this is the law etc while if the divine lord this is the law only I would say that they become invalid therefore the divine lord that which is gone out of thy lips etc rush lay face downward in the Beth Hamid rash end. Raise the difficulty if they are valid let them be accepted while if they are not accepted for what purpose do they come sent our Eliezer to him we find that those sacrifices which come after the death of their owners are valid yet they are not accepted for we learned if a woman brought her sin offering after childbirth and then died her ears must bring her burnt offering if she brought her burnt offering her ears do not bring her sin offering I agree in the case of a burnt offering he replied since it comes after death but in the case of a guilt offering which does not come after death whence do we know that it is valid he replied low support to your contention is available close at hand our Eliezer says also the guilt offering is invalid thereupon he exclaimed is this he who is spoken of as a great man I speak to you of an explicit mission and you answer me with our Eliezer's view rather said rush I will find a solution myself that which is gone out of thy lips etc. is this a free will offering surely it is a vow etc. as above our Zerah and our Isaac B. Abba were sitting and Abba sat with them they sat and debated Rush Lakish had a difficulty about the guilt offering which does not come after death and he addressed an exegesis on that which goeth out of thy lips yet say that which may come as a vow or as a free will offering must be brought but do not propitiate but a guilt offering is not to be brought at all said Abba to them Rush Lakish solved it. Difficulty from the following text and he shall kill it for a sin offering only when slaughtered in its own name is valid and when slaughtered not in its own name is invalid but other sacrifices slaughtered not in their own name are valid you might think then that they are accepted therefore it states that which goeth out of thy lips then say that which comes as a vow or a free will offering must be brought but is not accepted whereas a guilt offering is even accepted too said Abba. You cannot maintain that a guilt offering is in such circumstances accepted as the reverse follows from a burnt offering of forci of a burnt offering whose purpose is not to make atonement is not accepted then how much more is a guilt offering whose purpose is to make atonement not accepted as for a burnt offering you might argue the reason that it is not accepted is because it is altogether burnt then let peace offerings prove it as for peace offerings you might argue they are not accepted because they require libations and the waving of the breast and shoulder then let a burnt offering prove it and thus the argument revolves the characteristic of the former is not that of the latter and the characteristic of the latter is not that of the former the factor common to both is that they are holy sacrifices and if slaughtered not in their own names they are valid yet not accepted so also do I just the guilt offering which is holy hence if one slaughters it not in its name it is valid and not accepted. No, the factor common to both it may be argued is that they are also brought as public offerings. Then let the thanksgiving offering prove it. Talmud, Mas Sebekim be Talmud, Mas Sebekim be as for the thanksgiving offering it is not accepted because it requires loaves as an accompaniment. Then let the burnt offering and peace offerings prove it. And thus the argument revolves the characteristic of the one is not that of the other and that of it. Other is not that of the first. The factor common to all is that they are holy sacrifices. And if one slaughters them not in their own name, they are valid and are not accepted. So also do I this the guilt offering which is holy and hence if one slaughters it not in its name it is valid and is not accepted. No, the factor common to them all it may be asked is that they come as a vow or as a free will offering. Rather said Rabbi Scripture said this is a law etc. The Scripture assimilated it. The guilt offering to peace offerings as the peace offerings are holy sacrifices and if slaughtered not in their own name are valid and are not accepted so do I just the guilt offering to which is holy etc. What reason do you see to assimilate it to peace offerings assimilate it to the sin offering surely the divine law expressed a limitation in the word it nemonic hagish base arahuna and arnaman were sitting and arshis hate sat with them they sat and said now rush lakish had experienced a difficulty what about the guilt offering which does not come after death but our Eliezer could have answered him that the guilt offering too comes after death said arshis hate to them in what way is a guilt offering brought as a remainder then the remainder of a sin offering too is indeed offered this however is no argument in the case of a sin offering though the remainder thereof is offered yet the divine law expressed a limitation in the word it who but in connection with it. Guilt offering to who it is written that is written after the burning of the Emirim as it was taught but in the case of a guilt offering it is who is stated only after the burning of the Emirim and in fact if the Emirim are not burnt at all if the offering is valid then what is the purpose of it for Arhunas teaching in Rab's name for Arhunas said in the name of Rab if a guilt offering was transferred to pasture and one then slaughtered it without a defined purpose it is valid thus if it was transferred it is so but if it was not transferred it is not so what is the reason scripture says it is intimating it must be in its essential form Arnaman and Arshis hate sat and Arabi Mahana sat with them now they sat and debated now as to what our Eliezer said we find in the case of sacrifices that come after the death of their owners that they are valid yet are not accepted let Rush Lakish say to him let these two come and be accepted said Arabi Mahana to them as for the Offering of a woman after confinement if she gave birth did her children give birth to this R.C. Demer yet who is to say if she had been guilty of the neglect of many affirmative precepts she would not be atoned for and since she would be forgiven if she had been guilty of neglecting affirmative precepts then her heirs too may thus be atoned for are we then to say that the heirs acquire it but surely are Yohanan said if one leaves a meal offering to his two sons and dies it is offered and the law of partnership does not apply to it if however you think that they acquire a title to it surely the divine law set and when a soul bringeth a meal offering will you then say that they do not acquire it surely are Yohanan said if one leaves an animal dedicated for a sacrifice to his two sons and dies it is offered but they cannot effect substitution with it now it is well if you say that they acquire it for that reason they cannot effect substitution with it because they Become partners Talmud, Ma Sebekime and partners cannot effect substitution but if you say that they do not acquire it let them indeed even effect substitution there it is different because scripture says and if he change it at all which is to include the air and the same verse teaches one can change but not due to this are Jacob of Nihar Pekha Demur if so when it is written and if a man will redeem in connection with tithe which is also to include the air will you say there. To one can redeem but not to tithe is different because as far as their father too is concerned that redemption can be done in partnership R.C. said to Arashi now from this itself you may argue it as well if you agree that they acquire it for that reason one ear at least can effect substitution but if you say that they do not acquire it how can he effect substitution surely Arabab said in Ar Yohanan's name he who sanctifies the animal must add the fifth whilst only he for whom. Atonement is made can affect substitution and he who gives terima of his own for another man's produce the goodwill is his it does not affect a fixed absolute atonement but it does make a floating atonement the question was asked do they make atonement in respect of the purpose for which they came or do they not make atonement said Arshisha the son of Aridi reason asserts that it does not make atonement for if you think that it does what is the purpose of a second sacrifice what then do you maintain it does not make atonement why then is it offered said Arashi this is the difficulty felt by Arshisha the son of Aridi it is well if you say that it does not make atonement for those slaughtered for a different purpose yet it comes in virtue of having been dedicated for its true purpose while the second sacrifice comes to make atonement but if you say that it has made atonement what is the purpose of the second the question was as
Respect of the positive precept of laying of hands because it is a positive precept neglected after separation said Rabbi you speak of the precept of laying the hand there it is different because as long as he has not yet slaughtered he is subject to the injunction arise and lay hands when and is it a neglected positive precept after the slaughtering and in respect of the precept neglected after the slaughtering no question arises are Nabi Judah said to Rabbi perhaps it means it did. Make atonement for the person Talmud, Ma Sevakim B and it did not make atonement before heaven did we not learn and the rest of the oil that is in the priest's hand he shall put upon the head of him that is to be cleansed and the priest shall make atonement for him before the Lord if he put it he made atonement while if he did not put it he did not make atonement this is the view of our Akiva Yohan and Binuri said it is but the residue of a precept therefore whether he did put it on his head or he did not he made atonement yet we regard him as though he did not make atonement what is meant by as though he did not make atonement shall we say that he must bring another sacrifice but you say whether he did put or he did not put he made atonement hence it must mean it made atonement for the person yet it did not make atonement before heaven and here too it may mean that it did make atonement etc no there too it means that he made atonement in respect of putting it on it. Thumbs, but he did not make atonement in respect of the putting it on the head. Come and hear our Simeon said, For what purpose are the sacrificial lambs of Pentecost brought? Surely the lambs of Pentecost are peace offerings. Rather, the question is, For what purpose are the two he goats of Pentecost brought to make atonement for the defilement of the temple and its holy things? Now, once the blood of the first has been sprinkled, for what purpose is the second offered to make atonement for? Uncleanness which may have occurred in the interval between the two from this, it follows that Israel should have been perpetually engaged in offering their sacrifices, but that scripture spared them. Now, in this case, it is a positive command violated after the separation of the animals, yet it makes atonement. No, if they were separated at the same time, that indeed would be so, but the circumstances are that they were separated one after the other. Are we then to arise and assert that the Written law of scripture that two are brought holds good only when they are separated one after the other said our Papa do you speak of public sacrifices public sacrifices are different because the Beth tacitly stipulates concerning them in accordance with Rab Judah's diction in Samuel's name for Rab Judah said in Samuel's name the knife draws them to their legitimate purpose said our Joseph the son of our Samuel to our Papa does then our Simeon accept the thesis that the Beth makes a tacit stipulation surely our EDB Abin said in the name of our Amram in the name of our Isaac in the name of our Yohan and daily burnt offerings which are not required for the community Talmud Mas Sebakim cannot be redeemed according to our Simeon's view as long as they are unblemished while on the view of the sages they can be redeemed while unblemished moreover surely our Jeremiah asked our Zerah if the blood of the Pentecostal he goats was received in two basins and the blood of one was sprinkled what is it? Purpose of the second to which he replied on account of defilement that occurred between the sprinkling of the blood of the one and that of the other, thus he is in doubt only in respect of the violation of the positive command after the slaughtering, but he does not ask in respect of the violation of the positive command after the separating of the animal. No, perhaps his question is hypothetical. It was taught if one slaughtered a thanks offering in the name of his fellows, thanks offering. Rabbi ruled it is valid while Arhista said it is invalid. Rabbi ruled it is valid because a thanks offering has been slaughtered as a thanks offering. Arhista said it is invalid because it must be slaughtered in the name of his peace offering. Rabbi said once do I know it because it was taught and the flesh of his peace offerings for thanksgiving shall be eaten on the day of his offering. Abahanin said on our Eliezer's authority this comes to teach that if a thanks offering is slaughtered in the name of a peace offering it is valid if a peace offering is slaughtered in the name of a thanks offering it is invalid what is the difference between these two cases a thanks offering is designated a peace offering but a peace offering is not designated a thanks offering thus a peace offering slaughtered as a thanks offering is invalid whence it follows that a thanks offering slaughtered as a different thanks offering is valid surely that means even in the name of his fellows thanks offering no only when brought in the name of his own but what if it is in the name of his fellows it is invalid then instead of teaching if a peace offering is slaughtered in the name of a thanks offering it is invalid let him teach if a thanks offering is slaughtered in the name of a thanks offering of a different class it is invalid and how much more so a peace offering in the name of a thanks offering he wishes to teach of a peace offering slaughtered in the name of his own Thanks offering you might argue since a thanks offering is designated a peace offering a peace offering too is designated a thanks offering and when he kills it the former in the name of the thanks offering it should be valid therefore he informs us that it is not so Rabbi said if one slaughters a sin offering for one offense as a sin offering for another offense it is valid as a burnt offering it is invalid what is the reason the divine law said and he shall kill it for a sin offering and lowest sin offering has been slaughtered for a sin offering while from the same verse we learn that if it is slaughtered for a burnt offering it is invalid Rabbi also said if one slaughters a sin offering on behalf of another person who is liable to a sin offering it is invalid on behalf of one who is liable to a burnt offering it is valid what is the reason and the priest shall make atonement for him but not for his fellow and his fellow implies one like himself being in need of atonement. As he is Rabbi also said if one slaughters a sin offering on behalf of a person who is not liable in respect of anything at all it is invalid because there is not a single Israelite who is not liable in respect of an affirmative precept and Rabbi said a sin offering makes atonement for those who are liable in respect of an affirmative precept before she or I seeing that it makes atonement for those who are liable to Karath how much the more for those who are liable in respect of an affirmative precept. Shall we then say that it belongs to the same category but surely Rabbi said if one slaughters a sin offering on behalf of another person who is liable to a sin offering it is invalid on behalf of a person who is liable to a burnt offering it is valid Talmud, Mas Sebakim be it a sin offering does not make a fixed atonement but it does make a floating atonement Rabbi also said if a burnt offering was killed for a different purpose its blood must not be sprinkled for a different purpose this. Follows either from scripture or by reason if you will it is deduced from a text that which is gone out of thy lips thou shalt observe etc. Alternatively it is logical because he has made an alteration therein etc. As stated at the beginning of this chapter Rabbah also said if a burnt offering is brought after the death of its owner and is slaughtered under a changed sanctity it is invalid but if it is slaughtered with a change in respect of ownership it is valid for there is no ownership. After death but our Phinehas the son of RMI maintain there is ownership after death Arashi asked our Phinehas the son of RMI do you particularly maintain that there is ownership after death and so he dear must bring another burnt offering or perhaps if he dear has violated many affirmative precepts it makes atonement for him I maintain it particularly he answered him Rabbah said further a burnt offering is a votive gift for how is it possible if there is no repentance then it Sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination while if there is repentance surely it was taught if one violated an affirmative precept and repented he does not stir thence until he is forgiven hence it follows that it is a vote of gift mnemonic for whom does a sin offering atone a burnt offering after a vote of gift it was taught likewise our Simeon said for what purpose does a sin offering come you ask for what purpose does a sin offering come surely in order to make atonement rather the question is why does it come before the burnt offering because it is like an intercessor who enters to appease the king when the intercessor has appeased him the gift follows with the exception of the Passover offering and the sin offering how do we know it of the Passover offering because it is written observe the month of Aviv and prepare the Passover offering this intimates that all its preparations must be in the name of the Passover offering we have thus found that change in respect of Sanctity disqualifies it. How do we know the same of change in respect of owner? Because it says, then ye shall say it is the slaughtering of the Lord's Passover, which teaches that the slaughtering must be done in the name of the Passover offering. Now, since this teaching is redundant in respect of change in respect of sanctity, apply the teaching to change in respect of owner. We have thus found it as a regulation. How do we know that it is indispensable? Scripture saith, and thou shalt sacrifice the Passover offering unto the Lord thy God. To this our Saffir demurred does this passage, and thou shalt sacrifice, etc. Come for this purpose. Surely it is required for our nomen dictum for our nomen said in Rabbi Abba's name. How do we know that the leftover of a Passover offering is brought as a peace
The guilt offering and of the consecration offering and of the sacrifice of peace offerings now it was taught in the day that he commanded the children of Israel to present their offerings refers to the first ling tithe and Passover offering. The scripture assimilates it the Passover offering to the peace offering as in the case of the peace offering we require as a regulation that there shall not be either change in respect of sanctity or change in respect of owner. So in the case of all these do we require as a regulation that there shall not be either change in respect of sanctity or change in respect of owner. Again it is like the peace offering in this respect as you do not differentiate in the peace offering between slaughtering and the other services in respect of the regulation so must you not differentiate in the case of the Passover sacrifice between slaughtering and the other services in respect of indispensability then in that case what is the purpose of it is. For what was taught as for the Passover offering it is stated there to teach indispensability as far as slaughtering is concerned whereas in the case of a guilt offering it is stated only after the burning of the Emurim and in fact if the Emurim are not burnt at all if the offering is valid how do we know it of a sin offering because it is written and he shall kill it for a sin offering which intimates that it must be killed for the sake of a sin offering we have thus found it of Slaughtering how do we know it of receiving the blood because it is written Talmud, Mas Sebekimeh and the priest shall take of the blood of the sin offering which intimates that receiving must be for the sake of a sin offering we have thus found it of slaughtering and receiving how do we know it of sprinkling because scripture saith and the priest shall make atonement for him through his sin offering which teaches that atonement must be made for the sake of the sin offering we have thus found the law relating to change in respect of sanctity how do we know it of change in respect of owner scripture saith and the priest shall make atonement for him implying for him but not for his fellow we have thus found it as a regulation how do we know that it is indispensable as our who not the son of our Joshua said elsewhere scripture saith his sin offering where sin offering alone would suffice so here too scripture saith his sin offering where sin offering alone would Suffice we have thus found the regulation relating to change in respect of sanctity and the prohibition of change in respect of owner at the sprinkling this being both a regulation and indispensable how do we know that it is indispensable in the case of all services as far as change in respect of sanctity is concerned and that the prohibition of change in respect of ownership at the other services is both a regulation and indispensable said Arjuna it is inferred from a Nazarite sin. Offering for it is written and the priest shall bring them before the Lord and shall prepare his sin offering and his burnt offering this intimates that all its preparations as see the services must be for the sake of a sin offering we have thus found it regarding change in respect of sanctity how do we know change in respect of owner said Arjuna son of our Joshua scripture said his sin offering where sin offering alone would suffice to this Rabbin if so how do you interpret it? Superfluous his burnt offering where burnt offering alone would suffice but according to Rabbanah how does he interpret the apparently superfluous his meal offering his drink offering where meal offering drink offering alone would suffice he requires those for the following deduction their meal offering and their drink offering intimates at night their meal offering and their drink offering even on the next day but how do you interpret the superfluous his burnt offering where burnt offering alone would suffice furthermore can they be learned from each other the sin offering of forbidden fat cannot be learned from a Nazarite sin offering since the latter is accompanied by another sacrifice on the other hand a Nazarite sin offering cannot be learned from a sin offering of forbidden fat since the latter is a case of Kareth rather said Rabba we infer it from a leper sin offering for it is written and the priest shall prepare the sin offering which teaches that all its preparation services must be for the sake of a sin offering thus we have found the law relating to change in respect of sanctity how does he know it of change in respect of owner scripture set and he shall make atonement for him that is to be cleansed this intimates for this man who is to be cleansed but not for his fellow who is to be cleansed yet the question still remains can they be learned from each other the sin offering of forbidden fat cannot be learned from the leper sin offering since the latter is accompanied by another sacrifice on the other hand a leper sin offering cannot be learned from a sin offering of forbidden fat since the latter is a case of Kareth one cannot be learned from one but one can be learned from two but in the case of which should it not be written shall we say let the divine law not write it in the case of the sin offering of forbidden fat and let it be deduced from these others then I can argue that the reason in the case of these others is that another sacrifice accompanies them if we say let the divine law not write it in the case of the Nazarite sin offering and let it be deduced from these others I can argue that the reason in the case of these others is that no absolution revocation is possible if I say let the divine law not write it in the case of the leper sin offering and let it be deduced from these others then I can argue that the reason in the case of these others is that they do not come in poverty rather scripture set this is the law of the burnt offering of the meal offering and of the sin offering and of the sacrifice of peace offerings thus the writ assimilated it the sin offering to the peace offering as in the case of peace offerings both change in respect of sanctity and change in respect of name are prohibited for we require that the services be performed for their own sc that of the peace offering sake this being a regulation so in the case of the sin offering both change in respect of sanctity and change in respect of name are prohibited for we require that the services be performed for their own sake this being a regulation therefore the regulation is deduced from a peace offering while these other verses teach that it is indispensable again we have found this of the sin offering of forbidden fat wherefore a sin offering is written Talmud, Mas Sebekim how do we know it of the sin offerings of idolatry hearing a voice swearing clearly with the lips and the defilement of the sanctuary and its sacred objects wherefore a sin offering is not written the sin offering of idolatry is inferred from the sin offering of forbidden fat since it entails Kareth just as the latter does while all the others are inferred by analogy through a common characteristic our rabbis taught the Passover offering in its season if slaughtered in its own name is valid if not slaughtered in its own name it is invalid during the Rest of the year if slaughtered in its own name it is invalid if not slaughtered in its own name it is valid Nemotic Shalok Abbe Waz and Memahar Bezabiyeh whence do we know it said Samuel's father scripture said and if his offering for a sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord be of the flock this teaches that whatever comes of the flock is to be for a sacrifice of peace offerings then say if sacrificed as a peace offering it is valid but if sacrificed as anything else it is not valid said Arla in Aryohanan's name for a sacrifice includes every sacrifice then say for whatever purpose it is slaughtered let it be such if it were written for peace offering and a sacrifice it would be as you say since however it is written for a sacrifice of peace offerings its implication is for whatever purpose it is slaughtered let it be a peace offering yet say for a sacrifice is a generalization while a peace offerings is a particularization how in the case of a Generalization and the particularization the generalization includes only what is contained in the particularization hence if it is sacrificed as a peace offering it is valid but if it is offered as anything else it is not valid unto the Lord is again a generalization to this or Jacob of Nihar Pekad Demert but the last generalization is dissimilar from the first for the first generalization includes sacrifices but nothing else whereas the last generalization unto the Lord implies whatever is the Lord's even if he slaughtered it for foul offerings and even for meal offerings this is in accordance with the tenor of the school of our Ishmael who applies the rule to a generalization and a particularization of this nature and maintains that even in such a case where you have a generalization a particularization and a generalization in the sequence you must be guided by the particularization as the particularization is explicitly something that is not in its own name and it is valid so whatever that is not in its own name is valid then say as the particularization is explicitly something which can come as a vow or a free will offering so everything which can come as a vow or as a free will offering is included hence if he slaughters the Passover offering out of its season as a burnt offering or as a peace offering it is valid but if he slaughters it then as a sin offering or a guilt offering it is not valid rather for a sacrifice is an extension. Then say for whatever it is slaughtered let it be such said Rabin Talmud, Ma Sebekim we transfer sacrifices which are eaten to sacrifices which are eaten but do not transfer sacrifices which are eaten to sacrifices which are not eaten are then a sin offering and a guilt offering not eaten say rather we transfer sacrifices which are eaten by all to sacrifices which are eaten by all but do not transfer sacrifices which are eaten by all to sacrifices which are not eaten by all our Jose son. Of our Abin said we transfer sacrifices of lesser sanctity to sacrifices of lesser sanctity but do not transfer sacrifices of les
Be flagellated on its account, or alternatively, that in respect thereof we should be guilty of it shall not be redeemed, said Marzitra, the son of our nom and scripture, said, then both it and that for which it is changed shall be holy, which implies this is a substitute, but no other is a substitute, and say that if one slaughters is as a thanks offering, let it be a thanks offering in respect of what law that it may require the addition of loaves, can there be a case where the Passover offering itself does not require loaves, yet its remainder does require loaves, if so, then now to you may argue, can there be a case where the Passover offering itself does not require a drink offering to accompany it, yet its remainder requires a drink offering, this is our argument, can there be a case where the remainder of the thanks offering itself requires no loaves, yet the remainder of that which was converted into a thanks offering shall require loaves to this Aryamar, the son of our Hillel, the bird. And whence does it follow that it is written in reference to the remainder of a Passover offering? Perhaps it is written of the remainder of a guilt offering, said Rabbah Scripture said, and if it's offering for a sacrifice of peace offerings be of the flock, which implies that it refers to that for which the whole flock is equally fit to this Arab and Bihai. Others say Arab and Bihai had emerged everywhere else. You say that of his limitation, yet here of his extension, said Armani here too of his. A limitation teaching that it cannot be two years old, nor a female Arhana of Baghdad demur. Can you say that this text is written in reference to the Passover remainder? Surely, since it states if he bring a lamb for his offering, and if his offering be a goat, it follows that it does not refer to a Passover remainder that is required for what was taught. If he bring a lamb, this is to include the Passover offering in respect of its fat tail when it is stated if he bring a lamb. It is to include a Passover offering more than a year old and a peace offering which comes in virtue of a Passover offering in respect of all the regulations of peace offerings is that they require laying on of the hands drink offerings and the waving of the breast and shoulder again when it states and if his offering be a goat it breaks across the subject and teaches that a goat does not require the burning of the fat tail on the altar but is that deduced from this surely it is deduced from the verse quoted by Samuel's father for Samuel's father said and if his offering for a sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord be of the flock teaches that whatever comes of the flock must be for a sacrifice of peace offerings but still this is deduced from the verse quoted by Arnaman in the name of Rabbi Abu for Arnaman said in Rabbi Abu's name how do we know that a Passover remainder is brought as a peace offering because it says and thou shalt sacrifice the Passover offering unto the Lord thy God of the flock and of the herd, yet surely the Passover offering comes only from lambs or from goats. From this we learn that the Passover remainder must be utilized for something which comes from the flock and from the herd. And what is it a peace offering? In fact, however, three texts are written Talmud, Ma Sebakim B1 refers to an animal whose time for slaughtering is overpassed and whose year has passed, another is required for an animal. Whose time for slaughtering is overpassed, but whose year is not passed, and the third is required for an animal, neither whose time for slaughtering nor whose year is passed. Now all three texts are necessary for it. The divine Lord one text only I would say that it applies only to an animal whose year is passed, and also its time for slaughtering, since it is completely disqualified from a Passover offering, but if its time for slaughtering is passed, but not its year, I would say. That it is not valid if slaughtered as a peace offering since it is eligible for the second Passover. While if the divine law stated these two, I would argue that they are valid if slaughtered as a peace offering because they have been disqualified from their own purpose. But if neither its time for slaughtering nor its year has passed, so that it is eligible for the first Passover, I would say that it is not so. Hence, all three texts are necessary. Rab said in Mavic's name, if one slaughtered a sin offering as a sin offering of Nashon, it is valid for Scripture. Set this is the law of the sin offering, which teaches that there is one law for all sin offerings. Rabbah said and reported this discussion, whereupon our Meshur raised an objection to Rabbah. Our Simeon said all meal offerings whose fistfuls were taken under a different designation are valid and acquit their owners of their obligation because meal offerings are dissimilar from blood sacrifices for when one takes. A fistful of a griddle meal offering in the name of a stewing pan meal offering its preparation proves that it is a griddle meal offering if one takes a fistful of a dry meal offering in the name of a meal offering mingled with oil its preparation proves that it is a dry meal offering but in the case of animal sacrifices it is not so for there is the same slaughtering for all the same receiving for all and the same sprinkling for all thus it is only because its preparation proves its nature hence if its preparation did not prove its nature this would not be so yet why let us say that this is the law of the meal offering intimates that there is one law for all meal offerings rather if stated it was thus stated Rab said in Mavic's name if one slaughtered a sin offering in order that Nashon might be forgiven through it it is valid for no atonement is required for the dead then let him speak of any dead person he informs us this the reason that it is Valid is that he Nashon is dead, hence if one slaughtered it for a living person similar to Nashon, it is invalid, and who are meant those who are liable to a Nazarite sin offering or a leper sin offering, but these are as burnt offerings, rather if stated it was a stated rap said in Mabak's name, if one slaughters a sin offering for a wrong person who is liable to a sin offering such as Nashon's, it is valid for Nashon's sin offering was as a burnt offering, other state. That rap said in Mabak's name, if one slaughters a sin offering in the name of Nashon's sin offering, it is invalid for Nashon's sin offering is as a burnt offering, now let him state a Nazarite sin offering or a leper sin offering, he mentions the original sin offering of that nature, Rabbah said if one slaughters a sin offering of forbidden fat in the name of a sin offering of blood or in the name of a sin offering for idolatry, it is valid if one slaughters it in the name of a Nazarite sin offering or a leper sin offering it is invalid for these are in fact burnt offerings Rabbah asked if one slaughters a sin offering of forbidden fat in the name of a sin offering on account of the defilement of the sanctuary and its sacred flesh what is the law do we say the latter entails correct just as the former or perhaps the latter is not fixed like itself or Ahasan of Rabbah recited all these cases as invalid what is the reason and he shall kill it for a sin offering intimates that it must be killed for the sake of that sin offering said Arashi to Araha the son of Rabbah how then do you recite Rabbah's question we recite it in reference to change in respect of owner he answered him and we recite it thus Rabbah said if one slaughters a sin offering of forbidden fat on behalf of a wrong person who is liable to a sin offering for blood or a sin offering for idolatry it is invalid but if he slaughters it on behalf of a person who is liable to a Nazarite sin Offering or a leper sin offering it is valid and as for the question this is what Rabbah asked if one slaughters a sin offering of forbidden fat on behalf of a person who is liable to a sin offering on account of the defilement of the sanctuary and its sacred flesh what is the law do we say the latter entails correct like itself or perhaps the latter is not fixed like itself the question stands over it was stated if one slaughtered it for its own sake with the intention of sprinkling its blood for the sake of something else are Yohanan said it is invalid while Rush Lakish said it is valid are Yohanan said that it is invalid because an effective intention can be expressed at one service in respect to another service and we learn by analogy from the intention of pickle while Rush Lakish said that it is valid because an effective intention cannot be expressed at one service in respect to another and we do not learn from the intention of pickle now they are consistent with their views for it was stated Talmud, Ma Sebakim if one slaughters an animal with the express intention of sprinkling its blood or burning its fat to an idol or Yohanan said it is forbidden for any use for an effective intention can be expressed at one service in respect to another service and we learn without from within Rush Lakish rules that it is permitted for an effective intention cannot be expressed at one service in respect of another service and we do not learn without. From within now these are both necessary for if we were informed of their views in the latter case I might argue that Rush Lakish rules thus only in this instance yet he agrees with our Yohanan that within is learned from within while if we were informed of their views in the former instance I might argue that our Yohanan rules thus only there yet he agrees with Rush Lakish in the present case thus both are required when our Dimi came he said our Jeremiah raised an objection in support of our Yohanan while our Ella did so in support of Rush Lakish our Jeremiah in support of our Yohanan if it is valid where one says behold I slaughter after its time for slaughtering yet it is invalid if one slaughters it with the intention of
Passover offering and a sin offering rather said Arashi this is how your use if it is valid where one says behold I slaughter the sacrifice in the name of so and so yet it is invalid if one declares his intention to sprinkle its blood for the sake of so and so then seeing that when he declares behold I slaughter it for the sake of something else it is invalid is it not logical that it is invalid if he slaughters it with the intention of sprinkling the blood for the sake of something. Else RL raised an objection in support of Rush Lakish let it not be stated in the case of sprinkling and it could be inferred a minuary from slaughtering and receiving and for what purpose did the divine law stated to teach that you cannot effectively express an intention in respect of one service at a previous service to this Arpapa Demur yet perhaps its purpose is on the contrary to intimate that you can express an intention in respect of one service at a previous service. If so let scripture be silent about it and infer it by our ashes of a argument and the other refute the argument thus as for those slaughtering and receiving the reason may be that they require the north and are present at the inner sin offerings and the other now at all events we are discussing peace offerings it was stated if one slaughters it in its own name with the intention of sprinkling its blood for the sake of something else our nomin says it is invalid rabbi says it is valid. But rabbi retracted on account of our ashes of a argument our Eliezer said the guilt offering too it was taught our Eliezer said a sin offering comes on account of sin and a guilt offering comes on account of sin just as a sin offering slaughtered under a different designation is invalid so is a guilt offering invalid if slaughtered under a different designation said our Joshua to him that is not so if you say thus of the sin offering the reason is because its blood is sprinkled above. The scarlet line said our Eliezer to him let the Passover offering prove it though its blood is sprinkled below yet if one slaughters it for the sake of something else it is invalid as for the Passover offering replied our Joshua the reason is that it has a fixed time said our Eliezer to him then let the sin offering prove it our Joshua replied Talmud, Ma Sebekim B I am moving in a circle our Eliezer then drew another analogy in the case of a sin offering it says it is a sin offering which intimates that if it is slaughtered for its own sake it is valid and if it is not slaughtered for its own sake it is invalid again in the case of a Passover offering it says it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover which likewise intimates for its own sake it is valid and if not for its own sake it is invalid and in the case of a guilt offering too it says it is a guilt offering hence this too intimates for its own sake it is valid while if not for its own sake it is invalid. Said our Joshua to him it is a stated of the sin offering in connection with the slaughtering and so it is intimates for its own sake it is valid and if not for its own sake it is invalid again it is a stated of the Passover offering in connection with the sacrificing and here too it is intimates for its own sake it is valid while if it is not for its own sake it is invalid but as for the guilt offering it is a stated of it only after the burning of the emurim is prescribed and yet if the emurim were not burnt at all it is valid said our Eliezer to him lo it says as is the sin offering so is the guilt offering hence as the sin offering is invalid if not slaughtered for its own sake so is the guilt offering invalid if not slaughtered for its own sake the master said our Joshua said to him I am moving in a circle yet let the argument revolve and the inference be made from the feature common to both that argument is not employed because it can be refuted the feature. Common to both is that there is an aspect of Karath in them. The master said, Our Joshua said to him, That is not so if you say thus of the sin offering, the reason is because its blood is sprinkled above the scarlet line. Yet let him rather say to him, That is not so if you say thus of the sin offering, the reason is because its blood enters the innermost shrine. We are discussing the outer sin offerings. Yet let him say, The reason is because if its blood enters the innermost shrine, it is invalid. Our Eliezer holds that the guilt offering too is invalid. In that case, let him say to him, The reason is because it makes atonement for those who are liable to Karath. Our Eliezer draws his analogy from the sin offering incurred through hearing a voice. Let him say to him, The reason is because if the blood requires four applications. Our Eliezer holds as our Ishmael who maintains all blood requires four applications. Yet let him say, The reason is because the blood requires four. Applications on the four horns of the altar. Now, according to your reasoning, surely there are the distinctions of the finger, the horn, and the point. Rather, the fact is that here Joshua mentions but one of two or three reasons. Distinctions the master said, said our Joshua to him, that is not so. If you say, etc., let our Eliezer answer him, the blood of a guilt offering too is sprinkled above the scarlet line. Said Abbe, you cannot say that the blood of a guilt offering is sprinkled above. As the reverse may be inferred from a burnt offering of fortiori, if the blood of a burnt offering which is completely burnt is sprinkled below, how much the more is this true of a guilt offering which is not completely burnt? As for a burnt offering, the reason is because it does not make atonement. Let the burnt sin offering prove it. As for a burnt sin offering, the reason is because it is not a species that is slaughtered. Then let a burnt offering prove it. Thus, the peculiarity of the one is not. The peculiarity of the other and that of the other is not the same as the peculiarity of the first. The feature common to both is that they are sacrifices of the higher sanctity and their blood is sprinkled below. So will I adduce a guilt offering too that since it is of the higher sanctity its blood is sprinkled below. Rabbi Parzakia said to Arashi but let him refute it. Thus the feature common to both is that their value is unfixed. Will you then say the same of a guilt offering? Which has a fixed value rather this is our Eliezer's reason is because scripture saith the priest that offered it for a sin offering it requires its blood to be sprinkled above but the blood of no other sacrifice is sprinkled above. If so let us say with respect to the slaughtering of the sin offering too only it is valid when slaughtered in its own name but invalid when not slaughtered in its own name whereas other sacrifices are valid whether in their own name or not in their own name that it is not meant particularly since it disregards the Passover offering and here too it is not meant particularly since it disregards the bird burnt offering at all events nothing which is slaughtered is omitted alternatively this agrees with our Eliezer son of our Simeon who maintained the blood of the one is sprinkled in a separate place and that of the other is sprinkled in a separate place for it was taught the lower blood is applied below the scarlet line while the upper blood is applied above the scarlet line said our Simeon B Eliezer this holds good only of the bird burnt offering but in the case of the animal sin offering its blood is applied essentially on the very horn of the altar we learned elsewhere for our Akiba maintained all blood which entered the hikal to make atonement is unfit but the sages rule the sin offering alone is unfit our Eliezer said the guilt offering too is thus for it says as is the sin offering so is the guilt offering as for our Eliezer it is well his reason being as stated but what is the reason of the rabbi said rabbi they argue that you cannot say that if the blood of the guilt offering enters within it is unfit for the reverse follows from the burnt offering of washing of Talmud, Ma Sebekim the burnt offering is fit when its blood enters within though it is entirely burnt how much the more is the guilt offering fit seeing that it is not entirely burnt but it may be asked as for the burnt offering. The reason is because it does not make atonement let a sinner's meal offering prove it yet he should rather say let the sin offering of a bird prove it the sin offering of a bird is the subject of a question by our Avin as for a sinner's meal offering the reason is because it is not of a species that is slaughtered let the burnt offering prove it and thus the argument revolves the peculiarity of the one not being that of the other while the peculiarity of the latter is not that of it. Former the feature common to both is that they are sacrifices of the higher sanctity and when their blood enters within they are fit so too will I adduce the guilt offering which is a sacrifice of the higher sanctity and if its blood enters within it is fit Rabbi Barnish said to our Ashi yet let him refute it thus the feature common to both is that they have no fixed value will you say the same of the guilt offering which has a fixed value rather this is the Rabbi's reason is because scripture saith and no sin offering whereof any of its blood is brought into the tent of meeting shall be eaten it shall be burnt with fire this intimates the blood of the sacrifice but not the blood of another sacrifice and the other its blood implies but not its flesh and the other scripture writes its blood where blood would suffice and the other he does not interpret blood its blood as having a particular significance it is well according to the Rabbis who Maintain that if one slaughters a guilt offering under a different designation it is valid for that reason a meal offering is likened to a sin offering and to a guilt offering for it was taught our Simeon said it is written it is most holy as a sin offering and as a guilt offering a sinner's meal offering is like a sin offering therefore if its fistful of flour is taken under a
A sin offering are invalid. Are Yohanan said Joseph Behoni and our Elizer said the same thing. Rabbi said they disagree in respect of others slaughtered in the name of a sin offering for it was taught a paschal lamb which has passed its year and he its owner slaughtered it in its season for its own purpose. And similarly when a man slaughters other sacrifices as a Passover offering in its season our Elizer disqualifies them while our Joshua declares them valid said our Joshua if during the rest of the year when it is not valid if slaughtered in its own name yet others slaughtered in its name are valid then is it not logical that in its season when it is valid if slaughtered in its own name others slaughtered in its name are valid said our Elizer to him yet perhaps the argument is to be reversed if it is valid when slaughtered during the rest of the year in the name of another sacrifice though it is not valid if slaughtered then in its own name is it not logical that it should be valid when slaughtered in its season in the name of another sacrifice seeing that it is valid if slaughtered then in its own name and thus a Passover offering slaughtered on the 14th of Nisan under a different designation should be valid now would you say thus but in point of fact your Minori argument can be refuted thus as for others being valid during the rest of the year when slaughtered in its SC the Passover offering's name that is because it is valid when slaughtered then in the name of other sacrifices should then others slaughtered in its season in its name be valid seeing that it the Passover offering is invalid if slaughtered then in the name of others said our Joshua to him if so you lessen the strength of the Passover offering and increase the strength of the peace offering subsequently our Elizer proposed a different argument we find that a Passover remainder comes as a peace offering whereas a peace offering remainder does not come as a Passover offering now if the Passover offering whose remainder comes as a peace offering is nevertheless unfit if one slaughters it in its season as a peace offering is it not logical that the peace offering is unfit if slaughtered in the name of a Passover offering in its season seeing that its remainder does not come as a Passover offering Talmud, Moss Sebekim B said our Joshua to him we find that a sin offering remainder comes as a burnt offering but a burnt offering remainder does not come as a sin offering now if the sin offering is unfit when slaughtered as a burnt offering though its remainder comes as a burnt offering is it not logical that a burnt offering slaughtered as a sin offering is unfit seeing that its remainder does not come as a sin offering not so replied our Elizer to him if you speak of a sin offering the reason that a burnt offering slaughtered in its name is fit is because if the sin offering is fit when slaughtered in its own name throughout the Year will you say the same of the Passover offering which is fit when slaughtered in its own name only in its season since then that itself is unfit when slaughtered in its own name during the rest of the year it is logical that others slaughtered in its name during the rest of the year are unfit Simeon the brother of Ezra said etc our Ashi recited the following in our Yohanan's name and our Ahasan of Rabba recited it in our Jane's name what is the reason of Simeon the brother of Ezra because scripture saith and they shall not profane the holy things of the children of Israel which they shall exalt unto the Lord this teaches that they are not profaned rendered unfit through what is superior higher than themselves but they are profaned through what is inferior to themselves but does this text come for this purpose surely it is required for Samuel's dictum for Samuel said whence do we know that he who eats people is liable to death from the verse and they shall not Profane the holy things of the children of Israel which they shall exalt unto the Lord the writ refers to that which is yet to be exalted if so scripture should write which were exalted offered by state which they shall exalt hence and for both from this Arzara asked are they valid yet do not propitiate and so he disagrees in one only or are they valid and propitiate and he disagrees in both said Abay others maintain Arzara to come and here if one slaughtered a firstling or tithe in the name of a peace offering it is valid if one slaughtered a peace offering as a firstling or tithe it is invalid now if you think that he means that they are valid and propitiate is propitiation applicable to a firstling hence they are valid and do not propitiate and since the second clause means that they are valid and do not propitiate in the first clause too they are valid and do not propitiate but what argument is this the one is according to its nature and the other is according to its Nature then what does he inform us the principle governing higher and lower sanctity surely we learned it how so if one slaughtered most sacred sacrifices under the designation of lesser sacrifices etc you might say only in the most sacred sacrifices and the lesser sacrifices is there higher and lower but not where both are lesser sacrifices hence we are informed that it is not so but we learned this too the peace offering takes precedence over the first link because the former requires four blood dash sprinklings laying on of hands drink offerings and the waving of the breast and the shoulder the present passage is the main source while in the other it is taught incidentally mission if one slaughters the Passover offering on the morning of the 14th of Nisan under a different designation our Joshua declares it valid just as if it had been slaughtered on the 13th band but there declares it invalid as if it had been slaughtered in the afternoon said Simeon B.S.A.I. Have a tradition from the mouth of 72 elders on the day that our Eliezer son of Ezra was appointed to the academy that all sacrifices which are eaten though slaughtered under a different designation are valid save that their owners have not discharged their obligation except the Passover offering and the sin offering thus the son of Isaiah added only the burnt offering but the sages did not agree with him Gamar our Eliezer said in our Ashai's name Ben but declared fit a Passover offering which one slaughtered in its own name on the morning of the 14th because he holds that the whole day is its season then what does as if etc mean because our Joshua states as if he too says as if, if so instead of disputing where it is slaughtered under a different designation let them dispute where it is slaughtered in its own name if they differed where it is slaughtered in its own name I would say that our Joshua agrees with Ben but that it is invalid when Slaughtered under a different designation since part of it the day is fit eligible hence he informs us that it is not so but surely it is written at dusk said will the son of our ally that means between two evenings then will you say that the whole day is fit for the daily offering too seeing that at dusk is written in connection there with there since it is written the one lamb thou shalt offer in the morning it follows that at dusk is meant literally yet say one must be offered in the morning while the other may be offered the whole day scripture prescribes one for the morning and not two for the morning again will you say that the whole day is fit for the lighting of the lamp since at dusk is written in connection there with there it is different because it is written to burn from evening to morning and it was taught from evening to morning furnish it with its requisite measure so that it may burn from evening to morning another interpretation you have no other service valid from evening to morning save this alone now will you say in the case of incense too where at dusk is written that the whole day is fit for the burning thereof incense is different Talmud, Ma Sebekim because it is likened to lamps but there too it is written there thou shalt sacrifice the Passover offering at even B.A. Arab that comes to teach the ferment for it was taught let that in connection with which B.A. Arab at even and Ben Harabim between the evenings are said be deferred after that in connection with which Ben Harabim alone is said now can there be a case where if he slaughtered it in the morning you say that it is its proper time yet when afternoon arrives you say that it should be deferred yes for surely our Yohanan said the Halachah is that one must recite them in high afternoon service and then recite the additional service now what is the purpose of Ben Harabim at dusk written in connection with incense and lamps furthermore it was taught Rabbi rebutted the words of our Joshua on Ben, but there is view that is not so. If you speak of the thirteenth where no part of it is fit, will you speak thus of the fourteenth where part of it is fit? Now, if this is correct, then the whole of it is fit. Rather said our Yohan and Ben, but there are declared unfit a Passover offering which one slaughtered in the morning of the fourteenth, whether in its own or in a different name, since part of it is fit for the slaughtering are about at this. View if so, how is it possible on Ben, but there is ruling for a Passover offering to be fit if one separates it now, it is rejected of initio, while if one separated it yesterday, it was eligible and rejected. Rather said our Rabbi, it must be that he separated it after midday. Abbe said you may even say that one separates it in the morning because the disqualification of prematureness does not apply to the same day. Our Papa said you may even say that one separates it the previous evening. Prematureness does not apply to the night for our Ishmael taught on the night of the eighth day it enters the fold to be tithed and this is in accordance with our Afteriki for our Afteriki pointed out a contradiction it is written and it shall be seven days under its dam hence on the following night it is eligible yet it is written but from the eighth day and thenceforth it may be accepted for an offering whence it follows that it was not eligible the previous evening how is this to be reconciled the night for sanctification and
Since if the offering was once rejected it remains so now both rulings are necessary for had he informed us of the first only you might have said that the reason is that he made himself ineligible to offer a sacrifice with his own hands but in the latter case where he was involuntarily disqualified he is merely as one who fell asleep again had he informed us the latter case only you might argue that the reason is because his recovery is not dependent on himself but in the former case. Apostasy it is not so since it lies with him to retract us both are required our Jeremiah asked if one ate Halab set aside a sacrifice then the Beth ruled that Halab is permitted yet subsequently they retracted what is the law does this constitute permanent rejection or does it not constitute permanent rejection said a certain old man to him when Aryohanan commenced his rulings on rejected sacrifices he commenced with this very case what is the reason there the person was disqualified but the sacrifice was not rejected whereas here the sacrifice too became rejected said Simeon the son of Isaiah have a tradition from the mouth of 72 elder s etc why does he state 72 elder s because they all held this view unanimously Ben Isaiah added only the burnt offering Aruna said what is Ben Isaiah's reason it is a burnt offering an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord it is implies that when it is slaughtered in its own name it is Valid when not in its own name it is invalid but it is written in the case of the guilt offering too that is written after the burning of the emurim but in this case too it is written after the burning of the emurim it is written twice in connection with the burnt offering yet it is written twice in the case of the guilt offering too rather Ben Isaiah infers it a fortiori if a sin offering is invalid when one slaughters it under a different designation though it is not entirely burnt how much the more is a burnt offering invalid in such circumstances seeing that it is entirely burnt as for the sin offering it may be argued the reason is that it makes atonement then let the Passover offering prove it as for the Passover offering the reason is because its time for slaughtering is fixed then let the sin offering prove it and thus the argument revolves the feature peculiar to the one is not that peculiar to the other and the feature peculiar to the other is not that peculiar to the first their common characteristic is that they are sacred sacrifices and if one slaughters them under a different designation they are invalid so will I adduce the burnt offering too which is a sacred sacrifice and if one slaughters it for a different purpose it is invalid no their common feature is that an aspect of Kareth is involved in them Ben is a Talmud, Mas Sebekima does not admit the refutation of Kareth then let him adduce the guilt offering to the feature. Common to both is that they apply to the whole community as to an individual alternatively he does admit the refutation of Kareth but Ben had a tradition and when Arhuna said that he inferred it a fortiori he said this only in order to sharpen his disciples mission if one slaughtered the Passover offering or the sin offering not in their own name and he received the blood went with it and sprinkled it not in their own name or in their own name and not in their own name or not in their own name and in their own name they are disqualified how is in their own name and not in their own name meant in the name of the Passover sacrifice first and then in the name of the peace offering not in their own name and in their own name means in the name of the peace offering first and then in the name of the Passover offering for a sacrifice can be disqualified at any one of the four services slaughtering receiving carrying and sprinkling our Simeon declares it valid in the carrying because he argued the sacrifice is impossible without slaughtering without receiving and without sprinkling but it is possible without carrying how so one slaughters it at the side of the altar and sprinkles forth with our Eliezer said if one goes where he needs to go an illegitimate intention disqualifies it where he need not go an illegitimate intention does not disqualify it Gemara does then receiving disqualify surely it was taught and they shall present this refers to the receiving of the blood you say this refers to the receiving of the blood yet perhaps it is not so but rather it means the sprinkling when it says and they shall dash the blood low sprinkling is stated hence to what can I apply and they shall present it must refer to the receiving of the blood Aaron's sons the priest teaches that these services must be performed by a legitimate priest robed in priestly vestment said our Akiva how do we know that receiving must be performed by none but a legitimate priest robed in priestly vestments Aaron's sons is stated here while elsewhere it says these are the names of the sons of Aaron the priests that were anointed as there it refers to legitimate priests as robed in priestly vestments so here too it means by a legitimate priest robed in priestly vestments are Tarfon observed may I lose my sons if I have not heard a distinction made between receiving and sprinkling yet I cannot explain what it is said our Akiva I will explain it in the case of receiving intention was not made tantamount to action whereas in the case of sprinkling intention was made tantamount to action again if one received the blood without its proper precincts he is not liable to Kareth whereas if one sprinkles it without he is punished with Kareth if unfit men received it they are not liable on its account if unfit men sprinkled it they are liable on its account said Artarfan to him by the temple service you have not deviated to the right or the left I heard it yet could not explain it whereas you investigate it and agree with my tradition in these words he addressed him Akiva whoever departs from me is as though he departed from life said Rabba there is no difficulty the one refers to an intention of pickle while the other our mission refers to an intention for the sake of something else this too may be proved because it teaches for a sacrifice can be disqualified but it does not teach for a sacrifice becomes pickle this Proves it now does not an intention of pickle disqualify it the sacrifice at the receiving surely it was taught you might think that an intention of pickle is effective only at the sprinkling whence do we know to include slaughtering and receiving from the text and if any of the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offerings be at all eaten on the third day it shall not be accepted it shall be an abort thing pickle scripture treats of the services which lead to eating you might think that I also include the pouring out of the residue of the blood and the burning of the emurim therefore it states on the third day it shall not be accepted neither shall it be imputed unto him that offered it now sprinkling was included in the general statement and why was it singled out that an analogy therewith might be drawn intimating as sprinkling is a service and is indispensable for atonement so every act which is a service and is indispensable for atonement is included thus the pouring out of the residue and the burning of the emurim are excluded since these are not indispensable for atonement Talmud, Ma Sebekim B. There is no difficulty in the one case it means that he declared lo I slaughter the sacrifice with the intention of receiving its blood tomorrow while in the other case it means that he declared lo receive the blood with the intention of pouring out its residue tomorrow one of the rabbis said to Rabbi now does not intention disqualify it. Pouring out of the residue and the burning of the emurim yet surely it was taught you might think that intention is effective only in connection with the eating of the flesh whence do we know to include the pouring out of the residue and the burning of the emurim from the text and if any of the flesh be at all eaten on the third day it shall be an abhorred thing scripture refers to two eatings visiting by man and eating by the altar there is no difficulty in the one case he declares. Lo, I sprinkle the blood with the intention of pouring out the residue tomorrow. In the other, he declares, Lo, I pour out the residue with the intention of burning the emurim tomorrow. Arjuna, the son of Arhai, said, I have heard that the dipping of the finger in the blood renders a sacrifice pickle. In the case of an inner sin offering, Ilfa heard this and reported it before Barpata said, He do we learn pickle from else but from a peace offering then as the dipping of the finger does. Not render a peace offering pickle. So in the case of a sin offering too, the dipping of the finger does not render pickle, but do we really learn everything from a peace offering? If so, then reason thus as a service in the name of a different sacrifice does not free a peace offering from pickle. So a service in the name of a different sacrifice does not free a sin offering from pickle. What then can you say that it is deduced from the extension implied in scriptural text? And so here too it is. Deduced from the extension implied in the scriptural text, our Joshua B. Levi said in this upper chamber, I heard that the dipping of the finger renders pickle thereat. Our Simeon B. Lakish wondered, do we learn pickle from what else but from the peace offering? Then, as the dipping of the finger does not render the peace offering pickle, so in the case of the sin offering, too, the dipping of the finger does not render it pickle, but do we then really learn everything from the peace offering? If so, then. Reason thus as a service in the name of a different sacrifice does not free a peace offering from pickle, so a service in the name of a different sacrifice does not free a sin offering from pickle, said our Jose B. Hanada. Yes, indeed, we really learn everything from the peace offering since the intention to consume it without its precincts disqualifies a peace offering while performing a service for the sake of something else disqualifies a sin offering, then as the intention to
The meal offering places it in the utensil, carries it to the altar, or burns it thereon, renders it pickle. Now, as for taking a fistful, it is well that this affects pickle as it corresponds to slaughtering. Carrying the fistful corresponds to carrying the blood, burning it corresponds to sprinkling. But to what does putting the fistful into a utensil correspond? Shall we say that it is similar to receiving? Is it then similar? There it is automatic, whereas here he takes it himself and places it in the utensil. But since you cannot dispense with placing it in the utensil, you must say that it is an important service. So here too, since one cannot dispense with it, you must say that it is part of carrying the blood to the altar. No, in truth, it is similar to receiving. And as to your objection, there it is automatic, whereas here he takes it himself and places it in the utensil. The answer is since both are instances of placing in a utensil, what does it matter whether it is? Automatic or whether he personally takes and places it there shall we say that it is a controversy of tanning for one berry the taught the dipping of the finger renders a sin offering pickle while another taught it does not affect pickle nor does it become pickle surely then it is a controversy of tanning no one agrees with our rabbis and the other agrees with our simian if our simian why particularly the dipping of the finger surely he said Talmud, Ma Sebekim or whatever is not offered on the outer altar like the peace offering is not subject to pickle rather both agree with the rabbis yet there is no difficulty the one refers to outer sin offerings while the other refers to the inner sin offerings as for the outer sin offerings it is obvious since and he shall dip is not written in connection there with it is necessary to teach it one might argue since and he shall take his written and if an ape came and placed the blood there on his finger he the priest must take it Again it is as though and he shall dip were written therefore he informs us that for that very reason and he shall dip is not written so that it may imply the one and imply the other our Simeon declares it fit in the carrying our Simeon be like said our Simeon agrees that an illegitimate intention disqualifies at the carrying of the blood of the inner sin offerings because it is a service which cannot be omitted but our Simeon said whatever is not offered on the outer altar like the peace offering does not entail liability on account of pickle said our Joseph son of our Hannah he agrees that it disqualifies it a minority of offering for the sake of something else disqualifies a sin offering though it is valid in the case of a peace offering is it not logical that the intention of consuming it after time disqualifies a sin offering seeing that it disqualifies in the case of a peace offering we have thus found that the intention of consuming it after time disqualifies it how do we know that the intention to eat it without its precincts disqualifies if you would learn it from after time by analogy you may refute it as for after time that is because it involves karathif from sacrificing for the sake of something else that is because it operates at the bamba where does sacrificing for the sake of something else operate as a disqualification you must say in the case of the Passover offering and the sin offering and the Passover offering and the sin offering were not sacrificed at the bamba alternatively it is a scriptural analogy for and if any of the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offerings be at all eaten on the third day refers to the disqualification of after time while it shall be an important thing pickle refers to the intention of eating it without its precincts Rabbi said if you will say that our Simeon agrees with his son who maintained between the ulam and the altar is north our Simeon will then hold that Illegitimate intention is effective in the case of the carrying of the blood of inner sin offerings only from within the entrance of the ulam and if you will say that our Simeon agrees with our Judah who maintained the whole of the inner part of the temple court is sanctified he will then hold that an illegitimate intention is effective during the passage of the removal of the incense dishes only from the entrance of the hikal and without again if you will say that he holds that the sanctity of the hikal and that of the ulam is one then an illegitimate intention is effective only from the entrance of the ulam and without and if you will say that within the entrance is as within the hikal then an illegitimate intention is not effective even for one step save within the stretching out of his one's hand but if you will say that he holds that carrying without using the foot is not called carrying then an illegitimate intention is not effective at all Abbe said. To our histas, Amora asked our histas what of carrying by Israelites are it is valid. He replied, and a scriptural text supports me. And they killed the Passover lamb, and the priests dashed the blood which they received of their hand, and the levites flayed them. Arshis hate objected, Azar and one in Talmud, Masavakim be one who is intoxicated, and one who is physically blemished are unfit to receive the blood, carry it and sprinkle it. And the same applies to one who is sitting and to the performance of these by the left hand. This is indeed a refutation, but our histas quotes a text. It means that he Azar served as a mere post rabbi, and our Joseph both maintained carriage by Azar is a subject of controversy between our Simeon and the rabbis. According to our Simeon, who says that a temple service which can be dispensed with is not a service carriage by Azar is valid, but according to the rabbis, it is invalid. Said Abbe to them, but slaughtering is a service which cannot be. Dispense with and yet it is valid when done by Azar slaughtering is not a service he replied is it not surely Arzara said in Rab's name the slaughtering of the red heifer by Azar is invalid and our Papa observed thereon the reason is because Eliezer and statute are written in connection with it the red heifer is different because it is of the holy things of the temple repair but does it not follow a fortiori it is a service in the case of the holy objects of the temple repair yet it is not a service in the case of holy objects dedicated to the altar said Arshisha the son of Aridi let it be analogous to the inspection of leprous plagues which is not a service and yet requires the priesthood yet the carrying of the limbs to the ascent is a service which can be dispensed with and yet it is invalid when done by Azar for it is written and the priest shall offer bring near the hole and make it smoke burn it upon the altar and the master said this refers to the carrying. Of the limbs to the ascent where scripture has revealed that a priest is required it has revealed it but where scripture has not revealed it it has not but does not the reverse follow a fortiori if the carrying of the limbs to the ascent requires the priesthood though it is not indispensable to atonement how much the more does the carrying of the blood require a priest seeing that it is indispensable to atonement it was stated likewise Ulla said in our Eliezer's name carriage by Azar is invalid even according to our Simeon it was asked his carriage without moving the foot called carriage or not come and here and the same applies to one who is sitting and to the performance of these by the left hand which renders it invalid hence standing similar to sitting is valid no perhaps sitting means that he drags himself along and then standing similar to sitting means that he moves slightly come and here a dash Israelite slaughtered the Passover offering and a priest received the blood he handed it to his colleague and his colleague to his colleague there too it means that they the priest moved slightly then what does he the tana inform us that in the multitude of people is the king's glory come and here if a fit person received the blood and handed it to an unfit one the latter must return it to the fit one say the fit person must go round and take it it was stated Ullah said in our Yohanan's name carriage without moving the foot is not call carriage Talmud Ma Sebeki may now the question arises can this be repaired or can it not be repaired come and here if a fit person received the blood and handed it to an unfit one the latter must return it to the fit one now granted that the fit person receives it back yet if you think that it cannot be repaired it has already been made invalid this does not prove anything do you think that the Lazarite stood with it no it means that the Lazarite stood without it was Stated Ullah said in our Yohanan's name carriage without moving the foot is invalid this proves that it cannot be repaired our Naman raised an objection to Ullah if the blood was spilled from the vessel onto the pavement and one priest collected it, it is valid the circumstances here are that the blood had run outward would it run without only and not enter within it fell on sloping ground alternatively it fell into a depression another alternative is that it, the blood was thick. But does the Tana trouble to teach us all these moreover instead of teaching in another chapter if it was spilled onto the ground and the priest collected it, it is unfit let him the Tana draw a distinction in that very case thus when does this hold good only if the blood ran without but if it entered within it is unfit this is indeed a refutation it was stated carriage without moving the foot is the subject of a controversy between our Simeon and the rabbis in the case of a long Carriage all agree that it is unfit they disagree only in respect of a short carriage this was ridiculed in the West Eretz Israel if so as for the law that an illegitimate intention disqualifies a sin offering of a bird how is this possible according to our Simeon if the priest expressed this intention before the blood issue it is nothing if after the blood has issued then surely the precept has already been performed what difficulty is this perhaps the priest expressed his intention between the issuing of the blood and its reaching the altar for surely our Jeremiah asked our z
Said the validity of the argument, surely he is bound to bring it up is disputed by our Eliezer and the rabbis, for we learned our Eliezer said if one goes where he needs to go, an illegitimate intention disqualifies it. If he goes where he need not go, an illegitimate intention does not disqualify it. Whereon Rabbi commented, all agree that if the priest received the blood without and carried it within, that is a necessary walk. If he received it within and carried it without, it is an unnecessary walk. They disagree only where he brought it within and then carried it without again. One master holds, but he must surely bring it up to the altar while the other master holds. This is not the same as a carriage required for the service. Have they refuted him? Our Eliezer said if one goes where he must go, an illegitimate intention disqualifies it. How so? If he received it without and brought it within, it is a necessary walk. If he received it within and carried it without, it is an Unnecessary walk once if he carried it within again it is a necessary walk said he robbed to him if it was taught it was taught chapter two mission all sacrifices whose blood was caught by zar no any and atibul one lacking sacrificial atonement one lacking priestly vestments one who had not washed his hands and feet an uncircumcised priest an unclean priest one who was sitting one standing on utensils or on an animal or on his fellow's feet are disqualified if the priest caught the blood with his left hand it is disqualified our Simeon declares it valid Gemara how do we know that Azar disqualifies the sacrifice if he receives the blood because Levi taught scripture says speak unto Aaron and to his sons that they separate themselves from the holy things of the children of Israel etc what does the children sons of Israel exclude shall we say that it excludes the sacrifice of women can women sacrifice be offered in uncleanness again is it to exclude the sacrifices of even seeing that even the head plate does not propitiate for a master said but in the case of the sacrifices of evens whether done in ignorance or deliberately propitiation is not affected can these actually be offered in uncleanness hence this is what scripture means that they separate themselves from the holy things of the children of Israel and that they the children of Israel profane not my holy name the school of our Ishmael taught that is our disqualifies the sacrifices inferred a memory from a priest with a blemish if a priest with a blemish who may eat of the sacrifice profanes it when he officiates Talmud Ma Sebakim is it not logical that is our who may not eat profanes the sacrifice by officiating no as for a priest with a blemish the reason may be because in his case the man who offers officiates is treated on a par with what is offered then let an unclean priest prove it as for an unclean priest it. Reason is that he defiles the flesh of the sacrifice, then let one with a blemish prove it, and thus the argument revolves the distinguishing feature of one not being that of the other, and the distinguishing feature of the other not being that of the first. The feature common to both is that they are admonished not to officiate, and if they do officiate, they profane the sacrifice. So will I also, this is our who is likewise admonished that if he officiates, he profanes. How do we know that he is admonished if from that they separate themselves? Surely profanation is written in its very context rather from the text, but a common man's are shall not draw nigh unto you, but the argument can be refuted. The feature common to both is that they were not permitted at the high places. Do not say let an unclean priest prove it, but say let an one and prove it as for an one, and the reason is because he is forbidden to partake of the second tithe, then let a priest with a blemish prove it, and Thus the argument revolves the distinguishing feature of one is not that of the other and vice versa the feature common to both is that they are forbidden etc. But here too let us refute the argument the feature common to both is that they were not permitted at the high places to this our Sama the son of Robert Demert and who is to tell us that an one and was forbidden at the high places perhaps he was permitted at the high places our measure said it is inferred a memory from a priest who sits. If one who is sitting profanes the sacrifice if he officiates though he may eat thereof when sitting is it not logical that is our who may not eat profanes it if he officiates as for one who is sitting the reason may be because he is unfit to testify the inference is from a scholar who is sitting then refute it thus as for the general interdict of one who sits the reason may be because such is unfit to testify one does not refute by a general interdict and should you say that you can. Refute us then say that it is inferred from one who sits and one of these others and how do we know that one who is sitting is fit at the high place scripture saith to stand before the Lord to minister to him before the Lord one must stand but not at the high place O N E and how do we know it because it is written neither shall he go out of the sanctuary and he shall not profane the sanctuary of his God hence if another priest went in one and does not go out he does profane it or Eliezer said it is inferred from this verse behold have they offered their sin offering and burnt offering this day before the Lord it was I who offered hence it follows that had they offered it would rightly have been burnt now why does not our Eliezer draw the inference from the text neither shall he go out of the sanctuary he can answer you is it then written but if another goes out he does profane it and the other why does he not draw the inference from the text behold have they offered he holds that it was burnt on account of uncleanness. The school of our Ishmael taught it is inferred a minority from a priest with a blemish if Talmud, Ma Sevakim be a priest with a blemish who does eat thereof profanes it if he officiates it is surely logical that an one who may not eat thereof profanes it by his officiating in the case of a priest with a blemish the reason may be because they who sacrifice are regarded the same as those which are sacrificed then let Azar prove it. As for Azar the reason may be because there is no remedy for him then let a priest with a blemish prove it and thus the argument revolves the feature peculiar to one is not that of the other and the feature which characterizes the other is not that of the first the feature common to both is that they are admonished not to officiate and if they do officiate they profane it so do I it is in one and two who is admonished and if he officiates he profanes it now where is he admonished shall we? Say in the text neither shall he go out of the sanctuary surely profanation is written in that very context rather it is inferred from the text behold have they offered and he the school of our Ishmael holds that it was burnt on account of bereavement this argument may be refuted as for the feature common to both it is that there is no exception to the general interdict then let an unclean priest prove it as for an unclean priest the reason is that he defiles the flesh then let it others prove it and thus the argument revolves etc the feature common to both is that they are admonished etc yet let us refute it thus as for their common feature it is that there is no exception to the general interdict in favor of a high priest in the case of a private sacrifice the interdict of uncleanness is nevertheless raised our measure she has said it is inferred a minority from a priest who sits if a priest who eats sitting profanes the sacrifice if he officiates whilst sitting it is Surely logical that in one and who may not eat thereof profanes the sacrifice by his officiating as for one who sits the reason may be because he is unfit to testify the argument is from a scholar who sits and refute it thus as for the interdict of sitting that may be because such is unfit to testify one does not refute from the general interdict of sitting and should you say that you can refute thus say that it is inferred from one who sits and one of these others all sacrifices whose blood was caught by an ONEN are disqualified rabbis said they learned this only of a private sacrifice but in the case of a public sacrifice it is accepted this being inferred from uncleanness a minority of the general interdict of uncleanness was not raised in favor of a high priest in the case of a private sacrifice yet it was permitted to an ordinary priest in the case of a public sacrifice then bereavement whose general interdict was raised in favor of a high priest in the case of a private sacrifice is surely permitted to an ordinary priest in the case of a public sacrifice to this rabbi be a high let the interdict of bereavement not be raised in favor of a high priest in the case of a private sacrifice a minority of the interdict of uncleanness was not raised in favor of a high priest in the case of a private sacrifice though it was raised for an ordinary priest in the case of a public sacrifice is it not logical that the interdict of bereavement which was not raised for an ordinary priest in the case of a public sacrifice shall not be raised for a high priest in the case of a private sacrifice or argue thus let uncleanness be permitted to a high priest in the case of a private sacrifice a minority of bereavement which is not permitted to an ordinary priest in the case of a public sacrifice is permitted to a high priest in the case of a private sacrifice is it not logical that uncleanness which is permitted to an ordinary priest in the case of a Public sacrifice is permitted to a high priest in the case of a private sacrifice again argue thus let uncleanness not be permitted to an ordinary priest in the case of a public sacrifice a minority of bereavement is not permitted to an ordinary priest in the case of a public sacrifice though it is permitted to a high priest in the case of a private sacrifice then uncleanness which is not permitted to a high priest in the case of a private sacrifice is surely not permitted to an ordinary priest. In the
Sacrifice whereas he who is not unfit to partake of Terramah does not profane the service Rabbis said why must the Divine Law enumerate an unclean priest to Tibul Yom and one who lacks atonement they are all necessary for had the Divine Law written the law for an unclean priest only I would say that he disqualifies the sacrifice because he defiles if the law were written with reference to a Tibul Yom one who lacks atonement could not be derived from it seeing that the former is disqualified to partake of Terramah if it were written with reference to one who lacks atonement a Tibul Yom could not be learned from it seeing that the former lacks a positive act now one cannot be derived from one other but let one be derived from two in which should the Divine Law not write this ruling should it not write it with respect to one who lacks atonement so that it might be inferred from the others it might be argued as for the others their peculiar feature is that they are disqualified to partake of terim, or rather let not the divine law write it of a tibul yom which could be inferred from the others for how will you refute the analogy as for these others the reason is that they are wanting in a positive act this would be no refutation for after all its uncleanness is but slight talmud, ma sevakim he holds that a zab lacking atonement is as a zab now whether a zab lacking atonement is as a zab is dependent on ten aim for it was taught. If an one and or one lacking atonement burns it, it is fit. Joseph the Babylonian said, If an one and burns it, it is fit. But if one who lacks atonement burns it, it is unfit. Now surely they disagree. And this one master holds that a zab lacking atonement is as a zab, while the other master holds that he is not as a zab. No, all agree that he is as a zab. But here they disagree in the following: for it is written, and the clean person shall sprinkle upon the unclean whence it follows that he is unclean. Thus, teaching that a tibul yom is fit to officiate at the red heifer. Now one master holds this applies to every form of uncleanness mentioned in the Torah, while the other master holds that it applies to the uncleanness dealt with in this chapter only. Therefore, in one and a tibul yom rendered originally unclean through a dead reptile who are less stringent are derived a minori from a tibul yom rendered originally unclean through a dead body. But a zab who lacks atonement is not thus. Derived since he is more stringent as his uncleanness proceeds from his own body, one lacking the priestly vestments. Whence do we know it said Arabu in our Yohanan's name, and some derive ultimately the teaching from our Eliezer, the son of our Simeon, because scripture said, And thou shalt gird them with girdles, Aaron and his sons, and bind head tires on them, and they shall have the priesthood by a perpetual statute. When wearing their appointed garments, they are invested with their priesthood. When not wearing their garments, they are not invested with their priesthood. Now is this derived from the verse quoted? Surely it is derived from elsewhere, for it was taught, How do we know that if one who had drank wine officiates, he profanes the sacrifices? Because it is written, Drink no wine nor strong wine, that ye may put difference between the holy and the profane. How do we know the same of one who lacks priestly vestments, and of one who had not washed his hands and feet? Talmud, Moss. Zavakim, because statute is written in connection with each to serve as a gazerish, why if it were derived from that verse I would argue that it applies only to a service for which Azar is liable to death, but as for a service for which Azar is not liable to death I would say that it is not so, hence we are informed that it is not so, we have thus found it in the case of one who lacks priestly vestments, how do we know it of one who has drunk wine we deduce it from the word statute. Written here and in the case of one who lacks vestments, but the Tana deduces it from the text that you may put a difference, etc. That is before he has established the Gazerishawa, but the Tana learns the law for one who lacks vestments from that of one who drank wine. This is what he means. How do we know that no distinction is drawn between one who lacks vestments and one who drank wine or who did not wash his hands and feet because statute is written in respect of each to serve as a Gazerishawa? Then what is the need of that you may put difference, etc. to teach the practice of Rab for Rab would not appoint an interpreter from one festival day to the next on account of drinking, but still is it deduced from this text? Surely it is deduced from elsewhere, and the sons of Aaron the priest shall put fire upon the altar, which implies in his priestly state this teaches that if a high priest donned the vestments of an ordinary priest and officiated his service is unfit if we made the deduction from the earlier text I would argue that it applies only to a service which is essential for atonement but not to a service which is not essential for atonement but still is it deduced from this text surely it is deduced from elsewhere viz and Aaron's sons the priests shall lay the pieces etc which intimates the priests in their priestly state once we learn that if an ordinary priest on the vestments of a high priest and officiated his service is unfit if we made the deduction from the earlier text I would argue that it applies only to an insufficiency of vestments but not to an excess therefore if the present text informs us that it is not so our rabbis taught if the priestly vestments trailed on the floor or did not reach the floor or were threadbare and the priest officiated in them his service is valid but if he put on two pairs of bridges two girdles or if one garment was wanting or if there was one too many or if he had a Plaster on a wound in his flesh, or if his garments were Talmud, Ma Sevakim be besmeared or torn, and he officiated his services invalid. Rab Judah said in Samuel's name, trailing garments are fit garments which do not reach the pavement are unfit, but it was taught if they do not reach the ground they are fit. Said Rami Bihamma, there is no difficulty. The latter means where he hitches them up by the girdle, the former where from the very outset they are not long enough. Rab said either. Garments are invalid. Arhuna visited Arjiza, his host's son put a difficulty to him. Did then Samuel say trailing garments are fit while those which do not reach the ground are unfit, but it was taught if they do not reach the ground they are fit. Said he to him, disregard that for Rami Bihamma has answered it, but the difficulty is according to Rab. And should you answer what is meant by trailing those which are hitched up by the girdle for the girdle cuts off the length, but then there is a Difficulty about garments which do not reach said our Zerarab learns both clauses as one trailing garments which are hitched up by girdle are fit our Jeremiah of Dipti said as to trailing garments which he did not lift up there is a controversy of tanning for it was taught thou shalt make thee twisted cords upon the four corners of thy covering four intimates but not three yet perhaps that is not so but rather four intimates but not five when it says wherewith thou coverest thyself. A five cornered garment is alluded to hence how can I interpret four as intimating four but not three now why do you include a five cornered garment and exclude a three cornered one I include a five cornered one because five includes four and I exclude a three cornered one because three does not include four now another buried the taught upon the four corners of thy covering four but not three four but not five surely they disagree and this one master holds the additional corner is counted. As existent while the other master holds it is as non existent, no all agree that it is as existent, but here it is different because scripture includes a five cornered garment in the phrase wherewith thou coverest thyself, and the other how does he utilize this phrase wherewith thou coverest thyself? He requires it for what was taught that ye may look upon it. This excludes night attire, yet perhaps that is not so, but rather it excludes a blind man's garment when it says wherewith thou coverest thyself. Lo, a blind man's garment is alluded to, hence how can I interpret that ye may look upon it as excluding night attire? Now, why do you include a blind man's garment and exclude a night garment? I include a blind man's garment because it can be seen by others, while I exclude night attire because it is not seen by others, and the other he deduces it from wherewith, and the other he does not interpret wherewith as having a separate significance. Our rabbis taught, and the priest shall put on. His garment of bad this teaches that they his garments must be of linen bad implies that they must be new bad implies that they must be of twisted thread bad implies that the thread must be sixfold bad implies that secular garments must not be worn with them Abbe said to our Joseph as for saying bad implies that they must be of linen it is well for he informs us this only of linen but not of anything else but when he says bad implies that they must be new does it mean only new but not threadbare surely it was taught threadbare garments are fit said he to him and according to your reasoning when he says bad implies that the thread must be sixfold yet surely bad implies each thread separately rather this is what he means the garments which it is stated are to be bad must be of linen new of twisted thread and of sixfold thread some of these provisions are recommendations only while others are indispensable how do you know that bad means flax linen said are Joseph son of our Hananite connotes that which comes up from the ground in separate stocks say that it means wool wool splits but flax too splits it splits through beating rubbin as said it is deduced from the following they shall have linen tires upon their heads and shall have linen bridges upon their loins they shall not gird themselves with anything
Foster fathers has been fulfilled in you. We learned elsewhere if a priest has a wound on his finger, he may want to read about it in the temple, but not in the country. But if his purpose is to squeeze out blood, it is forbidden in both places. Are due to the son of our high said they learned this only of a reed, but a small belt constitutes an excess garment. But our Yohanan said they ruled that excess garments disqualify only when they are worn where garments are worn, but if not where garments are worn. They are not in excess yet deduced that it disqualifies on account of an interposition, it is on his left hand or even on the right, but not in the place of service. Now this disagrees with Rabba for Rabba said in Arhistah's name in the place of garments even a single thread interposes, but what is not in the place of garments if three finger breadth square interposes if less than this it does not interpose. Now he certainly disagrees with our Yohanan, but are we to say that he disagrees with our Judah the son of Arhai know a small belt is different because it is of some account another version states it thus are Judah the son of Arhai said they learned this only of a reed but a small belt interposes while our Yohanan maintained they said that interposition disqualifies even when less than three square only in the place of garments but if not where garments are worn and if it is three square it interposes if less it does not interpose and that is identical with Rabba's ruling in Arhistah's name shall we say that he Rabba disagrees with our Judah the son of Arhai know for a small belt is different since it is of some account now according to our Yohanan why particularly specify a reed let him mention a small belt he informs us and passant that a reed heals Rabba asked what if a wind entered through his garment do we require the garment to be on his flesh which condition is now absent or perhaps this is the normal mode of wearing further is vermin and interposition there is no question where it is dead for it certainly interposes but what if it is alive do we say since it moves to and fro it is natural and does not interpose or perhaps it does interpose since he objects to it does earth interpose earth certainly interposes rather the question is what about dust of earth does the space between the sleeves and the armpit interpose do we require it to be on his flesh which condition is absent or perhaps this is the normal mode of wearing what if he thrust his hand into his bosom does his body interpose or not does a thread interpose a thread certainly interposes rather the question is what about a hanging thread mar the son of our ashi asked what if one's hair entered beneath his garment is his hair as part of his body or is it not as his body are asked do the teflon interpose there is no question on the view that night is not the time for teflon for since they interpose at night they interpose by day too the question is raised only on the view that night is the time for Tefillin what then does a precept which is incumbent upon the body interpose or not now this question traveled about until it reached RMI said he to him the questioner we have an explicit teaching that Tefillin interpose an objection is raised priests engaged in their sacrificial service love it's on their days and Israelites during their mayamet are exempt from prayer and Tefillin surely that means that if they do put them on they do not interpose no it means that if they do put them on they do interpose if so can you say they are exempt surely he should state they are forbidden to don them since there are the Levites and the Israelites of whom he cannot teach they are forbidden he therefore teaches they are exempt but it was taught if he put them on they do not interpose there is no difficulty one refers to the Tefillin of the hand the other to that of the head wherein does that of the hand differ because it is Written and the priest shall put on his linen garment and his linen breeches shall he put upon his flesh which implies that nothing may interpose between it and his flesh then with respect to that of the head too it is written and thou shalt set the mitre upon his head it was taught his hair was visible between the headplate and the mitre Talmud. Mas Sevakim B and there he laid the tefillin one lacking in sacrificial atonement whence do we know it said Arhuna scripture saith and it. Priest shall make atonement for her and she shall be clean she shall be clean proves that she is unclean before atonement is made for her and one who had not washed his hands or his feet the implication of statute is derived from statute written in connection with one who lacked his priestly vestments our rabbis taught if a high priest did not perform immersion or did not sanctify himself between the changing of robes and between the services and he officiated his service is valid but the Service of both a high priest or an ordinary priest who officiated without the matutinal sanctification of their hands and feet is invalid said R.C. to our Yohan and consider the five immersions and the ten sanctifications are scriptural and statute is written in connection with them then let them be indispensable said he to him scripture said and put them on the putting on of the priestly vestments is indispensable but nothing else is indispensable at that his face lit up said he to him I have written you a bob on the tree trunk for if that is so the sanctifications of the morning too should not be indispensable said Hezekiah scripture said and it shall be a statute forever to them even to him and to his seed throughout their generations that which is indispensable for his seed is indispensable for himself and that which is not indispensable for his seed is not indispensable for himself or Jonathan said he deduced it from this that Moses and Aaron and his sons might wash their hands and their feet thereat that which is indispensable in the case of his sons is indispensable in his own case while that which is not indispensable in the case of his sons is not indispensable in his own case why does our Jonathan not deduce it from the text quoted by Hezekiah he can answer you that is written to shoot that the law holds good for all generations and the other why did he not deduce it from this text he requires it for our Jose son of our Hannah is ruling for our Jose son of our Hannah said you may not wash in a labor which does not contain sufficient water for the sanctifications of four priests for it says that Moses and Aaron and his sons might wash their hands and their feet thereat our rabbis taught how is the precept of sanctification fulfilled the priest places his right hand on his right foot and his left hand on his left foot and sanctifies them our Jose son of Judah said he places his both hands on each other and on his two feet lying on each other and sanctifies them said they to him you have made it too hard for it is impossible to do it thus surely they speak rightly to him said our joseph his colleague assist him wherein do they differ said abbe they disagree in respect of standing by being supported said Arsima the son of our ashi to and let him indeed sit and perform his sanctification scripture said and thou shalt anoint aaron and his sons and sanctify them that they my minister and the ministration must be done standing our rabbis taught if the priest sanctified his hands and feet by day he need not sanctify them at night if he sanctified them at night he must sanctify them by day this is rabbi's view for rabbi maintained the passing of the night is effective in respect of the sanctification of hands and feet our eliezer son of our Simeon said the passing of the night is not effective in respect of the sanctification of hands and feet another buried the taught if the priest was standing and Offering the fats on the altar throughout the night at dawn, he needs sanctification of hands and feet. This is Rabbi's view. Our Eliezer, son of our Simeon, said, since he sanctified his hands and feet at the beginning of the service, he need not sanctify them again even for ten days. Now both are necessary. For if we were informed of the first burial, I would argue that Rabbi ruled thus only there. The circumstances being that there had been an interval between one service and another, but here that there was no interval, I would say that Rabbi agrees with our Eliezer, son of our Simeon. While if we were informed of the latter burial, I would argue that here only does our Eliezer, son of our Simeon, rule thus. But in the former, he agrees with Rabbi. Hence, they are both necessary. What is Rabbi's reason? Because it is written when they approach the altar to minister. What is our Eliezer, son of our Simeon's reason? Because it is written when they enter into the tent of meeting, they shall wash with. Water and the other two surely it is written when they enter if when they approach were written and not when they enter I would say that for every single approach sanctification is necessary therefore the divine lord when they enter and the other two surely it is written when they approach if when they enter were written and not when they approach I would say that they must wash even for a mere entrance for a mere entrance surely it is written to minister rather when they approach is required for Araha son of Jacob's ruling for Araha son of Jacob said all agree with respect to the second sanctification that the priest performs the sanctification when he is clothed for scripture saith or when they approach he who lacks nothing but the approach washes his hands and feet hence he who has yet to clothe himself and then approaches excluded what is the purpose of to cause an offering made by fire to smoke Talmud Mas Sebekim you might say the sanctification is Required only for a service which is indispensable to atonement, but not for a service which is not indispensable to atonement. Hence, this clause informs us otherwise. When our came, he said in our Yohanan's name, if asked on the view that the passing of the night is of no effect in respect of the sanctification of hands and feet, does the water of the labor become unfit? Do we say for what purpose is this water for the sanctification of hands and feet? But the sanctification of hands and feet
Its water should not become unfit through the passing of the night. Surely this is even according to our Eliezer son of Arsimian. No, it represents Rabbi's view. Yet surely since the first clause is according to our Eliezer son of Arsimian, the second clause too is according to our Eliezer son of Arsimian. For the first clause is teaches the high priest and came to his bullock which bullock stood between the Ulam porch and the altar, its head toward the south and its face toward the west. While the priest stood in the east and faced west. Now whom do you know to maintain that between the Ulam and the altar was north our Eliezer son of Arsimian? For it was taught what is the north from the northern wall of the altar to the northern wall of the temple court and the whole of the space opposite the altar is north. That is our Jose son of our Judas view. Our Eliezer son of Arsimian added the space between the Ulam and the altar. Rabbi adds the place where the priests and Israelites tread, but all. Agree that the place on the inside of the knife's chamber is unfit. Now is it reasonable that the first barrier represents our Eliezer son of Arsimian's view and not Rabbi seeing that Rabbi goes further than our Jose son of Arjuda? Does he not go further than our Eliezer son of Arsimian's definition? This is what we mean if you think that it agrees with Rabbi. Let him station it in the place where the feet of the priests and the Israelites tread. What then it is according to our Eliezer son of Arsimian? Then let him station it in the space from the northern wall of the altar to the northern wall of the temple court. What then must you answer that it was placed in the position indicated on account of the high priest's fatigue? So on this view too it was on account of the high priest's weakness. Or Yohanan said if the priest sanctified his hands and feet for the removal of the ashes, he need not sanctify them again on the morrow because he has already done so at the beginning of it. Service according to whom, if according to Rabbi, surely he said that the passing of the night renders it null. If according to our Eliezer son of Arsimian, surely he said he need not sanctify himself again even for ten days. Said Abay, in truth, it is according to Rabbi, and the nullifying effect of the passing of the night is merely rabbinical, and he admits that the passing of the night does not nullify from cockcrow until morning. Rabbi said, in truth, it agrees with our Eliezer son of Arsimian, but our Yohanan accepted his view only in respect of the beginning of the service, but not in respect of the end of the service. An objection is raised when his brother priests saw him descend, they quickly ran and sanctified their hands and feet at the labor Talmud. Masabakim be now it is well according to Abay who interprets it, our Yohanan's ruling is agreeing with Rabbi, for Rabbi admits that the passing of the night does not nullify in the interval between cockcrow and morning for this will. Then be according to Rabbi, but according to Rabbi who interprets it as agreeing with our Eliezer son of Arsimian only, but in Rabbi's opinion the passing of the night nullifies even from cockcrow until morning with whom does this agree if with Rabbi then the passing of the night nullifies it if with our Eliezer son of Arsimian surely he said that he does not need sanctification even for ten days in truth it agrees with our Eliezer son of Arsimian the reference being to fresh priests and was asked. Is going out of the temple court effective to invalidate sanctification of hands and feet if you say that the passing of the night does not invalidate it that is because the priest did not cease officiating but since he ceases when he goes out he turns his mind away from it or perhaps since it rests with him to go back he does not turn his mind away from it come and here if he sanctified his hands and feet and they were defiled he immerses them but he need not sanctify them if they his hands and feet went out from the temple court, they retained their sanctity. If only his hands went out, we are not in doubt. Our doubt is where his whole body went out. What is the law? Then come and hear he whose hands or feet are unwashed must sanctify them at a service vessel within. If he sanctified them in a service vessel without or in an unconsecrated vessel within, or if he immersed in the water of a pit and officiated his service is invalid, thus it is only because he sanctified his hands from a service vessel without. But if he sanctified them within and then went out, his subsequent service is valid. No, perhaps what is meant by he sanctified them in a service vessel without that, e.g., he stretched his hands without and sanctified them. But if his whole body went out, you may certainly be in doubt, said Arzibit to our Papa. Come and hear if the priest went without the barrier of the wall of the temple court, if it was his intention to tarry there, he needs immersion. If for a short while he needs sanctification of hands and feet said he to him that means where he went out to ease himself at nature's call but that is explicitly taught he who eases himself needs immersion and he who answers nature's call requires sanctification of hands and feet he first teaches the general law and then defines it come and here for the services in connection with the red heifer our high be Joseph said the priest must sanctify himself from a service vessel within and then go out whereas our Yohanan maintained he can sanctify himself even without the temple even in a profane vessel even in a fire pot said our papa the red heifer is different since all its services are without going out does not disqualify it if so why must he sanctify himself at all we want it to be done like the services within it was asked is uncleanness effective in respect of sanctification of hands and feet if you say that going out does not invalidate sanctification that may be because the person remains fit but here that the person is no longer fit for service he turns his mind from it or perhaps since he will be fit again he is careful and does not turn his mind away from it come and here if the priest sanctified his hands and his feet and they became unclean he must immerse them but need not redash sanctify them where his hands only became unclean we do not ask our question is where his whole body was defiled his whole body surely I may deduce that he will turn his mind away from it since he must wait for the setting of the sun the question arises where e.g. he became unclean just before sunset come and here for the service in connection with the red heifer our high be Joseph said the priest must sanctify himself from a service vessel within and then go out whereas our Yohanan maintained he can sanctify himself even without the temple even in a profane vessel even in a fire pot Talmud Masabakim and now in the case of the red heifer we Defile him for we learned they used to defile the priest who was to burn the heifer and then make him immerse in order to combat the opinion of the Sadducees who maintained that this service was performed only by priests who had experienced sunset. This proves that uncleanness does not invalidate it. The red heifer is different since a tebal yom is not unfit for it. If so, why must he sanctify himself at all? Because we want it similar to the usual sacrificial service it was asked. Can it? Priest sanctify his hands and feet in the labor. Do we argue the divine law states and Aaron and his sons shall wash their at but not in it? Or perhaps it means even in it said Arnaman son of Isaac come and here or if he immersed in the water of a pit and officiates his service is invalid. Hence if he used the water of the labor in a similar way to the water of a pit and officiated his service is valid. No, it is particularly necessary for him the tanda to teach about the water of a Pit lest you say if he can bathe his whole body therein how much the more his hands and feet are high son of Joseph said the water of the labor becomes unfit for the Matiron as the Matiron themselves and for the burning of the limbs as the limbs themselves are his dom maintained even for the Matiron they become unfit only at dawn as the limbs while our Yohanan maintained once the labor is sunk it may not be drawn up again does this mean that it is not even fit for a night service surely are. As he said reporting our Yohanan in Ilfa's name if the labor was not sunk into the pit before evening the priest may sanctify himself thereat for a night service but he may not sanctify himself thereat on the morrow what is meant by it may not be drawn up for a day service but it is indeed fit for a night service if so this is identical with our high B Joseph S. view Talmud. Ma Sabakim be they disagree as to a preventive measure in respect of sinking the labor but surely our Yohanan. Said if the priest sanctified his hands for the removal of the ashes, he need not sanctify them again on the morrow because he has already sanctified them at the beginning of the service. According to Rabbi, who explains that this agrees with our Eliezer son of Arsimian, it is well this the present ruling agrees with Rabbi, but according to Abbe, who explains that it agrees with Rabbi, Rabbi is self contradictory for why must he lower it there, whereas here he must not lower it, it means that he raises it and then lowers it again. If so, on the morrow he does not sanctify, why so the meaning is that he need not sanctify, which is to say that the previous sanctification is indeed fit for the Matiron, and it is the same as our Histadas ruling. They disagree in respect of the regulation of lowering an objection is raised, they neither saw him nor heard him until they heard the sound of the wood of the machine which Ben Kadden made for the labor, and then they exclaimed it is time to. Sanctify hands and feet at the labor. Surely it means that he raised it, and which proves that it was sunk earlier. No, it means that he lowered it. Now, if he lowered it, would the
I think that the base sanctifies just as the labor sanctifies, therefore it says, Thou shalt also make a labor of brass, and the base thereof of brass I have made it alike in respect of brass, but not in respect of anything else. Marzitra, the son of Armari, said to Rubin, as for its base, it does not sanctify because it is not made for its inside to be used. Will you say the same of a profane vessel which is made for its inside? Rather, thereat excludes a profane vessel, if so it excludes a service vessel too. Surely the divine law included it by writing, they should wash, and what reason do you see for this choice? The one a service vessel needs anointing like itself, the labor, while the other does not need anointing like itself. Fresh Lakish said, Whatever can make up the prescribed quantity of the water of Amiqui makes up the water of the labor, but it does not make up to a rebuke. What does this exclude? Shall we say it excludes Mari liquid clay, then how is it meant? If a cow would bend and drink thereof, it is fit even for a rebuke too. While if a cow would not bend and drink thereof, it cannot make up even the quantity of a too. Again, if it is to exclude red insects, these are permitted even in the mass. For surely it was taught our Simeon B. Gamaliel said, You may perform immersion in whatever originates in the water. While our Isaac B. of Dimi said, You may perform immersion in the eye of a fish. Said our Papa, It excludes the case where one added SEA and took out SEA. For we learned if a had exactly 40 SEA and one added SEA and took out SEA, it is fit. And Rab Judah B. Sheila said in our C's name and our Yohanan's name up to the greater part thereof. Our Papa said, If one cut out a rebuke there and one may bathe needles and hooks, since it is derived from a valid Mikway, our Jeremiah said in the name of Resh Lakish, the water of a is fit for the water of the labor. Are we to say that it, the water of the labor need not be? Living water surely it was taught but its inwards and its legs shall he wash with water but not with wine with water but not with a mixture with water includes any water and all the more does it include the water of the labor now what does and all the more the water of the labor imply surely that it is living water no it means which is holy is then its holiness and advantage surely the school of Samuel taught only water which has no special name is fit Talmud, Mas Sebekim be which excludes the water of the labor which has a special name hence it surely means such as is fit for the water of the labor which proves that it must be living water it is a controversy of Tanaim for our Yohanan said as for the labor our Ishmael said it is the water of a spring while the sages maintain it may be ordinary water and uncircumcised priest whence do we know it said our Hista we did not learn this from the Torah of Moses our teacher but from the words of Ezekiel the son of Buzan, no alien. Uncircumcised in heart and uncircumcised in flesh shall enter into my sanctuary, and how do we know that they profane the service because it is written in that ye have brought in aliens uncircumcised in heart and uncircumcised in flesh to be in my sanctuary to profane it even my house when ye offer my bread the fat and the blood are rabbis taught it says alien you might think that this means literally an alien therefore scripture teaches uncircumcised in heart if so why does scripture call him alien because his actions are alien to his father in heaven now I know only that the uncircumcised in heart invalidates the sacrifice how do I know that the uncircumcised in flesh does likewise because the text states and uncircumcised in flesh and they are both necessary for if the divine law wrote that one uncircumcised in flesh is disqualified I would say that the reason is because he is repulsive but an uncircumcised in heart is not repulsive and so he is not disqualified and if we were informed about an uncircumcised in heart I would say that the reason is that his heart is not toward heaven but as for an uncircumcised in flesh whose heart is toward heaven he is not disqualified thus both are necessary and unclean priest I as disqualified the elders of the south said they learned this only of a priest unclean through a reptile but as for one unclean through a corpse since the head plate propitiates in the case of a public sacrifice it propitiates in the case of a private sacrifice if so let it be deduced from one unclean through a corpse a fortiori that one unclean through a reptile too does not invalidate the sacrifice if the head plate propitiates in the case of one unclean through a corpse who must be besprinkled on the third and on the seventh days of his defilement surely it propitiates in the case of one unclean through a reptile who need not be besprinkled on the third and on the seventh days the elders of the south hold that those who make atonement the priests are like those for whom atonement is made the people as in the case of those for whom atonement is made if they are unclean through a corpse the head plate does propitiate but if they are unclean through a reptile it does not so are those who make atonement one unclean through a corpse is included in the propitiatory effect of the head plate whereas one unclean through a reptile is not included what do they these elders hold if they hold you may not slaughter the passover and sprinkle its blood on behalf of one who is unclean through a reptile why may the community not sacrifice in uncleanness surely it is a principle that wherever an individual is relegated to the second passover the community celebrates it in uncleanness rather they hold that you do slaughter and sprinkle on behalf of him who is unclean through a reptile Ola said Resh Lakish criticized the southern scholars now whose power is greater the power of those who make atonement or the power of those for whom atonement is made surely the power of those for whom atonement is made then if a priest who was unclean through a reptile cannot propitiate officiate though where the owners were defiled by a reptile they can send their sacrifices to the temple is it not logical that a priest who was defiled by a corpse should not be able to propitiate seeing that if the owners were defiled by a corpse they cannot send their sacrifices the elders of the south hold one who is unclean through a corpse can also send his sacrifices but it is written if any man of you shall be unclean by reason of a dead body yet he shall keep the passover unto the lord in the second month on the fourteenth day at dusk they shall keep it that is a recommendation but it is written according to every man's talmud ma sevakim eating that too is only a recommendation yet is it not indispensable surely it was taught and shall he and his Neighbor next unto him take one according to the number of the the souls as teaches that the paschal lamb is not slaughtered save for those who are registered numbered for it you might think that if he slaughtered it for those who were not registered for it he should be as one who violates the precept yet it is fit therefore it is stated ye shall make your count takas who it is reiterated to teach that it is indispensable and eaters are assimilated to registered persons it. elders of the south do not assimilate them yet even if they do not assimilate them there is still the same reputation if a priest who was defiled by a reptile cannot propitiate though if the owners were defiled by a reptile they can send their sacrifices at the very outset is it not logical that a priest who was defiled through a corpse should not be able to propitiate seeing that if the owners were defiled through a corpse they cannot send their sacrifices at the very outset an objection is raised if the blood of a Passover offering is sprinkled and then it became known that it was unclean the head plate propitiates if the person became unclean the head plate does not propitiate because they the sages ruled in the case of a Nazi right one who sacrifices the Passover offering the head plate propitiates for the uncleanness of the blood but the head plate does not propitiate for the uncleanness of the person with what was the person defiled shall we say with the uncleanness of a reptile surely you maintain that you may slaughter the Passover offering and sprinkle its blood on behalf of one who is unclean through a reptile hence it must refer to defilement by a corpse yet it teaches the head plate does not propitiate which proves that if the owners were defiled they cannot send their sacrifices no if the owners were defiled through a corpse that would indeed be so but the meaning here is that the priest was defiled by a reptile if so consider the last clause of he was defiled with the uncleanness of the deep the head plate propitiates but surely our high taught the sages spoke of the uncleanness of the deep in respect of the corpse alone what does this exclude surely it excludes the uncleanness of the deep caused by a reptile no it excludes the uncleanness of the deep of gonorrhea again as to what Rami Biham asked as to the priest who propitiates with their sacrifices is the uncleanness of the deep permitted to him or is the uncleanness of the deep not permitted to him you may solve that the uncleanness of the deep is permitted to him for here we are treating of the priest Rami Biham certainly disagrees with the elders of the south come and here and Aaron shall bear the iniquity of the holy things now what iniquity does he bear Talmud Ma Sevakim be if the iniquity of pickle surely it is already said it shall not be accepted if the iniquity of Nathar surely it is already said neither shall it be imputed unto him that offered it Hence he bears not but the iniquity of defilement which is inoperative in opposition to its general rule in the case of a community now which uncleanness is meant if we say the uncleanness of a reptile where has that been waived hence it must mean uncleanness through a corpse which proves that if the owners become unclean
Stand there before the Lord the Red has repeated it to make standing indispensable. Rabbah said to Arnam and consider one sitting is Azazar and profanes the service. Then let us say just Azazar is liable to death so is one who sits liable to death. Why then was it taught but an uncircumcised priest and one and one sitting are not liable to death but are merely under an injunction not to officiate because a priest lacking the priestly vestments and one whose hands and feet are not. Washed are two laws which come as one Talmud, Mas Sevakime and two laws that come as one do not illumine other cases and on the view that they do illumine other cases one who has drunk wine is a third case and when three laws come as one all agree that they do not illumine other cases one standing on utensils or on an animal or on his fellow's feet the sacrifices are invalid whence do we know it for the school of our Ishmael taught since the pavement sanctifies and the service. Vessel sanctify just as with the service vessels nothing may interpose between him the priest and the service vessel so with the pavement nothing must interpose between him and the pavement now they are all necessary for if we were informed about vessels I would argue that standing on them disqualifies because they are not flesh but in the case of an animal which is flesh standing on it does not disqualify and if we were informed about an animal the reason is because it is not human. But as for his fellow who is human I would say that standing on his feet does not disqualify hence they are all necessary it was taught our Eliezer said if one foot is on the utensil and the other on the pavement one foot on the stone and the other on the pavement we consider wherever if the stone or the utensil be removed he can stand on the other foot his service is valid if not his service is invalid RMI asked what if a paving stone become loosened and he stood on it if it is not. His intention to fit it in the pavement there is no question for it certainly interposes the question arises where it is his intention to fit it in what then since it is his intention to fit it in it is as though already fitted or perhaps we say now at all events it is separate Rabbi Zudi stated the question thus RMI asked what if the stone became uprooted and he stood in its place what is the question this when David sanctified it did he sanctify the upper pavement only or Perhaps he sanctified it right to the nethermost soil then let him ask about the whole of the temple court in truth he is certain that he sanctified it to the nethermost soil but this is his question is this a natural way of service or is it not a natural way of service the question stands if the priest received the blood in his left hand it is disqualified our Simeon declares it fit our rabbis taught and the priest shall take of the blood of the sin offering with his finger and put it upon the horns of the altar with his finger he shall take this teaches that receiving must be done with the right hand with his finger he shall put this teaches that applying the blood on the altar must be done with the right hand said our Simeon is then hand stated in connection with receiving rather interpreted thus with his finger he shall put teaches that the application must be with the right hand since hand is not stated in connection with receiving if he received it with his left and it is fit now as for our Simeon what will you if he admits the Gezerisha what does it matter if hand is not written in connection with receiving while if he does not admit the Gezerisha what if hand were written in connection with receiving said Rab Judah in truth he does not admit the Gezerisha and this is what he means is then right hand stated in connection with receiving since then right hand is not stated in connection with receiving if he received it with the left. And the service is fit said Rabbah to him if so the same applies even to the application of the blood on the altar too moreover does not our Simeon accept the Gezerisha while surely it was taught our Simeon said wherever hand is stated it refers to the right only wherever finger is stated it refers to the right only rather said Rabbah in truth he admits the Gezerisha and this is what he says is then hand stated in connection with receiving since not hand but finger is written and the Blood cannot be received with the finger, therefore, if he received it with the left hand, it is fit, said Arsama, the son of Arashi to Rabbana, but it is possible to make a handle at the edge of the bowl and receive the blood, rather said Abay Talmud. Mas Sevakim be they disagree on the question whether a text is to be interpreted with what precedes and with what follows it. Abay said the following teaching of our Eliezer, son of Arsimian, disagrees with his fathers and with the rabbis for it. Was taught our Eliezer, son of Arsimian, said wherever finger is stated in connection with receiving, if the priest varied the reception of the blood, it is unfit, if the application it is fit, and wherever finger is stated in connection with the application, if he varied the application, it is unfit, if the reception it is fit, and where his finger stated in connection with the application, for it is written, and thou shalt take of the blood of the bullet and put it upon the horns of the altar with thy. Finger and he holds a text is interpreted with its precedent but not with its anti-precedent nor with what follows in Rabbi Barhanna said in our Yohanan's name wherever finger and priesthood are stated they refer to the right only it was assumed that we require both as it is written and the priest shall take of the blood of the sin offering with his finger and it is learned from a leper where it is written and the priest shall dip his right finger but surely priesthood alone is written in connection with the taking of the fistful of flour yet we learned if the priest took the handful with his left hand is it unfit said Rabbi he meant either finger or priesthood said Abbe to him yet priesthood is written in connection with the carrying of the limbs to the altar ascent as it is written and the priest shall offer the whole and make it smoke on the altar and the master said this refers to the carrying of the limbs to the ascent yet we learned the priest carries the right Foot of the sacrifice in his left hand with the inside of the skin outward when do we say that either finger or priesthood implies the right only in respect of a service which is indispensable to atonement as in the case of a leper but priesthood is written in connection with receiving which is indispensable to atonement yet we learned if he received the blood with his left hand it is unfit but our Simeon declares it fit our Simeon requires both does then our Simeon require both surely it was taught our Simeon said wherever hand is stated it refers to the right only wherever finger is stated it refers to the right only where finger is stated he does not require priesthood but where priesthood is stated he does require finger then what is the purpose of priesthood to teach that they must be in their priestly state but priesthood alone is written in connection with sprinkling yet we learned if he sprinkled with his left hand it is unfit and our Simeon does not disagree Said Abbe he does disagree in the Beritha for it was taught if the priest received with his left hand it is unfit but our Simeon declares it fit if he sprinkled with his left hand it is unfit but our Simeon declares it fit then as to what Rabbah said we draw an analogy of hand hand in respect of taking the fistful foot foot in respect of Eliza ear in respect of boring the ear why is this necessary in respect of the fistful seeing that it can be deduced from Rabbi Barhanas. Exegesis one is required for the taking of the fistful and the other for the sanctification of the fistful Talmud. Ma Sevakim but according to our Simeon who does not require the sanctification of the fistful at all or on the view that our Simeon does indeed require the sanctification of the fistful yet he certainly holds that it is fit if done with the left what is the purpose of Rabbah's analogy of hand hand if in respect of the actual taking of the fistful that is deduced from Rab. Judah the son of Arhai's teaching for Rab Judah the son of Arhai said what is our Simeon's reason scripture said it is most holy as the sin offering and as the guilt offering this teaches if the priest comes to perform its service with his hand he does so with the right hand as in the case of a sin offering if he comes to perform the service with a vessel he may do so with the left hand as in the case of the guilt offering it is necessary only in respect of a priest who takes it. Fistful of a sinner's meal offering you might think since our Simeon said the reason is that his sacrifice should not be adorned let it be fit too even if the priest takes a fistful with his left hand therefore the text informs us that it is not so mission if the blood was poured out onto the pavement and the priest collected it it is fit tomorrow our rabbis taught and the anointed priest shall take of the blood of the bullet this means of the life blood but not of the blood of it. Skin or of the draining blood of the blood of the bullock implies he is to receive the blood direct from the bullock for if you think that of the blood of the bullock is meant literally as it is written vis of the blood indicating even a portion of the blood only surely Rab said he who slaughters the sacrifice must receive all the blood of the bullock for it says and all the remaining blood of the bullock shall he pour out hence from the blood of the bullock means he is to receive the blood direct from the bullock for the author of this exegesis holds you subtract add and interpret the above text stated Rab said he who slaughters the sacrifice must receive all the blood of the bullock for it says and all the remaining blood of the bullock shall he pour out but surely this is written of the remainder of the blood since it is inapplicable to the remainder for all the blood is not available at the time applied to receiving Rab Judah said in Samuel's name he who slaughters must raise the
recited it that he asked him about a barrel and he solved it for him from a case of a bowl arguing thus do you not agree that in the case of the bowl sprinkling of blood is unavoidable we learned elsewhere if one places there one's hand or foot or vegetables leaves in order that the water should flow into the barrel if the water is unfit if one placed there leaves of canes or leaves of nuts it is fit this is the general rule if the water is conducted into the barrel by means of Anything which can become unclean it is unfit by means of anything which cannot become unclean it is fit how do we know it because our Yohanan said on the authority of our Jose B. Abba scripture saith nevertheless a fountain or a cistern wherein is a gathering of water shall be clean its existence must be affected through purity our high said in our Yohanan's name this proves that the airspace of a vessel is as a vessel itself said our zero to our high B. Abba but perhaps it refers to a direct run into the barrel fool replied he we learned so that the water shall flow into the barrel our high B. Abba also said in our Yohanan's name this mission was taught on the testimony of our Zadok for we learned our Zadok testified that running water which is assembled by means of nut leaves is fit there was such a case in Ahali which was referred to the sages in the chamber of hewn stone and they declared it fit our zero said in the name of Rabbi the priest slits the sacrificial bullets here and then receives its blood it is unfit for it is set and the anointed priest shall take of the blood of the bullet this implies the bullet as it was before we have thus found this law true of sacrifices of higher sanctity how do we know it of sacrifices of lower sanctity said Rabbah it was taught your lamb shall be without blemish a male of the first year this teaches that it must be without a blemish and a year old when it is slaughtered how do we know that it must be likewise at the receiving of the blood the carrying and the sprinkling because it says it shall be teaching that at all its stages as a sacrifice it must be without blemish and a year old have a raised an objection to him or Joshua said in the case of all sacrifices prescribed in the Torah whereof as much as an olive of flesh or fat remain the priest sprinkles the blood relate this to the provision that it must be a year old yet is it possible for it to be a year old at the slaughtering yet Two years old at the carrying and sprinkling said Rabbah this proves that even ours disqualify in the case of sacrifices are I said in our Eliezer's name in the case of the animal being within the temple court while its legs were without if he cut off its legs and then slaughtered it it is fit Talmud, Ma Sebekim if he slaughtered and then cut off the legs it is unfit if he cut off the legs and then slaughtered it it is fit surely he offers a blemished animal say rather if he cut off the legs and then received the blood it is fit if he received the blood and then cut off the legs it is unfit if he cut off the legs and then received the blood it is fit surely our Zara said if one slits the ear of the firstling and then receives its blood it is unfit because it says and he shall take of the blood of the bullock implying the bullock as it was originally said are his in Abami's name he cuts the limb as far as the bone if he received the blood and then cut it is unfit from this you may infer that the blood which is absorbed in the limbs is blood no perhaps the unfitness is on account of the fattiness then you may infer from this that if the flesh of sacrifices of lower sanctity passes out from the temple court before the sprinkling of the blood it is unfit no perhaps our mi in our Eliezer's name refer to sacrifices of higher sanctity our rabbis taught sacrifices of higher sanctity are slaughtered on the north side of the temple court and their blood is received on the north in service vessels if he stood in the south stretched out his hand to the north and slaughtered his slaughtering is valid if he thus received the blood his reception is invalid if he projected his head and the greater part of his body into the north side it is as though he had entered the north entirely if the animal struggled and passed over into the south and then returned it is fit sacrifices of lower sanctity are slaughtered Anywhere within the temple court and their blood is received in a service vessel within if he stood without and stretched his hand within and slaughtered his slaughtering is valid if he received the blood thus his reception is invalid if he projected his head and the greater part of his body within he is not regarded as having entered if it struggled and went without and returned it is unfit this proves that sacrifices of lower sanctity whose flesh went without before the sprinkling of it. Blood are unfit no perhaps this refers to the fat tail the lobe above the liver and the two kidneys Samuel's father asked Samuel what if it, the animal is within while its feet are without it is written even that they may bring them unto the Lord he replied which intimates that the whole of it must be within what if one suspended the animal and slaughtered it, it is valid he replied you have heard he observed for the slaughtering must be on the side of the altar which provision is. Unfulfilled what if the slaughterer was suspended and slaughtered thus it is invalid he replied you have heard said he the slaughtering must be on the side but the slaughterer need not be on the side what if he suspended himself and received the blood it is valid he replied you have heard observed he for such is not the way of service what if he suspended the sacrifice and received the blood it is invalid he answered you have heard he retorted slaughtering must be on the side but receiving need not be on the side Abbe said in the case of sacrifices of higher sanctity they are all invalid except where he suspended himself and slaughtered in the case of sacrifices of lower sanctity they are all valid except where he suspended himself and received the blood said Rabbah why do you say that if he suspended the animal and received the blood it is valid in the case of sacrifices of lower sanctity presumably because the airspace of within is as within and in the case of Sacrifices of higher sanctity to the airspace of the north is as the north rather said Rabbah in the case of sacrifices of both higher and lower sanctity they are all valid except in the case of sacrifices of higher sanctity where he suspended the animal and slaughtered it and in the cases of sacrifices of both higher and lower sanctity where he suspended himself and received the blood our Jeremiah asked our zero what if he the priest is within and his locks of hair are without said he to him have you not said that even that they may bring them unto the Lord intimates that the whole of it, the animal must come within so here too when they go in unto the tent of meeting intimates that the whole of him must enter the tent of meeting mission if the priest applied it the blood on the ascent or on the altar but not over against its base if he applied the blood which should be applied below the scarlet line above it or that which should be applied above below or that which should be applied within he applied without or what should be applied without he applied within it is unfit but does not involve correct Talmud. Ma Sebekim Bigamara Samuel said it is the flesh that is unfit but its owners are forgiven what is the reason because scripture saith and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement once the blood has reached the altar the owners are forgiven if so the flesh too should be fit scripture saith to make atonement I have given it for atonement but not for any other purpose now this proves that he holds that when blood is not applied in its proper place it is as though applied in its proper place now we learned in another chapter if the priest applied it the blood on the ascent or on the altar but not over against its base if he applied the blood which should be applied below the scarlet line above it or that which should be applied above below or that which should be applied within he applied Without or what should be applied without he applied within and if life blood is still available a fit priest must receive it a second time now if you maintain that when blood is not applied in its proper place it is as though applied in its proper place why must a fit priest receive it again and should you answer in order to permit the flesh for consumption is there a sprinkling which makes no atonement yet permits the consumption of the flesh had a fit priest applied it in the first place that would indeed be so the circumstances here are that an unfit priest applied it in the first place but let it constitute complete rejection for we learned but if any of these receive the blood intending to consume the flesh after time or without bounds and the life blood is still available a fit priest must receive it a second time thus only if they receive the blood with that intention but not if they sprinkled it thus what is the reason is it not because this affects complete rejection no the reason is because it became unfit through an illegitimate intention if so the same should apply to receiving moreover does an illegitimate intention disqualify it surely Rabbah said an illegitimate intention is without effect save when purpose by one who is fit for the service and in connection with that which is fit for the service and in a place fit for the service do not say but not if they sprinkled it thus say rather but not if they slaughtered it thus what does he inform us that an illegitimate intention disqualifies but we have learned it therefore they invalidate the sacrifice by an illegitimate intention purpose at slaughtering this is what we are informed is that from receiving an onwards intention on the part of an unfit priest does not invalidate what is the reason as that stated by Rabbah an objection is raised if the priest intends applying the blood which should be applied above the line below it or what should be applied below above immediately it is valid if he subsequently intended Talmud, Ma Sebeki may to consume it without bounds it is invalid but does not invol
literally and blood not applied in its proper place is as though applied in its proper place yet there is no difficulty in one case he applied it in silence in the other he applied it with an expressed intention we learned if he intended applying above the line what should be applied below it or below what should be applied above etc as far as it is analogous to the intention of leaving the blood until tomorrow this being in accordance with Arjuna 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 said both cases are where he sprinkles it in silence and the wrong place is not as the right place but the one is where lifeblood is still available while the other is where lifeblood is not available we learned it is unfit but does not involve karath as for rush lakish it is well he rightly teaches it is unfit but does not involve karath but according to our yohanan why teach that it does not involve karath this is a difficulty and according to samuel what is meant by it does not involve karath this is what the tana means if he sprinkled it thus with an illegitimate intention it is unfit but does not involve karath now as for our yohanan if the wrong place on the altar is not as the right place let it be as though the blood had been spilled from the surface vessel onto the pavement and so let him collect it he agrees with the view that it must not be gathered for our isaac be joseph said in our yohanan's name all agree if the priest sprinkled the blood above which should be sprinkled above or below which should be sprinkled below but not in accordance with the regulations that he must not regather it they disagree only where he sprinkled below what should be sprinkled above or above what should be sprinkled below there are Jose holds he must not regather it while our Simeon maintains he must regather it Talmud, Ma Sebakim B and our mission agrees with the view that he must not regather it but our said in Abami's name all agree if he sprinkled below what should be sprinkled above that he does not regather it and all the more if he sprinkled above what should be sprinkled below since the blood above runs down below they disagree only where he sprinkled without what should be sprinkled within or within what should be sprinkled without our Jose holds he must not regather it and our Simeon rules he must regather it our Naman B Isaac said we have also learned to the same effect our Judah said this is the law of the burnt offering it is that which goeth up on its firewood Upon the altar all night unto the morning here you have three limitations it excludes an animal slaughtered at night it excludes an animal whose blood was spilled and it excludes an animal whose blood was carried out beyond the hangings if any one of these ascended the altar it descends our Simeon said burnt offering I only know this of a fit burnt offering whence do I know to include one which was slaughtered at night or whose blood was spilled or whose blood passed without the hangings or who as he flesh spent the night away from the altar or who as he flesh went out or the unclean or which was slaughtered with the intention of burning its flesh after time or without bounce or whose blood was received and sprinkled by unfit priests or whose blood was applied below the scarlet line when it should have been applied above or above when it should have been applied below or without when it should have been applied within or within when it should have been applied without or a Passover offering or a sin offering which one slaughtered for a different purpose whence do we know to include all these from the phrase the law of the burnt offering which intimates one law for all burnt offerings is that if they ascended they do not descend you might think that I include also a robot and a nearby one set aside for an idolatry sacrifice or worship a harlot's hire or the price of a dog or a hybrid or a trophy or an animal cab through the caesarean section it text however states it is that and why do you include the former and exclude the latter I include the former because their disqualification arose in the sanctuary while I exclude the latter whose disqualification did not arise in the sanctuary at all events he teaches the cases where one sprinkled below what should be sprinkled above or above what should be sprinkled below and our Judah does not disagree what is the reason is it not because the altar has received it which proves that one cannot Regather it our Eliezer said the inner altar sanctifies the unfit what does he inform us we have learned it that which should be applied within etc if I drew my information from there only I would say that it applies only to blood which is eligible for it but if one threw the fistful of flour on the inner altar which is not eligible for it at all I would say that it is not so hence he informs us otherwise an objection is raised if strange incense ascended the altar it must descend because only the outer altar sanctifies the unfit in the case of such as are otherwise eligible for it thus only the outer one but not the inner one answer it thus if strange incense ascended the altar it must descend for the outer altar does not sanctify the unfit save in the case of what is otherwise eligible for it but the inner altar sanctifies both what is eligible and what is not eligible for it what is the reason one the outer altar is but as the pavement while the other the Inner altar is a surface vessel mission if one slaughters the sacrifice intending to sprinkle its blood without or part of its blood without to burn its emurim or part of its emurim without to eat its flesh or as much as an olive of its flesh without or to eat as much as an olive of the skin of the fat tail without it is unfit and does not involve karath if he slaughters it intending to sprinkle its blood or part of its blood on the morrow to burn its emurim or part of its emurim on the morrow to eat its flesh or as much as an olive of its flesh on the morrow or to eat as much as an olive of the skin of its fat tail on the morrow it is pickle and involves karath now it was thought that the skin of the fat tail talmud ma sevakim is as the fat tail then the difficulty arises surely he intends for man what is for the altar's consumption said samuel the author of this is our Eliza, who maintains that you can intend with effect for human consumption what is meant for the altar's consumption and for the altar's consumption what is meant for human consumption for we learned if one slaughters a sacrifice intending to eat what is not normally eaten or to burn on the altar what is not normally burnt it is fit but our Eliezer invalidates the sacrifice how have you explained it as agreeing with our Eliezer then consider the sequel this is the general rule whoever slaughters receives carries and sprinkles intending to eat what is normally eaten or to burn on the altar what is normally burnt after time etc thus only what is normally eaten but not what is not normally eaten which agrees with the rabbis thus the first clause agrees with our Eliezer and the final clause with the rabbis even so he answered him our said the skin of the fat tail is not as the fat tail rabbi observed what is our reason the fat thereof is the fat tail entire but not the skin of the fat tail our said in truth the skin of the fat tail is as the fat Tail, but we treat here in the mission of the fat tail of a goat. Now all these scholars did not say as Samuel because they would not make the first clause agree with our Eliezer and the second clause with the rabbis. They did not say as Arhuna because they hold that the skin of the fat tail is as the fat tail. But why do they not say as Arhista? Because what does the tana of the mission inform us on this view? Presumably that the skin of the fat tail is as the fat tail. Surely we have learned that the skin of the following is as their flesh, the skin under the fat tail and Arhista. It is necessary you might think that only in respect of uncleanness does it combine because it is soft. But as for here, I would say scripture writes even all the hallowed things of the children of Israel unto thee have I given them for a consecrated portion, which means as a symbol of greatness, so that they must be eaten just as kings eat and kings do not eat. Thus hence I would say that it is. Not as the flesh, therefore he informs us that it is an objection is raised if one slaughters a burnt offering intending to burn as much as an olive of the skin under the fat tail out of bounds it is invalid but does not involve karath after time it is pickle and involves karath Eliezer be Judah of the flask said on the authority of our Jacob and thus also did our Simeon be Judah of Farakum say on the authority of our Simeon the skin of the legs of small cattle the skin of the head of a young calf and the skin under the fat tail and all cases which the sages enumerated of the skin being the same as the flesh which includes the skin of the pudenta if he intended eating or burning these out of bounds the sacrifice is invalid and does not involve karath after time it is pickle and involves karath thus this is taught only of the burnt offering but not of a sacrifice as for our it is well it is right that he specifies a burnt offering but according to our why does he Particularly teach burnt offering let him teach sacrifice or his can answer you I can explain this as referring to the fat tail of a goat alternatively I can answer read sacrifice it is unfit and does not involve karath etc once do we know it said Samuel two texts are written what are they said rabbi and if any of the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offerings be at all eaten on the third day this refers to an intention of eating the flesh after time it shall be pickling. A poor thing refers to an intention of eating the flesh out of bounds and the soul that eat of it shall bear his iniquity only one involves karath but not two is after time and excluding out of bounds yet say that and the soul that eat of it refers to out of bounds and excludes after time it is logical that after time is graver since scripture commences with it on the contrary out of bounds is
Inequity where it refers to the intention of eating after time may be learned by analogy since it is similar thereto in respect of Mikdash rather said are Yohan Anzabdi believe I taught coaches learned from coach here is written because he hath profaned the coach holy thing of the Lord and that soul shall be cut off from the people and it is written elsewhere and if out of the flesh of the consecration or of the bread remain unto the morning then thou shalt burn the Nathar remainder. With fire it shall not be eaten because it is coach holy just as their coach is connected with Nathar so here too it is connected with Nathar and the divine law expresses a limitation in connection with Nathar but everyone that eateth shall bear his iniquity which excludes without bounds from Karath and why do you interpret the long text as referring to after time and third in the pericopia shall be holy as referring to without bounds perhaps I may reverse it it is logical that. The long text refers to after time since the meaning of iniquity is learned by analogy from Nathar and after time is similar thereto in respect of Zab on the contrary say that the long text refers to without bounds and third in ye shall be holy refers to after time because it is similar thereto scripture places it close by and excludes it rather said Rabbah the whole is deduced from the long text for it is written but if any of the flesh be at all eaten scripture refers to two eatings. Viz eating by man and eating by the altar of the sacrifice of his peace offerings as parts of the peace offerings render pickle and parts are rendered pickle so in sacrifices where there are parts which render pickle and parts which are made pickle the law of pickle applies there means after time it shall not be accepted as the acceptance of the valid sacrifice so is the acceptance of the invalid and as the acceptance of the valid necessitates that all its matter and be offered so does. The acceptance of the invalid necessitate that all its matter and be offered him that offered it becomes unfit in offering but does not become unfit through being eaten on the third day its scripture speaks of the sacrifice and not of the priest it shall not be imputed Talmud, Ma Sevakim other intentions must not be mingled therein and abhorred thing pickle this refers to the intention of eating it without bounds it shall be this teaches that they combine with each other and the soul. That eat of it one but not two and which is it the intention of eating it after time for the meaning of iniquity is learned from Nathar since it is similar to it in Zab our Papa said to Rabba according to you how do you interpret that in the pericopia shall be holy that is needed to teach that the illegitimate intention must concern a place which has a threefold function viz in respect of the blood the flesh and the immurim but I may deduce that from the earlier text viz and if it be at all eaten since the divine law expresses it by the word third said our Ashi I reported this discussion before our Mahana whereupon he answered me if I deduced it from there I would say third is a particularization and pickle is a generalization and so the generalization becomes an addition to the particularization and therefore other places are included too hence the text in ye shall be holy informs us that it is not so our rabbis taught and if any of the flesh of the sacrifice of his Peace offerings be at all eaten on the third day. Our Eliezer said, Incline your ear to hear scripture speaks of one who intends eating of his sacrifice on the third day. Yet perhaps that is not so, but rather scripture speaks of one who eats of his sacrifice on the third day. You can answer after it has become fit, shall it then become unfit? Said our Akiva to him, Behold, we find that Azab and Azaba and a woman who washes from day to day are presumed to be clean, yet since they have a discharge, they undo their cleanness. Hence you too need not wonder at this that after the sacrifice has become fit, it then becomes unfit. Said he to him, Lo, it says unto him that offereth intimating that it becomes unfit at the offering, but it does not become unfit on the third day. Yet perhaps that is not so, but it says him that offereth, meaning the priest who offers it when it says it, scripture speaks of the sacrifice and does not speak of the priest. Ben Aze said, Why is it stated because it? He said when thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God thou shalt not delay to pay it you might think that also he who delays the fulfillment of his vow incurs the sentence it shall not be accepted therefore it says it if pickle is subject to it shall not be accepted but he who delays his vow is not subject to it shall not be accepted others say it shall not be imputed teaches that it becomes unfit through imputation illegal intention but does not become unfit through being eaten. On the third day now how does Ben Aze know that scripture speaks of the sacrifice and not of the priest I can say that he deduces it from the exegesis of the others alternatively I can say that he knows this because it is written it shall not be accepted and it shall not be accepted can only apply to the sacrifice now Ben Aze deduces it is subject to it shall not be accepted but he who delays the payment of his vow is not subject to it shall not be accepted but is this. Deduced from the present text, surely it is deduced from the text cited by others, for it was taught others say you might think that a first language past its first year is Talmud, Ma Sevakim be as dedicated animals rendered unfit and so unfit, therefore it says, and thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God the tithe of thy corn and the firstlings of thy herd and of thy flock. The firstling is assimilated to tithe, this tithe does not become unfit through being kept from one year until the following. So the firstling does not become unfit through being kept from one year until the next. It is necessary you might think that this holds good only of the firstling which is not subject to acceptance, but other sacrifices which are subject to acceptance, I would say that they are not accepted, hence it informs us that it is not so, yet still it is deduced from elsewhere, is thou shalt not delay to pay it, and it will be sin in thee which teaches, but it will not be sin in. Thy offering, but we have interpreted this according to Ben Aze as teaching, and it will be sin in thee, but it will not be sin in thy wife. For you might think that I can argue since our Eliezer other state are Yohanan said a man's wife does not die save when money is demanded from him, and he lacks it. For it says, If thou hast not wherewith to pay, why should he take away thy bed from under thee? She also dies on account of the sin of violating the injunction, thou shalt not delay hence. Scripture informs us that it is not so others say it shall not be imputed, teaches that it becomes invalid through imputation intention, but it does not become invalid through being eaten on the third day. Now, how does our Eliezer utilize this text? It shall not be imputed, he needs it for the teaching of our For our said, How do we know that illegal intentions negative each other? Because it says it shall not be imputed, which means other illegal intentions shall not be. Mingled there with Armari recited it thus Arjane said how do we know that he who purposes an illegitimate intention in respect of sacrifices is flagellated because it says lo yeah shape said Arashi to Armari but it is a negative injunction not involving an action and one is not flagellated on account of a negative injunction which does not involve action this is according to Arjuna he replied who maintained one is flagellated on account of a negative injunction which does not involve action mission this is the general rule he who slaughters or receives the blood or carries it or sprinkles it intending to eat as much as an olive of that which is normally eaten or to burn on the altar as much as an olive of that which is normally burnt without bounds of sacrifice is invalid but it does not involve karath intending to eat or burn after time it is pickle and involves karath provided that the matter is offered in accordance with the law how is the matter offered in accordance with the law apart from that if one slaughtered in silence and received or sprinkled intending to eat the flesh after time or if one slaughtered intending to eat after time and received went and sprinkled in silence or if one slaughtered and received went and sprinkled intending to eat after time that is offering the matter in accordance with the law how is the matter not offered in accordance with the law if one slaughtered intending to eat without bounds and received went and sprinkled with the intention of eating after time or if one slaughtered intending to eat after time and received went and sprinkled intending to eat without bounds or if one slaughtered received went and sprinkled intending to eat without bounds if one slaughtered the Passover offering or the sin offering for the sake of something else and received went and sprinkled intending to eat them after time or if one slaughtered them intending to eat them after time and Received went and sprinkled for the sake of something else, or if one slaughtered received went and sprinkled for the sake of something else. In these cases, the matter was not offered in accordance with the law. If one intended to eat as much as an olive without bounds, and as much as an olive on the morrow, or as much as an olive on the morrow, and as much as an olive without bounds, half as much as an olive without bounds, and half as much as an olive on the morrow, half as much as an olive on the morrow, and half as much as an olive without bounds. The sacrifice is unfit and does not involve karath. Said Arjuna, this is the general rule where the intention of time precedes the intention of place. The sacrifice is pickle and involves karath, but if the intention of place precedes the intention of time, it is unfit and does not involve karath.
Rule that is indeed a difficulty we learned elsewhere if one declares this animal be a substitute for a burnt offering a substitute for a peace offerings it is a substitute for a burnt offering only this is our Meir's view said our Jose if such was his original intention since it is impossible to pronounce both designations simultaneously his declarations are valid but if having declared this animal be a substitute for a burnt offering he declared as an afterthought this be a substitute for a peace offerings it is a burnt offering it was asked what if one declares this animal be a substitute for a burnt offering and a peace offerings or this animal be a substitute for half a burnt offering and half a peace offering said Abbe here our Meir certainly agrees with our Jose Rabba said there is still the controversy Rabba said to Abbe according to you who maintain that here our Meir certainly agrees yet low slaughtering is analogous to half and half yet they disagree said he too. Him, do you think that Cheshit accounts only at the end? No, Cheshit accounts from the beginning until the end, and our Mishnah means that he declared that he cut one organ intending to eat the flesh after time, and the second organ intending to eat it without bounds. Yet, surely Kamiza is analogous to halves, yet they disagree there too. It means that he burnt a fistful of the meal offering with the intention of eating after time, and a fistful of the frankincense intending to eat without bounds. Yet, they disagree in respect of the fistful of a sinner's meal offering where there is no frankincense. They do not disagree. There are Ashi said, if you should say that they do disagree, they disagree in the steps. Our Shimai B. Ashi recited the passage as Abbe Arhu Nabi Nathan recited it as Rabba when Ardimi came. He said, Our Meir stated his ruling in accordance with the thesis of Arjuda who maintained regard the first expression, for we learned Arjuda said this is the general rule of it. Intention of time preceded the intention of place at his pickle and involves Kareth Talmud. Ma Sebakim B said Abbe to him, yet surely Rabbi Barhana said in Ar Yohanan's name when you bring Armeir and Ar Jose together you find that they do not disagree, but do they not disagree? Surely they do disagree, they disagree in what they disagree, he answered him, and they do not disagree in what they do not disagree. For our Isaac B. Joseph said in Ar Yohanan's name, all agree that if he declared let this sanctity fall upon the animal, and after that let that sanctity fall upon it, the latter does not fall upon it, let the sanctity not fall upon it, unless the other falls upon it too. All agree that the latter does not fall upon it, they disagree only where he declares let this animal be a substitute for a burnt offering, a substitute for a peace offering, Armeir holds since he should have said a substitute for a burnt offering and a peace offering, but said instead a substitute for a Burnt offering a substitute for a peace offering you may infer that he has indeed retracted and our Jose had he declared a substitute for a burnt offering and a peace offering I might have interpreted it half as a substitute for a burnt offering and half as a substitute for a peace offering therefore he declared a substitute for a burnt offering a substitute for a peace offerings to intimate that the whole should be a burnt offering and the whole should be a peace offering said he or Dimitu. Him Abbe he Rabbi Barhana said that they do not disagree but I maintain that they do disagree all other state our Ashai said perhaps our Babylonian colleagues know whether we learned as much as an olive as much as an olive or did we learn as much as an olive and as much as an olive the point of the question is this did we learn as much as an olive as much as an olive but if he declared as much as an olive and as much as an olive all agree that it constitutes a Mingling of intentions, or perhaps we learned as much as an olive and as much as an olive, and this in our Judah's opinion constitutes a detailed enumeration, and all the more if he declared as much as an olive, as much as an olive, come and here for Levi asked Rabbi what if he intended eating as much as an olive on the morrow after time without bounds said he to him that is indeed a question, it constitutes a mingling of intentions thereupon our Simeon B. Rabbi observed, is this not taught? In our mission, if he intended to eat as much as an olive without as much as an olive on the morrow, or as much as an olive on the morrow, as much as an olive without, or half as much as an olive without, half as much as an olive on the morrow, or half as much as an olive on the morrow, half as much as an olive without it is invalid and does not involve Karath, hence it follows that the other case constitutes a mingling of intentions. Nevertheless, he asked me a profound question, he replied. Though you say that it is implied in our Mishnah since I taught you both cases you find no difficulty but him I taught only one while he heard that the rabbis read both versions in the Mishnah hence his doubt was my teaching exact whereas their additional case constitutes a mingling of intentions or perhaps their version is exact whilst I had simply omitted one case when I taught him and just as I had omitted this instance so had they omitted the other instance now which case did he teach him if we say that he taught him as much as an olive and as much as an olive surely that is not an omission hence he taught him as much as an olive as much as an olive and let him ask about as much as an olive and as much as an olive he reasoned I will ask him one case from which I may infer both for if I ask about as much as an olive and as much as an olive it is well if he answers me that it is a comprehensive statement then all the more is it so in the case of as much as an olive on the morrow without but if he answers me that it is a detailed enumeration then I will still have the question about as much as an olive on the morrow without if so the same objection can be urged now too it is well if he answered him that as much as an olive on the morrow without constitutes a detailed enumeration then all the more is it so in the case of as much as an olive and as much as an olive but if he answered him that it is a comprehensive statement he would still have the question what about as much as an olive and as much as an olive if so he rabbi would have shown asperity Talmud Ma Sebakim seeing that as much as an olive and as much as an olive is a comprehensive statement is there a question about as much as an olive on the morrow without it was stated if one declares I will eat half as much as an olive after time half an olive without bounds and half as much as an olive after time said rabbi then the pickle awake as one Asleep, but our Hamnana maintained this constitutes a mingling of intentions. Rabbi said, Whence do I say it? Because we learned if one combines as much as an egg of an edible of first degree with as much as an egg of an edible of second degree, the combination ranks as first degree. If one separates them, each ranks as second degree. But if one recombines them, the mixture ranks as first degree. Whence does this follow? Because the second clause teaches if each falls separately on a loaf of terima. They render it unfit if they both fall on it simultaneously. They render it second degree. But our Hamnana argues there you had the requisite standard. But here the standard is absent. Our Hamnana said, Whence do I say it? Because we learned an edible which was defiled by a principal degree of uncleanness and one which was defiled by a derivative of uncleanness combined with each other to defile according to the lesser of the two. Surely that means even if the standard quantity is subsequently made. Of no, perhaps this holds good only when one does not make up the standard. When Ardini came, he said, When one declares his intention of eating half an olive without bounds and half an olive after time and another half an olive after time, Barkabur taught it is pickle because the declaration in respect of half an olive is of no effect as against that in respect of an olive. When Rabin came, he said, If one declares his intention of eating half as much as an olive after time and another half an olive after time and half an olive without bounds, Barkabur taught it is pickle because the declaration in respect of half an olive is of no effect as against that of an olive. Arashi recited it thus, If one declares his intention to eat half an olive after time and an olive half without bounds and half after time, Barkabur taught it is pickle because the declaration in respect of half an olive is of no effect as against that of an olive. Arjani said, If one Intended dogs to eat it on the morrow it is pickle because it is written and the dogs shall eat Jezebel in the portion of Jezreel to this RMI demurred if so if he intended fire to eat it on the morrow is that too pickle since it is written a fire not blown by man shall eat consume him and should you say that indeed is so surely we learned if he intended to eat half as much as an olive illegitimately and to burn half as much as an olive illegitimately it is fit because eating and burning do not combine if he expressed his intention in terms of eating that indeed would be so here in the Mishnah however he expressed it in terms of burning hence they do not combine because the term eating is one thing and the term burning is another RC asked what if he intended as much as an olive to be eaten illegitimately by two men do we go by his intention and there is the standard of disqualification or do we go by the eaters and there is not the standard set of a Come and here if he intended to eat half as much as an olive and to burn half as much as an olive illegitimately it is fit because eating and burning do not combine Talmud. Ma Sebakim be hence if he intended to eat half as much as an olive and to eat half as
You can intend with effect for the altar's consumption what is meant for human consumption and for human consumption what is meant for the altar's consumption for we learned if one slaughters the sacrifice intending to eat what is not normally eaten or to burn on the altar what is not normally burnt it is fit but our Eliezer invalidates it Abbe said you may even say that it is according to the rabbis but do not deduce but if he intends to eat what is fit for eating and to eat what is not normally eaten it is fit to deduce rather but if he intends to eat what is normally eaten and to eat what is normally eaten it is invalid then what does the Tana inform us if he informs us the law concerning what is normally eaten you can infer this from the first clause if he intends to eat half as much as an olive without half as much as an olive on the morrow his intentions combined if he informs us about intending to eat and to burn you can infer this by deduction from the first clause is only if he intends to eat what is normally eaten but not if he intends to eat what is not normally eaten then seeing that intentions to eat what is normally eaten and to eat what is not normally eaten do not combine is it necessary to teach about intentions to eat and to burn that they do not combine he needs to teach about intending to eat and to burn for you might argue only there do they not combine because his intention is not normal but here where his intentions in respect of each are normal I would say that they combine hence he informs us otherwise chapter 3 mission all unfit persons who slaughtered their slaughtering is valid for slaughtering is valid even when performed by Israelites serene and by women and by slaves and by unclean even in the case of sacrifices of higher sanctity provided that unclean persons do not touch the flesh therefore they invalidate the sacrifice by an illegitimate intention Talmud Moss. But if any of these receive the blood intending to eat the flesh or burn the emurim after time or without bounds and life blood is still available a fit priest must receive it a second time if a fit person received the blood and gave it to an unfit one he must return it to the fit one if he received the blood in his right hand and transferred it to his left he must retransfer it to his right if he received it in a sacred vessel and poured it thence into a secular non-sacred vessel he must return it to the sacred vessel if it spilled from the vessel onto the pavement and one collected it it is fit if the priest applied it on the ascent or on the altar but not over against its base or if he applied what should be applied below the scarlet line above it or what should be applied above below or what should be applied within he applied without or what should be applied without within and life blood is still available a fit priest must receive blood in Gemara who slaughtered implies only if done but not at the very outset but the following contradicts it and he shall slaughter this teaches that slaughtering by Azar is valid for slaughtering by Azarine women slaves and unclean persons is valid even in the case of most sacred sacrifices yet perhaps that is not so but rather it must be done by priests you can answer whence do you come to propose this from the fact that it is said and thou and thy sons with thee shall keep the priesthood in everything that pertaineth to the altar you might think that this applies to Shechita too therefore scripture states and he shall kill the bullet before the Lord and Aaron's sons the priests shall present the blood from receiving onwards priesthood is prescribed which teaches that Shechita by any person is valid the truth is that it may be performed even at the very outset too but because the Tana wishes to include unclean who may not slaughter in the First place, lest they touch the flesh, he states who slaughtered is then the slaughtering by an unclean person. Well, if it was done, the following, however, contradicts it, and he shall lay his hands upon the head of the burnt offering, and he shall kill the bullet before the Lord as laying must be done by clean persons only. So must Shechita be done by clean persons only. That is only a rabbinical law. Why does laying differ? Because it is written before the Lord, yet surely before the Lord is written of Shechita too, it is possible to make a long knife and slaughter. But in the case of laying too, he can project his hands into the temple court and lay. He holds that partial entry is designated entry. Are historic recited it reversely, and he shall lay and he shall kill as Shechita requires clean persons. So laying requires clean persons. Why does Shechita differ? Because it is written before the Lord Talmud, Masavakim be, but before the Lord is written in connection with. Lane two, he can project his hands within and lay them on the bullet. Then, in the case of Shechita two, he can make a long knife and slaughter. This agrees with Simeon the Temanite, for it was taught, and he shall kill the bullet before the Lord. The bullet must be before the Lord, but the slaughterer need not be before the Lord. Simeon the Temanite said, Once do we know that the slaughterer's hands must be on the inner side of the slaughtered from the text, and he shall slaughter the bullet before the Lord. He that slaughters the bullet must be before the Lord. Ola said in the name of Resh Lakish, if an unclean person projects his hands within, he is flagellated because it says she shall touch no hallowed things nor come into the sanctuary. Entry is assimilated to contact as partial contact ranks as contact, so partial entry is designated. Entry are Hashai raised an objection to a of a leper whose eighth day fell on the eve of Passover and who had a nocturnal discharge on. That day and performed immersion the sages said though any other Tebulyam may not enter the Levitical camp this one does enter it is preferable that an affirmative precept which involves Kareth should come and override an affirmative precept which does not involve Kareth now are Yohanan said by the law of the Torah there is not even an affirmative precept in connection therewith for it is said and Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court what does the new court mean that they introduced a new law there and ruled the Tebulyam must not enter the Levitical camp now if you say that partial entry is called entry how can he insert his hands for the sprinkling of his thumbs in both cases there is an affirmative precept involving Kareth from your very refutation I can answer you he replied a leper is different since he was permitted in respect of his leprosy he was permitted in respect of his nocturnal discharge are Joseph Observed Ola holds that if the majority were Zabin and they became unclean through the dead since they are permitted in respect of their defilement they are permitted in respect of their Ziba said Abbe to him how can you compare uncleanness was permitted but Ziba was not permitted perhaps this is what you meant if the majority are unclean through the dead and they become Zabin since they are permitted in respect of their uncleanness they are permitted in respect of their Ziba yes he replied said he to him yet they are still not alike in the case of a leper it is permitted and since it is permitted in respect of leprosy it is permitted in respect of his nocturnal discharge but defilement is merely superseded in respect of one it was superseded while in respect of the other Ziba it was not superseded said Rabbi to him on the contrary the logic is the reverse in the case of a leper it is permitted then it is permitted in respect of the one and not permitted in respect of the other but uncleanness is superseded what does it matter then whether it is superseded in one instance or whether it is superseded in two instances Talmud, Moss Sebekim of this proves that both hold that uncleanness is merely superseded in the case of a community shall we say that the following supports him in all cases of laying hands I apply the norm Shechita must immediately follow laying except this one which took place at the Nikonar gate because the leper might not enter therein until the blood of his sin offering and his guilt offering was sprinkled on his account now if you say that partial entry is not designated entry let him project his hands into the temple court and lay them on the sacrifice at our Joseph this is in accordance with our Jose son of our Judah who maintained the north is at a distance from the entrance then let a small gate be made of A and Rabba both quoted in reply all this do I give thee in writing as the Lord hath made me Wise by his hand upon me even all the works of this pattern others state that our Joseph said when one lays hands he must project his head and the greater part of his body into the temple court what is the reason we require him to lay hands with all his strength therefore it cannot be done otherwise what does the Tana hold if he holds that the laying hands on the guilt offering of a leper is a scriptural requirement and that the law that Shechita must immediately follow laying is scriptural then let him the leper enter the temple court and lay hands since the divine law ordained it said our Adabi Mahana it is a preventive measure lest he prolong his root others state that our Adabi Mahana said laying of hands on the guilt offering of a leper is scriptural but that Shechita must immediately follow laying is not scriptural an objection is raised and he shall lay his hands and he shall kill as laying must be done by clean persons only so must Shechita be done by clean persons only if however you say that it is not scriptural then it can be done by unclean persons to rather reverse it laying of hands on the guilt offering of a leper is not scriptural while the law that Shechita must immediately follow laying is scriptural Talmud, Moss Sebekim B. Rabbin said it was stated only in respect of flagellation when Rabin came he said in the name of Arabah it was stated in respect of an unclean person who touched sacred flesh
Touch no hallowed thing nor come into the sanctuary. The hallowed thing sacred flesh is assimilated to the sanctuary as the offense in connection with the sanctuary is one which involves Talmud, Ma Sabakim of the death penalty. So the offense in connection with the hallowed thing is one which involves the death penalty. Now, if the streets of touching is then the death penalty involved, hence it must treat of eating yet it is still required in respect of an unclean person who ate the sacred flesh before the sprinkling of the blood. For it was stated if an unclean person ate the sacred flesh before the sprinkling of the blood, Reshlakish maintained that he is flagellated while Aryohan ruled that he is not flagellated. Reshlakish maintained that he is flagellated for it is written, She shall touch no hallowed thing, no distinction being drawn whether it is before sprinkling or after sprinkling while Aryohan ruled that he is not flagellated as Bardella taught it is derived. From the recurring expression is uncleanness and that is written after the sprinkling if so let scripture say she shall not touch a hallowed thing while state no hallowed thing hence two things may be inferred from it the above text stated if an unclean person ate sacred flesh before sprinkling rush lakish maintained he is flagellated while Aryohan and ruled he is not flagellated Abe said this controversy applies only to bodily uncleanness but where the flesh is unclean all rule that he is flagellated because a master said and the flesh that touch it any unclean thing shall not be eaten is to include wood and frankincense though these are not edible yet scripture includes them Rabbi said the controversy is in respect of bodily uncleanness but where the flesh is unclean all agree that he is not flagellated what is the reason since we cannot apply to him the text having his uncleanness upon him that soul shall be cut off you cannot apply to him the text and the flesh that Touch it any unclean thing shall not be eaten but a master said and the flesh includes the wood and the frankincense that is where they were sanctified in a vessel so that they become as though all their matiron had been performed for we learned all which have matiron involve a penalty through defilement once their matiron have been offered whatever has no matiron involves a penalty through defilement when it has been sanctified in a service vessel it was stated if one brings up it limbs of an unclean animal on the altar Reshlakish maintained he is flagellated are Yohanan said he is not flagellated Reshlakish maintained that he is flagellated for scripture implies only a clean animal may be offered but not an unclean one and one is flagellated on account of a negative injunction which is inferred from an affirmative precept are Yohanan said he is not flagellated because one is not flagellated on account of a negative injunction which is inferred from an affirmative Precept R. Jeremiah raised an objection that may eat but not an unclean animal and a negative injunction which is inferred from an affirmative precept ranks as an affirmative precept said R. Jacob to R. Jeremiah B. Talifa I will explain it to you there is no disagreement at all about the limbs of an unclean domesticated animal they disagree about a beast of chase and it was thus stated R. Yohanan said he transgresses an affirmative precept while Rush Lakish said he does not transgress. Anything R. Yohanan said he transgresses an affirmative precept for scripture says ye shall bring your offering of the cattle behemoth this implies only of the cattle but not of the beast of chase while Rush Lakish said he does not transgress anything for the text intimates that it is meritorious robber raised an objection if it were said when any man of you bring death an offering to the Lord cattle behemoth I would agree that hey a beast of chase is included in behemoth isn't it? Verse these are the animals behemoth which ye may eat the ox the sheep and the goat the heart and the gazelle and the roebuck etc. Therefore the text states even of the herd or of the flock of the herd or of the flock have I prescribed unto thee but not a beast of chase hey you might think that one must not bring a hey yet if one did bring it it is valid for to what is this like to a disciple whom his master bade bring me wheat and he brought him wheat and barley where he is not regarded as having flouted his orders but as having added thereto and it is valid therefore the text states even of the herd or of the flock of the herd and of the flock have I prescribed unto thee but not a beast to what is this like to a disciple whom his master bade bring me not but wheat and he brought him wheat and barley he is not regarded as having added to his words but as having flouted them Talmud Ma Sabakim B and it the sacrifice is invalid this refutation of Reshlakish. Is indeed a refutation, and if any of these received, etc., Rush Lakish asked, Are Yohanan, does an unfit person render the blood in the throat a residue? Said he to him, There is no case of sprinkling rendering the remaining blood a residue, save where it is done with the illegal intention of after time or without bounds, since it counts in respect of pickle RZ, but recited it. Thus, Rush Lakish asked, Are Yohanan, does an unfit goblet of blood render the remainder a residue? Said he to him, What is your opinion about an unfit person himself? If an unfit person renders the blood a residue, then an unfit goblet too renders the blood a residue. If an unfit person does not render a residue, an unfit goblet too does not render a residue. Our Jeremiah of Diffy recited it. Thus, Abbe asked, Rabbi, does one goblet render another rejected or a residue? Said he to him, It is the subject of a controversy between our Eliezer, son of our Simeon, and the rabbis, for it was taught above, it is stated, and it Remaining blood thereof shall he pour out at the base of the altar while below it is stated and all the remaining blood thereof shall he pour out at the base of the altar. How do we know that if the priest received the blood of the sin offering in four goblets and made one application of blood from each all the rest are poured out at the base of the altar from the text and all the remaining blood thereof shall he pour out at the base of the altar. You might think that if he made the four applications from one goblet all the rest are to be poured out at the base therefore the text states and the remaining blood thereof etc. How is this to be understood the remaining blood of that goblet is poured out at the base but the other goblets are poured out into the duct. Our Eliezer son of our Simeon said once do we know that if the priest received the blood of the sin offering in four goblets and made the four applications from one goblet all are poured out. At the base from the text and all the remaining blood thereof shall he pour out at the base of the altar yet surely it is written and the remaining blood thereof shall he pour out etc. Said Arashi that is to exclude the residue of the blood left in the throat of the animal if the fit person received the blood and gave it to an unfit one etc. Now all these are necessary for if we were informed about an unfit person I would say what is an unfit person an unclean priest who is eligible for public service but the left hand is not so and if we were informed about the left hand that is because it is fit on the day of atonement but a secular non sacred vessel is not so while if we were informed about secular vessels that is because they are eligible for sanctification but as for the others I would say that it is not so thus they are all necessary now let it be regarded as rejection said Rabbanu to Arashi thus said our Jeremiah of Dipti in Rabbah's name this is in accordance with Hanan the Egyptian who does not accept the law of rejection for it was taught Hanan the Egyptian said even if the blood is in the cup he brings its companion and peers it Arashi answered when it lies in one's power to rectify the matter it does not constitute rejection Arshay observed reason supports Arashi for whom do you know to accept the law of rejection Arjuna as we learned even more did Arjuna say if the blood of the goat to be sacrificed was spilt the goat which was to be sent away must perish if the goat which was to be sent away perish the blood of the other must be poured out yet we know him to rule that where it lies in one's power to rectify the matter there is no rejection for it was taught Arjuna said he the priest used to fill a goblet with the mingled blood and sprinkled it once against the base of the altar this proves that where it lies in one's own hands there is no rejection this proves it to turn to the main text it was taught Ar Judah said he the priest used to fill a goblet with the mingled blood so that should the blood of one of them be spilled the result is that this renders it valid said they to Arjuna but surely if the mingled blood had not been received in a vessel how do they know rather they said to him perhaps it was not caught in a vessel I too he answered them Talmud Ma Sevakima spoke only of that which was received in a vessel and how does he himself know that the priests are careful but as they work quickly the blood may be spilled but the draining blood is mixed with it Arjuna is consistent with his view for he maintained the draining blood is called blood for it was taught the draining blood is subject to a warning Arjuna said it is subject to Karath but surely our Eliezer said Arjuna agrees in respect to atonement that it does not make atonement because it is said for it is the blood that make the atonement by reason of the life blood wherewith life departs is called blood Blood wherewith life does not depart is not called blood rather reply Arjuna is consistent with his view for he maintained blood cannot nullify other blood Arjuna said to them the sages on your view why did they stop up the holes in the temple court said they to him it is praiseworthy for the
Time or out of bounds it is valid and one is not culpable on their account in respect of pickle nut heart or uncle ns if one slaughters sacred animals intending to eat the fetus or the afterbirth without he does not render pickle if one rings the necks of doves intending to eat their eggs without he does not render them pickle one is not culpable on account of the milk of sacred animals or the eggs of doves in respect of pickle nut heart or uncle ns gamar r laser said if the priest Express the pickle intention in respect of the sacrifice the fetus too becomes pickle if he expresses a pickle intention in connection with the fetus the sacrifice does not become pickle if he expresses a pickle intention in respect of the awful the crop becomes pickle in respect of the crop the awful does not become pickle if he expresses a pickle intention in respect of the the bullocks become pickle in respect of the bullocks the emurim do not become pickle shall we say that the following supports him and both agree that if he expressed an intention of pickle in connection with the eating of the bullocks and their burning he has done nothing surely then if however he expressed an intention concerning the emurim the bullocks become pickle no talmud ma sabakim be deduced thus but if he expressed an intention concerning the emurim the emurim themselves become pickle come and hear the bullocks which are to be burnt and the he goats which are to be burnt are subject to the law of sacrilege from the time they are consecrated having been slaughtered they are ready to become unfit through the touch of a tea bull yum and one who lacks atonement and through being kept overnight linda surely that means through the flesh being kept overnight and you may infer from this that since being kept overnight renders it unfit and illegitimate intention renders it unfit no it refers to keeping the emurim overnight but since the second clause teaches you trespass in the case of all when they are in the ash house until the flesh is dissolved it follows that the first clause treats of keeping the flesh overnight what reason have you for supposing this each refers to its particular case the first clause treats of emurim and the second of the flesh rabbi objected the following neither render nor are rendered pickle the wool on the head of lambs and the hair of he goats beards and the skin the juice the jelly the offal the crop the bones the tendons the horns the hoofs, the fetus, the afterbirth, the milk of consecrated animals, and the eggs of doves, all of these neither render nor are rendered pickle, and one is not liable on their account in respect of pickle nut heart and uncleanness, and one who carries them up without is not liable. Does this not mean they do not render the sacrifice pickle, and they are not rendered pickle through the sacrifice? No, they do not render the sacrifice pickle, and they are not rendered pickle through themselves. If so, when the sequel teaches they neither render nor are rendered pickle, why this repetition? Yet even on your view, when he teaches one is not liable on their account for pickle, why this repetition? But you must answer that because he wishes to teach about nut heart and defilement, he also teaches about pickle. So now too you can answer because he wishes to teach about one who carries them without he also teaches, and all these neither render nor are rendered pickle. Rabbi said we too learned thus if one. Slaughter sacred animals intending to eat the fetus or the afterbirth without he does not render pickle if one rings the necks of doves intending to eat their eggs without he does not render pickle yet then he learns one is not culpable on account of the milk of sacred animals or the eggs of doves in respect of pickle nut heart or uncle ns hence it follows that one is culpable on account of the fetus and the afterbirth hence you must surely infer from this that in the one case it means through the sacrifice and the other through themselves this proves that we learned elsewhere and blemished animals are akiba declares blemished animals fit are high be abba declared in our Yohanan's name are akiba declares them fit only in the case of cataracts in the ice and such are fit in the case of birds and provided that their consecration for a sacrifice preceded their blemish and our akiba admits that a female burnt offering must be taken down because that is tantamount to the blemish Preceding its consecration are zero objected one who offers them up without is not liable but if one offers up the flesh of the mother one is liable and how is that possible in the case of a female burnt offering no it is well if you say that our Akiba holds that if a female burnt offering goes up it does not come down then this is in accordance with our Akiba but if you say that even if it went up it goes down in accordance with whom is the say he who offers up the flesh of them without is exempt hence he who offers up of the emurim of the mother is liable but he teaches of them and the mother is analogous to them rather say he who offers up of their emurim without is exempt hence he who offers up of their mother's emurim is liable mishnah if he slaughtered it with the intention of leaving its blood or its emurim for the morrow or of carrying them without arjuna disqualifies it but the sages declare it fit if he slaughtered it with the intention of sprinkling the blood on the ascent or on the altar but not over against its base or of applying below the line what should be applied above or above what should be applied below or without what should be applied within Talmud, Ma Sebekim or within what should be applied without or with the intention that unclean persons should consume it or that unclean priests should offer it or that uncircumcised persons should eat it or that uncircumcised persons should offer it or with the intention of breaking the bones of the Passover offering or eating thereof half roast or of mingling the blood with the blood of invalid sacrifices it is valid because an illegitimate intention does not disqualify a sacrifice save where it refers to after time or without bounds and in the case of a Passover offering and a sin offering the intention to slaughter them for a different purpose tomorrow what is our Judah's reason said our Eliezer two texts are written in reference to Nahar one text says and ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning and another text says he shall not leave any of it until the morning since one is superfluous in respect of actual leaving apply it to the intention of leaving it now does our Judah hold that this text comes for this purpose surely it is required for what was taught in the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offerings for thanksgiving shall be eaten on the day of his offering he shall not leave any of it until the morning we have thus learned that the thanks offering is eaten a day and a night how do we know the same of an exchange in offspring or a substitute from the text and the flesh how do we know the same of a sin offering and a guilt offering because it says and the flesh of the sacrifice etc and whence do we know to include a Nazarite's peace offering and the peace offerings of the Passover offering from the text his peace offerings whence do we know the same of the loaves of the thanks offering and a Nazarites loaves and the wafers because his offering is written and to all of these I apply the injunction he shall not leave any of it until the morning if so let scripture write lo tothra why write lo yanaya to teach that since it is superfluous in respect of actual leaving apply it to the intention of leaving granted that this reason is satisfactory in respect of the intention to leave the blood or the emurim what can you say about the intention to carry them out moreover our Judah's reason is based on logic for it was taught our Judah said to them the sages do you not admit that if he left it the blood or the emurim for the morrow the sacrifice is invalid so also if he intended to leave it for the morrow it is invalid and do you not admit that if he carried them without it is invalid so also if he intended to carry them without it is invalid rather our Judah's reason is based on logic now let our Judah disagree in the other cases too in which case should he disagree in the case of intending to break the bones of a Passover offering and eating thereof half roast does then the sacrifice itself become invalid in the case of the intention that unclean persons should eat it or that unclean persons should offer it does then the sacrifice itself become invalid in the case of the intention that uncircumcised persons should eat it or uncircumcised persons should offer it is then the sacrifice itself invalidated another version does it entirely depend on him as for the intention to mingle its blood with the blood of invalid sacrifices our Judah is consistent with his view for he maintains that blood does not nullify other blood as for the intention to apply below what should be applied above and above what should be applied below our Judah is consistent with his view for he maintains even what is not its place is also called its place then let him disagree where he applied without what should be applied within or Within what should be applied without our Judah holds we require a place which has a threefold function viz in respect of the blood the flesh and the emurim does then our Judah accept that view surely it was taught our Judah said scripture states thou shalt not sacrifice unto the Lord thy God an ox or a sheep wherein is a blemish even any evil thing here scripture extends the law to a sin offering which one slaughtered on the south side of the temple court or a sin offering whose blood entered within the inner sanctum teaching that it is invalid but does then our Judah not accept this interpretation of the surely we learned our Judah said if one carried the blood within ignorance it is valid hence if one did this deliberately it is invalid and we have explained this as meaning where he made atonement now if in that case where he has actually carried it within if he made atonement therewith it does invalidate the sacrifice but if he did not make atonement it does not how much the more so here where he has
Consume it without bounce or after time it is unfit and does not involve correct. This refutation of Araba is indeed a refutation. Aris said in the name of Rabbin Abisila if he intended that unclean persons should eat it on the morrow he is liable said Rabbin this is the proof is before sprinkling the flesh is not fit for eating and yet when he declares a pickle intention it becomes unfit yet it is not so there he will sprinkle the blood and the flesh will be fit here the unclean. Are not fit at all Aris said Ardimi behind and was wont to say one is liable for uncleanness in respect of unroast flesh of a Passover offering and loaves of a thanks offering of which no separation for the priest was made Rabbin said this is the proof is it was taught but the soul that eat of the flesh of the sacrifice of peace offerings that pertain unto the Lord having his uncleanness upon him that soul shall be cut off from his people this includes the of lesser sacrifices. In respect of uncleanness, this proves that though they are not fit for eating at all, one is liable for uncleanness on their account. So here too, though they are not fit for eating, one is liable for uncleanness on their account. Yet it is not so. There, the emirim of lesser sacrifices are fit for the most high, which excludes unroasted flesh of the Passover offering and the loaves of the thanks offering, of which no separation was made, which are fit neither for the most high nor for man another. Version now, the emirim are not fit. Yet it is not so. These emirim are fit for their purpose, whereas these are not fit at all. Chapter four, Mishnah Beth Shem. I maintain with regard to any blood which is to be sprinkled on the outer altar, if the priest applied it with one sprinkling, he has made atonement. But in the case of a sin offering, two applications are indispensable. But Beth Hillel rule in the case of a sin offering, two, if the priest applied it with a single application, he has. Made atonement therefore if he made the first application in the proper manner and the second with the intention to eat the flesh after time he has atoned and if he made the first application with the intention to eat the flesh after time and the second without bounds it is pickle and involves kareth with regard to any blood which is sprinkled on the inner altar if the priest omitted one of the applications he has not atoned therefore if he applied all in the proper manner but one in an improper manner if the sacrifice is invalid but does not involve kareth our rabbis taught how do we know that if the priest made one application in the case of those bloods which are to be sprinkled on the outer altar he has made atonement from the text and the blood of the sacrifices shall be poured out now is this text required for that purpose surely it is needed for what was taught Talmud Masavikima once do we know that all blood must be poured out at the base of it. Altar from the text and the blood of thy sacrifices shall be poured out against the altar. He deduces that from Rabbi's inference, for it was taught Rabbi said scripture writes, and the rest of the blood shall be drained out at the base of the altar. Now, if the blood need not be stated, why then is it stated? Because we have learned only that that blood which requires four applications must be poured out at the base. Whence do we know it of other blood from the text and the rest of the blood shall be drained out at the base of the altar? Yet still does it come for this purpose? It is required for what was taught. How do we know that if the priest poured out the blood which should be sprinkled, he has fulfilled his obligation from the text and the blood of thy sacrifices shall be poured out? He holds as our Akiva who maintained pouring is not included in sprinkling, nor is sprinkling included in pouring. For we learned if he recited the blessing for the Passover offering, either by Exempts the festival sacrifice, but if he recited the blessing for the sacrifice, he does not exempt the Passover offering. This is a view of our Ishmael. Our Akiva said the former does not exempt the latter, nor does the latter exempt the former. Yet still is it required for this purpose. Surely it is needed for what was taught. Is our Ishmael said from the text, but the first ling of an ox, or the first ling of a sheep, or the first ling of a goat, thou shalt not redeem. They are holy. Thou shalt dash their blood against the altar and shalt make their fat smoke for an offering made by fire. We learn that a first ling must have its blood and its emurim presented at the altar. Whence do we know it of the tithe and the Passover offering? Because it says, and the blood of thy sacrifices shall be poured out. He agrees with our Jose the Galilean, for it was taught our Jose the Galilean said, thou shalt dash their blood against the altar and shalt make their fat smoke. Not its blood is said, but there. Blood not its fat is said but their fat this teaches concerning the first ling the tithe of animals and the Passover offering that their blood and emurim must be presented at the altar now does our Ishmael utilize this text for both purposes there is a controversy of two tanaim as to our Ishmael's view as for our Ishmael who makes the whole verse refer to a first ling it is well hence it is written and the flesh of them shall be thine but according to our Jose the Galilean who makes it refer to the tithe and the Passover offering too surely the tithe and the Passover offering are eaten by their owners what then is the meaning of and the flesh of them shall be thine the plural intimates whether it be whole or blemished Talmud Masabakim be thus intimating that a blemished first ling is given to a priest for which teaching we do not find any other text in the whole Torah and our Ishmael he deduces it from it shall be thine written at the end of the verse it is well according to our Jose the Galilean who makes it refer to the tithe and the Passover offering to hence it is written thou shalt not redeem they are holy which intimates they are offered but their substitutes are not offered and we learned even so the substitutes of the firstling or tithe they themselves their young and the young of their young ad infinitum are as the firstling or tithe respectively and are eaten when blemished by their owners and we also learned our Joshua said I have heard from my teachers that the substitute of a Passover offering is offered and that the substitute of a Passover offering is not offered and I cannot explain it but according to our Ishmael who makes the whole of it refer to a firstling whence does he know that the substitute of tithe and the Passover offering are not offered as for tithe he learned similarity of law with the firstling from the fact that passing is written in both cases as for the Passover offering consider lamb is explicitly written in Connection with it, why then does scripture write if he bring a lamb for his offering to include the substitute of a Passover offering after Passover, intimating that it is sacrificed as a peace offering, you might think that it is likewise so before Passover. Therefore, scripture writes it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. Now, all these tanaim who utilize this text, the blood of thy sacrifices shall be poured out for a different exegesis. How do they know this law of the mission of that? With regard to any blood which is sprinkled on the outer altar, if the priest applied it with one sprinkling, he has made atonement. They hold as Beth Hillel who maintained with regard to the sin offering, too. If the priest applied it with a single application, he has made atonement, and we learn all the others from the sin offering. But in the case of a sin offering, two applications are indispensable. Are who not said what is Beth Shammai's reason? The plural form Karnoth horns is written. Three times denoting six applications, thus intimating that four are prescribed, while two at least are essential. But Beth Hillel argue the written forms are Karnath singular twice and Karnath plural once, which denotes four, implying that three applications are prescribed, while only one is essential. Yet say that all are only prescribed. We find no atonement without right. Alternatively, this is Beth Hillel's reason. Both Micra the version as read and Misarath the version as traditionally written are effective. The Micra is effective in adding one application, while the Misarath is effective in subtracting one. If so, when Scripture writes Lotodafoth, 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 which denotes four compartments, you can likewise argue that both the Micra and the Misarath are effective, and five compartments should be necessary. He holds as our Akiva who said Tot means two and Kapi and Foth means two in Afriki again. If so, when Scripture writes Bia Sukat, Bia Sukat, Bia. So you may argue that both the Micra and the Masarath are effective then one should have five walls for the tabernacle booth Talmud, Mas Sebakim there subtract one text for the command itself and one for the covering so three are left then the mosaic halacha comes and diminishes the third wall fixing it at a handbreadth if so when scripture states then she shall be unclean two weeks Shabayim Shabayim 70 is actually written then argue the Micra and it. Masarath are both effective and so she should have to spend 42 days in uncleanness there it is different because it is written as in her menstrual state now the tana of the following very this is it Beth Hillel's ruling as follows Weekeeper and he shall make atonement is stated three times on account of the analogy which might otherwise be drawn but surely we have an analogy to this effect blood is prescribed below the red line and blood is prescribed above as with it. Blood which is prescribed below if one made a single application he affects atonement so with the blood which is prescribed above if one makes a single application he makes atonement or you may reason in this direction blood is prescribed within and blood is prescribed without as in the case of blood prescribed within
Yet say that and he shall make atonement intimates even if he made only three applications above the red line and one below and he shall make atonement even if he made only two applications above and two below and he shall make atonement even if he did not apply the blood above but only below said are Adabi Isaac if so you annul the law of horns but if the divine law has ordained it so let them be annulled said Rabba what thing is it that requires three surely the horns yet say and he shall make atonement teaches even if he made only one application above and three below we do not find blood applied half above and half below do we not surely we learned he sprinkled thereof once above and seven below that was done as majlif one swinging a whip what is a majlif Rab Judah showed it by imitating the movements of a whipper again we learned he besprinkled the surface of the altar seven times Talmud, Mas Sebakim be surely that means on the upper half of the altar as People say the noonlight shines and so it is midday said Rabbi Shila no it means on the altar's top surface cleared from ashes for it is written and the like of the very heaven for clearness but there is the remainder of the blood the pouring out of the remainder at the altar's base is not essential but there is the remainder of inner sin offerings which according to one view is essential we mean in one and the same place it was taught our Eliezer B. Jacob said Beth Shem I maintain that two applications in the case of the sin offering and one in the case of all other sacrifices permit them for consumption and may render them pickle Beth Hillel rule one application only in the case of the sin offering and one in the case of all other sacrifices permit them for consumption and may render them pickle to this Arashai demur if so this controversy should be recited among the lenient rulings of Beth Shem I and the stricter rulings of Beth Hillel said Rabbi and when the question was first asked it was whether the sacrifice was permitted so that Beth Shammai were stricter or Yohanan said the three final applications of sin offerings may not be made at night and are made after the owner's death while he who presents them without the temple court is culpable our Papa said in some respects they are as the first blood while in others they are as the last in respect of sprinkling them without the temple court at night there with the requirement of a service vessel sprinkling on the horn with the finger washing and residue they are as the first blood in respect of death not permitting the flesh not rendering it pickle and not entering within they are as the last blood our Papa said how do I know it because we learned if the blood spurted direct from the animal's throat onto the priest's garment it does not need washing from the horn or from the base of the altar it does not need washing hence if some of the blood which was fit for the horn spurted on the garment it does need washing then on your reasoning you may argue if it spurted from the base it does not need washing hence if some of the blood which was fit for the base spurted on the garment it does need washing yet surely it is written and if out of the blood which is to be sprinkled spurt upon any garment thou shalt wash that whereon it was sprinkled in a holy place which excludes this residue as the blood has already been sprinkled hence you must say that this is in accordance with our Nehemiah for we learned our Nehemiah said if one presented the residue of the blood without the temple court he is liable but granted that you know our Nehemiah to rule thus in respect of presenting the blood without the temple court by analogy with the limbs and the fat pieces do you however know him to rule thus in respect of washing yes Talmud, Mas and so it was taught the bloods which require the base Necessitate washing and an illegitimate intention in connection with same is effective and one who presents thereof without the temple court is liable the blood however which is poured out into the duct does not necessitate washing and an illegitimate intention in connection with same is not effective and one who presents thereof without is exempt from punishment now whom do you know to rule that one who presents thereof without is liable are Nehemiah and he also rules that it necessitates washing and that an illegitimate intention in connection with the same is effective but it was taught the pouring out of the residue and the burning of the limbs on the altar which are not indispensable for atonement are accepted in that an illegitimate intention in connection with same is of no effect that was taught in reference to the last three applications of a sin offering if so why does it say which requires the base surely it is sprinkled on the horn of the altar say which is required for the base but then what of an illegitimate intention in connection with same is effective surely you said it does not permit the flesh it does not render it pickle and does not enter within as the last blood rather that bury the was taught in respect of the blood of the inner sacrifices but in the case of the blood of outer sacrifices what will you say he is exempt and instead of teaching about the blood which is poured out into the duct let the tanna teach a distinction in that very case thus this is said only of the blood of inner sacrifices but in the case of the outer sacrifices he is exempt this is in accordance with our Nehemiah who maintained that one who presents the residue of the blood without is liable and so he the tanna could not enumerate three instances of exemption corresponding to three instances of liability Rubin is said from the horn is meant literally but from the base means from that which is Fit for the base set are Talafabi Gazid Rubin perhaps both mean the blood that is fit etc. How is that possible seeing that you say that even the blood fit for the horn does not necessitate washing need one speak about the blood fit for the base hence from the horn is meant literally while from the base means from that which is fit for the base all blood which is sprinkled on the inner altar etc. Our rabbis taught us shall he do with the bullock as he did with the bullock of the sin offering so shall he do with this why is this stated as a repetition of the law of sprinkling to teach that if the priest omitted one of the applications he has done nothing I know this only of the seven applications which are indispensable in all cases whence do we know it of the four applications from the text so shall he do with this with the bullock means the bullock of the day of atonement Talmud, Mas Sebakim B as he did with the bullock refers to the bullock of it. Anointed priest, the sin offering refers to the goats of idolatry. You might think that I include the festival goats and new moon goats. Therefore, scripture states, so shall he do with this. And what reason do you see for including the former and excluding the latter? Since the writ intimates extension and intimates limitation, I include the former which make atonement for the known transgression of a precept, while I exclude the latter which do not make atonement for the known transgression of a precept. And the priest shall make atonement even though he had not laid hands on the bullock, and it shall be forgiven to them even though he had not poured out the residue. And what reason do you see for invalidating the sacrifice in the case of sprinklings and validating it in the case of laying on of hands and the residue? You can answer, I invalidate in the case of sprinklings as they are indispensable elsewhere, while I validate in the case of laying on of hands and the residue. Which are not indispensable in all other cases, Talmud. Ma Sebakim of the Master said, I know it only of the seven applications which are indispensable elsewhere, where said our Papa in the case of the red heifer and leprosy. How do we know it of the four applications? Because it is written, so shall he do. Why do the seven applications differ? Presumably because they are prescribed and reiterated, then the four applications too are prescribed and reiterated, said our Jeremiah. This is necessary. Only according to our Simeon, for it was taught in the upper section, horns is written where horn would suffice, which implies two, and in the lower section, horns is written instead of horn, which implies four. This is our Simeon's view. Our Judah said it is unnecessary, for surely it says, which is in the tent of meeting, intimating upon all which is mentioned in the tent of meeting. Now, how does our Judah employ the text? So shall he do? He requires it for what was taught, as we have not learned. About laying on of hands and the residue of the blood in the case of the bullock of the day of atonement once then do we know it from the text so shall he do but have we not learned it of the bullock of the day of atonement surely you said with the bullock refers to the bullock of atonement day it is necessary you might think that it applies only to a service which is indispensable for atonement but as for a service which is not indispensable for atonement I would agree that it is not. So hence he informs us otherwise now how does our Simeon employ this phrase in the tent of meeting he utilizes it as teaching that if the sealing of the call was broken the priest did not sprinkle and the other he deduces it from which is and the other he does not interpret which is as having a particular significance Abbe said according to our Judah to the text is required you might think that it is analogous to laying hands and pouring out the residue of the blood which are not indispensable in spite of being prescribed and reiterated so you might argue that the four applications too are indispensable hence the text informs us that it is not so the master said with the bullock refers to the bullock of the day of atonement in respect of which law if to intimate that the four applications are essential it is obvious since statute is written in connection with it said our nomin b isaac this is necessary only on our judas view for he maintained statute is written only in reference to the rites performed in the white vestments within the inner sanctuary and it teaches that if one rite was wrongly performed before another the high priest has done nothing but as for the rites performed in the white vestments without if not performed in correct order
blood and if the divine Lord in the blood only I would say that he may even sponge it up there for the divine Lord and he shall dip what is the purpose of the altar of sweet incense to teach that if the altar had not been consecrated by sweet incense the priest did not sprinkle and was taught in accordance with our prophet thus shall he do as he did why does scripture say with the bullet to include the bullet of the day of atonement in respect of all that is prescribed in this passage that is rabbi's view said are Ishmael it follows a fortiori if rites of diverse sacrifices were assimilated to each other even where the sacrifices are not the same surely rites are assimilated to each other where the sacrifices are the same what then does scripture intimate by the phrase with the bullet this refers to the bullet brought for the community's unwitting transgression while the other with the bullet refers to the bullet of the anointed priest the master said if where the sacrifices are not assimilated to each other to what does the sacrifices are not assimilated to each other allude shall we say to the bullock of the day of atonement and the goat of the day of atonement then the argument can be refuted as for these their rights are similar because their blood enters the innermost sanctum rather it alludes to the community's bullock for unwitting transgression and the goat sacrificed on account of idolatry but here too the argument can be refuted as for these their rights are the same because they make atonement for the violation of a known precept rather it alludes to the community's bullock for unwitting transgression and the goat of the day of atonement and this is what he means if where the sacrifices are not the same since one is a bullock and the other is a goat yet the rights are alike as far as what is prescribed in their case is concerned and where the sacrifices are the same this one being a bullock and the other being a bullock it is surely logical Talmud, Mas Sebekima that their rights shall be alike then the rights of the Day of Atonement bullock are learned from those of the bullock of the anointed priest insofar as the latter are deduced from eth in the blood and the mention of dipping and the rights of the goat of the Day of Atonement are also learned from those of the goats brought on account of idolatry of Forshiorai but can that which is learned through a Hekish then in turn teach a Forshiorai said our Papa the Tana of the school of Arishmael holds that that which is learned through a Hekish can in turn teach a Forshiorai with the bullock refers to the community's bullock for unwitting transgression but that is written in the very text said our Papa because he wishes that the community's bullock for unwitting transgression shall teach that the goats for idolatry require the burning of the lobe above the liver and the two kidneys on the altar yet that is not prescribed. In the actual passage on the community's bullock for unwitting transgress but is learned through a hekish therefore with the bullock is needed to make it as though it were prescribed in the actual text and thus it should not be a case of what is learned through a hekish in turn teaching through a hekish it was taught in accordance with our papa thus shall he do with the bullock as he did why does scripture further state with the bullock because it is said and they have brought their offering an offering made by fire unto the lord and their sin offering before the lord for their error now their sin offering refers to the he goats for idolatry while their error alludes to the community's bullock for unwitting transgression hence when the text says their sin offering for their error the torah intimates behold you must treat their sin offering as their offering for error but once have you learned the law in the case of their offering for error was it not through a Hekish can then that which is learned through a Hekish in turn teach through a Hekish therefore the text states as he did with the bullock which refers to the community's bullock for transgression while the other with the bullock alludes to the anointed priest's bullock the master said their sin offering refers to the he goats for idolatry deduce this from the earlier verse for a master said the sin offering is to include the he goats of idolatry said our papa it is necessary I might argue that the force of this extension applies only to the sprinklings which are prescribed in that very passage Talmud, Ma Sebekim be Talmud, Ma Sebekim be but as for the burning of the lobe and the two kidneys which are not prescribed in that passage I would say that it is not intimated therefore the text informs us that it is not so Arhuna the son of our Nathan said to our papa but surely the Tana states with the bullock includes the bullock of the day of atonement in respect of Everything which is prescribed in the text it is a controversy of Tanaim the Tana of the Academy includes it in this way while the Tana of the school of Arishmael includes it in that way the school of Arishmael taught why are the lobe and the two kidneys mentioned in connection with the anointed priest's bullock but not in connection with the community's bullock for unwitting transgression it may be compared to a king of flesh and blood who was angry with his friend but spoke little of his offense out of his love for him the school of Arishmael also taught why is the veil of the sanctuary mentioned in connection with the anointed priest's bullock but not in connection with the community's bullock of unwitting transgression it may be compared to a king of flesh and blood against whom a province sent if a minority offended his retainers remain with them but if the majority offend his retainers do not remain with them therefore if he applied all correctly and one incorrectly I.T. the sacrifice is invalid but does not involve Kareth we learned elsewhere if the priest made a pickle intention at the burning of the fistful of flour but not at the burning of the incense or at the frankincense but not at the fistful our says that it is pickle and one is liable to Kareth on its account but the sages maintain it does not involve Kareth unless the priest makes a pickle intention for the whole matter our Simeon B. Lakish commented do not say that our Meir's reason is because he holds that you can make a sacrifice pickle in half a matter rather the circumstances here are that the priest presented the fistful on the altar with a pickle intention and the frankincense in silence here our holds that when one does a thing he does it with his first intention how do you know it because the Tana teaches therefore if he applied all correctly and one incorrectly if the sacrifice is invalid but does not involve Kareth hence if he applies one Correctly and all the others incorrectly it is pickle with whom does this agree if with the rabbis surely the rabbis say that you cannot make pickle at half a matter hence it must be our now if our mayor's reason is that you can make pickle at half a matter then even in the conditions which he teaches it is still pickle hence it must surely be because he holds that when one does a thing he does it with his first intention said our Samuel B. Isaac in truth it agrees with the rabbis and what is meant by correctly in the proper manner for pickle but since the Tana teaches therefore if he applied all correctly and one incorrectly at the sacrifice is unfit but does not involve correct it follows that incorrectly means in a manner to make it fit said rabbi what does incorrectly mean with an intention of eating it without bounce or as she said it means under a different designation hence it follows that if the priest did not do it with an intention of consuming it without Bounce or under a different designation one is liable because the first clause teaches it is pickle and one is liable to Kareth on its account the second clause two teaches it is unfit and does not involve Kareth an objection is raised when is the said in the case of blood that is presented on the outer altar Talmud, Mas Sevakim but in the case of blood presented on the inner altar e.g. the 43 applications of the day of atonement the 11 of the anointed priest's bullock and the 11 of the community's bullock of unwitting transgression if he the priest declared a pickle intention whether at the first the second or the third our mayor maintains that it is pickle and involves Kareth while the sages say it does not involve Kareth unless the priest declares a pickle intention at the whole matter incidentally he teaches if the priest declared a pickle intention whether at the first at the second or the third and yet our mayor disagrees said our Isaac B. Abendit. Circumstances here are e.g. that he declared a pickle intention at the Sheshit of this being one matter if so what is the reason of the rabbi said rabbi who are the sages in this passage are Eliezer for we learned with regard to the fistful of flour the frankincense the incense the priest's meal offering the anointed priest's meal offering and the meal offering of the libations if the priest presented as much as an olive of one of these without the temple court he is liable but our Eliezer exempts him unless he offers the whole without but surely rabbi said yet our Eliezer admits in the case of blood for we learned our Eliezer and our Simeon maintain from where he left off there he recommences rather said rabbi at the very the means e.g. where he declared a pickle intention at the first applications was silent at the second and again declared a pickle intention at the third now we might argue if you claim that he acts with his original intention why should he repeat his pickle Intention at the third applications therefore he informs us that we do not argue so to this Arashi Demur does he then teach that he was silent rather said Arashi the circumstances here are e.g. that he declared a pickle intention at the first second and third you might argue if you think that whatever one does one does with the first intention why must he repeat his pickle declaration at each one therefore he informs us that we do not argue so Talmud, Mas Sebekim be but he teaches. Whether or that is indeed a difficulty the master said our mayor said it is pickle and involves Kareth
What is this said in the case of the taking of the fistful, the placing in the vessel and the carriage, but when he comes to the burning of the fistful and the frankincense, if he presents the fistful with a pickle intention and the frankincense in silence, or if he presents the fistful in silence and the frankincense with a pickle intention, our mayor declares it pickle and it involves Kareth, while the sages rule it does not involve Kareth unless he declares a pickle intention in respect of the whole matter. Now he teaches incidentally if he presents the fistful in silence and the frankincense with a pickle intention, and yet they disagree, say having already presented the frankincense with a pickle intention, one objection is that that is the first clause, moreover it was indeed taught, and after that that is indeed a difficulty mission. These are the things for which one is not liable on account of pickle the fistful, the incense, the frankincense, Talmud, Ma Sevakim of it. Priest meal offering the anointed priest meal offering the blood and the drink offerings that are brought separately that is the view of our mayor the sages maintain also those that are brought with an animal sacrifice a leper's log of oil our simian maintained does not involve liability on account of pickle while our mayor rules it involves liability on account of pickle because the blood of the guilt offering makes it permitted and whatever has ought that makes it permitted whether for man or for the altar involves liability on account of pickle the sprinkling of the blood of the burnt offering permits its flesh for burning on the altar and its skin to the priest the blood of the burnt offering of the bird permits its flesh to the altar the blood of the sin offering of the bird permits its flesh to the priest the blood of the bullocks that are burnt and the goats that are burnt permits their immunum to be offered on the altar our simian said whatever is not sprinkled on the outer Altar as the peace offering does not involve liability on account of pickle. Gamarola said if the fistful of the meal offering which is pickle is presented on the altar, its pickle status leaves it seeing that it reduces others to the state of pickle. How much the more so itself? What does he mean? This is what he means. If it is unacceptable, how can it reduce others to the state of pickle? What does he inform us if that it does not involve liability for pickle? Surely we have learned that these are the things for which one is not liable on account of pickle. The fistful, the incense, the frankincense, the priest's meal offering, the anointed priest's meal offering, and the blood. Rather, he informs us that if it ascended the altar, it does not descend. But we have learned that flesh that is kept overnight or that goes out of its permitted boundaries, or which is unclean, or which was slaughtered with the intention of being consumed after time or without bounds, if it ascended the altar. Does not descend rather he informs us that if it was taken down from the altar it must be taken up again but surely we have learned just as it does not descend once it had ascended so it does not ascend after having descended that Allah's teaching is only when the fire of the altar has taken hold of it but this too Allah has already stated once for Allah said they learned this only where the fire had not taken hold of it but if the fire had taken hold of it it must go up again you might think that this holds good only of Talmud, Mas Sevakim B. which is all one but as for the fistful which is divisible I would say that it is not so therefore he informs us otherwise Araha said therefore when half of the fistful which is pickle is lying on the ground and half has been taken up on the wood pile on the altar and the fire has taken hold of it we must take up the whole of it even at the very outset our Isaac said in our Yohanan's name if pickle not hard or unclean. Flesh is taken up to the altar, therefore bidden status leaves them. Said our histado, author of this statement, is then the altar a ritual bath of purification. Said our zera, this law applies where the fire has taken hold of it. Our Isaac Bibas now objected. Others say when scripture writes, but the soul that eats of the flesh of the sacrifice of peace offerings, having his uncleanness upon him, that soul shall be cut off from his people. It implies one whose uncleanness can leave him thus. Excluding flesh whose uncleanness cannot leave it, but if this is correct, surely the uncleanness does leave it through the fire. Said Rabba, we mean through Amikwe is then Amikwe written in the text. Rather said our Papa, we are dealing with the flesh of peace offerings, which is not eligible for presenting on the altar. Rabbanah said having his uncleanness upon him implies one whose uncleanness leaves him while he is yet whole. Thus flesh is excluded because uncleanness does not leave it while it is whole but only when it is defective to turn to the main text having his uncleanness upon him scripture speaks of uncleanness of the person you say scripture speaks of uncleanness of the person yet perhaps it is not so but rather of uncleanness of the flesh here having his uncleanness upon him is said while elsewhere it says his uncleanness is yet upon him as their scripture speaks of uncleanness of the person so here too scripture speaks of uncleanness of the person our jose said since the holy things are mentioned in the plural whilst uncleanness is stated in the singular scripture must refer to uncleanness of the person rabbi said and he choose that scripture speaks of uncleanness of the person others say having his uncleanness upon him implies one whose uncleanness leaves him thus excluding flesh whose uncleanness cannot leave it a master said rabbi said and he choose that scripture speaks of uncleanness of the person how does this imply it said rabbi every text which our Isaac be a me and every math the which Z E I R I did not explain are not explained thus did our Isaac be a me say since the rid commences in the feminine form and ends in the feminine while it employs the masculine form in the middle the rid must speak of uncleanness of the person a math for it was taught if the lighter ones were stated why were the more stringent ones stated and if the more stringent ones were stated why were the lighter ones stated if the lighter ones were stated and not the more stringent ones I would say the lighter ones involve a negative injunction and the more stringent ones involve death therefore the more stringent ones are stated while if the more stringent were stated and not the lighter I would say the stringent ones involve culpability but the lighter ones do not involve culpability at all therefore the lighter ones are stated now what are the lighter ones and the more stringent ones shall we say that the lighter ones are the Tithe and the more stringent ones are terror mocking you then say I would say the more stringent ones involve death surely now it too involves death moreover if it were not stated would I say that it involves death surely it is sufficient for the conclusion to be as its premise again if the lighter ones mean uncleanness of a reptile and the more stringent ones uncleanness of a corpse to what then does it refer if to terror mock both involve death moreover can you say therefore the more stringent ones are stated to teach that they involve a negative injunction only but surely it involves death whilst if it refers to the eating of tithe Talmud, Ma Sevaki can you say if the more stringent ones were not stated I would say that the more stringent ones involve death but surely it would be derived from the uncleanness of a reptile and it is sufficient for the conclusion to be as the premise said the lighter ones are uncleanness of a reptile while the more stringent ones our uncleanness through a corpse and this is what the Tana means if uncleanness of a reptile were stated and tithe and terima were enumerated but uncleanness of a corpse were not stated I would say the lighter defilement involves a negative injunction in respect of the lighter holy things and death in respect of the more stringent and since the lighter defilement involves death in respect of the more stringent holy things the more stringent defilement too involves death in respect of the lighter holy things therefore the more stringent defilement is stated whatever has ought that makes it permitted whether for man or for the altar involves liability on account of pickle or rabbis taught or perhaps it includes only that which is similar to a peace offering as a peace offering is distinguished in that it is eaten two days and one night so all that may be eaten two days and one night are included how do we know that that which is eaten a day and a night only is also included because scripture says, and if any of the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offerings etc which includes all whose remainder is eaten how do we know that a burnt offering whose remainder is not eaten is included because scripture says the sacrifice whence do we know to include the burnt offerings and meal offerings until I can include a leper's log of oil from the text which they hallow unto me not is then learned from uncleanness because profanation is written in connection with both and pickle is learned from not because iniquity is written in connection with both now since its scripture ultimately includes all things why then are peace offerings specified to teach you as a peace offering is distinguished in that it has something which permits it both for man and for the altar so everything which has something which permits it both for man and for the altar involves liability on account of pickle the sprinkling of the blood of the burnt offering Permits its flesh were burning on the altar and its skin to the priests the blood of the bird burnt offering permits its flesh for the altar the blood of the bird sin offering permits its flesh to the priests the blood of the bullocks that are burnt and the goats that are burnt permits their immune room to be offered on the altar and I exclude the fistful the frankincense the incense the priest's meal offering the anointed priest's meal offering and the blood our simian said
Libations and the blood disagrees with the rabbis for it was taught the drink offering which accompanies an animal sacrifice involves liability on account of pickle because the blood of the sacrifice permits it to be offered on the altar that is our meir's view said they to him but a man can bring his sacrifice today and the drink offering even ten days later I too he answered the rule thus only when they come together with the sacrifice said our Joseph the author of this is rabbi who maintained that the applications of the leper's log of oil permitted and since its sprinklings permitted its sprinklings render it pickle for it was taught you commit trespass in respect of the leper's log of oil until the blood is sprinkled once the blood is sprinkled you may not use it and you do not commit trespass rabbi said you commit trespass until its sprinklings are made and both agree that it may not be eaten until its seven sprinklings and the applications on the thumbs are made this was reported before our Jeremiah whereupon he exclaimed that a great man like our Joseph should say such a thing Talmud, Ma Sebakim below all agree that when the log comes separately its sprinklings permitted and yet they do not render it pickle for it was taught a leper's log of oil involves liability on account of pickle because the blood permits it for sprinkling on the thumbs that is our mayor's view said they do our mayor but a man can bring his guilt offering now and his log even ten days. Later I too he answered the rule thus only when it comes with the guilt offering rather said our Jeremiah in truth it agrees with our mayor but delete drink offerings from this passage Abbe said after all you need not delete it but he first teaches about the log which comes with the guilt offering and the same applies to the drink offering which comes with the sacrifice and then he teaches about the drink offering which comes separately and the same applies to the log which comes. Separately the blood of the bird sin offering permits its flesh to the priests whence do we know it for Levi taught this shall be thine the priests every offering of theirs that is to include a leper's log of oil I might think that the divine Lord reserved from the fire whereas this is not reserved from the fire therefore it informs us that it is not so even every meal offering of theirs includes the meal offering of the omer and the meal offering of jealousy I might think that it is written and they shall eat these things wherewith atonement was made whereas the meal offering of the omer comes to permit the new corn while the meal offering of jealousy comes to establish guilt therefore the text informs us that it is not so and every sin offering of theirs includes the sin offering of a bird I might think that it is nibble therefore the text informs us that it is not so and every guilt offering of theirs includes a Nazarite's guilt offering and a leper's guilt offering I might think that these come to qualify them therefore the text informs us that it is not so but it is explicitly written that a leper's guilt offering is eaten rather it is to include a Nazarite's guilt offering teaching that it is like a leper's guilt offering which they may render includes what is taken by robbery from a proselyte shall be for thee it shall be thine even for betrothing a woman it was taught our Eliezer said on the authority of our Jose the Galilean if the priest declared a pickle intention in respect of a right which is performed without he renders a pickle in respect of a right which is performed within he does not render a pickle how so if he stood without and declared low I slaughter the sacrifice intending to sprinkle its blood tomorrow he does not render a pickle because it is an intention expressed without concerning a right which is performed within if he stood within and declared low I sprinkle the blood intending to burn it he mirror and pour out the residue tomorrow he does not render it pickle because it is an intention expressed within concerning a right which is performed without if he stood without and declared low I slaughter the sacrifice intending to pour out the residue tomorrow or to burn the mirror tomorrow he renders it pickle because it is an intention expressed without concerning a right which is performed without our Joshua be Levi said which text teaches this as is taken from the ox of it. Sacrifice of peace offerings what then do we learn from the ox of the sacrifice of peace offerings scripture however likens the anointed priest bullock to the ox of the sacrifice of peace offerings as the ox of the sacrifice of peace offerings does not become pickle unless its rites and its intentions are done on the outer altar so the anointed priest bullock does not become pickle unless its intentions and its rites are done in connection with the outer altar are not set in. Rabbi Biabo's name and Rab's name the Halacha is as our Eliezer's ruling in the name of our Jose said Rabbi Talmud, Ma Sebaki may do we need a Halacha for the days of the Messiah? Abay answered if so we should not study the whole of the slaughtering of sacrifices yet we say study and receive reward so in this case to study and receive reward he replied this is what I mean why state the Halacha another version he replied I mean why state the Halacha mission of the sacrifices of heathens do not involve liability on account of pickle nut heart or defilement and if a priest slaughters them without the temple he is not liable that is our Simeon's view but our Jose declares him liable tomorrow our rabbis taught you may neither benefit from the sacrifices of heathens nor do you commit trespass and they do not involve liability on account of pickle nut heart or defilement and they the heathens cannot effect substitution and they cannot bring drink offerings but their animal. Sacrifices require drink offerings to accompany them that is the view of our Simeon said our Jose I hold that a stringent view should be taken on all these matters because it is said of them any man that bringeth his offering unto the Lord this applies only to sacrifices of the altar but in the case of objects sacred to the temple repair one does commit trespass you may neither benefit nor do you commit trespass you may not benefit by rabbinical law nor do you commit trespass because in respect of the trespass offering identity of law is derived from the fact that sin is written here and in the case of Teramah while in respect to Teramah the children of Israel is written which intimates but not those of heathens and they do not involve liability on account of pickle nethar or defilement what is the reason because the scope of pickle is derived from nethar since iniquity is written in connection with both and the scope of nethar is derived from defilement because Profanation is written in connection with both while in respect to defilement the children of Israel is written which intimates but not those of heathens and they cannot effect substitution what is the reason because substitution is assimilated to the tithe of cattle and cattle tithe is assimilated to corn tithe while the children of Israel is written in connection with corn tithe which intimates but not that of heathens can then that which is learned through a heckish in turn teach. Through a heckish corn tithe is hollow that is well on the view that the teacher is the determining factor but on the view that the taught is the determining factor what can be said rather cattle tithe is an obligation for which there is no fixed time and as it is an obligation for which there is no fixed time it is brought by Israelites but not by heathens and they cannot bring drink offerings our rabbis taught scripture said all that our homeborn shall do these things after this. Matter the homeborn can bring drink offerings but a heathen cannot bring drink offerings you might think then that his burnt offering does not require a drink offering therefore scripture teaches thus shall be done for each bullock etc. said our Jose I hold that a stringent view should be taken on all these matters this applies only to sacrifices of the altar etc. what is the reason he holds that when the scope of trespass is derived from Teramah because sin is written in connection with both it applies only to that which is like Teramah whose holiness is intrinsic but not to the sanctity of the temple repair which is but monetary sanctity our rabbis taught if blood was defiled and the priests sprinkled it unwittingly if the sacrifice is accepted Talmud, Ma Sebakim be it deliberately it is not accepted this was said only of a private sacrifice but a public sacrifice whether done unwittingly or deliberately is accepted but a heathen as sacrifice whether it is done. Unwittingly or deliberately is not accepted now the rabbi stated the following in our papa's presence with whom does this agree not with our Jose for if it agrees with our Jose surely he said I hold that a stringent view should be taken on all these matters said our papa to them you may even say that it agrees with our Jose there it is different because scripture says that it may be accepted for them before the Lord for them but not for even said our who not the son of our Nathan to our papa if so. When scripture says speak unto Aaron and to his sons that they separate themselves from the holy things of the children of Israel which they hallow unto me does that also mean they but not even rather said our ashi scripture says that it may be accepted for them whilst heathens are not subject to acceptance mission of the things which do not involve liability on account of pickle involve liability on account of nuthar and defilement except blood our Simeon declares one liable in respect of Anything which is normally eaten but the wood the frankincense and the incense do not involve liability on account of defilement tomorrow our rabbis taught you might think that liability on account of defilement is incurred only in respect of that which has met iron both for man and for the altar and that is logical if liability on account of pickle is incurred only in respect of that which has met iron both for man and for the altar though it is fixed and variable and is incurred in
have been offered if it has no matiran culpability is incurred as soon as it is sanctified in a sacred vessel we have thus found it of defilement how do we know it of not our identity of law with defilement is learned from the fact that profanation is written in both yet let us learn identity of law from pickle because iniquity is written in connection with both reason asserts that we should learn it from uncleanness because they are alike in respect of this being a mnemonic on the contrary one should learn it from pickle because it resembles it in the following points permissibility the head play cleanness time that which is offered and these are more numerous rather it is derived from levi's teaching for levi taught how do we know that the writ speaks of time disqualification too because it says that they profane not my holy name talmud mas se bakim talmud mas se bakim the writ speaks of two modes of profanation is the disqualification of nathar and the disqualification of defilement except blood etc once do we know it settle the scripture set for the life of the flesh is in the blood and i have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls this teaches it is yours the school of our ishmael taught to make atonement implies but not for trespass are you had and said scripture set it is which intimates it is before atonement as after atonement as there is no trespass after atonement so there is no trespass before Atonement say it is after atonement as before atonement as it involves trespass before atonement so it involves trespass after atonement nothing involves trespass once its function is performed does it not but lo there are the separated ashes that is because the separated ashes and the priestly vestments are taught in two texts which come for the same purpose and wherever two texts come for the same purpose they do not eliminate other cases that is well according to the rabbis who maintain that an Aaron shall put off the linen garments and shall leave them there teaches that they must be stored away but what can be said on the view of Ardosa who maintain that they are permitted to an ordinary priest only that he the high priest does not use them on another day of atonement because the separated ashes and the beheaded heifer are taught in two texts which come for the same purpose and wherever two texts come for the same purpose they do not eliminate other cases that is well on the view that they do not eliminate but what can be said on the view that they do eliminate two limitations are written here is written over the heifer whose neck was broken while there it says and he shall take up the ashes and he shall put them beside the altar now why do I need three texts in connection with blood one excludes it from trespass another from nathar and a third from defilement but no text is required for pickle for we learned whatever has matter and whether for man or for the altar involves liability on account of pickle whereas blood is itself a matter are you had and said for what purpose is correct stated three times in connection with peace offerings talmud mas sebakim be one to serve as a generalization the second as a particularization and the third is required in respect of things which are not eaten and according to our simian who maintain that the things which cannot be eaten do not involve liability on account of uncleanness what does it Included includes the inner sin offerings you might think that since our Simeon said whatever does not come on the outer altar like peace offerings does not involve liability on account of pickle then it does not involve liability on account of uncleanness either hence scripture informs us that it is not so said our Simeon that which is normally eaten etc it was stated our Yohanan and Reshlakish our Eliezer and our Jose son of our are the peers concerned in the following discussion one of the former peer and one of the latter peer one maintained the controversy in the mission refers to uncleanness of the flesh but in the case of personal uncleanness all agree that the offender is not flagellated but the other maintained as there is a controversy in the one case so is there in the other Rabbi said logic supports the view that as there is a controversy in the one case so is there in the other what is the reason since the text and the flesh that touch it any unclean thing is Applicable to it, then the text having his uncleanness upon him is applicable to it too. That is how Artabiomi recited this discussion. Arkahana recited the views of one of the former peer and one of the latter peer as referring to the final clause. One maintained the controversy refers to personal uncleanness, but in the case of uncleanness of flesh, all agree that he is flagellated, while the other maintained as there is a controversy in the one case, so is there in the other. Rabbi said logic supports the view that as there is a controversy in the one case, so is there in the other. What is the reason since the text having his uncleanness upon him is not applicable to it? The text and the flesh that touch it, any unclean thing is not applicable to it, but surely a master said, and the flesh is to include the wood and the frankincense that is a mere disqualification. Mission of the sacrifice is slaughtered for the sake of six things, for the sake of the sacrifice, for the sake of it. Sacrificer for the sake of the divine name, for the sake of fire offerings, for the sake of a savor, for the sake of pleasing and a sin offering, and a guilt offering, for the sake of sin. Our Jose said, even if one did not have any of these purposes in his heart, it is valid because it is a regulation of the Beth Din, since the intention is determined only by the celebrant. Gemara Rab Judah said in Rab's name, Scripture says it is a burnt offering, an offering made by fire, a pleasing savor unto the Lord. The burnt offering intimates that it must be slaughtered for the sake of a burnt offering, excluding where it is slaughtered for the sake of a peace offering, in which case it does not acquit the owner of his obligation. An offering made by fire intimates that it must be for the sake of an offering made by fire, excluding the charring of the meat, which is not valid. Savor intimates that it must be for the sake of a savor. This excludes the roasting of limbs elsewhere and bringing. Them up on the altar, which is not valid for Rab Judah said in Rab's name, if one roasted limbs and took them up onto the altar, they do not fulfill the requirements of savor pleasing intimates that it must be for the sake of pleasing the Lord, for the sake of him who spoke and called the world into existence. Rab Judah said in Rab's name, if one slaughtered a sin offering under the designation of a burnt offering, it is invalid. If one slaughtered it under the designation of Hullin, it is valid. Our Eliezer said, What is Rab's reason? And they shall not profane the holy things of the children of Israel. Holy things profane holy things, but Hullin does not profane holy things. Rab raised an objection. Our Jose said, Even if one did not have any of these purposes in his heart, it is valid because it is a regulation of the Beth Din, thus it is only because he had no purpose in his heart at all. Hence, if he intended it for the sake of Hullin, it is invalid, said Abbe to him, perhaps this. Deduction is to be made if he had no intention at all it is valid and propitiates while if he intended it for the sake of Holland it is valid but does not propitiate our Eliezer said if one slaughters a sin offering for the sake of Holland it is valid if one slaughtered it as Holland it is invalid this is as the question which Samuel asked Arhuna Talmud, Mas Sebakim how do we know that when one is unaware engaged in sacrifices if the sacrifice is invalid because it says and he shall kill the bullet before the Lord which intimates that the killing must be for the sake of the bullet we know this said he to him but how do we know that awareness is indispensable he shall slaughter it with your will said he which teaches slaughter it with your knowledge since the intention is determined only by the celebrant our mission does not agree with the following tenet for it was taught our Eliezer son of our Jose said I have heard that the owner of the sacrifice renders it pickle. Rabbi said, What is our Eliezer son of our Jose's reason? Because scripture says, Then shall he that offereth his offering present unto the Lord, etc. Abbe said, Our Eliezer son of our Jose, our Eliezer, and our Simeon, B. Eliezer, all hold that when one expresses an intention while another performs the act, it is an effective intention. Our Eliezer son of our Jose, this view that we have stated, our Eliezer, as we learned, if one slaughters for a heathen, his Chechetta is fit, but our Eliezer declares it unfit, our Simeon, B. Eliezer, as it was taught, our Simeon, B. Eliezer stated a general rule that which is not fit to put away, and such is not generally put away, yet it did become fit to a certain person, and he did put it away, and then another came and carried it out. The latter is rendered liable through the former's intention. Now both of them agree with our Eliezer son of our Jose. If we say thus without, is there a question about within our Eliezer son of our Jose does not agree with the other two, perhaps he ruled us only. In reference to within but not in reference to without our Simeon B. Eliezer agrees with our Eliezer if we say thus in connection with the Sabbath is there a question about idolatry our Eliezer does not agree with our Simeon B. Eliezer perhaps he ruled us only in connection with idolatry because it is similar to within but in the case of the Sabbath the Torah interdicted only a considered labor C-H-A-P-T-E-R-V Mishnah which is the place for the rites of sacrifices the slaughtering of sacrifices of the higher sanctity is at the north side of the altar the slaughtering of the bullock and the he of the day of atonement is done at the north and the reception of their blood is performed with service vessels at the north and their blood requires sprinkling between the staves
Offering their slaughtering is at the north and the reception of their blood is done with the service vessel at the north. At first he thought that the blood was received in the hand and so he omitted it but when he saw that it cannot be done adequately without a vessel also being used he re-included it for it was taught and the priest shall take of the blood of the guilt offering you might think with a vessel but scripture adds and the priest shall put it etc as the pudding must be by. The very priest himself so the taking must be by the very priest himself you might think that it is likewise for the altar therefore scripture states for as the sin offering so is the guilt offering as the sin offering requires a vessel for the reception of the blood so does the guilt offering require a vessel thus you must conclude that two priests received the blood of a leper's guilt offering one in his hand and the other in a vessel he who received it in a vessel went to the altar and he who received it in his hand went to the leper Talmud, Ma Sebakim as for the bullock and the goat of the Day of Atonement etc. Consider the north side of the altar is written in connection with the burnt offering then let him teach about the burnt offering first because this is deduced about the sin offering by exegesis he cherishes it more than let him teach the other sin offerings first because the blood of these which he does enumerate enters the inner sanctuary he cherishes. It more now where is the north written in connection with the burnt offering and he shall kill it on the side of the altar northward we have thus found it of the flocks how do we know it of the herd scripture set and we of his offering be of the flock above and continues the preceding section so that the subject above may be deduced from that below that is well on the view that you can learn the subject above from that below but on the view that you cannot learn it thus. What can be said for it was taught and if any one sin etc. This teaches that one is liable to a guilt offering of suspense on account of doubtful trespass that is our act of his ruling but the sages exempt him surely then they disagree and this one master holds that we learn the subject above from that below while the other master holds that we do not learn it said our papa all agree that we do learn thus but this is the rabbi's reason Mizwath is employed here and Mizwath is employed in connection. With the sin offering of forbidden fat as there it means a law whose deliberate infringement entails kareth and its unwitting infringement entails a sin offering so here too it is entailed only by that whose deliberate infringement entails kareth while its unwitting infringement involves a sin offering and our akiva as there it is fixed so here it is fixed thus excluding the sin offering for the defilement of the sanctuary and its sacred object sacrifices which is variable and the rabbis. There is no semi gazerishawa but our akiva too surely admits that there is no semi gazerishawa that indeed is so here however they differ in this our akiva holds and if a soul is written and the bob indicates conjunction with the preceding subject but according to the rabbis too surely it is written and if a soul shall we say that they differ in this one master holds that a hekish is stronger while the other master holds that a gazerishawa is stronger no all agree that the gazerishawa Shawah is stronger but the rabbis can answer you the subject below is learned from that above that the guilt offering must be two silver shekels in value so that you should not say surely the doubt cannot be more stringent than the certainty as the certainty of sin requires a sin offering even a sixth of azuz in value so for the doubt a guilt offering of a sixth of azuz is sufficient now how does our Akiva know this he deduces it from the text and this is the law of the guilt offering which intimates that there is one law for all guilt offerings that is well on the view that law can be so interpreted but on the view that law cannot be so interpreted whence does he derive it he derives it from the repetition of according to the valuation but what can be said of the guilt offering of a maidservant promised in marriage where according to the valuation is not written he derives it from the repetition of with the ram how do we know that a sin offering Requires the north because it is written and he shall kill the sin offering in the place of the burnt offering we have found it of slaughtering how do we know it of receiving because it is written and the priest shall take of the blood of the sin offering how do we know that the receiver himself must stand in the north the text says and he shall take which intimates he shall betake himself to the place where the blood is received we have thus found it as a regulation how do we know that it is indispensable another text is written and he shall kill it for a sin offering in the place where they kill the burnt offering and it was taught where is the burnt offering slaughtered in the north so this too is slaughtered in the north Talmud Ma Sebakim be do you then learn it from this verse is it not already stated in the place where the burnt offering is killed shall the sin offering be killed why then has this been singled out to fix the place for it so that if one did not slaughter it in the north it is invalid you say it has been singled out for this purpose yet perhaps it is not so but rather to teach that this one alone requires the north but no other requires the north therefore it states and he shall kill the sin offering in the place of the burnt offering thus constituting a general law in respect of all sin offerings that they require the north we have thus found it true of a prince's sin offering that it is both a recommendation and indispensable we have also found it as a recommendation in the case of other sin offerings how do we know that it is indispensable for other sin offerings because it is written in reference to both the lamb and the she goat and what is the purpose of it that is required for what was taught it is slaughtered on the north but Nashan's goat was not slaughtered in the north and it was taught and he shall lay his hand upon the head of the goat includes Nashan's goat in respect of laying. Hence that is our Judas view our Simeon said it includes the goats brought on account of idolatry in respect of laying hands you might argue since they are included in respect of laying hands they are included in respect of the north hence we are informed otherwise to this Rubin Adamur that is well on our Judas view but what can be said on our Simeon said Marzitra son of Armari to Rubin and is it well on our Judas view surely where it is included it is included and where it is not included it is not included and should you say had scripture not excluded its inclusion would be inferred by analogy if so let laying hands itself be inferred by analogy but you must answer that a temporary sacrifice cannot be inferred from a permanent one so here too a temporary sacrifice cannot be inferred from a permanent one rather it teaches this it is slaughtered in the north but the slaughter need not be in the north but the law concerning the slaughter is Deduced by Arya's exegesis for it was taught Arya said and he shall kill it on the side of the altar northward why is this stated because we find that the receiving priest must stand in the north and receive the blood in the north while if he stood in the south and received the blood in the north it is invalid you might think that this slaughtering is likewise therefore scripture states and he shall kill it intimating that it must be in the north but the slaughterer need not be in the north rather it teaches this it must be killed in the north but a bird does not need the north for it was taught you might think that a bird offering needs the north and this is indeed logical if scripture prescribed north for a lamb though it did not prescribe a priest for it is it not logical that it should prescribe north for a bird seeing that it did prescribe a priest for it therefore it is stated no as for a lamb the reason is because scripture prescribed the utensil for it rather it teaches this it must be killed in the north but the Passover offering need not be slaughtered in the north for it was taught our Eliezer B. Jacob said you might think that a Passover offering needs the north and this is indeed logical if scripture prescribed the north for a burnt offering though it did not prescribe a fixed season for its slaughtering is it not logical that it should prescribe the north for a Passover offering seeing that it did prescribe a fixed season for its slaughtering therefore it is stated no as for a burnt offering the reason is because it is altogether burnt then learn it from a sin offering as for a sin offering the reason is because it makes atonement for those who are liable to correct then learn it from a guilt offering no as for a guilt offering the reason is because it is a most sacred sacrifice and you cannot learn it from all these likewise because they are most sacred sacrifices after all it is as we said originally it must be in the north but the slaughterer need not be in the north and as to your difficulty that is deduced from Arya's exegesis the answer is that it does not really exclude the slaughterer from the north but is meant thus the slaughterer need not be in the north whence it follows that the receiver must be in the north the receiver surely that is deduced from and he shall take which we interpret let him betake himself to the north he does not interpret and he shall take as meaning let him betake himself we have thus found a recommendation that slaughtering a burnt offering must be in the north and a similar recommendation about receiving how do we know that the north is indispensable in the case of slaughtering and receiving said are at a of other state rabbi Bishila it is deduced a for if it is indispensable in the case of a sin offering which is only learned from a burnt offering surely it is logical that it is indispensable in the case of a burnt offering from which a sin offering is learned no as for a sin offering the reason is because it makes atonement for those who are liable to Karath said Rabbanah this is our addis difficulty do we ever find the secondary more stringent than the primary said Marzitra son of Armari
requires the north because it is written in the place where they kill the burnt offering shall they kill the guilt offering we have thus found it of slaughtering how do we know it of receiving because it is written and the blood thereof shall be dashed etc which teaches that the receiving of its blood too must be in the north how do we know that the receiver himself must stand in the north and its blood is written where its blood alone would suffice we have thus found it as a recommendation how do we know that it is indispensable another text is written and he shall kill the he lamb in the place where they kill the sin offering and the burnt offering now does that come for the present purpose surely it is required for what was taught if anything was included in a general proposition and was then singled out for a new law you cannot restore it to the terms of its general proposition unless the writ explicitly restores it to the terms of its general proposition how so scripture saith and he shall kill the elam in the place where they kill the sin offering and the guilt offering in the place of the sanctuary for as the sin offering so is the guilt offering it is the priest it is most holy now as the sin offering so is the guilt offering need not be said why then is as the sin offering so is the guilt offering said because a leper's guilt offering was singled out and made subject to a new law is that in respect of the thumb of the hand of big toe of the foot and the right ear you might think that it does not require the presentation of its blood and immurim at the altar therefore scripture says as the sin offering so is the guilt offering as the sin offering requires the presentation of its blood and immurim at the altar so does a leper's guilt offering require the presentation of blood and immurim at the altar if so let it be written in the latter passage and not in the former now that is well if we hold that when anything is Made the subject of a new law, it cannot be learned from its general law Talmud, Ma can be, but its general law can be learned from it, then it is correct, but if we hold that neither can it be learned from the general proposition, nor can the general proposition be learned from it, then this law is required for its own purpose, since scripture restored it, it restored it, Marzitra son of Armari said to Rabbanah, yet say when scripture restored it to the general proposition, it was only in respect of the presentation of the blood and emurim, since this requires priesthood, but slaughtering which does not require priesthood does not require the north either, if so let scripture say for it is as a sin offering, why stay for as a sin offering, so is the guilt offering to teach, let it be like the other guilt offerings, why must it be likened to both a sin offering and a guilt offering, said Rabbanah, it is necessary if it were likened to a sin offering and were not likened to a Guilt offering I would say once did we learn that a sin offering is slaughtered in the north from a burnt offering thus that which is learned through a hekish in turn teaches through a hekish marzit or the son of Armari said to Rabbanah then let it be likened to a burnt offering and not likened to a sin offering then I would say that elsewhere that which is learned through a hekish in turn teaches through a hekish and if you object then let it be likened to a sin offering I could reply it scripture prefers to liken it to the principal rather than to the secondary therefore it likened it to a sin offering and it likened it to a burnt offering thus intimating that that which is learned through a hekish does not in turn teach through a hekish Rabbah said it is learned from the following for it is written as is taken off from the ox of the sacrifice of peace offerings for what purpose is this written if for the lobe of the liver and the two kidneys surely that is Written in the body of the text, but because scripture wishes to intimate that the burning of the lobe of the liver and the two kidneys of the he goats brought as sin offerings for idolatry shall be learned by analogy from the community's bullock for a sin offering on account of sinning and unawareness, whereas this law is not explicitly stated in the passage on the bullock of unawareness, but is learned from the anointed priest's bullock, therefore, as is taken off is required so that it might count as written in that very passage and not as something which is learned through a hekish and then in turn teaches through a hekish said our papa to Rabbah, then let scripture write it in its own context and not assimilate it to the anointed priest's bullock. If scripture wrote it in its own context and did not teach it by assimilation, I would say that which is learned through a hekish can in turn teach through a hekish, and if you object, then let scripture assimilate it, I could. Answer that scripture prefers to write it explicitly in its own context rather than to teach it through a hekish. Therefore, scripture wrote it and assimilated it in order to teach that that which is learned through a hekish does not in turn teach through a hekish. Nimad hekish and gazurish wa kalw homer. It is agreed that that which is learned through a hekish does not in turn teach through a hekish. This being learned either by rabbis or by rabbis exegesis can that which is learned through a hekish teach through a gazurish wa And here our Nathan B. Abtalamo said, Once do we know that a spreading outbreak of leprosy in garments covering the whole is clean? Kara hath baldness of the back of the head and gamma hath baldness of the front are mentioned in connection with garments and also in connection with man. Just as in the latter, if the plague spread over the whole skin, he is clean. So in the former too, if it spread over the whole garment, it is clean. And how do we know it there because it is written and if the leprosy cover all the skin from his head even to his feet and thereby his head is assimilated through a hekish to his feet as there when it is all turned white having broken out all over him he is clean so here too when it breaks out all over him he is clean said are you hanan in the whole Torah we rule that whatever is learned can teach save in the case of sacrifices where we do not rule that whatever is learned can teach for if it were so that we did rule thus let northward not be said in connection with the guilt offering and it could be inferred from sin offerings by the gazurish it is most holy surely then its purpose is to teach that that which is learned by a hekish does not in turn teach through a gazurish but perhaps we do not learn it there because one can refute it as for a sin offering it requires north because it makes atonement for those who are liable to the superfluous most Holy is written that which is learned through a hekish teaches in turn by KALW Homer Talmud, Ma Sevaki made this follows from what the school of our Ishmael taught that which is learned through a hekish can it teach through a binyan of said our Jeremiah let northward not be written in connection with a guilt offering and it could be inferred from a sin offering by a binyan of for what purpose then is it written surely to intimate that that which is learned through a hekish cannot in turn teach through a binyan of yet according to your reasoning let it be inferred from a burnt offering by a binyan of why then is it not so inferred because you can refute it as for a burnt offering it requires the north because it is altogether burnt so in the case of a sin offering too you can refute it as for a sin offering it requires the north because it makes atonement for those who are liable to Garth one cannot be learned from one but let one be learned from the other two from which could it be derived? Will you say let the divine law not write it in the case of a burnt offering and it could be derived from a sin offering and a guilt offering? Then you can argue as for these they require the north because they make atonement. Let not the divine law write it in respect of a sin offering and let it be derived from the others. Then you can argue as for those the reason is because they are males. Let not the divine law write it in connection with a guilt offering and let it be derived from the others. Then you can argue the reason is because they operate in the case of a community as in the case of an individual that which is learned by Gazerisha Wakanet in turn teach through a Hekish said our Papa it was taught and this is the law of the sacrifice of peace offerings. If he offers it for a thanksgiving from this we learn that a thanksgiving can be brought from tithe since we find that a peace offering can be brought from tithe and how do we know this of a peace offering itself because there is written in each case said Marzitra the son of Armari to Rabbin of a corn tithe is merely holy and said he to him who says that which is learned must be holy and that which teaches must be holy can that which is learned by Gazerisha what teach by Gazerisha what said Rami Bihama it was taught of fine flour soaked Merbek this teaches that the Rebukah soaked cake must be of fine flour soaked how do we know the same of Halith because Halith is stated in both places how do we know it of Rikakin wafers because Matzoth unleavened bread is written in connection with each said Rabbin to him how do you know that he learns the Gazerisha what of Matzoth Matzoth from Halith perhaps he learns it from oven baked cakes rather said Rabbin it was taught and its inwards and its dung even the whole bullet shall he carry forth without the camp this teaches that he carries it forth whole you might think that he burns it whole but its head and its legs is stated here and its head and its legs is stated elsewhere as there it means after cutting up so here too it means after cutting up if so as there it is after the flaying of the skin so here too it means after the flaying therefore it says and its inwards and its tongue how does this teach the reverse said our papa just as its tongue is within it so must its flesh be within its skin and it was further taught rabbi said skin and flesh and dung are mentioned here talmud ma sevakim b and skin and flesh and dung are mentioned elsewhere as there it was burnt after being cut up but without flaying so here too it is burnt after being cut up but without fl
Dictum can nevertheless teach by Ahagish in accordance with our Papa, then KALWA Homer, which can be learned from Ahagish in accordance with the school of our Ishmael, can surely teach by Ahagish that is well on the view that accepts our Papa's dictum, but what can be said on the view that rejects our Papa's dictum, then the question stands can that which is learned by KALWA Homer teach in turn by Gazurisha, while yes, for this follows by KALWA Homer if Gazurisha, while which cannot be learned from Ahagish in accordance with our Yohan and can teach by Gazurisha, while in accordance with Rami Bihama, then is it not logical that KALWA Homer, which can be learned by Ahagish in accordance with the school of our Ishmael, can teach by Gazurisha, while can that which is learned by KALWA Homer teach in turn by KALWA Homer, yes, for this follows from KALWA Homer if Gazurisha, while which cannot be learned by Ahagish in accordance with our Yohan and can teach by KALWA Homer as we. Have just said that a KALWA Homer which can be learned from Ahagish in accordance with the school of our Ishmael is it not logical that it can teach by KALWA Homer and this is a KALWA Homer derived from KALWA Homer surely this is a secondary derivation from KALWA Homer rather argue thus yes and this follows from a KALWA Homer if Ahagish which cannot be learned through Ahagish in accordance with either Rabbah or Rabbah it can teach by KALWA Homer in accordance with the school of our Ishmael then a KALWA Homer which is learned through Ahagish in accordance with the school of our Ishmael can surely teach through a KALWA Homer and this is a KALWA Homer derived from KALWA Homer can that which is learned by KALWA Homer teach in turn through opinion of said our Jeremiah come and here if one wrong the neck of a bird sacrifice and it was found to be a tear our said it does not defile in the gullet our Judah said it does defile in the gullet said our it is a KAL W.A. Homer, if the Shechita of an animal cleanses it even when tearful from its uncleanness, yet when it is nibble, it defiles through contact or carriage. Is it not logical that Shechita cleanses a bird when tearful from its uncleanness, seeing that when it is nibble, it does not defile through touch or carriage? Now, as we have found that Shechita, which makes it a bird of Holland fit for eating Talmud, Moss Sebakim cleanses it when tearful from its uncleanness, so wringing the neck, which makes it a bird sacrifice fit for eating, cleanses it when tearful from its uncleanness. Our Jose said it is sufficient that it be like the nibble of a clean, i.e., edible animal which is cleansed by Shechita, but not by wringing its neck, yet that is not so even granted there that it is so, yet it is deduced from the Shechita of Holland, can that which is learned by Binyan of Teach by Ahagish or by Gazurish or by KALWA Homer or by Binyan of Solve one of the questions from it. Following, why did they say that if the blood is kept overnight on the altar, it is fit because if the emurim are kept overnight, they are fit? Why are the emurim fit if kept overnight? Because the flesh is fit if kept overnight. Flesh that goes out because flesh that goes out is fit at the high place. Bama unclean flesh because it was permitted in public service. The emurim of a burnt offering intended to be burnt after time because it propitiates in respect of its pickle status. The emurim of a burnt offering intended to be burnt out of bounds because it was likened to the intention to burn it after time where unfit persons received the blood and sprinkled it. In the case of those unfit persons who are eligible for public service, can you then argue from what is its proper way to that where the same is not the proper way? The tanner relies on the extension indicated by this is the law of the burnt offering, the residue of the blood, etc. What is the reason? Scripture. Set and all the remaining blood of the bullet shall he pour out at the base of the altar of burnt offering which is at the door of the tent of meeting this intimates the one which you first meet our rabbis taught at the base of the altar of burnt offering but not at the base of the inner altar at the base of the altar of burnt offering the inner altar itself has no base at the base of the altar of burnt offering apply the laws of the base to the altar of burnt offering yet perhaps that is not so rather it intimates let there be a base to the altar of burnt offering said our Ishmael this would follow a fortiori if the residue of the blood of the sin offering which does not make atonement requires the base then surely the sprinkling itself of the blood of the burnt offering which makes atonement requires the base said our Akiba too this would follow a fortiori if the residue which does not make atonement and does not come for atonement requires the base is it not Logical that the sprinkling itself of the blood of the burnt offering which makes atonement and comes for atonement requires the base if so why does scripture state at the base of the altar of burnt offering to teach apply the laws of the base to the altar of burnt offering the master said at the base of the altar of burnt offering but not at the base of the inner altar surely that is required for its own purpose that is learned from which is at the door of the tent of meeting at the base of the altar of burnt offering Talmud, Mas Sebakim be apply the laws of the base to the altar of burnt offering for if you think that it is meant literally as written why do I need a text in respect of the residue seeing that the pouring out of the residue was performed without end should you say that but for the text I would argue that it is indeed reverse Talmud, Mas Sebakim made the residue of the inner offerings on the outer altar and that of the outer offerings on it. Inner altar surely the inner altar had no base yet perhaps that is not so rather it intimates let there be a base to the altar of burnt offering but is it written at the base of the burnt offering surely it is written at the base of the altar of burnt offering if at the base of the burnt offering were written I would say that it means on the vertical wall of the base now that it is written at the base of the altar of burnt offering it denotes on the rooftop of the base thereupon are Ishmael said for the roof of the base why do I need a text this would follow a fortiori if the residue of the blood of the sin offering which does not make atonement requires the roof and the sprinkling itself of the blood of the burnt offering which makes atonement is it not logical that it requires the roof of the base said Arakiba if the residue of the blood of the sin offering which does not make atonement and does not come for atonement requires the roof of the base is it not Logical that the sprinkling itself of the blood of the burnt offering which makes atonement and comes for atonement requires the roof of the altar if so why does scripture state at the base of the altar of burnt offering to teach apply the laws of the base to the altar of burnt offering wherein do they differ set are at a but they disagree as to whether the pouring out of the residue is indispensable one master holds it is indispensable while the other master holds it is not indispensable our papa said all agree that the residue is not indispensable but here they disagree as to whether the draining out of the blood of the burnt sin offering is indispensable or not one master holds that it is indispensable while the other master holds that it is not indispensable it was taught in accordance with our papa and all the remaining blood of the bullock shall he pour out at the base of the altar why is the bullock stated it teaches that the day of atonement bullock must have its blood poured out at the base that is the view of our Akiva said our Ishmael this is inferred a fortiori if that whose blood does not enter within as a statutory obligation needs a base that whose blood enters within as a statutory obligation is it not logical that it needs a base said our Akiva if that whose blood does not enter the innermost sanctuary either as a statutory obligation or as a regulation needs a base that whose blood enters the innermost sanctuary as a statutory obligation is it not logical that it needs a base you might think that it is indispensable for it therefore it states and he shall make an end of atoning which teaches all the atoning services are now complete these are the words of our Ishmael now and a fortiori argument can be made in respect of the anointed priest's bullock if that whose blood does not enter within either as a statutory obligation or as a regulation needs a base that whose blood enters within both as a statutory obligation and as a Regulation is it not logical that it needs a base you might think that it is indispensable for it therefore scripture says and all the remaining blood of the bullock shall he pour out the rid transmits it into the remainder of a precept to teach you that the pouring out of the residue is not indispensable now does our Ishmael hold that the draining of the blood of the bird sin offering is indispensable surely the school of our Ishmael taught and the rest of the blood shall be drained out. That which is left must be drained out Talmud, Mas Sebakim be but what is not left is not drained out there is a controversy of two Tanaim as to our Ishmael's opinion Rami Bihama said the following Tana holds that the pouring out of the residue is indispensable for it was taught this is the law of the sin offering the priest that offered it for sin shall eat it this teaches only that sin offering whose blood was sprinkled above the red line but not that whose blood was applied. Below say whence did you come to this from the implication of what is said and the blood of thy sacrifices shall be poured out and thou shalt eat the flesh we learned that if the blood of those sacrifices
Inner altar does not complete it, surely it must refer to the residue of the blood said Rabbi to him. If so, you could infer it a menorah of the blood of the inner sacrifices of which eventually the residue is obligatory without yet if presented without in the first place he does not make atonement, then the blood which is to be sprinkled above and is not eventually obligatory below. Is it not logical that if he applied it at the outset below he does not make atonement? Rather, the meaning is this. Not the altar alone completes it, but also the veil our rabbis taught, and he shall make an end of atoning if he atoned, he made an end, while if he did not atone, he did not make an end. This is our Akiba's view said our Judah to him. Why should we not interpret if he made an end, he atoned, while if he did not make an end, he did not atone, which thus intimates that if he omitted one of the sprinklings, his service is ineffective, wherein do they differ? Our Yohanan and our Joshua believe I disagree, one maintains. They differ on the mode of interpretation, the other maintains they differ as to whether the pouring out of the residue is indispensable. It may be proved that it was our Joshua B. Levi who maintained that the pouring out of the residue is indispensable. For our Joshua B. Levi said on the view that the residue is indispensable, he brings another bullock and commences with him. But does our Yohanan not hold this view? Surely our Yohanan said our Nehemiah taught in accordance with the view that the residue is indispensable, but you must say in accordance with the view, but not that of these Tanaim. Then here too on the view does not refer to that of these Tanaim mission of public and private sin offerings. These are the public sin offerings. The egots of new moons and festivals are slaughtered in the north, and their blood is received in a service vessel in the north, and their blood requires four applications on the four horns. How was it done? Talmud, Ma Sebakim, he went up this and turned to the Surrounding balcony and passed on successively to the southeast, the northeast, the northwest, and the southwest corners. The residue of the blood he poured out at the southern base. They were eaten within the hangings by male priests prepared in any fashion the same day and night until midnight tomorrow. How did he do it? Or Yohanan and our Eliezer disagree. One maintained he applied it within a cubit in either direction. The other maintained he applied it with a downward movement on the edge of the horn on the view of our Eliezer, son of Arsimian, who said that its blood is applied essentially on the very horn of the altar. There is no dispute at all. They differ on Rabbi's view. One master holds that a cubit in either direction is also against the horn, while the other master holds only at the edge, and no further an objection is raised. How was the blood of the public and the private sin offerings applied? He went up the ascent, turned to the surrounding balcony, and passed on to the south. East horn where he dipped his right finger, i.e. the index finger of his right hand, into the blood in the bowl and supported it with his thumb on the side and his little finger on the other and applied it with a downward movement against the edge of the horn until all the blood on his finger was gone and thus he did at every horn. This is what he means. Its regulation is that it be applied at the edge. Yet if he applies it within a cubit in either direction, we have no objection. What was this? Allusion to Rabbi and our Eliezer, son of Arsimian, as it was taught, the upper blood is applied above the scarlet line and the lower blood is applied below the scarlet line. That is Rabbi's view. Our Eliezer, son of Arsimian, said this holds good only of a burnt offering of a bird, but in the case of an animal sin offering, its blood is applied essentially on the very horn. Our Rabbi said, What is Rabbi's reason? Because it is written, and the altar shall be four cubits and from the altar and upward there. Shall be four horns now was the altar only four cubits said our Adabi Ahaba it means and the place of the horns was four cubits did the horns occupy four cubits say rather the limits of the horns were four cubits we learned elsewhere a scarlet line encompassed it about the middle to distinguish between the upper and the lower bloods whence do we know it said our Ahabi our Katna because it said that the net may reach halfway up the altar thus the Torah prescribed the barrier to distinguish between the upper and the lower bloods the residue of the blood etc our rabbis taught at the base of the altar means the southern base you say the southern base yet perhaps it is not so but rather the western base and the undefined is learned from the defined you can answer we infer his coming down the ascent from his exit from the hikal as his exit from the hikal was to the nearest side so his coming down the ascent was to the nearest side it was taught our Ishmael said in both cases the western Bases meant Arsimian Bio, he said in both cases the southern base is meant as for him who maintains that both were poured out at the western base it is well he holds that the undefined is learned from the defined but what is his reason who holds that the southern base is meant in both cases said R.C. this Tana maintains that the whole altar stood in the north another version the whole entrance stood to the south Talmud, Ma Sebakim B the school of our Ishmael taught in Arsimian B. Yo, he's ruling in both cases the western base is meant and your token is meant pulled the man mission of the burnt offering is a sacrifice of higher sanctity it is slaughtered in the north and its blood is received in a service vessel in the north and its blood requires two applications which are for it had to be flayed dismembered and completely consumed by the fire tomorrow why does he teach that the burnt offering is a sacrifice of higher sanctity because it is most holy is not written in its case. And its blood requires two applications, which are for how did he do it? Rab said he applied the blood and applied it again. Samuel said he made a single application in the shape of a Greek gamma. This is a controversy of Tanaim, and the priests shall dash the blood round about the altar. You might think that he sprinkles it with a single sprinkling. Therefore, Scripture states round about if round about. You might think that he must encompass it with blood like a thread. Therefore, Scripture states and they shall dash how then is it done? Its blood requires two applications in the shape of a Greek gamma, which constitute for our Ishmael said round about is said here and round about is said elsewhere. As there it means four separate applications. So here too it means four separate applications. If so, just as there it means four applications on the four horns. So here too it means four applications on the four horns. You can answer the burnt offering needs a base, whereas it. Southeast horn had no base. What was the reason? Said our Eliezer because it was not in the portion of the raven. For our Samuel son of our Isaac said the altar occupied a cubit in Judah's portion. Our Levi Bihama said in our Hamas son of our Hannah's name a strip issued from Judah's portion and entered Benjamin's portion. Whereat the righteous Benjamin grieved every day, wishing to possess it as it is said Talmud. Ma Sebakim Talmud. Ma Sebakim yearning for him all day. Therefore was Benjamin privileged to become a host to the Holy One. Blessed be he as it is said and he dwelleth between his shoulders. An objection is raised. How was the burnt offering of a bird sacrificed? He the priest pinched off its head, closed by its neck, and divided it and drained out its blood on the wall of the altar. Now if you say that it had no base, did he simply apply it in the air? Said our Naman B Isaac. Perhaps they thus stipulated that the air space should count as Benjamin's and the soil as Judah's. What? Does it had no base mean Rab said in the construction our Levi said in respect of blood now Rab interpreted the text just quoted in his Benjamin's heritage shall the altar be built while Levi interpreted it in his heritage shall the sanctuary be built which means a place sanctified for the reception of blood come and here the base ran along the whole of the north and the west sides and extended one cubit into the south and one cubit into the east by extended his meant in respect of blood. Come and here the altar was thirty two cubits by thirty two this was the side length come and here thus it was found that it overhung a cubit over the base and a cubit over the balcony say a cubit corresponding to the base area and a cubit of the balcony come and here for Levi taught how did they build the altar they brought a frame thirty two cubits square and one cubit deep and they brought round smooth stones of all sizes and they brought plaster molded lead and pitch melted them down. And poured them in, and this was the place of the base. Then they brought a frame thirty cubits square and five cubits deep, and they brought smooth stones, etc. And this was the place of the balcony. Then they brought a frame twenty-eight cubits square and three cubits deep, and they brought smooth stones, etc. And this was the place of the wood pile. Then they brought a frame one cubit square, and they brought smooth round stones of all sizes and pitch and molded lead melted them down and poured them in. And this formed the horn. And similarly for each horn, and should you answer Talmud, Ma Sevakim, be that he subsequently cut it away. Surely unhewn whole stones are prescribed. They placed a plank there and then removed it. For if you will not say thus, when Arkahana said the horns were hollow, for it is written, and they shall be filled like the basins, like the horns of the altar. Here too you may object that the divine law prescribed whole stones, but you must answer that something. Was first placed there and then removed. So here two planks were first placed there and then removed. Rabba lectured what is meant by the
And for this dove the Edomite envied David as it is written because envy on account of thy house hath eaten me up and it is written Lord remember unto David all his affliction how he swore unto the Lord and vowed unto the mighty one of Jacob surely I will not come into the tent of my house nor go up into the bed that is spread for me I will not give sleep to mine eyes nor slumber to mine eyelids until I find out a place for the Lord a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob lo we heard of it. As being in Ephrath we found it in the field of the forest in Ephrath means in the book of Joshua who Joshua was descended from Ephraim in the field of the forest alludes to the territory of Benjamin as it is written Benjamin is a wolf that raved Nephmish the peace offerings of the congregation and the guilt offerings these are the guilt offerings the guilt offering for robbery for trespass for a betrothed bond made a Nazarite's guilt offering a leper's guilt offering and the guilt offering of suspense are slaughtered in the north and their blood is received in a service vessel in the north and their blood requires two sprinklings which constitute four and they are eaten within the hangings by male priests prepared in any manner a day and a night until midnight Talmud Mosseva King Gemara how do we know that it requires the north as Rabbah son of Arhain and recited before Rabbah and Yeshal offer one he goat for a sin offering and two he lambs of the first year for a Sacrifice of peace offerings as a sin offering requires the north so must the peace offerings of the congregation be slaughtered in the north said Rabbah to him now whence do we learn this about a sin offering from a burnt offering condemned that which is learned through a Hekish teaching turn through a Hekish rather said Rabbah it follows from what Armari the son of Arkahana recited Yeshal blow with the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings as a burnt offering was a sacrifice of higher sanctity so were the public peace offering sacrifices of higher sanctity as a burnt offering was slaughtered in the north so were the public peace offering slaughtered in the north now what is the purpose of the first Hekish to teach that it is like a sin offering as a sin offering is eaten by male priests only so are public peace offerings eaten by male priests only said Abbe to him Rabbah if so when it is written in connection with a Nazarite's ram and he shall present his offering unto the Lord one ulam of the first year without blemish for a burnt offering and one ulam of the first year without blemish for a sin offering and one ram without blemish for a peace offering will you say that here too the divine law assimilated to a sin offering as a sin offering may be eaten by male priest only so the Nazarite's ram may be eaten by male priest only how compare there since it is written and the priest shall take the shoulder of the ram when it is sodden this is holy for the priest it follows that the whole of it is eaten by its owner but at least the shoulder that is sodden should be eaten by male priest only that is a difficulty alternatively you can answer it is called holy but not most holy then in respect of which law is it assimilated said Robert to teach that if he shaves himself after one sacrifice of the three he fulfills his duty mission of the thanks offering and the Nazarite's ram are sacrifices of lesser sanctity they are slaughtered anywhere in the temple court and their blood requires two sprinklings which constitute four and they are eaten in any part of the city by any person prepared in any manner the same day and the night following until midnight the parts thereof which are separated are governed by the same law save that these are eaten only by the priests their wives their children and their slaves Gemara our rabbis taught in the breast of waving and it thy of heaving shall ye eat in a clean place said our Nehemiah did they then eat the earlier sacrifices in uncleanness rather clean implies that it is partially unclean thus it means clean from the defilement of a leper but unclean with the uncleanness of a zab and which places that the camp of the Israelites yet say that it means clean from the defilement of a zab yet unclean with the defilement of the dead and which places that the Levitical camp set of a scripture set and Ye shall eat at the meal offering in a holy place it must be eaten in a holy place but another need not be eaten in a holy place thus withdrawing it from the camp of the divine presence into the Levitical camp and in a clean place is written which withdraws it into the camp of the Israelites Rabbah said it must be eaten in a holy place but another need not be eaten in a holy place withdraws it altogether then the divine Lord in a clean place thereby bringing it into the Israelites camp yet say that it brought it into the Levitical camp we bring it back into one camp not into two if so you can also argue in respect of withdrawing we withdraw it from one but not from two moreover it is written thou mayest not eat within the gates etc rather it clearly must be explained as a mission of the peace offering is a sacrifice of lesser sanctity it may be slain in any part of the temple court and its blood requires two sprinklings which constitute four and it may be eaten in any part of the city by any person prepared in any way during two days and one night the parts thereof which are separated are similar save that these are eaten by priests their wives their sons and their slaves Gemara our rabbis taught and he shall kill it at the door of the tent of meeting and he shall kill it before the tent of meeting and he shall kill it before the tent of meeting this teaches that all sides of the temple court are fit in the case of sacrifices of lesser sanctity and the north side of Forshiori of sacrifices of higher sanctity which were not made fit for slaughtering on all sides are fit on the north is it not logical that sacrifices of lesser sanctity which are fit on all sides are fit in the north our Eliezer said the rid comes specifically to declare the north fit for you might say is not the reverse logical if sacrifices of lesser sanctity which are fit on all sides yet their place is not fit for sacrifices of higher sanctity then Sacrifices of higher sanctity which are permitted in the north only is it not logical that their particular place is not permitted for sacrifices of lesser sanctity therefore the tent of meeting is stated Talmud, Ma Sevakim beware and do they differ the first tana holds three texts are written one is for its own purpose to intimate that the door of the tent of meeting is required the second is to permit the sides and the third is to invalidate the sides of the sides while no text is necessary for the north whereas our Eliezer holds one is for its own purpose to intimate that the door of the tent of meeting is required the second is to permit the north and the third is to permit the sides but no text is required in respect of the sides of the sides why is the door of the tent of meeting written in one case whereas before the tent of meeting is written in the others we are thereby informed of Rab Judah's teaching in Samuel's name for Rab Judah said in Samuel's name if a peace. Offering is slaughtered before the doors of the Hekal are opened it is invalid for it is said and he shall kill it at the entrance opening of the tent of meeting when it is opened but not when it is shut it was stated likewise Marak Babi Hamas said in Arhose son of Arhana's name if one slaughtered a peace offering before the doors of the Hekal were opened it is invalid because it is said and he shall kill it at the entrance opening of the tent of meeting when it is open and not when it is shut in the West Palestine they recited it thus Arahabi Jacob said in Arashi's name if a peace offering is slaughtered before the doors of the Hekal are opened it is invalid in the tabernacle if it is slaughtered before the Levites set up the tabernacle or after the Levites take down the tabernacle it is invalid it is obvious that if it is shut it is as though it were locked what if a curtain shuts it off said Arzera that itself is made only for an open door what of an elevation come and here for it was taught our Jose B. R. Judah said there were two wickets in the knives recess and their elevation was eight cubits in order that the whole of the temple court might be made fit for the consumption of sacrifices of higher sanctity and the slaughtering of sacrifices of lower sanctity does this not mean that an elevation eight cubits high stood before them these wickets no it means that they themselves were eight cubits high and objection is raised all the gates there were twenty cubits high and ten cubits wide the wickets were different but there were the sides they were built at the corners what about the space behind the place of the mercy seat Kippurath come and here for Rami son of Rab Judah said in Rab's name there was a small passageway behind the place of the mercy seat in order to make the whole temple court fit for the consumption of most holy sacrifices and the slaughtering of minor sacrifices and there were two such and thus it is written and to Lepa Arbar, what does Lepa Arbar mean? Said Rabbah son of Arshila, as one says, facing without Kalap. Lepa Rab Judah said in Samuel's name, liability for uncleanness is incurred. Talmud, Masavakim, only in respect of an area 187 cubits in length by 135 in breadth. Aitana recited before Arnam, and the whole temple court was 187 cubits in length by 135 in breadth. Said he to him, thus did my father. Say within such an area, the priests entered, consumed the most holy, and slaughtered the minor sacrifices there, and were liable for uncleanness. What does this exclude? Shall we say that it excludes the windows, doors, and the thickness of the wall? Surely we learned the
Consider when you say you may not slaughter are we not discussing a case where the Shechita is opposite the entrance for if it is not why is it necessary to teach it hence you must admit that although you would slaughter opposite the entrance yet he teaches you may not slaughter because they are not sanctified then learn also they do not involve culpability now do we not require the consumption to be facing the entrance surely our Jose son of Arhanan had taught there were two wickets in the knives recess and their elevation was eight cubits in order to make the temple court fit for the eating of most sacred sacrifices and the slaughtering of minor sacrifices said Robin to delete eating from this passage but it is written boil the flesh at the door of the tent of meeting and there eat temporary sacrifices are different our Isaac Beobudimi said how do we know that the blood is invalidated by sunset because it says it shall be eaten on the day that he offered his slaughtering on it. Day that you slaughter you can offer on the day that you do not slaughter you cannot offer but this text is needed Talmud, Ma Sebakim be for its own purpose if so let scripture say it shall be eaten on the day of its slaughtering what is the purpose of that he offered infer from it on the day that you slaughter you can offer on the day that you do not slaughter you cannot offer yet perhaps this is what the divine law means if he the priest presents the blood on the same day you may eat the flesh on the same day and on the next while if he presents the blood on the morrow you may eat the flesh on the morrow and on the day after if so let scripture write it shall be eaten on the day that he offered what is the purpose of his slaughtering infer from it on the day that you slaughter you can offer on the day that you do not slaughter you cannot offer it was stated if one intends eating the flesh on the evening of the third day Hezekiah said it the sacrifice is fit are you hand Said it is unfit Hezekiah said it is fit seeing that it was not yet relegated to the fire Aryohanan said it is unfit seeing that it is rejected from eating if one eats the flesh on the evening of the third day Hezekiah maintained he is exempt seeing that it was not yet relegated to the fire Aryohanan maintained he is culpable seeing that it was rejected from eating it was taught in accordance with Aryohanan with regard to sacrifices which are eaten on the same day only an intention is effective in respect of their blood from sunset and in respect of their flesh and their immurim from dawn but as to sacrifices which are eaten two days and one night an intention is effective in respect of their blood from sunset in respect of their immurim from dawn and in respect of their flesh from sunset on the second day our rabbis taught you might think that the peace offerings may be eaten on the evening of the third day and this is indeed logical some sacrifices are eaten on the same Day and others are eaten during two days as those sacrifices which are eaten on the same day only the night follows them so also the sacrifices which are eaten during two days the night follows them therefore it says and if I remain until the third day while it is yet day it may be eaten but it may not be eaten on the evening of the third day you might think that it is burnt immediately and this is logical some sacrifices are eaten on the same day and others are eaten during two days as the sacrifices which are eaten on the same day burning immediately follows eating so the sacrifices which are eaten during two days burning immediately follows eating therefore it says on the third day it shall be burnt with fire you must burn it by day but you must not burn it at night mission of the first ling tithe and passover offering are sacrifices of lesser sanctity they are slaughtered in any part of the temple court and their blood requires one sprinkling provided that it is applied over Against the base they differed in their consumption as follows the first ling was eaten by priests only while the tithe might be eaten by any man and they were eaten in any part of the city prepared in any manner during two days and one night the Passover offering might be eaten only at night only until midnight and it might be eaten only by those registered for it and it might be eaten only roasted tomorrow which Tanner rules thus said are his tithe it is our Jose the Galilean for it was taught our Jose the Galilean said not its blood is said but their blood not its fat is said but their fat this teaches concerning the first ling tithe and the Passover offering that their blood and immurim must be presented at the altar how do we know that it must be sprinkled over against the base at our Eliezer the meaning of sprinkling is learned from a burnt offering Talmud Masabakime and how do we know it of a burnt offering itself because it is written at the base of the altar of the burnt Offering this proves that the statutory burnt offering requires sprinkling at the base if so just as there two applications which constitute four are required so here two two applications which constitute four are required said why must round about be written in connection with both a burnt offering and a sin offering that there might be two verses with the same teaching and two verses with the same teaching do not illumine other cases that is well on the view that they do not illumine but on the view that they do illumine what can be said the guilt offering is a third and three certainly do not illumine the first ling is eaten by priests our rabbis taught how do we know that a first ling is eaten during two days and one night because it is said and the flesh of them shall be thine as the way breast and as the right thigh the rid assimilated it to the breast and the thigh of a peace offering as a peace offering might be eaten during two days and one night so may the First ling be eaten during two days and one night and this question was asked of the sages in the vineyard of Yebna for how long may a first ling be eaten whereupon our Tarfan replied during two days and one night now a certain disciple was present who had come to the Beth Hamid Rash for the first time by the name of our Jose the Galilean master said he to him once do you know this my son replied he a peace offering is a sacrifice of lesser sanctity and a first ling is a sacrifice of lesser sanctity. As a peace offering is eaten during two days and one night so a first ling is eaten during two days and one night master he objected a first ling is the priest's stew and a sin offering and a guilt offering are the priest's stews then let us argue as a sin offering and a guilt offering may be eaten during one day and one night so a first ling may be eaten one day and one night said he to him let us compare the two objects and then deduce one from the other as a peace offering does not come on. Account of sin so a firstling does not come on account of sin hence as a peace offering is eaten two days and one night so is a firstling eaten two days and one night master he objected let us compare the two objects and then deduce one from the other a sin offering and a guilt offering are priestly dues and a firstling is a priestly due as a sin offering and a guilt offering cannot be brought as a vow or a free will offering so a firstling cannot be a vow or a free will offering hence as a sin offering and a guilt offering are eaten one day and one night so may a firstling be eaten one day and one night our Akiba then leaped into the debate and our Tarfan withdrew said he our Akiba to him behold it says and the flesh of them shall be thine etc the rid assimilated them to the breast and thigh of a peace offering as a peace offering is eaten two days and one night so a firstling is eaten two days and one night said he to him you have likened it to the breast and thigh of a peace Offering, but I might liken it to the breast and thigh of a thanks offering as a thanks offering is eaten one day and one night. So a firstling is eaten one day and one night. Lo, he replied, It says it shall be thine now, it shall be thine. Need not be stated why then is it said the rib thereby prolong the existence of a firstling. When this discussion was reported to our Ishmael, he said to them, Those who reported it, go forth and say to Akiba, You have heard whence do we learn this of it? Thanks offering from a peace offering can then that which is learned through a Hekish teaching turned by a Hekish, hence you must determine it not by the second version but by the first version. Now, how does our Ishmael employ this phrase? It shall be thine. It teaches that a blemished firstling is given to the priest for which teaching we do not find any other text in the whole Torah and our Akiba, he learns it from their flesh which intimates whether it whole or blemished and our Ishmael it means. The flesh of these firstlings wherein do they differ one master holds that which is inferred from the subject itself and another does constitute a hekish while the other master holds it does not constitute a hekish on the view that it does not constitute a hekish it is well hence it is written and so shall he do for the tent of meeting which intimates as he sprinkles the blood of the bullock in the holy of holies once upward and seven times downward so must he sprinkle in the hikal and as he sprinkles the blood of the goat in the holy of holies once upward and seven times downward so must he sprinkle in the hikal but on the view that it does constitute a hekish what can be said the localities only are deduced from one another Talmud, Mas Sebakim be alternatively the sprinklings without in the hikal are directly inferred from those within the holy of holies on the view that it does not constitute a hekish it is well hence it is written ye shall bring out of your dwellings two wave loaves of two tenth parts of an ephah etc. Now ye shall bring need not be said what then does ye shall bring teach whatever you bring on another occasion must be like this as here a tenth of an ephah is used for hella so there two a tenth is required for hella if so as here two tenths are required so there two two tenths are required therefore scripture states they shall
It may not be eaten by day said Abay to him or Joseph how do you know that the author of our Mishnah is our Eliezer B. Ezra while the law is biblical perhaps the law is rabbinical only the reason being to prevent transgression if so why state only until midnight but it means it is as the other laws as those are biblical so is this biblical Talmud. Ma Sebaki may see HAPTERB a Mishnah if sacrifices of higher sanctity are slaughtered on the top of the altar our Jose said they are. As though they were slaughtered in the north our Jose son of our Judah said from the middle of the altar southward is as south from the middle of the altar northward is as the north Mara RC said in our Yohanan's name our Jose maintained that the whole of the altar stood in the north what then does as though etc mean you might think that we require them to be slaughtered on the side of the altar which they were not hence he informs us that it is not so said our Zerah to RC if so will you. Indeed say that our Jose son of Arjuda holds that the altar is half in the north and half in the south and should you answer that indeed is so surely it was you who said in our Yohanan's name our Jose son of Arjuda admits that if he slaughtered them in a corresponding position on the ground they are unfit said he to him this is what our Yohanan said both of them inferred their views from the same text and thou shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings and thy peace offerings our Jose holds it. Whole of it the altar is fit for the slaughtering of the burnt offering and the whole of it is fit for peace offerings while our Jose son of Arjuda holds divided half of it is for a burnt offering and half for a peace offering for if you think that the whole of it is fit for a burnt offering then seeing that the whole of it is fit for a burnt offering need it be said that the whole of it is fit for a peace offering and the other it is necessary you might think that only a burnt offering. Is fit if slaughtered on the top of the altar since its room is cramped, but as for peace offerings whose room is not cramped, I would say that it is not so, hence the text informs us otherwise. The above text stated RC said in our Yohanan's name, our Jose son of Arjuda admits that if he slaughtered them in a corresponding position on the ground, they are unfit. Our Ahav Dipti asked Rabbanah what does in a corresponding position on the ground mean, shall we say on the cubit of the base or the cubit of the terrace? Surely that is the altar itself. Moreover, what does on the ground mean? And if you say that he made a cavity in the ground and slaughtered therein, would that be a proper altar? Surely it was taught an altar of earth, thou shalt make unto me this teaches that it must be joined to the earth, that it must not be built over cavities or on rocks. It means that he shortened it. Our Zara said, Is it possible that the statement of our Yohanan is correct, and yet we have not learned it in? The mission so he went out searched and found it for we learned they selected from their sound fig tree wood to arrange the second pile for incense by the southwest horn at a distance of four cubits from it northward sufficient wood was taken to make about five seahs of coals and on the sabbath about eight seahs because they placed there the two censers of frankincense for the shoebread and what is the token this agrees with our jose for it was taught talmud ma sebakim b our jose said this is the token whatever is taken from within to be placed without is placed as near as possible to the inner altar and whatever is taken from without to be placed within is taken from as near as possible to the inner altar whatever is taken from within to be placed without what is it if we say the residue of the blood surely it is distinctly written thereof and all the remaining blood of the bullet shall he pour out at the base of the altar of burnt offering which is at the door of the tent of meeting further as to whatever is taken without to be placed within what is it if we say the coals of the day of atonement surely it is explicitly written thereof and he shall take a censer full of coals of fire from off the altar before the lord rather whatever is taken within to be placed without means the two censers of the frankincense for the shoe bread which we infer from the residue of the blood and whatever is taken without to be placed within is the coals of every day which are inferred from the coals of the day of atonement now what does he hold if he holds that the whole altar is in the south he would have to carry it 27 cubits from the horn and even if he holds that the sanctity of the call and that of the ulam are one yet he would have to carry it down 22 cubits and if he holds that it was half in the north and half in the south he would have to bring it down 11 cubits and even if he holds that the sanctity of the call and that of the ulam are one he would have to bring it down six cubits hence it must surely be that he holds that the whole altar was in the north and these four cubits are as follows one cubit for the base one for the terrace one for the horns and one for the feet of the priests for should one go further than this there would no more be the door set our Adabi but this is in accordance with our Judah for it was taught our Judah said the altar stood in the middle of the temple court now it was thirty two cubits square of which ten cubits faced the door of the hikal and it extended eleven cubits on either side thereof thus the altar was exactly opposite the hikal yet even so according to our Judah he would have to bring it down eleven cubits and even if he held that the sanctity of the hikal and that of the ulam are one he would still have to bring it down six cubits do you think that these four cubits include the cubit of the base and the cubit of the terrace no they are exclusive of the cubit of the base and the cubit of the terrace now let us make this agree with our Jose and assume that he too holds that it stood in the center because we know definitely that our Judah holds that it stood in the middle our Sharabia said this is in accordance with our Jose the Galilean for it was taught our Jose the Galilean said since it says and thou shalt set the labor between the tent of meeting and the altar while another verse states and thou shalt set Talmud, Ma Sebakim of it. Altar of burnt offering before the door of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting it follows that the altar was at the door of the tent of meeting while the labor was not at the door of the tent of meeting where then was it the labor placed between the ulam and the altar slightly toward the south now what does he hold if he holds that the whole altar stood in the south let it be placed southward from the wall of the Hikal, for that would be between the ulam and the altar and even if he Holds that the sanctity of the ulam and that of the call are one, let it be placed southward from the wall of the ulam, for that would still be as between the ulam and the altar, or if he holds that half was in the north and half in the south, let it be placed southward from the wall of the call between the ulam and the altar, and even if he holds that the sanctity of the ulam and that of the call are one, let it be placed southward from the wall of the ulam as being between the ulam and the altar, hence it must surely be that he holds that the whole altar stood in the north, then let it be placed between the altar and the call northward, he holds that the sanctity of the call and ulam is identical, then let it be placed northward from the wall of the ulam when it would be between the ulam and the altar, scripture saith northward, which means that the north must be free from vessels, which Tana disagrees with our Jose the Galilean, our Eliezer B. Jacob, for it was taught our Eliezer B. Jacob. Said northward intimates that the north must be free from everything even from the altar rab said if the altar was damaged all sacrifices slaughtered there are unfit we have a text to this effect but have forgotten it when our Kahana went up he found our Simeon B. Rabbi teaching in our Ishmael B. R. Jose's name how do we know that all the sacrifices slaughtered at a damaged altar are unfit because it is said and thou shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings and thy peace offerings now do you then sacrifice on it rather it means when it is whole and not when it is defective said he that is the text which alluded rab but our Yohanan maintained in both cases they are unfit wherein do they disagree rab holds live animals cannot be permanently rejected while our Yohanan holds live animals can be permanently rejected an objection is raised all the sacred animals which were before the altar was built and then the altar was built are unfit now before it was built they were rejected of Initio say rather before it was raised before it was raised but the, the animals would be too old rather it means the animals which were consecrated before the altar was damaged and then the altar was damaged are unfit now did you not amend it then read which were slaughtered but surely our said in Rab's name if the altar was removed from its place the incense was burnt on its the altar side even as Rabba said Arjuna agrees in respect of the blood so here too Rab agrees in respect of the blood what statement of Arjuna is referred to it was taught the same day did the king hallow the middle of the court that was before the house of the Lord because the brazen altar that was before the Lord was too little to receive the burnt offering and the meal offering and the fat of the peace offerings this is meant literally these are the words of Arjuna said our Jose to him Talmud Ma Sebakim be but surely it is said a thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer Upon that altar wall of the eternal house it is set and Solomon offered for the sacrifice of peace offerings which he offered unto the Lord two and twenty thousand oxen and when you calculate the number of burnt offerings and the number of cubits the latter was larger than the former
I was twice its length sent Arjuna to him. Is it possible that the priest stood on the altar performing the service whilst all the people saw him from without sent Arjuna to him? But surely it is stated in the hangings of the court and the screen for the door of the gate of the court, which is by the tabernacle and by the altar roundabout, which teaches that as the tabernacle was ten cubits high, so was the altar ten cubits high, and it says the hangings for the one side were fifteen cubits Talmud, Masay Bakima, what then is the meaning of and the high five cubits from the upper edge of the altar to the top of the hangings, and what does and the height thereof shall be three cubits mean from the edge of the terrace to the top of the altar, and Arjuna he relates the Gazirish to the breadth. Now according to Arjuna, surely the priest could be seen, granted that the priest could be seen, the service sacrifice in his hand could not be seen as for Arjuna it is. Well, hence it is written, did the king hallow, but according to Arjuna, what is the meaning of did hallow the middle of the court? He hallowed it to set up the altar therein. As for Arjuna, it is well, hence it is written, was little, but according to Arjuna, what is meant by little? This is what it means. The altar of stones which Solomon made instead of the brazen altar was too small, wherein do they differ? One master holds you learn without from without, but you do not learn without from within. While the other master holds you learn a utensil from a utensil, but you do not learn a vessel from an edifice. Rabba said Arjuna admits in respect of the blood, for it was taught Arjuna said he used to fill a goblet with the mingled blood, so that should the blood of one of them be spilled, it is found that this renders it fit. But if you think that Arjuna holds that the whole of the temple court was sanctified, the precept has been already performed. No, perhaps that is because he holds that. We require pouring out with man's force if so let us take it and pour it out in its place no perhaps that cannot be done because he holds that the precept must be performed in the most fitting way our Eliezer said if the altar was damaged you cannot eat the remainder of the meal offering on account of it because it is set and eat it without leaven beside the altar now did they eat it then beside the altar rather it means when it is whole and not when it is damaged we have found it true. Of the residue of the meal offering how do we know it of sacrifices of higher sanctity the implication of holy coach is learned by Gazirisha while once do we know it of sacrifices of lesser sanctity said Abay it is derived by our Jose's exegesis for it was taught our Jose stated three laws on the authority of Talmud, Mas Sebakim be three elders and the following is one of them or Ishmael said you might think that a man can take up second tithe to Jerusalem and consume it there now eh? Days and that would be logical. A firstling must be brought to the place, and tithe must be brought to the place, as the law of firstling operates only whilst the temple stands. So the law of tithe is valid only whilst the temple stands. No, as for a firstling, the reason is because its blood and emirim must be presented at the altar. Let first fruits prove it. As for first fruits, the reason is because they must be placed before the altar. Therefore, it states, and thither shall ye bring your burnt offerings and your tithes and the firstlings of your herd and of your flock. This assimilates tithe to firstling, as the law of firstling is valid only whilst the temple stands. So is tithe valid only whilst the temple stands. Yet let us revert to the argument and learn it from the common characteristic, because that can be refuted. The feature common to both is that each is connected with the altar. What does he hold if he holds that the first sanctity hallowed it for the nonce and for? The future then even a firstling too is thus while if he holds that it did not hallow it for the future there should be a question even about a firstling too said Rubina in truth he holds that it did not hallow it for all time but here we discuss a firstling whose blood was sprinkled before the temple was destroyed then the temple was destroyed and we still have its flesh now its flesh is likened to its blood as its blood requires the altar so does its flesh require the altar then tithe comes and is learned from a firstling but can then that which is derived by a hekish teach in turn by a hekish the tithe of corn is merely hulling that is well on the view that the taught is a determining factor but on the view that the teacher is a determining factor what can be said blood and flesh are the same thing when Rabin went up he reported this teaching in our Jeremiah's presence whereupon he observed the Babylonians are fools because they dwell in a land of darkness they engage. In dark discussions have they not heard what was taught during the dismantling of the tabernacle on their travel sacrifices became unfit and Zabin and lepers were sent out of their precincts whereas another buried the taught sacrifices might be eaten in two places surely then the former refers to sacrifices of higher sanctity and the latter to sacrifices of lesser sanctity said Rabbanah both refer to sacrifices of lesser sanctity yet there is no difficulty Talmud, Mas Sebakim the former. Agrees with Arishmael the latter with the rabbis alternatively both treat of sacrifices of higher sanctity but what does in two places mean before the Levites set up the tabernacle Talmud, Mas Sebakim be and after the Levites dismantled the tabernacle you might argue that in the latter case the flesh became unfit through having gone out of bounds therefore he informs us otherwise yet say that that is indeed so scripture saith then the tent of meeting shall set forward even when it has. Set forward it is the tent of meeting our said in Rab's name the altar at Shiloh was of stones for it was taught our Eliezer B. Jacob said why is stone stated three times one refers to that of Shiloh another to that of Nob and Gibeon and the third to that of the eternal house our Ahabi am I raised an objection the fire which descended from heaven in the days of Moses did not depart from the brazen altar until the days of Solomon and the fire which descended in the days of Solomon did not depart until Manasseh came and removed it now if this is correct it should have departed earlier here in Rab's name made a statement in accordance with our Nathan for it was taught our Nathan said the altar at Shiloh was of brass it was hollow and filled with stones our Nam and B. Isaac said what does it did not depart mean it did not depart disappear into nothingness how was it the rabbi said it sent forth sparks our Papa said it took up its abode now here now there we learned elsewhere and when the children of the exile went up to Eretz Israel. They added there two four cubits on the south and four cubits on the west, like a Greek camel. What is the reason? Said our Joseph, because if the first was not sufficient, said Abay to him, if it was sufficient for the first temple, when it is written, Judah and Israel were many as the sand which is by the seashore in multitude, would it be insufficient for the second temple whereof it is written, the whole congregation together was forty and two thousand, etc. There in the first temple, the heavenly fire assisted them. Here in the second temple, it did not assist them. When Rabin came from Palestine, he said in the name of our Simeon, because they added the pits to its structure. At first, they had thought that an altar of earth meant that it was to be closed in with earth, but subsequently they held that drinking must be like eating. And what does an altar of earth mean? That it should be attached to the earth, not built on rocks, tall good. Mas Sebakim or oversellers are Joseph said is that not which was taught and they set the altar upon its bases which means that they attained to its final measurements but surely it is written and all this do I give thee in writing as the Lord hath made me wise by his hand upon me even all works of this pattern rather said are Joseph they found a text and interpreted it then David said this is the house of the Lord God and this is the altar of burnt offering for Israel this intimated that the altar was like the house as the house was sixty cubits in length so were there sixty cubits for the altar as for the temple it is well for its outline was distinguishable but how did they know the side of the altar said our Eliezer they saw in a vision the altar built and Michael the great prince standing and offering upon it while our Isaac Napaha said they saw Isaac's ashes lying in that place our Samuel Benam and said from the side of the whole house they smelt the odor of incense. While from there the side of the altar they smelt the odor of limbs Rabbi Hannah said in our Yohanan's name three prophets went up with them from the exile one testified to them about the dimensions of the altar another testified to them about the side of the altar and the third testified to them that they could sacrifice even though there was no temple in a that it was taught our Eliezer B. Jacob said three prophets went up with them from the exile one who testified to them about the dimensions of the altar and the side of the altar another who testified to them that they could sacrifice even though there was no temple and a third who testified to them that the Torah should be written in Assyrian characters our rabbis taught the horn the ascent the base and squareness are indispensable the measurements of its length breadth and height are not indispensable how do we know it said our Huna scripture set the altar and wherever the altar is set it is indispensable if so are the labor according to Rabbi and the terrace according to our Jose son of Arjuna also indispensable because it is written and thou shalt put it under the carco ledge round the altar beneath and it was taught what was the carco Rabbi said it was the labor our
Yourself who is a great man knows what I meant he replied then he dubbed them Talmud, Mas Sebekin be the children of Kitra the sons of Artarfan's sister were sitting before Artarfan thereupon he quoted and Abraham took another wife and her name was Yohan he said to him Kitra is written then he dubbed them the children of Kitra Arab and Bihuna said in Arhamba Bikiria's name the logs which Moses made were a cubit long and a cubit broad and their thickness was that of the instrument for Labelling off the top of Ser Jeremiah observed it was measured with a stump cubit said R Joseph is not that which was taught upon the wood that is on the fire which is upon the altar this intimates that the wood must not project at all beyond the altar we learned elsewhere there was an ascent at the south side of the altar thirty two cubits in length by sixteen cubits in breadth whence do we know it said Arhuna scripture said and he shall kill it on the side of the altar northward this intimates that the side must be in the north and the front in the south yet say the side in the north and the face in the north said Rabbi throw a man on his face said Abbe to him on the contrary let the man sit upright it is written the altar shall be rubo but surely that is required to teach that it must be square is then rubo written and on your reasoning is then rubo's written rather rubo is written which implies both now and infers it from the following four. It was taught our Judah said and the steps thereof shall look toward the east every turning which you take must be rightward to the east yet say must be leftward to the east you cannot think so for Rami B. Ezekiel recited the sea which Solomon made stood upon twelve oxen three looking toward the north and three looking toward the west and three looking toward the south and three looking toward the east this teaches that every turning which you take must be to the right eastward but that is required for its own purpose if so why must looking toward be repeated our Simeon B. Jose B. Lacuna asked our Jose did our Simeon B. Jose maintain that there was a space between the ascent and the altar and do you not maintain so he replied surely it is said and thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings the flesh and the blood this intimates that just as the blood requires throwing so does the flesh require throwing I assert that he stood at the side of the place of the pile and threw it he answered Said he to him when he threw did he throw onto a burning pile or onto a pile that was not burning surely onto a burning pile and there it would be impossible to do otherwise our papa said it must be like the blood just as in the case of the blood the airspace above the pavement interposed so in the case of the flesh the airspace above the pavement interposed Rab Judah said two small stairways branched off from the major ascent by which one turned to the base and to the terrace and these were separated from the altar by a hair's breadth because roundabout is said whilst Arabab quoted Rabo four square now both roundabout and Rabo must be written for if the divine lord roundabout only I would say that it can be circular therefore the divine lord Rabo whilst if the divine lord Rabo only I would say that it could be long and narrow hence the divine lord roundabout we learned elsewhere the ascent and the altar were sixty two cubits but they were 64 hence it is found that it overhung a cubit of the base and a cubit of the balcony Talmud, Mas Sebekim Rami Bihama said all the ascents had a gradient of one cubit and three except the ascent of the altar which rose one cubit and three and a half cubits and a finger and a third counting the little fingers mission of the fistfuls of meal offerings were taken in any part of the temple court and they, the meal offerings were eaten within the hangings by male priests prepared in any manner on the same day and night until midnight Gamara R. Eliezer said if the fistful of a meal offering was taken in the call it the ceremony is valid for thus we find it in the removal of the censors Our Jeremiah raised an objection and he shall take thence his fistful that means from the place where the feet of the Tsar stand Ben Bathura said how do we know that if the priest took the fistful with his left hand he must return the fistful and take it with his right hand because it Says thence which means from the place whence he had already taken a fistful some state that he or Jeremiah raised the objection and answered it himself other state our Jacob answered our Jeremiah Bartolava has explained that its purpose is only to declare the whole of the temple court fit I might argue since a burnt offering is a most holy sacrifice and a meal offering is most holy as a burnt offering requires the north so does a meal offering require the north therefore the text informs us. Otherwise as for a burnt offering the reason is because it is altogether burnt then learn it from a sin offering as for a sin offering the reason is because it atones for those who are liable to correct then learn it from a guilt offering as for a guilt offering the reason is because it is a blood sacrifice and as for all these two the reason is because they are blood sacrifices rather the text is necessary I might think since it is written and he shall bring it unto the altar and he shall take up there from his fistful as it must be brought near to the southwest horn so must the fistful be taken by the southwest horn hence the text informs us that it is not so our Yohanan said if a peace offering is slaughtered in the Hikal it is fit because it is set and he shall kill it at the door of the tent of meeting and the adjunct cannot be stricter than the principle and objection is raised our Yohanan be but there is said how do we know that if even surrounded the whole of it temple court the priests enter the Hikal and eat there the most holy sacrifices and the remainder of the meal offering because it says in a most holy place shalt thou eat thereof yet why is this text necessary let us quote in the court of the tent of meeting shall they eat it and the adjunct cannot be stricter than the principle how compare there that we are dealing with service we say let the adjunct not be stricter than the principle since a man can perform a service in the presence of his master but as for eating since a man cannot eat in the presence of his master we do not say let the adjunct not be stricter than the principal mission of the sin offering of a bird was sacrificed by the southwest horn now it was fit if done in any place but this was its particular place that horn served for three things below and three things above below for the sin offering of the bird for the presenting of meal offerings and for the residue of the blood above for the pouring out of wine and water and for the burnt offering of the bird when the east was too much occupied all who ascended the altar ascended by the right Talmud, Mas Sebekim be then they went round the altar and descended by the left except for these three who ascended and descended by retracing their steps tomorrow whence do we know it said our Joshua scripture saith he shall put no oil upon it neither shall he put any frankincense thereon for it is a sin offering a sin offering is designated a meal offering and a meal offering is designated a sin offering as a sin offering requires the north so does a meal offering require the north and as a meal offering is presented at the southwest horn so is a bird sin offering offered at the southwest horn and how do we know this of the meal offering itself because it was taught the sons of Aaron shall offer it before the Lord you might think at the west of the altar therefore it states in front of the altar if it is to be in front of the altar. You might think in the south but scripture says before the Lord how then was it done he presented it at the southwest horn opposite the edge of the horn and that is sufficient our Eliezer said you might think that he presents it on the west of the horn or the south of the horn but you can rebut this for wherever you find two texts one confirming itself and the other whereas the second confirms itself but annuls the other you abandon the one which confirms itself and annuls the other end. Except that which confirms itself and the other two thus if you say before the Lord means in the west how can you confirm in front of the altar but when you say in front of the altar means in the south you confirm before the Lord as meaning the south but how can you confirm this said Arashi this Tana holds that the whole altar stood in the north now it was fit if done in any place etc what does this mean said Arashi this is what it means any place is fit for its melika but this was the place for its sprinkling we have thus learned here what our rabbis taught if he nipped it by any part of the altar it is valid if he sprinkled its blood on any part of the altar it is valid if he sprinkled the blood but did not drain it out it is valid provided that he applies some of the light blood below the scarlet line what does this mean this is what he means if he nipped it by any part of the altar it is valid if he drained the blood at any part of the altar it is valid Talmud, Mas. Zabakim for if he sprinkled but did not drain out it is valid provided that he applies some of the light blood below the scarlet line that horn served for three things etc for the sin offering of the bird as we have stated for the presenting for it is written and he shall bring it near i.e. present it unto the altar for the residue of the blood for it is written and all the remaining blood thereof shall he pour out at the base of the altar above for the pouring of the wine and the water and for the burnt offering of a bird when the east was too much occupied what is the reason our Yohanan said because it is nearest to the ash deposit our Yohanan said come and see how great was the strength of the priests for no part of birds is lighter than the crop and the feathers yet sometimes the priest threw them more than thirty cubits for we learned he took a silver pan brazier and ascended to the top of the altar where he parted the coals to
Altar while left means the left of the person and let him teach either both with reference to the altar or both with reference to the person that is indeed a difficulty. Mishnah was a sin offering of a bird sacrificed. He pinched off its head close by its neck but did not sever it and he sprinkled its blood on the wall of the altar. The residue of the blood was drained out on the base only the blood belonged to the altar while the whole of it belonged to the priest. Kamara our rabbis taught. And he shall sprinkle of the blood of the sin offering that means with the body of the sin offering how is it done? He the priest grasps the head and the body of the bird and sprinkles its blood on the wall of the altar but not on the wall of the ascent nor on the wall of the hikal nor on the wall of the ulam and which wall is meant the lower wall yet perhaps it is not so but rather on the upper wall and that is indeed logical if the blood of an animal sin offering is sprinkled. Above though that of an animal burnt offering is sprinkled below surely the blood of a bird sin offering is sprinkled above seeing that that of a bird burnt offering is sprinkled above therefore it states and the rest of the blood shall be drained out at the base of the altar which intimates that it must be sprinkled on a wall where the residue will drain down to the base and which is at the lower wall yet let us first perform it above and then below said Rabbah is then Yamzeh. He shall drain written surely Yamazeh shall be drained as written which implies of its own accord Arzitra Bitopia said in Rab's name how is the bird sin offering pinched off he grasps its two wings and two fingers and its two legs and two fingers stretches its neck over the width of his thumb and pinches it off in the very that it was taught the bird is without he holds its wings and two fingers and its two legs with two fingers stretches its neck over the width of two fingers and pinches it off. And this was a difficult rite in the temple. This and no other surely there were Kemais and Hafanase. Rather, this was one of the difficult rites in the temple. Mishnah was the burnt offering of a bird sacrificed. He the priest ascended the descent and turned to the surrounding balcony. Once he made his way to the southeast horn, he nipped its head close by the neck and severed its sand, drained out its blood onto the wall of the altar. He took the head, turned the part where it was nipped. To the altar dried it with salt and threw it onto the altar dash fire. Then he came to the body, removed the crop, the feathers, and the entrails that came forth with it, and threw them onto the ash depository. He rent the body but did not sever it. Yet if he did sever it, it is fit. Then he dried it the body with salt and threw it onto the altar dash fire. If he did not remove the crop or the feathers or the entrails which came forth with it and did not dry it with salt or made any other deviation. Therein after he had drained the blood out it is fit if he severed the sin offering or did not sever the burnt offering it is unfit if he drained out the blood of the head but not the blood of the body it is unfit the blood of the body but not the blood of the head it is fit if he nipped the sin offering of a bird for the sake of something else if he drained out its blood for the sake of something else or for its own sake and for the sake of something else or for the sake of something else and for its own sake it is unfit a burnt offering of a bird is fit in such circumstances save that it does not free its owner of his obligation if a sin offering of a bird or a burnt offering of a bird was nipped or if its blood was drained out with the intention to eat what was normally eaten or to burn what was normally burned without bounds it is invalid but does not involve karath after time it is pickle and involves karath provided that the matter was offered in accordance with it. Regulations How does he offer the matter according to regulations if he nipped it in silence and drained the blood with an intention of after time or if he nipped it with an intention of after time and drained the blood in silence or if he nipped it and drained the blood with an intention of after time in these cases he offered the matter according to regulation how does he not offer the matter according to regulation if he nipped it with an intention of without bounds and drained it blood with an intention of without bounds or if he nipped it with an intention of after time and drained the blood with an intention of without bounds or if he nipped it and drained the blood with an intention of without bounds Talmud, Masabakim if he nipped it an offering of a bird under a different designation and drained the blood with an intention of after time or if he nipped it with an intention of after time and drained the blood under a different designation or if he Nipped it and drained the blood under a different designation. In these cases, he did not offer the matter according to regulation if he intended to eat as much as an olive without bounce and as much as an olive on the morrow, or as much as an olive on the morrow and as much as an olive without bounce, half as much as an olive without bounce and half as much as an olive on the morrow, half as much as an olive on the morrow and half as much as an olive without bounce. The sacrifice is unfit and does not involve karef. Said Arjuna, this is the general rule where the wrongful intention of time precedes that of place. The sacrifice is pickle and involves karef, but if the wrongful intention of place precedes that of time, it is unfit and does not involve karef. But the sages maintain in both cases the sacrifice is unfit and does not involve karef if one intends to eat half as much as an olive without bounce or after time and to burn half as much as an olive. Similarly, it is fit for eating and burning. Do not combine Gemara or Rabbis taught, and the priest shall bring it unto the altar. Why is this stated? Because it is said, and he shall bring his offering of turtle doves or of young pigeons. You might think that when he vows a bird as a burnt offering, he must give not less than two birds. Therefore, it states, and the priest shall bring it. He can bring even one bird to the altar. Why is the priest stated to prescribe a priest for it? For you might argue is not the reverse logical. If a priest was not prescribed for a sheep, though north was prescribed for it, is it not logical that a priest is not prescribed for a bird, seeing that scripture did not prescribe north for it? Therefore, the priest is stated in order to prescribe a priest for it. You might think that he must nip it with a knife, and that is indeed logical. If scripture prescribed the utensil for Shechita, though it did not prescribe a priest for it, is it not logical that it Prescribe the utensil for nipping seeing that it prescribed the priest for it therefore it states and the priest shall pinch off its head said Arakiba would you then think that as our might approach the altar why then is the priest stated to teach that the pinching must be done by the very priest himself you might think that he can pinch it off either above the red line or below it therefore it states and pinch off its head and make it smoke on the altar as Hakdara making it smoke is done on the top of the altar so is pinching done on the top of the altar and shall pinch off close by the nape of the neck you say close by the nape yet perhaps it is not so but rather by the throat it follows by logic and shall pinch off is stated here and, and shall pinch off is stated elsewhere as there it is close by its neck so here it is close by its neck if so just as there he pinches but does not sever it so here too he pinches but does not sever it therefore it states and shall Pinch off its head and make it smoke as in Hakkara the head is by itself and the body is by itself so after pinching the head is by itself and the body is by itself and how do we know that the Hakkara of the head is separate and that of the body is separate because it is set and make it smoke thus the burning of the body is ordered how then do I interpret and the priest shall make it smoke upon the altar scripture here treats of the burning of the head and the blood thereof shall be drained out on the side of the altar but not on the wall of the ascent nor on the wall of the hikal and which is at the upper wall yet perhaps it is not so but rather the lower wall and that is indeed logical if the blood of an animal burnt offering is sprinkled below though that of an animal sin offering is sprinkled above surely the blood of a burnt offering of a bird is sprinkled below seeing that that of a sin offering of a bird is sprinkled below therefore it states and Shall pinch off and shall burn and the blood thereof shall be drained out. Now can you really think that after he has burnt it he returns and drains it? Rather it is to tell you as Hakkara is done on the top of the altar so is the draining out on the top of the altar. How did he do this? He ascended the ascent and turned to the terrace whence he proceeded to the southeast horn. Then he pinched off its head close by the neck, severed it and drained some of its blood on the wall of the altar. If he did it below his feet even a cubit it is fit our Nehemiah and our Eliezer B. Jacob maintained it must essentially be done not elsewhere but on the top of the altar wherein do they differ. Abbe and Rabbah both said they differ in respect of building a pyre on the terrace. Then he took the body etc. Our rabbis taught and he shall take away its crop with the feathers thereof. That is the crop you might think that he cuts through with a knife and takes it therefore it states with the feathers. Thereof hence he takes the plumage together with it. Our Abba Jose Behan and said he takes it the crop together with the crop. The school of our Ishmael taught with the feathers thereof means with its very own feathers. Hence he cuts it round with a knife like a skylight Talmud. Ma Sebakim be he rent it but did not sever it. Our rabbis taught and he shall rent it. Renting is by hand only and thus it says and he rent him as one would
Required the cutting of the greater part of the flesh, yes, and it was taught likewise how is the melaka of a bird sin offering performed. He cuts through the spinal column and the nape without the greater part of the flesh until he reaches the gullet or the windpipe. When he reaches the gullet or the windpipe, he cuts one organ or the greater part thereof together with the greater part of the flesh. And in the case of a burnt offering, two organs or the greater part thereof. This was stated. Before our Jeremiah said, He have they not heard what our Simeon Beliakim said on the authority of our Eliezer B. Pedat, on the authority of our Eliezer B. Shamu our Eliezer son of our Simeon affirmed, I have heard that a bird sin offering is severed, and what does he shall not divide it asunder mean Talmud, Mas Sebakim, he need not sever it, said Araha the son of Rabba to our Ashi, if so, when it is written in connection with the pit, and if a man shall open a pit and not cover it, does that too mean that he need not cover it? How compare there, since it is written, the owner of the pit shall make it good, he is obviously bound to cover it, but here consider it is written, and the priest shall bring offer it unto the altar, whereby the Red drew a distinction between the bird sin offering and the bird burnt offering, what then is the purpose of he shall not divide it asunder, infer from this that he need not sever it if he drain the blood of the body, our rabbis taught a burnt offering teaches that. Even if he drained the blood of the body but did not drain the blood of the head, it is still a valid burnt offering. You might think that even if he drained the blood of the head but not the blood of the body, it is valid. Therefore, it states it is how does this imply? It said, Robin, it is logical for most of the blood is found in the body. C H A P T E R B I mission. If a sin offering of a bird is offered below the red line with the rights of a sin offering and for the sake of a sin offering, it is fit if it is offered with the rights of a sin offering but in the name of a burnt offering or with the rights of a burnt offering and in the name of a sin offering or with the rights of a burnt offering and in the name of a burnt offering. It is unfit if he offers it above the red line even with the rights of any of these. It is unfit if a burnt offering of a bird is offered above with the rights of a burnt offering and in the name of a burnt offering. It is fit with it. Rights of a burnt offering, but in the name of a sin offering, it is fit, but does not free its owner of its obligation if he offers it with the rights of a sin offering, and in the name of a burnt offering, or with the rights of a sin offering, and in the name of a sin offering, it is unfit if he offers it below, even with the rights of any of these, it is unfit. Talmud, Mas Sebakim B. Gamar, wherein does he deviate? If we say that he deviates in Melika, shall we then say that it does not agree with our Eliezer son of Arsimian, who said, I have heard that one severs a bird sin offering, but have we not explained that it does not agree with our Eliezer son of Arsimian? No, it means that he deviates in the sprinkling that too is logical, since the sequel teaches if he offers it above, even with the rights of any of these, it is unfit, which means even with the rights of a sin offering, and in the name of a sin offering, now wherein does he deviate? If you say that he deviates in Melika, surely. Master said if he performed its melaka on any part of the altar it is fit hence it must surely mean that he deviates in sprinkling and since the second clause means in sprinkling the first clause too means in sprinkling why interpret it thus each is governed by its own circumstances if a burnt offering of a bird etc wherein does he deviate if we say that he deviates in melaka then when he detana teaches in the sequel all of these do not defile in the gullet and involve trespass shall we say that this does not agree with our Joshua for if it agreed with our Joshua surely he ruled that they do not involve trespass rather he deviated in draining the blood and consider the subsequent clause if one offered a burnt offering of a bird below the red line with the rights of a sin offering and in the name of a sin offering our Eliezer maintains it involves trespass our Joshua said it does not involve trespass now wherein did he deviate if we say in draining granted that our Joshua Ruled thus where he deviated in Melika did he rule thus in reference to draining hence it must mean in Melika then the first and the last clauses refer to Melika while the middle clause refers to draining yes the first and the last clauses refer to Melika while the middle clause refers to draining mission and all of these do not defile in the gullet and involve trespass except the sin offering of a bird which was offered below the red line with the rights of a sin offering and in the name of a sin offering if one offered the burnt offering of a bird below with the rights of a sin offering and in the name of a sin offering our Eliezer maintained it involves trespass our Joshua ruled it does not involve trespass said our Eliezer if a sin offering involves trespass when the priest deviated in its name though it does not involve trespass when it is offered in its own name is it not logical that a burnt offering involves trespass if he deviated in its name seeing that it Involves trespass when he offered it in its own name. No answered our Joshua when you speak of a sin offering whose name he altered to that of a burnt offering. It involves trespass because he changed its name to something that involves trespass. Will you say the same of a burnt offering whose name he changed to that of a sin offering, seeing that he changed its name to something which does not involve trespass? Talmud, Mas Sebakim said our Eliezer to him, Let sacred sacrifices which are slaughtered in the south and in the name of lesser sacrifices prove it, for he changed their name to something which does not involve trespass, and yet they involve trespass. So also do not wonder that in the case of the burnt offering, although he changed its name to something that does not involve trespass, it involves trespass. Not so replied our Joshua if you say thus of most sacred sacrifices which are slaughtered in the south and in the name of lesser sacrifices, they involve trespass because he Change their name to something which is partly forbidden and partly permitted. Will you say the same of a burnt offering where he changed its name to something that is altogether permitted? Gemara it was taught our Eliezer said to our Joshua let a guilt offering slaughtered in the north as a peace offering prove it though he changed its name it involves trespass so need you not wonder that a burnt offering involves trespass even though he changed its name said our Joshua to him no if you say thus of a guilt offering where he changed its name but not its place will you say the same of a burnt offering where he changed its name and its place said our Eliezer to him let a guilt offering slaughtered in the south as a peace offering prove it where he changed its name and its place yet it involves trespass so need you not wonder that a burnt offering involves trespass even though he changed its name and changed its place no replied our Joshua if you say thus of a guilt offering where though he Changed its name and its place, he did not deviate in its rights. Will you say the same of a burnt offering where he changed its name and its place and its rights? Thereupon he was silent, said Rabbah, why was he silent? He could answer him, let a guilt offering which one slaughtered in the south in the name of a peace offering and with change of owner prove it where he changed its name and its place and its rights, and yet it involves trespass. Now, since he did not answer him, thus you may infer that our Eliza discerned our Joshua's reason for our Adabi Ahab said our Joshua maintained if a bird burnt offering was offered below with the rights of a sin offering and in the name of a sin offering immediately he nipped one organ thereof it is transmuted into a bird sin offering. If so, a bird sin offering which was offered above the red line with the rights of a burnt offering and in the name of a burnt offering as soon as he nips one organ of it, let it be transmuted through the other organ into a Bird burnt offering and should you say that indeed is so surely our Yohanan said in our Banag's name that is the tenor of the mission does that not mean that is the tenor of the mission but no more no it means that is the tenor of the whole mission our Ashi said as for a bird burnt offering offered below with the rights of a sin offering and in the name of a sin offering it is well since the fitness of the latter requires one organ whereas that of the former requires both organs while a bird burnt offering cannot be offered below immediately he nips one organ it is transmuted into a bird sin offering but when one offers a bird sin offering above with the rights of a burnt offering and in the name of a burnt offering since a master said Melika is valid wherever it is done immediately he nips one organ it becomes unfit when therefore he nips the second organ how can it be transmuted into a bird burnt offering the above text stated our Adabi Ahab said our Joshua maintained a Bird burnt offering was offered below with the rights of a sin offering and in the name of a sin offering immediately he nipped one organ thereof it is transmuted into a bird sin offering Talmud, Ma Sebakim become and here in the case of a sin offering for one and a burnt offering for the other if he the priest offered both above the red line half is fit and half is unfit if he offered both below half is fit and half is unfit if he offered one above and one below both are unfit for. I assume that he offered the sin offering above and the burnt offering below yet even granted that he did offer the burnt offering below let it be transmuted into a bird sin offering granted that our Jo
Species if they were of two species she must bring four if she fixed the time of her bow Talmud, Ma Sebakim a Talmud, Ma Sebakim she must bring another five birds to be sacrificed above if she had vowed of one species if of two she must bring six if she gave them to the priest but does not know what she gave and the priest went and offered them but he does not know how he offered them she now requires four birds on account of her vow and two on account of her statutory. Obligation and one sin offering Ben Isa said two sin offerings are Joshua observed this is a case where the sages said when it is alive it has one voice and when it is dead it has seven voices granted that our Joshua ruled us in respect of liberating it from trespass did he ruled us in respect of converting it into an obligatory offering mission in regard to all unfit persons who performed Melika the Melika is invalid and they the sacrifices do not defile in the gullet if he the priest nipped them with his left hand or at night if he slaughtered Holland within or a sacrifice without the temple court they do not defile in the gullet if he nipped with a knife or if he nipped Holland within or sacrifices without Talmud, Ma Sebakim B or if he sacrificed turtle doves before their time or pigeons after their time or a bird whose wing was withered or blind in the eye or whose foot was cut off all these defile in the gullet this is the general rule all. Whose unfitness arose in the sanctuary do not defile in the gullet if their unfitness did not arise in the sanctuary they defile in the gullet. Gamara Rab said if they were nipped with the left hand or at night they do not defile in the gullet by Azar or with a knife they do defile in the gullet. Why is the left hand different? Presumably because it is fit on the day of atonement and likewise night is fit in respect of the burning of the limbs and the fats and surely Azar too is. Fit for Shechita Shechita is not a sacrificial right is it not surely Arzara said Shechita of the red heifer by Azar is invalid and Rab observed thereon the reason is because Eliezer and statute are written in connection with it the red heifer is different because it is of the holy things of the temple repair does it not then follow a forciori right? if the holy things of the temple repair require priesthood surely the holy objects dedicated to the altar require priesthood said R. Shisha the son of Aridi let it be analogous to the inspection of leprous plates which is not a right and yet requires priesthood but let us learn it from the high places one cannot learn from the high places can one not surely it was taught how do we know that if flesh which went out ascended the altar it does not descend because flesh that goes out is fit at the high places the tanner relies on the text this is the law of the burnt offering but are Yohanan maintained of Azar. Performed Melika it does not defile in the gullet if Melika was done with a knife it does defile in the gullet we learned in regard to all unfit persons who performed Melika the Melika is invalid as for our Yohanan it is well all includes Azar but according to Rab what does all include it is surely to include Melika with the left hand and at night but the left hand and night are explicitly taught he the tanner teaches and then explains come and here this is the general rule. All whose unfitness arose in the sanctuary do not defile garments when the flesh of the bird is in the gullet as for our Yohanan it is well all includes Azar but according to Rab what does it include Talmud, Ma Sebakim yet even on your view what does the clause if their unfitness did not arise in the sanctuary include rather the first clause includes Shechita bird sacrifices within while the second clause includes Melika of Holland without it was taught in accordance with R. Yohanan if Azar nipped it or if an unfit person nipped it or if it was pickle nut or an unclean sacrifice it does not defile in the gullet R. Isaac said I have heard two laws one relating to Chemizah by Azar and the other to Melika by Azar one descends and the other does not descend but I do not know which is which said Hezekiah it is logical that in the case of Chemizah it goes down while in the case of Melika it does not go down why is Melika different presumably because it was done at the high places but Kemiza too was done at the high places and should you say there were no meal offerings at the high places and there were no bird offerings at the high places either for our she's hate said on the view that there were meal offerings at the high places there were bird offerings at the high places on the view that there were no meal offerings there were no bird offerings what is the reason and sacrifice peace offerings of oxen unto the Lord offerings implies but not birds offerings implies but not meal offerings say rather there was no sanctification of a meal offering in service vessels at the high places if he nipped them with his left hand or at night etc our rabbis taught you might think that melika which is done within defile garments when the flesh is in the gullet therefore it states and every soul that eat nibble of that which dieth of itself he shall wash his clothes etc but this too is nibble rather it States Tirfa that which is torn of beast as Tirfa does not permit the forbidden so everything which does not permit the forbidden is included thus Melika which is performed within is excluded since it permits the forbidden it does not defile garments when the flesh is in the gullet hence it includes Melika and as Hefes of sacrifices without and Melika of Holland both within and without since they do not permit the forbidden they defile garments when the flesh is in the gullet another berry the taught you might think that the Sheshit of Holland within and that of sacrifices both within and without defile in the gullet therefore nibble is stated but this too is nibble rather therefore it states Tirfa as Tirfa is the same within and without so all which are the same within and without are included in this law thus the Sheshit of Holland within and that of sacrifices within and without is excluded since these are not the same within as without. They do not defile garments when the flesh is in the gullet as for Holland it is well that is not the same within as without but sacrifices are unfit in both cases said Rabbi if Shechita without is effective in that it involves Karat shall it not be effective in cleansing it from the defilement of Nibla we have thus found it of Shechita without how do we know it of Shechita within because it is not the same within as without if so when one performs Melika on sacrifices without. They too should not defile since within is not the same as without said Arshai my Ashi you infer that which does not make it fit from that which does not make it fit but you do not infer that which does not make it fit from that which does make it fit do you not surely it was taught how do we know that if flesh which went out ascended the altar it does not descend because flesh that goes out is fit at the high places the tanner relies on the extension intimated and this is a law of the burnt offering mission if one performed Melika and if the bird was found to be Tirtha Armeir said it does not defile in the gullet Talmud, Ma Sebakim B. Arjuna said it does defile in the gullet said Armeir it is a KALWA homer if the Shechita of an animal cleanses it even when Tirtha from its uncle and yet when it is nibble it defiles through contact or carriage is it not logical that Shechita cleanses a bird when Tirtha from its uncle and seeing that when it is nibble it does not defile through contact or carriage now as we have found that Shechita which makes it a bird of Holland fit for eating cleanses it when Tirtha from its uncle and so Melika which makes it a bird sacrifice fit for eating cleanses it when Tirtha from its uncle and our Jose said it is sufficient for it to be like the nibble of a clean permitted animal which is cleansed by Shechita but not by Melika Gamara now does not Armeir accept the principle of Dayo it is sufficient. Surely the principle of Dayo is biblical for it was taught how is a KALWA homer applied and the Lord said unto Moses if her father had but spit in her face should she not hide in shame seven days how much more should a divine reproof necessitate shame for fourteen days but it is sufficient for that which is inferred by an argument to be like the premise said our Jose son of our Abin Armeir found a text and interpreted it this is the law of the beast and of the bird now in which law is a beast. Similar to a bird and a bird to a beast a beast defile through contact and carriage whereas a bird does not defile through contact or carriage a bird defile garments when its flesh is in the gullet whereas a beast does not defile garments when its flesh is in the gullet but it is to tell you as in the case of a beast that which makes it fit for eating makes it clean when tearful from its defilement so in the case of a bird that which makes it fit for eating makes it clean when tearful. From its defilement, then what is Arjuna's reason? Said Rabbi Arjuna found a text and interpreted it, and every soul which eat nibla or tirfa he shall wash his clothes, etc. Said Arjuna, why is tirfa stated if tirfa can live? And surely nibla is already stated, while if tirfa cannot live, it is included in nibla, hence it is to include a tirfa which one slaughtered and teaches that it defiles, if so, said Arshis by to him when it is written, and the fat hell of nibla. And the fat of tirfa may be used for any other service, but yet shall in no wise eat it thereto. Let us argue why is tirfa stated if tirfa can live, and surely nibla is already stated, and if tirfa cannot live, it is included in nibla, hence it is to include a tirfa which one slaughtered and teaches that it's hell of is clean, hence
Talmud, Wasib Kingle, let this to be derived from and the fat of Nibla which intimates that whose interdict is on account of do not eat the hell of Nibla, hence this the hell of a forbidden animal is excluded since its interdict is not on account of do not eat the hell of Nibla but on account of uncleanness rather this tirfa is required in order to include Hayah. I might argue only that whose hell of is forbidden whilst its flesh is permitted is included in this law hence. Hayah is excluded since its hell of and its flesh are permitted therefore the word tirfa informs us that it is not so wherein does an unclean forbidden animal differ presumably because its hell of is not distinct from its flesh but then the hell of Hayah is not distinct from its flesh moreover surely it is written but yet shall in no wise eat it rather said of a tirfa is needed for its own purpose lest you argue since an unclean animal is forbidden whilst yet alive and a tirfa. Is forbidden whilst yet alive as the hell of an unclean animal is unclean defile so is the hell of a tirfa unclean if so this too is required lest you say since an unclean bird may not be eaten and a tirfa may not be eaten as an unclean bird does not defile garments when the flesh is in the gullet so a tirfa too does not defile moreover can tirfa really be derived from an unclean animal an unclean animal enjoyed no period of fitness whereas a tirfa enjoyed a period of fitness and should you answer what can be said of a tirfa from birth yet of its kind this can be said rather said rather the torah ordained let the interdict of nibla come and fall upon the interdict of hell let the interdict of tirfa come and fall upon the interdict of hell and both are necessary for if we were informed this about nibla i would argue that the reason is because it defiles but as for tirfa i would say that it does not fall upon the interdict of hell and if we were Informed this about Tirfa I would say that the reason is because its interdict dates from when it was alive but as for Nibla L would say that it is not so hence they are both necessary now how does Armeir employ this word Tirfa he needs it to exclude Shechita which is within and Arjuda another Tirfa is written and Armeir one excludes Shechita which is within and the other excludes an unclean forbidden bird and Arjuda that is derived from Nibla and Armeir how does he employ this Nibla to show that the standard of eating is required viz as much as an olive yet let this be derived from the first text since the divine law expressed it in terms of eating one text is employed to show that the standard of eating is required for defilement viz as much as an olive while the other intimates that the standard of eating must be within the time of eating half a loaf I might argue since this is anomalous let it defile even when it takes more than the time Required for eating half a loaf, hence the text informs us otherwise our rabbis taught in the hell of Nibla and the hell of Tirfa may be used for any other service, but yet shall in no wise eat of it. Scripture speaks of the hell of a clean permitted animal. You say scripture speaks of the hell of a clean animal, yet perhaps it is not so, but rather of the hell of an unclean animal. You can answer scripture declared an animal clean on account of its being slaughtered and declared it clean on account of hell of as when it declared it clean on account of being slaughtered, it referred to a clean permitted but not an unclean forbidden animal. So when it declared it clean on account of hell of it referred to a clean but not an unclean animal, or argue in this wise scripture cleansed from Nibla and it cleansed from hell of as when it cleansed from Nibla, it was in the case of unclean and not in the case of clean, so when it cleansed from hell of it did so in the case. Of unclean not in the case of clean thus you must say Talmud, Ma Sebekim be when you argue in the one way the text applies to clean whilst when you argue in the other way it applies to unclean therefore it says Tirfa which intimates the kind where there is Tirfa then I might exclude the unclean since there is no Tirfa in its kind but I will not exclude Hayah since there is Tirfa in its kind scripture however teaches but yet shall in no wise eat of it intimating that it refers to that whose halab is forbidden whereas its flesh is permitted thus Hayah is excluded since its halab and its flesh are permitted are Jacob be Abba said to Rabba if so is it only the nibla of a clean animal that defile whereas the nibla of an unclean animal does not defile said he to him how many elder scholars of you have heard there in the second clause applies to the nibla of an unclean bird are you had and said only unblemished birds did our mayor declare clean but not blemished ones while are Eliezer maintained he ruled thus even in the case of blemished ones it was stated likewise RBB said in our Eliezer's name Armeir declared blemished birds clean even ducks and fowls are Jeremiah asked what if one beheaded a goat what is the reason in the case of ducks and fowls is it because they are species of birds but a goat is not of the same species as a heifer or perhaps it is of the species of cattle RDM sat and recited this discussion said Abbe to him hence it follows that the beheaded heifer is clean yes he replied the school of Arjane said forgiveness is written in connection therewith as in the case of sacrifices are Nathan the father of Arhuna objected but yes shall in no wise eat of it I know this law only of hell of which may not be eaten but may be otherwise used how do we know it of the hell of the ox that is stoned and the beheaded heifer because it says all hell of yes shall not eat but if you think that the beheaded heifer is clean could it be Clean while its hell of is unclean where one did indeed behead it no text is required it is required only where one slaughtered it then let Sheshit be efficacious in cleansing it from Nibla the text is necessary only where it died hence it follows that it was forbidden whilst yet alive yes Arjane observed I have heard a time limit for it but have forgotten it while our colleagues maintain its descent to the rugged valley that renders it forbidden C-H-A-P-T-E-R-B-I-I -I mission all. Sacrifices which became mixed up with sin offerings that must be left to die or with an ox that is to be stoned even one in ten thousand all must be left to die if they were mixed up with an ox with which transgression had been committed e.g. Talmud, Ma Sebekim that had killed a man on the testimony of one witness or of its owner a robot or a nearby or an animal set aside for an idolatrous sacrifice or that had been worshipped as an idol or that was a harlot's hire or a dog's exchange. Talmud, Mas Sebekim B or that was Kilay or Tirfa or an animal calved through the Caesarean section they must graze until they become unfit then they are sold and one brings a sacrifice of the same kind at the price of the better of them if they were mixed up with unblemished animals of Holland the Holland must be sold for the purpose of that kind if a sacrifice was mixed up with a sacrifice both being of the same kind this one must be offered in the name of whoever is its owner and the other must be offered in the name of whoever is its owner if a sacrifice was mixed up with a sacrifice both being of different kinds they must graze until they become unfit and then one purchases at the price of the better of them an animal of each kind and bears the loss of the excess out of his own pocket if they were mixed up with a firstling or tithe they must graze until they become unfit and then are eaten as firstling or tithe all sacrifices can be mixed up except the sin. Offering and the guilt offering tomorrow what does even mean this is what he means all sacrifices with which sin offerings that must be left to die e.g. an ox that must be stoned became mixed up even one in ten thousand must be left to die but we have already learned it once all which are forbidden to the altar e.g. a roba and a near render others forbidden whatever their number said Arkahana I reported this discussion to our Shimai B. Ashi and he said to me they are both necessary for if we learn from there I would say that is only where they are forbidden to the altar but where they are forbidden to a limit it is not so while if we learn from here I would say that this ruling applies only to these which are forbidden for any use but as for the others which are not forbidden for general use it is not so thus they are both necessary but surely those which are not interdicted for all use are taught in this mission does he teach by what number they render all Forbidden then let him teach the other and we would not require this one he needs the remedy but those which are forbidden to lame and he also teaches there the following are themselves forbidden and render others forbidden whatever their number one of nizek and animals of idolatry Talmud, Ma Sebekim they are both necessary for if I learned from there I would say that applies only to Holland but as for sacrifices let us not cause the loss of all of them while if I learned from here I would say this applies only to sacred animals because it is repulsive but as for Holland where it is not repulsive I would say that though they are forbidden for any use let them be annulled by the majority thus both are necessary now let them indeed be annulled by the majority and should you answer they are important and cannot be annulled that is well on the view that we learned whatever one is want to count but on the view that we learned that which one is want to count what can be Said for we learned if a man has bundles of fenugreek of Kilayim of a vineyard Talmud, Ma Sebekim B they must be burnt if they were mixed up with others and those again with others they must all be burnt that is the view of
Cask and he does not know in which cask or on top of a beehive and he does not know in which our Meir maintains that our Elizer said we regard the upper layers as if they are separated and the lower ones neutralize the upper ones while our Joshua ruled if there were a hundred tops they neutralize if not all the tops are forbidden and the bottom layers are permitted our Judah maintained our Elizer said if there were a hundred tops they neutralize if not all the tops are forbidden etc while our Joshua ruled even if you have three hundred tops they do not neutralize if he pressed it in a round jar and he does not know in which part of the jar he pressed it whether in the north or in the south all agree that it is neutralized our Ashi said you may even say that it agrees with the rabbis living creatures are important and cannot be neutralized now let us detach them one by one and say whatever is detached is detached from the majority you say detach them but that is capo talmud Ma say b and every case of capo is like half and half rather the difficulty is this let us force them to scatter and then say whatever is detached is detached from the majority said rabbi we fear lest eg ten priests come at the same time and offer them one of the rabbis observed to rabbi if so is the tray forbidden rather the reason is because we fear lest eg ten priests come and take them simultaneously is that possible rather said rabbi the reason is because of capo rabbi said since the rabbis ruled that we must not offer them if one does offer it each animal does not propitiate our hunabi judah raised an objection to rabbi if a sin offering was mixed up with a burnt offering or a burnt offering with a sin offering even one in ten thousand all must die when is this if the priest consulted the authorities but if the priest did not consult the authorities and he sacrificed them all above half are fit and half are unfit below half are fit and half are unfit if he sacrificed one above and one below both are unfit for I assume that the sin offering was offered above and the burnt offering below said he to him this my ruling is in accordance with the view that live animals can be permanently rejected the other is in accordance with the view that live animals cannot be permanently rejected but what about slaughtered animals regarding which all agree that they are permanently rejected Talmud, Ma Sebekim yet we learned our Elizer said if he offered the head of one of them all the heads must be offered he ruled in accordance with Hanan the Egyptian for it was taught Hanan the Egyptian said even if the blood is in the cup he brings its companion and pairs it or Anam and said in the name of Rabbi Abba in Rab's name if a ring of idolatry was mixed up with a hundred rings and one of them fell into the great sea all are permitted because we say the one which fell was the one which was forbidden Robber raised an objection to our Nam and even one in ten thousand all must be left to die yet why so let us say that the first which dies is the forbidden one said he to him Rab ruled in accordance with our Elizer for we learned our Elizer said if he offered the head of one of them all the heads may be offered but surely our Eliezer said our Elizer permitted them to be offered only in twos but not singly I also meant in twos he replied Rab said if a ring of idolatry was mixed up with a hundred rings and forty of them were detached to one place and sixty to another if one was detached from the forty it does not forbid others if one was detached from the sixty it renders others forbidden why is one from forty different presumably because we say the forbidden article is among the majority then in the case of one from sixty two we must say the forbidden article is in the majority rather this is what he said if the forty were all separated to one place they do not render others forbidden if Sixty were detached to one place they render others forbidden when I stated this before Samuel he said to me leave idolatry alone for a doubt therein and a double doubt are forbidden for all time an objection is raised the doubt of idolatry is forbidden but a double doubt is permitted how so if a goblet of idolatry fell into a storeroom filled with goblets all are forbidden if one of these was detached and mixed up with ten thousand and from the ten thousand one was detached into ten thousand they are permitted it is a controversy of ten aim for it was taught our Judah said pomegranates of batten however small their proportion render others forbidden how so if one of them fell into ten thousand and one of the ten thousand into another ten thousand all are forbidden our Simeon be Judah said on our Simeon's authority if it fell into ten thousand they are forbidden but if one of the ten thousand fell into three and one of the three fell among others they are permitted in accordance with whom did Samuel rule if in accordance with our Judah it is forbidden even in the case of other interdicts if in accordance with our Simeon then even in the case of idolatry too a double doubt is permitted and should you say our Simeon allows a distinction between idolatry and other interdicts then when it was taught a doubt of idolatry is forbidden but a double doubt is permitted who is its author it is neither our Judah nor our Simeon in truth the author of this is our Simeon and he permits in the case of idolatry too while Samuel agrees with our Judah in one matter but disagrees in another the master said if one of the ten thousand fell into three and one of the three fell among others they are permitted Talmud, Ma Sebekim by are three different presumably because there is a majority then if it fell among two there is also a majority what does he mean by three two together with itself alternatively he agrees with our Eliza Rushlakish said if a cask of Terima was mixed up with a hundred casks of Hullen and one of them fell into the salt sea all of them become permitted for we assume the one which fell was the forbidden one now the rulings of both Arnaman and Reshlakish are necessary for if we learn from Arnaman's ruling I would say it applies to idolatry only because it has no remedy to permit it but in the case of Terima which has a remedy I would say that it is not so while if we learn from Reshlakish I would say it applies only to a cask whose fall is noticeable but as for a ring whose fall loss is not noticeable I would say that it is not so thus they are both necessary Rabbi said Reshlakish permitted only a cask whose fall is noticeable but not a fig but our Joseph said even a fig has its fall so its removal rise our Eliezer said if a closed cask of Terima fell among a hundred casks he opens one of them removes there from the proportion of the mixture and drinks the rest our Dimi sat and reported this ruling. Said our to him we see here quaffing and drinking say rather if one of them was opened he removes thereof the proportion of the mixture and drinks our Ashai said if a sealed cask of terima was mixed up with a hundred and fifty casks and a hundred of them were opened accidentally he removes from them the proportion of the mixture and drinks but the rest are forbidden until they are opened accidentally for we do not say the forbidden article is in the majority a robot or nearby etc. As for all the others it is well for their disqualification is not perceptible but how is this case of terfa possible if it is perceptible let the priest come and remove it whilst if he cannot distinguish it how does he know that a terfa was mixed up the school of Arjane said the circumstances here are e.g. that an animal perforated by a thorn was mixed up with one attacked by a wolf Reshlakish said it was mixed up e.g. with a fallen animal you say a fallen animal that two can be. Examined he holds that if it stood up it needs observation for 24 hours if it walked it needs examination our Jeremiah said e.g. it was mixed up with the young of a tirfa this being in accordance with our Eliza who maintained the young of a tirfa cannot be offered at the altar all these rabbis did not explain it as a school of our Jani because they hold that you can distinguish an animal perforated by a thorn from one attacked by a wolf as a perforation of the former is elongated whereas that of the latter is round they did not explain it as reshlakish for they hold if it arose it does not need 24 hours if it walked it does not need examination they did not explain it as our Jeremiah because they would not make it agree with our Eliza if a sacrifice was mixed up with a sacrifice both being of the same kind etc but the sacrifice requires laying on a pen said our Joseph it refers to sacrifices of women but not to men sacrifices Talmud. Ma Sebekim Abbe raised an objection to him if an individual sacrifice was mixed up with an individual sacrifice or a congregational sacrifice with a congregational sacrifice or if an individual sacrifice and a congregational sacrifice were mixed up the priest must make four applications of the blood of each sacrifice yet if he made an application of each he has fulfilled his obligation and if he made four applications from all its suffices when is the said if they were mixed up alive but if they were mixed up after being slaughtered he makes four applications for all of them yet if he made one application he fulfilled his duty rabbi said we examine the application if it contains sufficient for each it is fit if not it is unfit now he teaches about an individual who is similar to the congregation as the congregation consists of men so the individual means a man said rabbi and is it reasonable that this is correct as it stands surely not for he teaches when is this said if they were mixed up alive but not if they were mixed up when slaughtered but what does it matter whether they are alive or slaughtered rather this is what he means when is the said if they were mixed up when slaughtered as if they
Repair can it be weighed by the pound? Is the profit of Hitish of greater consideration or is the degradation of the firstling of greater consideration? Said Arhose Bz but a come and here if they were mixed up with the firstling or tithe they must graze until they become unfit and then they are eaten as firstling or tithe surely that means that they are not weighed by the pound. Arhuna and Arhazikia disciples of Ar Jeremiah said how compare there you have two sanctities and two bodies but here. You have two sanctities and one body to this Arhose B. Abin demurred what if he said redeem me a firstling which he had devoted to temple repair would we eat him if he says redeem surely the divine law said that it must not be redeemed rather said RMI did he transmit ought save what he possessed all sacrifices can be mixed up etc. Why are a sin offering and a guilt offering different presumably because one is a male and the other is a female and the same applies to a sin offering. And a burnt offering there is the ruler's he goat in the case of a guilt offering too there is the ruler's he goat one has hair and the other has wool a Passover offering and a guilt offering too cannot be mixed up for the former is a year old while the latter is two years old there are the Nazarite's guilt offering and the leper's guilt offering alternatively sometimes a year old looks like a two year old and sometimes a two year old looks like a year old mission if a guilt offering was Mixed up with a peace offering, our Simeon said they must be slaughtered at the north side of the altar and eaten in accordance with the laws of the more stringent of them. Said they to him, one must not bring sacrifices to the place of unfitness. If pieces of flesh were mixed up with pieces of flesh, most sacred sacrifices with lesser sacrifices, pieces that are eaten one day with those that are eaten two days and one night, they must be eaten in accordance with the laws of the more stringent of them. Gemara Tana recited before Rabbi, you must not purchase terima with the money of seventh year produce because you diminish the time allowed for its consumption. The rabbi stated in Rabbi's presence, this does not agree with our Simeon. For if it agreed with our Simeon, surely he maintained one may bring sacrifices to the place of unfitness. Said he to them, you may say that it agrees even with our Simeon. That is only when it was done, but not at the very outset, but not at the outset. Abe raised an objection to him Talmud, Masse Bakime and in all these the priests may deviate in their mode of eating and eat them roast stewed or boiled and they may season them with condiments of Hullin or Terima that is our Simeon's ruling leave the Terima of condiments he replied as it is only rabbinical he raised an objection you may not purchase Terima with second tithe money because you reduce its consumption but our Simeon permits it thereupon he was silent when he Abe came. Before our Joseph he said to him why did you not refute him from the following you may not boil seventh year vegetables in oil of Terima in order not to bring sacred food to the place of unfitness but our Simeon permits it said Abe to him did I not refute him from this law of condiments and he answered me leave the Terima of condiments as it is only rabbinical so here too he would answer me the Terima of vegetables is only rabbinical if so he the Tana should teach the reverse this. Vegetables of Terima with seventh year oil and did I not raise the objection to him and he answered me it means where they were mixed together so here too he could answer me that they were mixed together if they were mixed together what is the reason of the rabbis it is analogous to a guilt offering and a peace offering how compare there it has a remedy is in grazing whereas here it has no remedy in grazing this can only be compared to a piece mixed up with other pieces where since there is no remedy they are eaten in accordance with the laws of the more stringent of them to this rub and it emerged how compare when a piece is mixed up with other pieces it has no remedy at all whereas this has a remedy in squeezing out and our Joseph how shall we squeeze it out if we squeeze it out while seventh year produce is spoiled if we squeeze it a little then after all it remains mixed up he raised an objection to him our Simeon said on the morrow he brings his guilt offering Together with the log of oil and declares if this is a leper's offering, this is his guilt offerings and this is its log of oil Talmud, Ma Sevakim B and if not let this guilt offering be a vote of peace offering that guilt offering must be slaughtered in the north and requires sprinkling on the thumbs laying of hands the accompaniment of drink offerings and the waving of the breast and the thigh and it is eaten one day and one night a man's repair is different that is well of it. Guilt offering what can be said about the log of oil he declares if I was not a leper let this log be a vote of gift but perhaps he was not a leper and he must take off a fistful he does take off a fistful but perhaps he was a leper and he requires seven sprinklings he makes them but it is defective he brings a little more and replenishes it for we learned if the log became defective before he poured it he replenishes it but if the fistful must be burnt he does burn it on the altar. When if after the seven sprinklings it becomes a residue which was reduced between the taking of the fistful and the burning and you may then not burn the fistful on its account while if before the seven sprinklings we have the exegetical rule every offering whereof a portion has been consigned to the fire of the altar is subject to ye shall not make smoke burn said Arjuna the son of Arsimian because he brings it up on the altar as mere fuel for it was taught our Eliezer said for a sweet savor you may not take it up on the altar but you may take it up Talmud, Ma Sebakim for fuel but there is a residue which is to be eaten whereas we have this little more on whose account no fistful was taken he redeems it where does he redeem it if within the temple court then he brings Hullin into the temple court if without it becomes unfit through having gone out in truth he redeems it within but it is Hullin automatically yet surely Arsimian said you cannot bring oil. As a votive offering, the repair of a man is different. Our Rehumi sat before Rubina and stated in the name of Arhuna be Talifa, yet let him declare, let this guilt offering be a suspensive guilt offering. You may infer from this that the Tana who disagrees with our Eliezer and maintains that you cannot bring a suspensive guilt offering votively is our Simeon said he Rubina to him, our Rehumi Torah Torah, you have confused lambs with rams Mishnah if the limbs of a sin offering were mixed up with those of a burnt offering. Our Eliezer said he must place them all on the top of the altar and regard the flesh of the sin offering on top as though it were wood, but the sages maintain they must become disfigured and then go out to the place of burning tomorrow. What is our Eliezer's reason? Scripture saith, but they shall not come up for a sweet sabour on the altar for a sweet savour. You may not take it up on the altar, but you may take it up as wood, and the rabbis the divine law expressed a limitation. In the word them, them you may not bring up for a sweet savor but only as wood but not anything else and our Eliezer only in respect of them have I included the ascent making it like the altar but not in respect of anything else and the rabbis you may infer both things from it our mission does not agree with the following for it was taught our Judah said our Eliezer and the sages had no controversy about the limbs of a sin offering which were mixed up with the limbs of a burnt offering both agreeing that they must be offered up if mixed up with the limbs of a robot or nearby both agree that they must not be offered wherein do they differ about the limbs of an unblemished burnt offering which were mixed up with the limbs of a blemished one there our Eliezer maintains that they must be offered up on the altar and I regard the flesh of the blemished animal on top as mere wood while the sages say they must not be offered up now according to our Eliezer why are Roba and Nirba different presumably because they are not eligible a blemished animal too is not eligible Talmud, Ma Sebakim B said Arhunah it refers to cataracts in the eye and is in accordance with our Akiva who maintained that if they ascended the altar they do not descend granted that our Akiva ruled us if it was done did he ruled us at the very outset said our Papa the circumstances here are e.g. that they went up the ascent if so even when they are by themselves they must be offered. Rather this is our Eliezer's reason the divine law expressed a limitation and there is a blemish in them they shall not be accepted only when there is a blemish in them shall they not be accepted but when they are mixed up they are accepted and the rabbis only when the blemish is in them shall they not be accepted but if their blemish has gone they are accepted and our Eliezer he derives it from Bambahem and the rabbis they attribute no significance to Bambahem if so how can our Eliezer? Say I regard surely the divine law declared it fit he says this to them on their ruling in my opinion the divine law declared it fit but even on your view you should at least admit that the flesh of a blemished animal is like wood by analogy with the flesh of a sin offering and the rabbis here it is repulsive there it is not repulsive mission if the limbs of burnt offerings were mixed up with the limbs of a blemished burnt offering our Eliezer said if the priest offered the head of one of them all the heads are to be offered the legs of one of them all the legs are to be offered but the sages maintain even if they had offered all except one of them it goes forth to the place of burning tomorrow our Eliezer said our Eliezer decl
Impossible that one kind should not exceed the other and nullify it. You may infer three things from this. You may infer I interdicts nullify each other and you may infer two the interdict of taste in a greater quantity is not scriptural and you may infer three a doubtful warning is not called a warning robber raised an objection if one made a dough of wheat and rice if it tastes of corn it is subject to hell now that is so even if the greater part is rice that is by rabbinical law only. If so consider the sequel a man can fulfill his duty thereby on Passover Talmud, Ma Sebekim be rather when one kind is mixed with a different kind its status is determined by taste when one kind is mixed with the same kind its status is determined by the greater part yet where one kind is mixed with its own kind let us determine its status as though it were one kind with a different kind for we learned if it was mixed with wine we regard it as though it were water does that not mean that we regard the wine as though it were water no it means that we regard the blood as though it were water if so he should state the blood is nullified moreover it was taught our Judah said we regard it as though it were red wine if its appearance goes faint it is valid if not it is invalid it is a controversy of tanaim for it was taught if one immerses a pail containing white wine or milk we decide by the excess our Judah said we regard it as though it were red wine if its appearance goes faint it is valid if not it is invalid but the following contradicts this if one immersed a pail full of saliva it is as though he had not immersed it if it was full of urine we regard it as though it were water if it was filled with water of lustration the water of the meekway must exceed the water of lustration now whom do you know to hold that we regard our Judah yet he teaches that an excess is sufficient said Abay, there is no difficulty Talmud Latter is his own view, the former is his teachers, for it was taught our Judah said on our Gamaliel's authority, blood cannot nullify other blood, saliva cannot nullify saliva, and urine cannot nullify urine. Rabbah said we are discussing a pail which is clean on the inside and unclean on the outside by law, even a small quantity is sufficient, and it was only the rabbis who enacted a preventive measure lest one begrudge the water and not immerse it, since then we have an excess of mequay water. Nothing else is required, Rabbah said the rabbis have said that taste is a determining factor, and the rabbis have said that we decide by the majority, and the rabbis have said that we go by appearance when one kind is mixed with a different kind, taste is a determining factor when one kind is mixed with the same kind, the greater part determines its status, and where there is appearance we go by looks. Now Resh Lakish disagrees with our Eliezer, for our Eliezer said just as Precepts cannot nullify one another, so can interdicts not nullify one another. Whom do you know to maintain that precepts cannot nullify one another? It is Hillel, for it was taught it was related of Hillel the elder that he used to wrap them together, for it is said they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Talmud, Mas Sebekim B. Our rabbis taught us to the shard of Azab and Azab the first and second time it is unclean, the third time it is clean. When is that if one poured water into it, but if one did not pour water into it, it is unclean. Even the tenth time our Eliezer B. Jacob said at the third time it is clean, even if one did not pour water into it. Now, whom do you know to maintain that one kind is not nullified by its own kind? Our Judah, but the following contradicts it. If flax was spun by an who moves it is clean, but if it is damp, he who moves it is unclean on account of the fluid of her mouth. Our Judah said one also who moistens it in water is unclean on. Account of the fluid of her mouth, even if he washes it many times, said our papa saliva is different because it is increased to stead. If it was mixed with the blood of unfit animals, it must be poured out into the duct, etc. Wherein do they differ, said RZ, but they differ as to whether a preventive measure is enacted in the temple. One master holds that we enact a preventive measure, while the other master holds that we do not enact a preventive measure. Our papa said all agree that we do enact a preventive measure, but here they disagree as to whether it is usual for the draining blood to exceed the life blood. One master holds that it is common, while the other master holds that it is not common. As for our papa, it is well for that reason he teaches if it was mixed with the blood of unfit animals, it must be poured out into the duct with the draining blood, it must be poured out into the duct, but according to RZ, but let him attend combine them and teach them together that indeed is a Difficulty mission if blood of whole unblemished animals was mixed with blood of blemished animals it must be poured out into the duct if a goblet was mixed up with other goblets our Eliezer said if he the priest offered sprinkled one goblet all the goblets are offered but the sages maintain even if they offered all of them save one it must be poured out into the duct if blood that is sprinkled below was mixed with blood that is sprinkled above our Eliezer said he must sprinkle it above and I regard the lower blood above as though it were water and then he sprinkles again below but the sages maintain it must be poured out into the duct yet if the priest did not ask but sprinkled it it is fit Talmud Ma Sebekim if blood which requires one application was mixed with blood also requiring one application if the mixture should be presented with one application if blood which requires four applications was mixed with blood requiring four applications they must be presented with four applications blood which requires four applications with that which requires one application our Eliezer said it the mixture must be presented with four applications our Joshua maintained it must be presented with one application said our Eliezer to him but lo he transgresses the injunction not to diminish from God's commandment lo he transgresses the injunction not to add thereto our Joshua countered the injunction not to add applies only where it is by itself replied our Eliezer the injunction not to diminish applies only where it is by itself our Joshua answered moreover said our Joshua when you make four applications you transgress the injunction not to add and commit a positive action with your own hands whereas when you do not make four applications you transgress the injunction not to diminish but do not commit a positive action with your own hands our Eliezer said our Eliezer declared them fit only in twos but not singly our Dimi raised an objection, but the sages maintain even if they offered all of them save one, it must be poured out into the duct. Said our Jacob to our Jeremiah B. Talifi, I will explain it to you. What does one mean? One pair now both are necessary, for if it were stated in the former case, I would argue that only there does our Eliza rule thus because his atonement was already made therewith, but in the present instance he agrees with the rabbis, while if it were stated in the present case, I would argue that only here do the rabbis rule thus, but in the former instance they agree with our Eliza, hence both are necessary. We learned elsewhere in the case of a flask into which a little water fell, our Eliza said he the priest makes two sprinklings, but the sages disqualify it. As for the rabbis, it is well they hold that we assume even distribution and sprinkling requires a minimum standard, and sprinklings do not combine, but what does our Eliza hold if he holds that there is no even distribution? What if he does? Sprinkle twice perhaps he sprinkles ordinary water both times rather he holds that there is even distribution now if he holds that sprinkling does not require a minimum standard why must he sprinkle twice rather he holds that sprinkling does require a minimum standard and if he holds that sprinklings do not combine what if he does sprinkle twice and even if sprinklings do combine who can say that the standard is made up said Resh Lakish in truth he holds that there is even distribution and sprinkling does require a minimum standard but the case we discuss here is where one standard quantity was mixed up with another Rabbi said in truth there is even distribution and sprinkling does not require a standard but the rabbis penalized him so that he should not benefit thereby our Ashi said there is no even distribution therefore he must sprinkle twice an objection is raised Rabbi said according to our Eliza the sprinkling of any quantity purifies sprinkling does not require a Standard sprinkling is permissible if half the water is fit and half is unfit Talmud. Ma Sebekim be moreover it was explicitly taught if blood which is applied above was mixed with blood that is applied below our Eliezer said he must sprinkle it above and the lower blood acquits him but if you say that there is no even distribution why does it acquit him perhaps he sprinkled the upper blood below and the lower blood above the case we discuss here is where we have an excess of upper blood and he sprinkles above the quantity of the lower blood plus a little more but he teaches that the lower blood acquits him it counts as the residue come and here if he the priest sprinkled it without asking our Eliezer said he must resprinkle above and the lower blood acquits him here too the excess was upper blood and he sprinkles above the quantity of the lower blood plus a little more but he teaches that the lower blood acquits him it counts as the residue Come and here if he sprinkled it above without asking both agree that he must resprinkle below and both sprinklings are credited to him here too the excess was upper blood and he sprinkles above the quantity of the lower blood plus a little
Add there to rather said rabba where the blood is mixed together they do not disagree they disagree in respect of the goblets or Eliza holds a view that we regard etc while the rabbis reject the view that we regard etc now do they not disagree where the blood itself is mingled surely it was taught our Judah said our Eliza and the sages did not dispute about the blood of a sin offering which was mixed with the blood of a burnt offering both agreeing that it must be offered sprinkled if it was mixed with the blood of a robot or a nearby they agree that it must not be offered about what do they disagree about the blood of an unblemished animal which was mixed with the blood of a blemished animal there our Eliza maintains that it must be offered whether the blood itself is mingled or whether the goblets are mixed while the sages say that it must not be offered our Judah when teaching our Eliza's view relates it to both mixing of the blood itself and to that of the goblets, but the rabbis hold that they disagree about goblets. Only Abbe said they learned this only of the beginning of the sin offering and the burnt offering. But as to the end of the sin offering and the beginning of the burnt offering, all agree that the place of the burnt offering is the place of the residue. Said our Joseph to him, thus did our Judah say the residue requires the projection. And thus said Reshlagish, they learned this only of the beginning of the sin offering and the burnt offering. But as to the end of the sin offering and the beginning of the burnt offering, all agree that the place of the burnt offering is the place of the residue. Whereas our Yohan and others say our Eliezer said there is still the controversy. Our Hunabi Judah raised an objection. They are holy. This teaches that if the blood of a firstling was mixed with the blood of other sacrifices, it must be offered sprinkled. Surely it speaks of the end of the burnt offering and the beginning of a Firstling and this proves that the place of the burnt offering is the place of the residue. No, it speaks of the beginning of the burnt offering and that of the firstling. What then does it inform us that sacrifices do not nullify one another? Surely that is deduced from the text, and he shall take of the blood of the bullock and of the blood of the goat. It is a controversy of Tanaim. One deduces it from this text, and another deduces it from the other text. Robber raised an objection and errands. Sons, the priests shall present the blood and dash the blood round about against the altar. Talmud, Mas Sebakim, by his blood repeated for one. I think I only know about a burnt offering which was mixed up with its substitute, for even if they were mixed up whilst alive, they must be offered. Whence do I know to include the thanks offering and the peace offering? I include the thanks offering and the peace offering because they can be brought as a votive or a free will offering like itself. Whence do I know to include the guilt offering? I include the guilt offering which requires four applications like itself. Whence do I know to include a firstling tithe and the Passover offering because it says blood blood now surely that speaks of the end of the burnt offering and the beginning of the firstling whence you may infer that the place of the burnt offering is the place of the residue. No, it speaks of the beginning of the burnt offering and that of the firstling what then does. He inform us that sacrifices do not nullify one another surely that is deduced from the text and he shall take of the blood of the bullock and of the blood of the goat. It is a controversy of Tanaim one deduces it from this text and another deduces it from the other text. Now these Tanaim do not learn it from and he shall take of the blood of the bullock and of the blood of the goat because they hold you do not mingle the blood for sprinkling on the horns they do not learn it from it. Repetition of blood because they do not attribute any significance to this repetition, but why do they not deduce it from they are holy? They hold that they are holy teachers, they are offered, but their substitute is not offered, and the other he deduces it from whether it be ox or sheep, it is the Lord's, it is offered, but its substitute is not offered. Come and hear if the priest sprinkled it above without asking, both agree that he must resprinkle it below, and both are accounted to him. Now, does that not mean that the blood of a sin offering and that of a burnt offering were mixed, in which case, as soon as he sprinkles above, it becomes a residue, yet he teaches both agree that he must resprinkle it below, which proves that the place of the burnt offering is the place of the residue. When our Isaac B. Joseph came, he said in the West, they said the case we are discussing here is where, e.g., the blood of an outer sin offering was mixed with the residue of an inner sin offering. Said Abbe to him, yet let the master say, e.g., where it was mixed with the residue, perhaps this is what you would inform us even on the view that the residue is indispensable, yet if some of it is lacking, it does not matter, said Rabbit Tasfaya Rabbin, but we have explained that as meaning that the greater part was upper blood and he sprinkles above as much as there was of the lower blood plus a little more that was only he replied on the hypothesis first stated that the Mishnah treats of where the blood itself was mingled and in accordance with the thesis that there is no even distribution, but in our final conclusion we hold that they disagree where the goblets were mixed up Mishnah, if blood which is to be sprinkled within was mixed with blood that is to be sprinkled without it must be poured out into the duct if the priest sprinkled without and then sprinkled within it is valid if he sprinkled within and then resprinkled without our Akiba declares it unfit while the sages. Declare it fit for our Akiba maintained all blood which entered the call to make atonement is unfit but the sages rule the sin offering alone is unfit our Eliezer said the guilt offering too for it says as is the sin offering so is the guilt offering tomorrow now let our Eliezer disagree here too what should be done shall we first sprinkle without and then sprinkle within that cannot be done because just as the upper blood must precede the lower so must the inner precede the outer Talmud. Ma Sebakim then let us first sprinkle within and then sprinkle without since the sin offering and the guilt offering become unfit if their blood enters within he could not give a general ruling for our Akiba maintained etc. Rab Judah said in Samuel's name for example to what may our Akiba's ruling be compared to a disciple who was mixing wine for his master with hot water when he the master said to him mix me a drink with what he inquired are we not occupied with hot water he replied. Now then I mean with either hot or cold so here to consider we are discussing the sin offering for what purpose then does the divine law write sin offering to teach I do not mean a sin offering alone but all sacrifices to this are who not the son of our Joshua the Merd consider all sacrifices are included in respect of scouring and rinsing why then does the divine law write sin offering hence you may infer from this only the sin offering but nothing else this then can only be compared to a disciple who was mixing a drink for his master with either hot or cold water when he said to him mix it for me with hot water only rather our Akiba's reason is that in every sin offering is written where and a sin offering would suffice for it was taught a sin offering I know this only of a sin offering how do we know it of most sacred sacrifices in general because it says every sin offering how do we know it of lesser sacrifices because it says and every sin offering this is the view of our Akiba said our Jose the Galilean to him even if you go on including all day I will pay no heed to you rather a sin offering I only know this of a private sin offering whence do we know it of a public sin offering because it says every sin offering again I know it only of a male sin offering whence do I know it of a female sin offering because it says and every it is just the reverse rather this is what he means I only know it of a female sin offering whence do I know it of a male sin offering from the text and every sin offering now does our Jose the Galilean hold that this text comes for this purpose surely it was taught our Jose the Galilean said the whole passage speaks only of the bullocks which were to be burnt and the he goats which were to be burnt and its purpose is I to teach that when they are disqualified they must be burnt before the temple and to to impose a negative injunction against eating them said they to him as to an outer sin offering whose Blood entered the innermost sanctuary whence do we know that it is disqualified said he to them from the verse behold the blood of it was not brought into the sanctuary within he argues on our Akiba's contention mission if the blood of a sin offering was received in two goblets and one of them went without the inside one is fit if one of them entered within our Jose the Galilean declares the outer one fit but the sages disqualify it said our Jose the Galilean if the place where an intention directed to it disqualifies is without you do not treat what is left as what went out then the place where an intention directed to it does not disqualify is within is it not logical that we do not treat what is left as what entered within if it entered within to make atonement even if he the priest did not make atonement it is unfit these are the words of our Eliza our Simeon said it is not unfit unless he makes atonement our Judah said if he took it in unwittingly it is fit for all Unfit blood which was presented at the altar, i.e., sprinkled the headplate does not propitiate save for unclean blood, for the headplate propitiates for that which is unclean but does not propitiate for what goes out. Gemara, it was taught our Jose the Galilean said it is a KALW a homer if the place where an intention directed to it disqualifies is without the blood without does not disqualify that which is within and the place where an intention directed
Blood within is it not logical that an intention concerning without shall not disqualify therefore scripture writes there which means after time while pickle means without bounds flesh which goes without becomes unfit that which enters within is fit now logically it might be unfit for it though the blood without does not disqualify the blood within flesh which goes without becomes unfit and since blood within does disqualify blood without is it not logical that flesh which enters within shall be disqualified lo it says any of the blood its blood disqualifies but not its flesh then in that case you can argue a fortiori if though the blood within disqualifies the blood without flesh that enters within is fit then since blood without does not disqualify blood within is it not logical that flesh that goes without is fit lo it says therefore ye shall not eat any flesh that is torn of beast in the field once flesh passes without bounds it is forbidden our rabbis taught Behold the blood of it was not brought into the sanctuary within I only know it of within how do we know it of they call because it says into the sanctuary within then let the sanctuary be stated but not within said Rabba one comes and illuminates the other this being analogous to the case of Tashab and Sakir for it was taught Tashab means one a Hebrew slave acquired in perpetuity Sakir one purchased for a period of six years now let Tashab be stated but not Sakir and I would reason if one acquired in perpetuity may not eat how much more so one acquired only for a period of six years were it so I would say Tashab is one purchased for a limited period but one acquired in perpetuity may eat therefore Sakir comes and teaches the meaning of Tashab that the latter is one purchased in perpetuity while the former is one purchased for a period of six years and neither may eat said to him as for there it is well there are two persons and though scripture could write a Slave whose ear was bored may not eat and the other would be inferred a minori yet scripture often takes the trouble to write a thing which is derived a minori but here since it becomes unfit and they call what business has the inner sanctuary rather said abe it is required only where the priest takes a circuitous route said rabba to him but entering is written in connection there with rather said rabba whatever the priest intends to carry into the innermost sanctuary does not become unfit and they call rabba asked what if the priest carried the blood of the congregational bullock for forgetfulness or that he goat for idolatry into the innermost sanctuary do we say scripture writes into the sanctuary within wherever we read into the sanctuary we read within and wherever we do not read into the sanctuary we do not read within or perhaps it is not in its place now should you answer that it is not in its place what if the priest sprinkled the blood of the bullock and that of the ego of the day of atonement on the slaves then carried it out into the call and then took it in again do we say it is their place or perhaps once it has gone out it has gone out should you answer once it has gone out it has gone out what if he sprinkled their blood on the veil Talmud Moss Sabakim carried it out to the altar and then carried it within here it is certainly the same place or perhaps we designate this carrying going out the question stand over if it entered within to make atonement it was taught our Eliza said it is stated here to make atonement in the holy place and it is stated elsewhere and there shall be no man in the tent of appointment when he goeth in to make atonement in the holy place as there it means when he has not yet made atonement so here too it means when he has not yet made atonement our Simeon said it is stated here to make atonement and it is stated elsewhere and the bullock of the sin offering and the goat of the sin offering Whose blood was brought in to make atonement as there it means when he had already made atonement so here it means where he made atonement wherein do they differ one master holds you learn without from without but you do not learn without from within while the other master holds you learn an animal from an animal but you do not learn an animal from man our Judah said etc but if the priest took it in deliberately it is disqualified when if he made atonement or even if he did not make atonement said our Jeremiah it was taught since it is said and the bullock of the sin offering and the goat of the sin offering whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place why is it further said and he that burneth them shall wash his clothes you ask why is it further said and he that burneth them that is required for itself rather the question is why is sin offering repeated because we have only learned that when the bullock and the goat of the day of atonement are Burnt they defile garments. How do we know the same of other sacrifices which are burnt because sin offering is repeated? These are the words of our Judah. Our Meir said that exegesis is unnecessary. Lo, it says, and the bullock of the sin offering and the ego of the sin offering. Now to make atonement need not be stated. Why then is to make atonement stated? It teaches that with all atoning sacrifices, he that burns them, the sacrifices defile his garments. Whereas our Judah does not understand to make atonement in that way. What is the reason? Surely because he utilizes it for exerisha wa chapterix mission. The altar sanctifies whatever is eligible for it. Our Joshua said, whatever is eligible for the altar fire does not descend. Hence, once it ascended, because it is said that is the burnt offering upon its fire. What is the burnt offering which is eligible for the altar fire does not descend. Once it ascended, so whatever is eligible for the altar fire does not descend. Once it Ascended Argamaliel said whatever is eligible for the altar does not descend once it ascended because it is said that is the burnt offering upon its firewood upon the altar as the burnt offering which is eligible for the altar does not descend once it ascended so whatever is eligible for the altar does not descend once it ascended Argamaliel and Arjashua differ only in respect of the blood and libations Argamaliel maintaining that they must not descend while Arjashua maintains that they must descend our Simeon said if the sacrifice is fit while the libations which accompany it are unfit or if the libations are fit while the sacrifice is unfit or even if both are unfit the sacrifice must not descend while the libations do descend Talmud Ma Sevakim Bigamara only what is eligible for IT but not what is not eligible for it what does this exclude said our Papa it excludes fistfuls which were not sanctified in a service vessel to this rubbin how does this differ from Ola's ruling for Ola said if the emurim of lesser sacrifices were laid on the altar before the sprinkling of their blood they are not removed because they have become the food of the altar the latter do not themselves lack a right while the former themselves lack a right our Joshua said whatever is eligible for the altar fire etc and our Gamaliel too surely it is written the burnt offering upon its firewood that comes to teach that limbs which spring off from the altar must be replaced and the other how does he know that the limbs which spring off must be replaced he deduces it from where to the fire hath consumed and the other that is required for teaching what was consumed as a burnt offering you must replace but you do not replace what was consumed as incense Kedareth for our hand of Abimanyamai the son of our Eliezer be Jacob recited and he shall take up the ashes where to the fire hath consumed the burnt offering on the altar what was consumed as a burnt offering you Replace but you do not replace what was consumed as incense and the other do you then not learn automatically that we replace what was consumed as a burnt offering our Gamaliel said what is eligible etc and our Joshua too surely upon the altar is written he requires that as follows what does the divine law say whatever is eligible for its fire with the altar sanctifies and the other another altar is written and the other one is required where it had a period of fitness while the other text is required where it had no period of fitness and the other since they are now unfit and the divine law included them there is no difference whether they had a period of fitness or did not have a period of fitness our Simeon said if the sacrifice is fit etc it was taught our Simeon said scripture speaks of a burnt offering as a burnt offering comes on its own account so all which come on their own account are included hence libations which come on account of a sacrifice are excluded our Jose. The Galilean said from the text whatsoever touch it the altar shall be holy I understand whether it is eligible for the altar or not eligible therefore scripture states now this is what thou shalt offer upon the altar two lambs as lambs are eligible for the altar so whatever is eligible is included our Akiva said scripture states burnt offering as a burnt offering is eligible for the altar so whatever is eligible is included wherein do they differ said our Adabi Akiva they differ about a disqualified burnt offering of a bird one master deduces the law from burnt offering while the other master deduces it from lambs now as to the one who deduces it from lambs surely burnt offering too is written if lambs were written while burnt offering were not written I would think that the law applies even if they became disqualified while yet alive therefore the divine law wrote burnt offering and as to the one who deduces it from burnt offering surely lambs is written if Burnt offering were written while lambs were not written I would think that the law applies even to a meal offering therefore the divine Lord lambs were and do these tanaim and the tanaim of our mission differ said our papa they differ in respect of fistfuls which were sanctified in a service vessel according to our tanaim they do not descend while according to the other tanaim they descend reshlakish said with regard
thereof and their drink offerings can be brought at night. The meal offerings thereof and their drink offerings can be brought on the morrow there as drink offerings libations which are brought by themselves and our Simeon admits that they do not descend. Hence Eresh Lakish informs us that it is not so Mishnah the following do not descend once they ascended flesh that is kept overnight or that goes out of its permitted boundaries or which is unclean or which was slaughtered with. The intention of consuming same after time or without bounds or if unfit persons received and sprinkled its blood Arjuna said that which was slaughtered at night or whose blood was spilt or whose blood passed without the hangings if it ascended must descend our Simeon said it does not descend because our Simeon maintained if its disqualification arose in the sanctuary the sanctuary receives it if its disqualification did not arise in the sanctuary the sanctuary does not receive it the disqualification of the following did not arise in the sanctuary a and nearby one set aside for an idolatrous sacrifice an animal worshipped idolatrously a harlot's higher dogs exchange kill a yim tear an animal cab through the caesarean section and blemished animals are akiba declared blemished animals fit run into the seat of the priest said my father used to repulse blemished animals from off the altar just as they do not descend once they ascended so they do not ascend if they had descended and all of these if they ascended to the top of the altar whilst alive must descend if a burnt offering went up alive to the top of the altar it must descend if one slaughtered it on the top of the altar he must play it and dismember it where it lies Gamar it was taught Arjuna said this is the law of the burnt offering it is that which goeth up on its firewood upon the altar all night unto the morning here you have three limitations it excludes an animal slaughtered at night an animal whose blood was spilled and an animal whose blood passed out beyond the hangings if any one of these ascended the altar it must descend our Simeon said burnt offering I only know this of a fit burnt offering whence do I know to include one which was slaughtered at night or whose blood was spilled or whose blood passed without the hangings or the flesh of which spent the night away from the altar or went out or the unclean or which was slaughtered with the intention of burning its flesh after time or without bounce or whose blood was received and sprinkled by unfit persons or whose blood was applied below the scarlet line when it should be applied above or above when it should be applied below or without when it should be applied within or within when it should be applied without or a Passover offering or a sin offering which one slaughtered for a different purpose whence do we know to include all these from the phrase the law of the burnt offering which intimates one law for all burnt offerings is that if they ascended they do not descend you might think that I also include a robot and a nearby one set aside for an idolatry sacrifice or worship a harlot tire or the price of a dog or a hybrid or a tirfa or an animal cab through the caesarean section scripture however states it is that and why do you include the former and exclude the latter since scripture includes Talmud, Ma Sevakim B and excludes I include it. Former because their disqualification arose in the sanctuary while I exclude the latter whose disqualification did not arise in the sanctuary but Arjuna infers the law from the following why did they say that if blood is kept overnight it is fit because if the emirim are kept overnight they are fit why are the emirim fit if they are kept overnight because flesh is fit if kept overnight flesh that goes out because flesh that goes out is fit at the high place bam unclean flesh. Because it was permitted in public service the emirim of a sacrifice intended to be burnt after time because it propitiates in respect of its pickle status the emirim of a sacrifice intended to be burnt out of bounds because it was likened to the intention to burn it after time where unfit persons received the blood and sprinkled it in the case of those unfit persons who are eligible for public service can you then argue from what is its proper way to that where the same is not it. Proper way the tanner relies on the extension indicated by this is the law of the burnt offering. Are Yohanan said if one slaughters an animal at night within and offers it without he is culpable Talmud, Ma Sevakim let this not be less than slaughtering without and offering up the limbs without our high Abin raised an objection one who slaughters a bird within and offers it up without is not culpable if he slaughtered it without and offered it up without he is culpable yet let us say. Let it not be less than slaughtering and offering up without that is a refutation alternatively the slaughtering of a bird within is mere killing Allah said if the emirim of lesser sacrifices are laid on the altar before their blood is sprinkled they do not descend because they have become the food of the altar are zero observably to learn likewise that whose blood was spilled or whose blood passed without the hangings if you say there that if the limbs or emirim ascended they do not. Descend though if he the priest should come to sprinkle he has nothing to sprinkle how much more so you're seeing that if he comes to sprinkle he has what to sprinkle no relate this to a most sacred sacrifice but there is the Passover offering which is a lesser sacrifice relate this to where it is slaughtered under a different designation we learned and all of these if they ascended the altar whilst alive must descend hence if they ascended when slaughtered they do not descend surely. That is so whether they are most sacred sacrifices or lesser sacrifices no deduce thus but if they are slaughtered some of these must descend and some do not descend but he teaches and all of these that refers to whilst alive that is obvious in truth it refers to living animals which have a cataract in the eye this being in accordance with our Akiba who maintain that if these ascend they do not descend how have you explained it as referring to unfit animals and consider the final clause. If a burnt offering went up alive to the top of the altar it must descend if one slaughtered it on the top of the altar he must play it and dismember it where it lies but if it is unfit can it be flayed and dismembered surely the divine law said and he shall cut it into pieces it implies a fit but not an unfit animal the final clause refers to a fit sacrifice and what does he the tana inform us that flaying and dismembering can be done on top of the altar then on the view that flaying and dismembering cannot be done on top of the altar what can be said the case we discuss here is e.g. where it had a period of fitness and then became disqualified disagreeing with our Eliezer son of our Simeon who maintained since the blood was sprinkled and the flesh had become acceptable even for a single hour he must play it and its skin belongs to the priest if so when it was taught what does he do he takes down the inwards and washes them why should he do so what then should we do offer i.e. burn them with their dung presented now unto thy governor will he be pleased with thee or will he accept that person this is our difficulty why must he wash them so that if another priest chances upon them and does not know he will take them up Talmud, Ma Sevakim B and shall we arise and do a thing to priests whereby they may come to a stumbling block even so it is better that divine sacrifices should not lie like carrion our high B Abba said our Yohan and ask if the Emirim of lesser sacrifices were taken up before their blood was sprinkled must they go down or not said our I to him then inquire about a trespass offering I do not ask about a trespass offering he replied because sprinkling alone makes it subject to a trespass offering I only ask about their going down and he eventually ruled that they do not go down and do not involve trespass our Naman B Isaac recited it thus our high B Abba said our Yohan and ask if the Emirim of lesser sacrifices were taken up before their blood was sprinkled do they involve a trespass offering or not said rmi to him then ask about their going down i do not ask about going down he replied because they have become the food of the altar i ask only about a trespass offering and eventually he ruled they do not go down and do not involve trespass the disqualification of the following did not arise in the sanctuary etc our yohan and said only in the case of cataracts in the eye did our akiba declare them fit since such are fit in the case of birds and provided that their consecration for a sacrifice preceded their blemish and our akiba admits in the case of a female burnt offering that it must be taken down because that is tantamount to the blemish preceding its consecration our jeremiah asked is nearby disqualification in birds or is nearby no disqualification in birds do we say you shall bring your offering of the cattle excludes roba and nearby hence whatever is subject to the disqualification of roba is Subject to the disqualification of Nirba and whatever is not subject to Roba is not subject to Nirba or perhaps sin has been committed with it said Rabba come and here our Akiba declared blemished animals fit now if this is correct let him also declare a Nirba fit since it is fit in the case of birds hence infer from this that it is not fit our Naman B Isaac said we too have learned thus with regard to a Nirba bird set apart for an idolatry sacrifice a bird worship a harlot's hire. The price of a dog a tum tum and a hermaphrodite all of these defiled garments when they are in the gullet this proves it our hand of the seeking of the priests what does he inform us I can say that he informs us of the actual fact alternatively what does he repulse mean indirectly just as they do not descend if they once ascended etc Ola said they learned this only where the
Priests shall make the whole smoke on the altar if they are severed from the animal they do not go up for it is said and thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings of flesh and the blood upon the altar of the Lord thy God Gemara our rabbis taught and the priests shall make the whole smoke on the altar this includes the bones tendons horns and hoofs you might think even if they were severed therefore it states and thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings of flesh and the blood if we had only the text flesh and blood to go by Talmud Ma Sebekim you might have thought that one must remove the tendons and bones and lay only flesh on the altar therefore it says and the priests shall make the whole smoke how are these texts reconciled if they are attached they ascend if they are severed even if they are on the top of the altar they must go down which tana do you know to maintain that if they were severed they must go down it is rabbi for it was taught and the priests shall make the Whole smoke on the altar. This includes the bones, tendons, horns, and hoofs. Even if they were severed, how do then I interpret? And thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings of flesh and the blood. It is to teach you burnt pieces, flesh of the burnt offering you must replace on the altar. But you do not replace burnt tendons and bones. Rabbi said one text states, and the priest shall make the whole smoke on the altar, thus extending the law. While another text states, and thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings of flesh and the blood, thus limiting it. How do you reconcile them? If they are attached, they ascend. If they are severed, even if they are on the top of the altar, they descend. If they are severed from the animal, they do not go up, etc. Our Zara said they learned this only if they were severed downwards. But if they were severed upwards, they come nearer to being burnt. Even if they were severed, said Rabbi, this is what he means. They learned this only if they were severed after sprinkling. But if they were severed before sprinkling, the sprinkling comes and makes them permitted for general use, even to make from them a knife handle. He holds as our Yohanan said on our Ishmael's authority, it shall be as the priest's set of the burnt offering, and it shall be as a set of the guilt offering, as the bones of the guilt offering are permitted for even its flesh is permitted to the priest, so are the bones of the burnt offering permitted. This must be redundant, for if it is not redundant, you can refute the deduction as for a guilt offering. The reason is because its flesh is permitted, it is redundant, for it's superfluous, it shall be as is written. Our Adabi, I have raised an objection. The bones of sacrifices involve trespass before sprinkling, but do not involve trespass after sprinkling, whereas the bones of the burnt offering always involve trespass, say, whereas those of the burnt offering, if they were severed before sprinkling, involve trespass until the sprinkling, if they were. Severed after sprinkling, they always involve trespass. Now, Yerabba disagrees with our Eliezer, for our Eliezer said if they were severed before sprinkling, they involve trespass. After sprinkling, one must not use them, but they do not involve trespass. Mission, and if any of these sprang off from the altar, they are not replaced. Similarly, if a coal sprang off from the altar, it is not replaced. Limbs that sprang off from the altar if before midnight must be replaced and involve trespass after midnight. They are not replaced and do not involve trespass, just as the altar sanctifies whatever is eligible for it, so does the ascent sanctify whatever is eligible for it, and just as the altar and the ascent sanctify whatever is eligible for them, so do vessel sanctify tomorrow. How is it meant if they have substance, then even after midnight to let them be returned, while if they have no substance, even before midnight to they need not be returned. This holds good only Talmud, Ma Sebekim of. Hardened limbs whence do we know it said Rabbah one text states this is the law of the burnt offering it is that which goeth upon its firewood upon the altar all night and he shall burn thereon etc. Whereas another text states all night and he shall take up the ashes how are these texts reconciled divided the night half is for burning and half for taking up the ashes are Kahana raised an objection every day he the priest takes up the ashes at cock crow or slightly before or slightly after on the day of atonement he does this at midnight on festivals at the first watch if then you maintain that the altar must be cleared from midnight onwards how may we advance it said are you had and from the implication of all night do I not know that it is until the morning why then is unto the morning stated at another morning to the morning of the night therefore every day it is sufficient from cock crow on the day of atonement it is done at midnight on account of it. Fatigue of the high priest on festivals when there were many sacrifices and so the Israelites came very early it was done at the first watch as the sequel teaches and before Kakro the temple court was full of Israelites it was stated if they sprang off before midnight and he replaced them after midnight Rabbi said Talmud, Ma Sevakim of the second midnight consumes them Arhista said the dawn consumes them the scholars of the academy said what is Arhista's reason if midnight which does not establish Lina establishes Eichel then dawn which establishes Lina surely establishes Eichel if they sprang off before midnight and he replaced them after dawn Rabbi said the second midnight consumes them Arhista said they never reach Eichel to this Arjos of and who is to tell us that midnight establishes Eichel only when they are on the top of the altar perhaps it establishes Eichel wherever they are they sent from hence the law agrees with Arjos it was stated likewise Arhi Abba said if they sprang off before midnight and were replaced after midnight you may not use them nor do you commit trespass on their account. Barkabur taught likewise if they sprang off before midnight and were replaced after midnight they are not subject to trespass. Our Papa asked Abba now since they sent from there that the law agrees with our Joseph and our Hibi. Abba said the same and Barkabur taught likewise wherein do Rabba and Arhista disagree in the case of fat limbs he answered him Rabba asked Rabba is Lina effective when the limbs are on the top of the altar or is it not effective on top of the altar what are the circumstances if we say that they, the limbs did not descend surely since you say that even if they were kept overnight in the temple court they do not descend can there be a question when they are kept on the top of the altar rather the question is where they descended do we liken it to the table for we learned even if they are on the table. Many days it does not matter or perhaps we liken it to the pavement of the temple court said he to him Lin is not effective when the flesh is on the top of the altar did he accept this ruling from him or did he not accept it from him come and here for it was stated limbs which spent the night in the temple court the priest can go on burning them all night if they were kept overnight on the top of the altar he can always go on burning them if they descended Rabbi said they reascend. Rabbi said they do not reascend this proves that he did not accept the ruling from him this proves it just as the altar sanctifies etc our rabbis taught whatsoever touches the altar shall be holy I know it only of the altar how do I know it of the ascent because it says the altar how do we know it of service vessels because it says whatsoever touch it them shall be holy reshlakish ask our Yohan and do the service vessel sanctify the disqualified we have learned that he replied just. As the altar and the ascent sanctify whatever is eligible for them, so do vessel sanctify. Said he, my question is whether they can be offered in the first place, but that too we have learned Talmud, Ma Sevakim B, or where unfit persons received and sprinkled the blood. Surely that means where unfit persons received and sprinkled the blood. No, it may mean that unfit persons received it or unfit persons sprinkled the blood. The scholars ask, is the airspace above the altar as the altar? Or not come and here just as the altar sanctifies, so does the ascent sanctify. Now, if you say that the airspace above the altar is not as the altar, then the airspace above the ascent too is not as the ascent. How then can one carry it up from the ascent to the altar, seeing that it is as having descended? He drags it, but there was a gap between the ascent and the altar when the greater part of it, the limb is nearer the ascent, it is as though it were on the ascent, and when the greater part of it is nearer the altar it is as though it were on the altar then from this you can solve Rami Biham's question this is there a connective in limbs which ascend the altar or not solve that there is a connective that is no difficulty then solve it Rabbi son of Arhain and Demert if you say that the airspace above the altar is as the altar how is it possible for a burnt offering of a bird to be disqualified through an illegitimate intention surely the altar has received it Arshai my Biashi Demert why not it is possible e.g. where he declared behold I pinch it intending to take it off tomorrow from the altar then carry it up again and burn it that is well according to Rabbi who maintained that Lina is effective when the sacrifice is on top of the altar but according to Rabbi who held that Lina is not effective on top of the altar his intention certainly does not count according to Rabbi too it is possible e.g. if he declared behold I pinch it with the intention of Taking it down before dawn and taking it up again after dawn at all events you can solve the question in the other direction viz that the airspace of the altar is as the altar for should you think that the airspace of an altar is not as the altar
Meal offering is dry in comparison with blood. Samuel said the service vessel sanctified only when wholeful and through the inside others stated they sanctify only when wholeful and within were and do they differ they differ in respect of the overflow of measures in a very that it was taught they sanctify only when full whole through the inside and within R.C. said in our Yohanan's name they learned this only where he the priest does not intend to add thereto but if he intends adding. Thereto each portion becomes holy in turn it was taught likewise both of them filled with fine flour filled means complete said our Jose when is that when he does not intend to add thereto but if he intends to add thereto each portion becomes holy in turn a liquid vessel does not sanctify etc. Rab others state R.C. said they do not sanctify to be offered but they sanctify it to be disqualified others recited in connection with the following you may not bring meal offerings drink. Offerings and the meal offering of an animal sacrifice or the first fruits from a mixture and it goes without saying from Orla and Kilayim of the vineyard if one did bring such it is not sanctified said Rabbi other state RC it is not sanctified to be offered but it is sanctified to be disqualified our rabbis taught when holy vessels are perforated you may not melt them nor melt lead into them if they were damaged you may not repair them if a knife was damaged you may not smooth out the damage if it slipped out of its haft you may not replace it Abbasal said there was a knife which caused her foot in the temple whereupon the priests decided by vote to hide it our rabbis taught the priestly garments were not sewn but woven as it is said of woven work if soiled they might not be washed with natron or with ale but you may wash them in water said Abbe this is what he means if they merely needed water you may wash them even with natron or ale Talmud Masabakim if they needed natron or ale you may not wash them even in water others maintain you may not wash them at all because there is no poverty in the place of wealth our rabbis taught the robe meil was entirely of blue as it is said and he made the robe of the ephod of woven work all of blue how were its skirts made blue wool purple wool and crimson thread twisted together were brought and manufactured into the shape of pomegranates whose mouths were not yet opened and in the shape of it cones of the helmets on children's head 72 bells containing 72 clappers were brought and hung there on 36 on each side our said on the authority of rabbi judah there were 36 18 on each side our and yanibi says and said as there is a controversy here so is there a controversy in respect to leprous plagues for we learned the appearances of plagues our dosa biharkina said there are 36 akibia bimahalal said there are 18 our says and also said what are the sections on sacrifices and the priestly vestments close together to teach you as sacrifices make atonement so do the priestly vestments make atonement the coat atones for bloodshed for it is said and they killed the ego and dipped the coat in the blood the bridges atone for lewdness as it is said and thou shalt make them linen bridges to cover the flesh of their nakedness the mitre made atonement for arrogance how do we know it said our hand let an article placed high up come and atone for an offense of hauteur the girdle atone for impure meditations of the heart i.e. where it was placed the breastplate atone for neglect of civil laws as it is said and thou shalt make a breastplate of judgment the ephod atone for idolatry as it is said without ephod there are teraphim the robe atone for slander how do we know it said our hand let an article of sound come and atone for an offense of sound the headplate atone for brazenness of the headplate it is written and it shall be upon Aaron's forehead whilst of brazenness it is written yet thou hadst a harlot's forehead but that is not so for surely our Joshua be Levi said for two things we find no atonement through sacrifices but find atonement for them through something else and they are bloodshed and slander bloodshed is atoned for by the beheaded heifer while slander is atoned for by incense for our Hanani recited how do we know that incense atones because it is said and he put on the incense and made atonement for the people and the school of our Ishmael taught likewise for what does incense atone for slander let that which is done in secret come and atone for an offense committed in secret the slander contradicts slander and bloodshed contradicts bloodshed there is no difficulty bloodshed does not contradict bloodshed in the one case the murderer is known in the other the murderer is unknown if the murderer is known he is liable to death it means where he committed murder deliberately but was not warned slander too does not contradict slander here it was done in secret there it was done in public Talmud, Ma Sebekim A-C-H-A-P-T-E-R-X Mishnah whatever is more constant than another takes precedence over the other the daily offerings precede the additional offerings the additional offerings of the Sabbath precede the additional offerings of new moon the additional offerings of new moon precede the additional offerings of new year for it is said ye shall offer these beside. The burnt offering of the morning which is for a continual burnt offering tomorrow whence do we know it you ask whence do we know it surely he the tannis states the reason is beside the burnt offering of the morning perhaps only the daily offerings precede the additional offerings because they are constant how do we know that additional offerings precede less frequent additional offerings set early because scripture states like these ye shall offer daily for seven days instead of these like these is written but this is required for its own purpose if so let scripture write these ye shall offer daily if it wrote these ye shall offer daily for seven days I would think that these are offered in the seven days daily is written yet I might still interpret these ye shall offer for the day but on the remaining days I could not know how many scripture says ye shall offer which implies that all your offerings must be alike I base and we learn it from that very text for if so let scripture say beside the burnt offering of the morning and then be silent why state which is for a continual burnt offering to teach that that which is more constant takes precedence mission whatever is more sacred than another precedes that other the blood of a sin offering precedes the blood of a burnt offering because it propitiates the limbs of a burnt offering precede the immune of a sin offering because it the former is entirely for altar fires a sin offering Precedes a guilt offering because its blood is sprinkled on the four horns and on the base a guilt offering precedes a thanks offering and a Nazarite's ram because it is a sacrifice of higher sanctity a thanks offering and a Nazarite's ram precedes a peace offering because they are eaten one day only and require the accompaniment of loaves a peace offering precedes a firstling because it requires four blood applications laying of hands drink offerings and the waving of the breast and it thigh a firstling precedes tithe because its sanctity is from the womb and it is eaten by priests tithe precedes burnt offerings because it is a slaughtered sacrifice and part of it is most sacred visits blood and immune birds precede meal offerings because they are blood sacrifices a sinner's meal offering precedes a votive meal offering because it comes on account of sin a sin offering of a bird precedes a burnt offering of a bird and it is likewise when he dedicates them Talmud, Mas. Zabakim Bikamara, how do we know these things because our rabbis taught in the second young bullet thou shalt take for a sin offering now if this comes to teach that there are two sacrifices surely it has already been said and offer thou the one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering what then is taught by in the second young bullet thou shalt take for a sin offering for one might think that a sin offering takes precedence over all the rights of a burnt offering therefore it says and a second young bullet thou shalt take for a sin offering if we had only the text and a second young bullet to go by you might think that a burnt offering precedes a sin offering in all its rights therefore it says and offer thou the one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering how are these to be reconciled the blood of a sin offering takes precedence over the blood of a burnt offering in sprinkling because it propitiates the limbs of a burnt offering etc yet what so say that only the first application of the blood of the sin offering which makes atonement takes precedence but not the rest said Rabbanah here we are treating of the beloved sin offering and though it was like a burnt offering the divine law ordered it to take precedence in the West Palestine they said since he commenced the applications of the sin offering he completes them it was asked regarding the blood of a sin offering and the limbs of a burnt offering which of them takes precedence does the blood of a sin offering take precedence because it propitiates or perhaps the limbs of a burnt offering take precedence because they are entirely destined for altar fires come and here the blood of a sin offering precedes the blood of a burnt offering thus only the blood of a burnt offering does it precede but it does not precede the limbs of a burnt offering on the contrary infer from the subsequent clause the limbs of a burnt offering precede the of a sin Offering thus only the emurim of a sin offering do they precede but they do not precede the blood of a sin offering rather no inference can be made from this it was asked as to the blood of a burnt offering and the emurim of a sin offering which of these takes precedence does the blood of a burnt offering take precedence because it comes in virtue of a sacrifice that is altogether burnt or perhaps the emurim of a sin
but because he wishes to teach in a later clause the limbs of a burnt offering precede the emurim of a sin offering, for if he taught that they precede the emurim of a guilt offering, I would argue only the emurim of a guilt offering do they precede, but they do not precede the emurim of a sin offering. For that reason, he teaches about a sin offering only come and here a sin offering precedes a guilt offering, thus only a sin offering precedes a guilt offering, but a burnt offering does not. Surely that refers to the blood. No, it refers to the emurim. This may be proved too, for he teaches because its blood is applied and does not teach because it is applied. This proves that a sin offering precedes, etc. On the contrary, a guilt offering should precede because it has a fixed value. Even so, the greater number of altar rites is more important. A guilt offering precedes a thanks offering, etc. On the contrary, a thanks offering and a nazarite ram should take precedence since they require. Loaves, even so, sacrifices of higher sanctity are more important. A thanks offering and a Nazarite ram, etc. On the contrary, a peace offering should take precedence since it is congregational as well as private. Even so, the fact that they are eaten for one day only is more weighty. It was asked as to a thanks offering and a Nazarite ram, which of these takes precedence? Does a thanks offering take precedence because it requires the accompaniment of four kinds of loaves or perhaps a Nazarite's ram takes precedence because other sacrifices accompany it? Come and here, this one precedes the other because the former requires four kinds of loaves, whereas the latter requires only two kinds of loaves. A peace offering precedes a firstling, etc. On the contrary, a firstling should take precedence since its sanctity is from the womb and it is eaten by priests only. Even so, the greater number of rites connected with a peace offering are more important. A firstling precedes, etc. On the contrary. Tithe should take precedence since it sanctifies what precedes it and what follows it, even so sanctity from the womb is weightier. Tithe precedes bird offerings, etc. On the contrary, bird offerings should take precedence since they are most sacred, even so the species of slaughtering is more important. Rubin of Ishila said if the emurim of lesser sacrifices are taken out before the sprinkling of the blood, they are disqualified. Now our tannis supports this because it is a slaughtered sacrifice and part of it is most sacred visits blood and emurim is for emurim it as well as these are absent in birds, but blood at all events is present. Surely then he informs us this emurim are like blood just as blood is most holy before sprinkling, so are emurim most holy only before sprinkling, and only then are they designated most sacred, and as blood is disqualified through being taken out, so are emurim disqualified through going out. Shall we say that the following supports him if the flesh of Lesser sacrifices was taken out before the sprinkling of the blood. Our Yohanan says it is fit. Resh Lakish maintains it is disqualified. Our Yohanan says that it is fit since it must eventually be carried out. In any case, Resh Lakish maintains that it is disqualified. It was not yet time for it to be carried out. Thus, they disagree only in respect of flesh, but not in respect of Emurim. No, in fact, they disagree in respect of Emurim too. But the reason that they disagree explicitly about flesh is to inform you how far Resh Lakish maintains his view that even flesh, which will eventually be carried out, he maintains that it was not yet time for it to be carried out. Shall we say that it is dependent on Tanaim with regard to Emurim of lesser sacrifices which were taken out before sprinkling? Our Eliezer maintains they do not involve trespass Talmud, Ma Sebakime, and one is not culpable on their account in respect of pickle nut heart or uncleanness. Our Akiba maintains they involve trespass and one is culpable on their account for pickle nut heart and defilement. Surely they disagree where they were taken in again and they disagree in this one master. Our Eliezer holds that they were disqualified by having been taken out while another master holds that they were not disqualified by being taken out. Said our Papa if they were taken in again none disagree but here they disagree where they are still without and they disagree in this one master holds that sprinkling is not effective for what is without while the other master holds that sprinkling is effective for what went out but surely it was our Papa who said if they are still without none disagree they disagree only where they were taken in again that is only in connection with the two loaves which are not part of the sacrifice itself but since Emurim are part of the sacrifice itself they disagree where they are still without bird offerings precede etc. On the contrary meal offerings should take precedence since they are both Congregational and private, even so, the fact that they are blood sacrifices outweighs this. A sinner's meal offering, etc. On the contrary, a voted meal offering should take precedence since it requires oil and frankincense. Even so, a sinner's meal offering, which is brought on account of sin, is more important since it makes atonement. It was asked as to the meal offering of a soda and a voted meal offering, which of these takes precedence? Does a voted meal offering take precedence because it requires oil and frankincense, or perhaps a soda's meal offering takes precedence because it is brought to investigate sin? Come and here, a sinner's meal offering precedes a voted meal offering. Thus, only a sinner's meal offering precedes a voted meal offering, but a soda's meal offering does not know. Does he then teach because it makes atonement? Surely he teaches because it comes on account of sin, and this one, a soda's meal offering, too, comes on account of sin. Come and here, this one. Precedes that one because the former is of wheat while the latter is of barley. Surely that means a voted meal offering precedes a soda's meal offering. No, it means that a sinner's meal offering precedes a soda's meal offering. Then infer it from the fact that the former makes atonement while the latter does not make atonement. What then it refers to a voted meal offering. Then infer it from the fact that the one voted meal offering requires oil and frankincense while the other does not require oil and frankincense. Rather, he states one of two reasons: a sin offering of a bird precedes, etc. Whence do we know it? For our rabbis taught, and he shall offer that which is for the sin offering first. For what purpose is this stated? If to teach that it comes before the burnt offering, surely it is already said, and he shall prepare the second for a burnt offering. This, however, furnishes a general rule for all sin offerings that they take precedence over all burnt offerings, which. Accompany the messy the bird sin offering precedes the bird burnt offering the animal sin offering precedes the animal burnt offering and even the bird sin offering precedes an animal burnt offering therefore that a bird sin offering precedes a bird burnt offering is inferred from and he shall prepare the second for a burnt offering an animal sin offering precedes an animal burnt offering because the divine law intimated an extension of bird sin offering precedes an animal burnt offering because this is a general rule come and here our Eliezer said wherever a sin offering is exchanged the sin offering of a bird takes precedence but here the burnt offering of a bird takes precedence wherever it comes on account of sin the sin offering takes precedence but here the burnt offering takes precedence wherever both birds come instead of one sin offering the sin offering takes precedence but here that they do not both come on account of one sin offering the burnt offering Takes precedence said Rabbi Scripture accorded it precedence in respect of designating it come and here bullocks take precedence over rams rams take precedence over lambs lambs over he goats Talmud, Ma Sevakim B does that not refer to those of the festival no it means those of a voted offering bullocks precede rams because their drink offerings are larger and for the same reason rams precede lambs while lambs precede he goats because more is offered of them is a fat tail. Come and here the bullock of the anointed priest precedes the congregation's bullock for inadvertent sin the congregation's bullock for inadvertent sin precedes the bullock for idolatry the bullock of idolatry precedes the he goats of idolatry and this is so notwithstanding that the bullock of idolatry is a burnt offering whereas the he goats of idolatry are sin offerings but why not deduce from the first clause the congregation's bullock for inadvertent sin precedes the bullock of idolatry. We do not speak of where both sacrifices are of one kind there a sin offering certainly takes precedence we speak of two kinds and yet here we find a burnt offering preceding a sin offering in the West Palestine they said in Rabbi Bimari's name the sin offering of idolatry lacks an olive as Eli hath is written Rabbi said in their case according to the ordinance is written now that you have come to this you may even say that the preceding passage refers to the bullocks of the festival. For after their ordinance is written in connection with them too it was asked with regard to a bird sin offering an animal burnt offering and tithe which of these precede shall the bird sin offering come first there is tithe which must precede it shall tithe come first there is the animal burnt offering which must precede it shall the animal burnt offering come first there is the bird sin offering which must precede it here they held that a slaughtered sacrifice is more important in the West they said the superiority of an animal burnt offering over tithe serves the bird sin offering and advances it over that of tithe mission. All sin
Continual burnt dash offerings precede the additional offerings Talmud, Ma Sabaki may now this is so notwithstanding that the additional offerings are more sacred no does then the Sabbath affect the additional offerings and not affect the continual offerings come and here the additional offerings of the Sabbath precede the additional offerings of new moon does then new moon affect its own additional offerings and not affect the additional offerings of the Sabbath come and here the additional offerings of new moon precede the additional offerings of new year although new year is holier does then new year affect its own additional offerings and not affect the additional offerings of new moon come and here another reason the blessing for one is constant while the blessing for the day is not constant and of that which is constant and that which is not constant that which is constant comes first now this is so notwithstanding that the blessing for the day is holier does then the Sabbath affect the blessing for the day and not affect the blessing for the one come and here for our Yohan and said the Halachah is that one must recite the Minha afternoon service and then recite the additional service although the additional service is more sacred does then the Sabbath affect the additional service and not affect the Minha service come and here in the case of a peace offering of yesterday and a sin offering and a guilt offering of today yesterday's peace. Offering takes precedence hence if both are of today the sin offering and the guilt offering take precedence although a peace offering is more constant said Rabbah you speak of what is common we ask about what is constant not about what is more common said Arhuna be Judah to Rabbah is then what is common not the same as what is constant surely it was taught I would exclude the Passover offering which is not constant but I would not exclude circumcision which is constant what does constant mean? It is more constant in precepts. Alternatively, circumcision is constant in comparison with the Passover offering. It was asked if one thing is constant and another non constant, and the priest slaughtered the non constant first. What is the law? Do we say since he slaughtered it, he must offer, i.e., sprinkle it first, or perhaps he must give it to another to stir the blood until he offers the constant and then offer the non constant? Said Arhuna of Surah, come and here in the case of a peace offering of yesterday and a sin offering and a guilt offering of today. Yesterday's peace offering takes precedence, hence if it were a peace offering of today analogous to that of yesterday, and how could that be if he slaughtered the peace offering first? The sprinkling of the sin offering and the guilt offering would take precedence. No, perhaps how is the case of a peace offering of yesterday and a sin offering and a guilt offering of today meant where he slaughtered both where? However, he did not slaughter both. There you have the question. Come and here another reason. The blessing for the wine is constant, whereas the blessing for the day is not constant. And of that which is constant, and that which is not constant, that which is constant comes first. Here too, since it the wine has arrived, it is analogous to both having been slaughtered. Come and here for our Yohan and said the Halachah is that one must recite the Minha afternoon service and then recite the additional service. Here too, since the time for the Minha service has come, it is as though they were both slaughtered. Araha, the son of Arashi, said to Rabbi, Come and here if he killed it before midday, it is disqualified because at dusk is set in connection with it. If he killed it before the evening, tamed it is fit, and one must stir its blood until he sprinkles the blood of the tamed. The case we discuss here is where e.g. he first slaughtered the tamed. Said Araha, the elder to Arashi, the Mishnah too. Proves that because it teaches until he sprinkles the blood of the tamed, but it does not teach until he slaughters the tamed and sprinkles its blood. This proves it, and in all of these the priests may deviate, etc. What is the reason? Scripture says, even all the hallowed things unto thee have I given them for a consecrated portion, which means as a symbol of greatness, so that they can be eaten. Just as King's eat mission, our Simeon said, if you see oil being shared out in the temple court, you need not ask what it is, for it is the residue of the wafers rikakim of the Israelites meal offerings or of the lepers log of oil. If you see oil being poured onto the fires, you need not ask what it is, for it is the residue of the oil of the wafers of priests meal offerings or of the anointed priests meal offering. For men cannot offer oil alone. Our Tarfan said, oil can be donated by itself. Talmud, Ma Sevakim, Bikamara Samuel said, according to our Tarfan, when a man donates oil by itself. He removes a fistful, burns it on the altar, and its residue is eaten. What is the reason scripture says? And when anyone bringeth a meal offering, this teaches that one can donate oil by itself, and that an offering of oil is like a meal offering, as a fistful is taken of a meal offering, and the rest is eaten. So the oil one takes a fistful off, and the rest of it is eaten. Our Zara observed, we too have learned thus. Our Simeon said, If you see oil being shared out in the temple court, you need not ask what it is, for it is the residue of the wafers rikakim of the Israelites' meal offerings, or of the lepers' log of oil, for men cannot offer oil alone. Hence it follows that on the view that it can be offered, it can be shared out. Said Abay to him, and consider the next clause. If you see oil poured on the fires, you need not ask what it is, for it is the residue of the wafers of priest's meal offerings, or of the anointed priest's meal offering, for men cannot offer oil alone. Hence it Follows that on the view that it can be offered, the whole of it is a fire offering. Thus, the first clause presents a difficulty on Abay's view, while the last clause presents a difficulty on Arzera's view. As for Arzera, it is well. The first clause refers to the residue, while the last clause refers to the fistful. But on Abay's view, there is a difficulty. The first clause is taught on account of the last clause. As for saying that a second clause is taught on account of the first clause, that is well. But does one teach a first clause on account of a second clause? Yes, they said in the West Palestine, the first clause is taught on account of the second clause. Come and here, one in our Akiba's view is for the basin's oil, and our Tarfan's view is for the fires. Now, surely, since the whole of the wine is for basins, the whole of the oil is for burning. Why choose to say thus? Each is conditioned by its own law. Our Papa said this is dependent on Tanaim. When one donates oil, he must bring not less than a. Log rabbi said three logs wherein do they differ the scholars stated before our papa they differ as to whether we say judge from it and all from it or judge from it and place the deduction on its own basis the rabbis hold judge from it and all from it as a meal offering can be donated so can oil be donated and all from it as a meal offering requires a log of oil so here too a log of oil is required and as a meal offering a fistful thereof is removed and the rest is eaten so the oil alone a fistful thereof is removed and the rest is eaten and the other learns from a meal offering as a meal offering is donated so is oil donated but place it on its own basis visit is like a drink offering of wine as a drink offering consists of three logs so oil consists of three logs and as the whole of a drink offering is for basin so the oil is altogether for the fires our papa observed to have a if rabbi inferred it from a meal offering then all would agree that you judge from it and all from it, Rabbi, however, deduces it from homeborn said Arhuna, the son of our Nathan to our Papa. Can you say thus surely it was taught a meal offering? This teaches that oil alone can be donated, and how much three logs now? Whom do you know to maintain that it must be three logs, Rabbi? Yet he deduces it from a meal offering. If it was taught, it was taught. He replied, Samuel said, When one donates wine, he brings it and sprinkles it on the fires. What is the reason scripture saith, and thou shalt present for the drink offering half a hin of wine for an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord, but he extinguishes the fires. Partial extinguishing is not called extinguishing, but that is not so for surely our nomin said in Rabbi Biabba's name, if one removes a coal from the altar and extinguishes it, he is culpable. That is when there is none but that coal alternatively extinguishing as part of a religious rite is different. Come and here for our Eliza B. Jacob taught since. Scripture authorized the taking up of the ashes. You might think that one can extinguish the embers and take them up, but you must say that one may not extinguish there. It is different for one can sit and wait. Come and here, wine in our Akiva's view is for the bowls, oil in our Tarfan's view is for the fires. Moreover, it was taught the wine of the drink offering is for the bowls, yet perhaps it is not so, but rather for the fire. Say he must not extinguish. There is no difficulty. One agrees with our Judah, the other with our Simeon. Are we to say that Samuel agrees with our Simeon? Surely Samuel said one may extinguish a lump of fiery metal in the street that it should not harm the public Talmud, Ma Sebakim, but not a burning piece of wood. Now, if you think that he agrees with our Simeon, even that of wood too should be permitted in respect to what is unintentional, he holds with our Simeon, but in the matter of work which is not needed, per he agrees with our Judah, Arhuna said if a drink offering. Of wine was defiled, one must make a separate fire for it and burn it for it is set, and every sin
Sin offering requires washing, therefore it states this is the law of the sin offering. Said Rush Lakish on Bar Kippur's authority scripture set shall the sin offering be slaughtered. Thus the writ speaks only of those which are slaughtered. Yet say rather that the writ speaks only of those which are eaten as it is written in a holy place shall it be eaten but not inner sin offerings. The divine law included them by writing the law. If so even the bird sin offering too is included. The divine law expressed a limitation in this is and why do you prefer it? Thus it is logical to include animal inner sin offerings because it is an animal it is slaughtered in the north its blood is received in a vessel Talmud. Ma Sebekim B its blood is sprinkled on the horn with the finger on the edge of the horn and it is an offering made by fire on the contrary include rather the bird sin offering because it is an outer offering like itself and is eaten like itself those points. Of similarity are more are Joseph said scripture set the priest shall eat it this one shall he eat but not another thus the writ excluded of those which are eaten then what is the purpose of this is if not for this is I would say that shall eat it is the style of scripture hence this informs us otherwise Rabbi said scripture set and when there is sprinkled it's a hence the writ speaks of those which are sprinkled but surely we learned those scripture speaks of the sin offerings which are eaten this is what the Tana means although scripture speaks of the sin offerings which are eaten that is only in respect of scouring and rinsing but in respect to washing and when there is sprinkled it's a is written if so instead of saying both those which may be eaten and the inner sin offerings he should say both the inner sin offerings and those which may be eaten learn both the inner sin offerings and those which may be eaten if so the bird sin offering too is Included the divine law expressed a limitation in this is if so an outer sin offering too is not included the divine law expressed an extension in the law and why do you prefer it thus it is logical to include an animal sin offering because it is an animal it is slaughtered in the north its blood is received in a vessel its blood is sprinkled on the horn with the finger on the edge of the horn and it is an offering made by fire on the contrary include the bird sin offering. Since it requires hazal like itself those points of similarity are more are often asked what if one took the blood of a bird sin offering within by its neck is its neck like a service vessel and so if the sacrifice is disqualified or perhaps it is like an animal's neck while the divine law said and every sin offering whereof any of the blood is brought into the tent of meeting shall be burnt with fire implying of its blood but not of its flesh come and here if it the bird. Struggled entered within and then returned to his fit hence if however the priest took it and it is disqualified then according to your reasoning when it is taught in connection with most sacred sacrifices if it struggled and entered the south and then returned to his fit will you infer but if he the priest carried it out of the north into the south it is disqualified rather this is required where it went without so there too it is required where it went without our oven asked what if it blood of the bird offering poured out onto the pavement and one collected it do we say that the divine law merely did not demand a service vessel and therefore one collects it and it is fit or perhaps in its case the divine law actually disqualified a service vessel and therefore one collects it but it is disqualified said Rabbi come and here you might think that the blood of the bird sin offering necessitates washing therefore this is stated now if you think that in its case the divine Law actually disqualified a service vessel I can infer this since it was disqualified in the airspace of a vessel said Arhuna son of Joshua the text is necessary where one presses the garment to its neck Levi asked Rabbi what if it spurted from one garment onto another garment do we say it was rejected from the first garment in respect of washing or not that is indeed a question he replied it does need washing on either alternative if one can collect the blood and it is fit for sprinkling then this is fit while if it is collected and disqualified I agree with our Akiva who maintained that if it had a period of fitness and was then disqualified its blood necessitates washing Talmud Ma Seba King Rami Biham asked Arhista what if it spurted onto an unclean garment Arhuna the son of Arjashu observed since he asks us you may infer that he holds that if it had a period of fitness and was disqualified its blood does not necessitate washing nevertheless his question is that only when they come consecutively but not when they come simultaneously or perhaps there is not difference here his star replied this is a controversy of our Eliezer and the rabbis in accordance with rabbis view and as explained by Abbe for it was taught our Eliezer said if the water of lustration was defiled it cleanses an unclean person for lo we sprinkle the water of lustration upon it and now rabbi observed our Eliezer said this in accordance with the thesis of our Akiva his teacher who maintained that when the vessel containing the water of lustration is carried over an unclean place it is as though it rested therefore we learned if a man stood on the other side of an oven and a reptile was in the oven and he put forth his hand to the window took a flask and carried it across the oven our Akiva declares it unclean while the rabbis declare it clean now they disagree and this our Akiva holds that it is as lying while the rabbis hold that it is not as lying thereon but Abbe raised an objection it was taught our Akiva admits that in the case of sprinkling if one carried it over an unclean earthen vessel or over an unclean couch or seat it is clean for nothing defile above as below save as much as an olive of a corpse and other things which defile through overshadowing which includes a leper stone rather said Abbe all agree that it is not as though it lay thereon but here they differ in this our Akiva holds that we enact a preventive measure lest it lay. Thereon while the rabbis hold that we do not enact a preventive measure but our Akiva admits in the case of sprinkling for since it has gone out it has gone out now wherein do our Eliezer and the rabbis disagree said Abbe they disagree as to whether we draw an analogy between previous defilement and contemporary defilement one master holds that we draw an analogy and the other master holds that we do not draw an analogy Rabbi said all hold that we do not draw an analogy but here they disagree in. This R. Eliezer holds that sprinkling requires a minimum standard and sprinklings combine while the rabbis hold that sprinkling does not require a minimum standard the blood of a disqualified sin offering etc. Our rabbis taught and when there is sprinkled of the blood thereof that means of the blood of a fit sacrifice but not of the blood of a disqualified one. Our Akiva said if it had a period of fitness and was subsequently disqualified its blood necessitates washing if it did not have a period of fitness and was disqualified of an issue its blood does not necessitate washing whereas our Simeon maintained in both cases its blood does not necessitate washing what is our Simeon's reason thereof is written and of the blood thereof is written one excludes where it had a period of fitness and the other excludes where it did not have a period of fitness and our Akiva thereof excludes Terima. Our Simeon however is consistent with his view for he maintained lesser sacrifices do not Necessitates scouring and rinsing and how much the more terra mamisha if blood spurted direct from the animal's throat onto a garment it does not necessitate washing from the horn or from the base of the altar it does not necessitate washing if it poured out onto the pavement and the priest collected it it does not need washing only blood which was received in a vessel and is fit for sprinkling necessitates washing tomorrow our rabbis taught you might think that if the blood spurted from the throat onto the garment it necessitates washing therefore it states and when there is sprinkled etc I ordered thee to wash the garment only when the blood is fit for sprinkling another berry that taught you might think that if it spurted from the horn or from the base it requires washing therefore it states and when there shall be sprinkled that excludes this blood which was already sprinkled if it poured out onto the pavement etc Talmud Ma Sebekim B Why do I need this too he states the reason what is the reason that if it poured out onto the pavement and the priest collected it it does not need washing because only blood which was received in a vessel and is fit for sprinkling necessitates washing fit for sprinkling what does this exclude it excludes a case where one received less than is required for sprinkling in one vessel and less than is required for sprinkling in another vessel for it was taught our he'll have to be Saul said if he sanctified less than is required for sprinkling in one vessel and less than is required for sprinkling in another vessel he has not sanctified it now it was asked how is it with blood is it a traditional law and we cannot learn from a traditional law or perhaps what is the reason there because it is written and a clean person shall take his and dip it in the water so here too it is written and the priest shall dip his finger in the blood come and here for our Zerika said in our Eliezer's name in the case a blood too he does not sanctify it Rabbi said it was taught and the priest shall dip but not sponge up in the blood there must be sufficient blood for dipping from the beginning and sprinkle of the blood of the blood specified in this passage now it is necessary to write both and he shall dip and in the blood for if the divine law wrote and he shall dip only I would say even where there is insufficient for dipping in the first place therefore the divine
Gold Misha, if the blood spurted onto the skin before it was flayed, it need not be washed. If it spurted after it was flayed, it must be washed. These are the words of our Judah. Our Eliezer said, IT need not be washed. Even if it spurted after it was flayed, only the place of the blood needs washing, and whatever is eligible to contract Uncle Anas and is fit for washing, whether a garment, a sack, or a hide, must be washed. The washing must be in a holy place. The breaking of an earthen vessel must be in a holy place, and the scouring and rinsing of a brazen vessel must be in a holy place. In this, the sin offering is more stringent than other sacrifices of higher sanctity. Gamara, how do we know it? Because our rabbis taught, and when there is sprinkled of the blood thereof upon a garment, I know it only of a garment. Whence do I know to include the skin after it is flayed? Because it says, Thou shalt wash that whereon it was sprinkled. You might think that I include the skin even before it. Was played, therefore it states a garment as a garment is an article eligible to contract uncleanness, so everything that is eligible to contract uncleanness is included. These are the words of our Judah. Our Eliezer said a garment, I know it only of a garment, whence do I know to include a sack Talmud, Moss, Sabah, Kimei, and all kinds of garments, because it says thou shalt wash that whereon it was sprinkled. You might think that I can include a skin after it was flayed, therefore it says a garment as a garment is an article which contracts uncleanness, so everything which contracts uncleanness is included, wherein do they differ set of a they differ about a cloth less than three finger breadth square. He who says that it must be eligible, this too is eligible for if its owner desires he can intend it for use, but he who maintains anything which contracts uncleanness, this at all events cannot contract uncleanness. Rabba said they disagree over a garment which its owner intended to. Embroider he who maintains that it must be eligible this too is eligible for if its owner desires he can abandon his intention he however who maintains anything which can contract uncleanness now at all events it cannot contract uncleanness other state robbers said they disagree about an untrimmed hide which he intended to trim he who maintains that it must be eligible this too is eligible he however who maintains anything which can contract uncleanness this however cannot contract uncleanness until he trims it and it was taught even so our Simeon Bemis he said a hide which its owner intended trimming is clean until he trims it only the place of the blood needs washing how do we know it for our rabbis taught you might think that if the blood spurted on part of the garment the whole garment must be washed therefore it states thou shalt wash that whereon it was sprinkled I ordered thee to wash only the place of the blood whatever is eligible to contract Uncle Anes. This anonymous teaching agrees with our Judah and fit for washing excludes a vessel which requires scraping whether a garment sackcloth or hide are we to say that a skin can be washed but the following contradicts this if dirt is upon it one wipes it off with a rag if it is of leather skin water is poured over it until it disappears said Abbe there is no difficulty one agrees with the rabbis the other agrees with others for it was taught a garment and sackcloth are washed a vessel and a skin are scraped others maintain the garment sackcloth and skin are washed while a vessel is scraped with whom does the following statement of our high be as she agreed as I stood many times before rab and dabbed his shoes with water with whom with the rabbis rab observed does anyone maintain that skin is not washable surely it is written and the garment or the warp or the wolf or whatsoever thing of skin it be which thou shalt wash rather said rab the scriptural text and our mission refer to soft Skins whereas they disagree about hard skins but surely our high Ashi said I stood many times before Rab and dabbed his shoes with water they were of hard leather and he acted in accordance with the rabbi subsequently Rabbi said my statement was incorrect are we to say that the text refers only to soft skins does it not refer even to foresters apparel which comes from overseas yet the divine law states that it must be washed rather said Rabbi leprosy since it breaks out in the article itself moistens it and softens it Rabbi observed if I have a difficulty it is this Talmud, Moss Sabakim B pillows and bolsters are soft yet we learned if it is of leather water is poured over it until it disappears rather said Rabbi all washing without rubbing is not called washing and as to our high Ashi statement I stood many times before Rab and dabbed his shoes with water dabbing is permitted but not rubbing now our mission treats either of soft skins and it agrees with all or of hard ones and it agrees with others if so let water be poured even over a garment too in the case of a garment soaking it in water constitutes its washing now Rabbah is consistent with his view for Rabbah said if one threw a scarf into water he is culpable if one threw linseed into water he is culpable as for a scarf it is well as he thereby washes it but what is the reason in the case of linseed and should you say because he causes it to grow if so the same applies to wheat and barley too this linseed emits mucus if so the same applies to undressed hides there he needs Rabbah lectured it is permitted to wash a shoe on the sabbath said our papa to Rabbah but surely our high as he said I stood many times before Rab and dabbed his shoes with water for him thus only dabbing is permitted but not washing subsequently Rabbah appointed an interpreter before him and lectured what I told you was an error but in truth dabbing is permitted but washing is forbidden the washing must be in a holy place, etc. How do we know it? Because our rabbis taught thou shalt wash in a holy place. From this we learn that the washing must be in a holy place. How do we know that earthen vessels must be broken? Because it says, But the earthen vessel wherein it is sodden shall be broken. How do we know that brazen vessels must be scoured and rinsed? Because it says, And if it be sodden in a brazen vessel, it shall be scoured and rinsed in water. In this the sin offering is more stringent, etc. And is there nothing else? Surely there is the fact that its blood enters within this refers to outer sin offerings, but outer sin offerings too have a peculiar stringency, as if their blood entered within they are disqualified. This is in accordance with our Akiba who maintained all bloods which enter the call to make atonement are disqualified, yet there is the fact that they make atonement for those who are liable to correct. This refers to the sin offering for the hearing of the voice or oath of Utterance yet there is a fact that they require four sprinklings this agrees with our Ishmael who maintained all blood requires four sprinklings but there is a fact that the sprinklings must be on the four horns yet on your reasoning surely there are the horn the finger and the edge rather the tana mentioned one out of two or three stringencies mission if a garment was carried outside the hangings it must re-enter and it is washed in a holy place if it was defiled without the hangings. One must tear it then it re-enters and is washed in a holy place if an earthen vessel was carried outside the hangings it re-enters and is broken in a holy place if it was defiled without the hangings a hole is made in it then it re-enters and is broken in a holy place if a brazen vessel was carried outside the hangings it re-enters and is scoured and rinsed in a holy place if it was defiled outside the hangings it must be broken through then it re-enters and is scoured and rinsed in a holy. Place Gamara to this Rabbin Adamur, you say one must tear it, surely the Divine Law speaks of a garment and this is not a garment, he leaves enough of it untorn to be used as an apron, but that is not so for surely Arhuna said they learned this only if one did not leave enough to be used as an apron untorn, but if one left enough to be used as an apron, it is technically joined Talmud, Ma Sebakim Talmud, Ma Sebakim, that is by rabbinical law only if an earthen vessel was carried outside, etc. But the Divine Law spoke of a vessel and this is not a vessel, the hole is only large enough for a little root, if a brazen vessel it must be broken through, etc. But then it is not a vessel, he hammers the hole together, Rush Lakish said if the priest's robe became unclean, one must take it in less than three finger breadth square at a time and wash it because it is said that if the robe be not rent, our Adabi have objected thick garments and soft unwoven garments are not. Subject to the law of three finger breadth square, they count because of the parent piece, but surely it requires seven substances. For our nomin said in Rabbi Abba's name, the blood of the sin offering and the appearance of leprosy require seven substances, whereas it was taught but that urine may not be taken into the temple Talmud. Ma Sebakim B, and should you say that one mixes it in with the seven substances and applies them all at once, surely we learned if they were not applied in their order or if they were all applied simultaneously, it is of no avail. And should you say that he mixes it up in one of the substances, but surely we learned that he must rub the stain three times with each substance, rather he mixes it up in tasteless saliva. For Rush Lakish said there must be tasteless saliva with each one mission, whether one boiled urine or poured boiling flesh, etc., into it, whether most sacred sacrifices or lesser sacrifices, the pot requires scouring and rinsing are. Simeon said
Refired, this is a refutation of Rabu Bihala. It is indeed a refutation. Rabbana said to our Ashina, since Rabu Bihala was refuted, why did Rab say pots must be broken on Passover? Rab maintained that there a metal one is meant. Alternatively, it may be an earthen oven. This the oven is fired from the inside, while the other the pot is fired on the outside. Then let us burn it. The pot from within he would spirit, lest it break. First, therefore, a tiled pan, since it is burnt from without, is forbidden. Talmud, Mas Sevakim. Then why should the pots in the temple be broken? Let them be returned to the kill set. Arzera, because kills are not permitted in Jerusalem. Abay retorted and are then refused heaps permitted in the temple court. Abay, however, had overlooked what Shimei of Kalnavo recited. The fragments of earthen vessels were swallowed up in their place. Now, when our said in Rabu Bihala's name, the temple oven was of metal. It be an earthen one since it was heated. Within since the two loaves and the shoe bread were baked in the oven and were sanctified in the oven, it became a service vessel, and we do not make earthen service vessels. Talmud, Mas Sevakim B, and even our Jose, son of Arjuda, said only that wooden ones were permitted, but not earthen ones. Our Isaac, the son of Arjuda, used to attend Rami Biham S lectures. He left him and attended Arshis hate S lectures. One day he Rami Biham met him and observed the noble has taken us by the hand, and his scent has come into the hand because you have gone to Arshis hate. You are like Arshis hate. That was not the reason he replied. Whenever I asked a question of you, you answered me from reason, and if I found a teaching to the contrary, it refuted your answer. But when I ask a question of Arshis hate, he answers it from a teaching, so that even if I find a teaching which refutes him, it is one teaching against another. Said he to him, ask me a question, and I will answer you in accordance with the teaching. Thereupon he asked him if one boiled the sacrifice in part of a vessel does it require scouring and rinsing or does it not require them it does not require them he replied by analogy with the spurting of blood but it was not taught so he protested it is logical that it is like a garment he replied just as a garment needs washing only in the place of the blood so a vessel requires scouring and rinsing only in the place of boiling how can you compare them he objected blood does not spread whereas boiling spreads moreover it was taught the spurting of blood is more stringent than scouring and rinsing and scouring and rinsing are more stringent than spurting spurting is more stringent since the law of spurting operates in respect to outer sin offerings and inner sin offerings and it operated before sprinkling which is not so in the case of scouring and rinsing scouring and rinsing are more stringent in that scouring and rinsing are required for most sacred sacrifices and for lesser sacrifices again if one boiled the flesh in part of a vessel the whole vessel requires scouring and rinsing which is not so in the case of spurting if it was taught it was taught he replied and what is the reason scripture says and if it be boiled in a brazen vessel which means even in part of a vessel whether most sacred sacrifices etc are rabbis taught scripture saith a sin offering I know it only of a sin offering how do I know it of all sacrifices because it says it is most holy you might think that I include teramah therefore it says every male among the priests may eat thereof which excludes teramah these are the words of our Judah our Simeon said most holy sacrifices necessitate scouring and rinsing but lesser sacrifices do not necessitate scouring and rinsing because it is written it is most holy most holy sacrifices do necessitate it but lesser sacrifices do not what is our Judah's reason since thereof is necessary to exclude teramah it follows that Lesser sacrifices necessitate scouring and rinsing and our Simeon he can answer you thereof intimates what we said elsewhere now does not teramah necessitate scouring and rinsing surely it was taught you may not boil milk in a pot in which meat was boiled and if one did the milk is forbidden if it the meat could communicate its flavor to it if one boiled teramah in it one must not boil holland in it and if one did the holland is forbidden if it the teramah could communicate flavor to it said obey this holds good only in respect of what a master said is if one boiled flesh in part of a vessel the whole vessel must be scoured and rinsed but in the case of teramah only the part where it was boiled needs scouring and rinsing Rabbah said it holds good only in respect of what a master said it shall be scoured and rinsed in water but not in wine in water but not in a mixture this however may be scoured and rinsed even in wine even in a mixture Rabbah Beulah said it Holds good only in respect of what a master said the scouring and rinsing must be in cold water this however is done in hot water that is well on the view that scouring and rinsing must be done in cold water but on the view that the scouring is in hot water and the rinsing in cold what can be said there is the additional rinsing mission our tarfan said if one boiled flesh in a pot at the beginning of a festival he can boil therein during the whole festival but the sages maintain until the time of eating scouring and rinsing scouring merica is as the scouring of a goblet and rinsing is as the rinsing of a goblet scouring and rinsing are done in cold water talmud moss save the spit and the grill are scalded in hot water tomorrow what is our tarfan's reason because scripture said and thou shalt turn in the morning and go unto thy tents the retreats the whole of the festival as one morning to this arahid boy bmi demurred is there no pickle during a festival and is there no nut hard during a festival and should you say that indeed is so surely it was taught our Nathan said our Tarfan gave its ruling only rather the reason is as our Naman said in Rabu Biabua's name is each day effects calling for the previous one but the sages maintained until the time of eating etc what does this mean said our Naman in Rabu Biabua's name he must wait as long as the sacrifice may be eaten and then scour and rinse it once do we know this said our Yohanan on it authority of Abba Jose Biabba it is written it shall be scoured and rinsed and it is written every male among the priests may eat what does this proximity intimate he must wait as long as the sacrifice may be eaten and then scour and rinse it scouring is as the scouring of a goblet rinsing is as the rinsing of a goblet our rabbis taught scouring and rinsing are done with cold water these are the words of rabbi but the sages maintain scouring is with hot water and rinsing is with cold what is the reason of the rabbis? It is comparable to the cleansing GIL of even vessels. And rabbi, he can tell you, I do not speak of Hagala scalding. I speak of the scouring and rinsing after Hagala and the rabbis. If so, let scripture write either it shall be well scoured or well rinsed. Why say it shall be scoured and rinsed to inform you that scouring is done with hot water and rinsing is done with cold? And rabbi, if scripture wrote it shall be well scoured, I would say that it requires two scourings or two rinsings. Therefore, it shall be scoured and rinsed is written to inform you that scouring must be as the scouring of a goblet. Rinsing must be as the rinsing of a goblet. Mission: If one boiled sacrifices and holland in it, or most holy sacrifices and lesser sacrifices, if they were sufficient to impart their flavor, the less stringent must be eaten as the more stringent of them. But they do not necessitate scouring and rinsing, and they do not disqualify by touch. If an unfit wafer touched a fit wafer or an unfit piece of flesh touched a fit piece of flesh not the whole wafer or the whole piece of flesh is forbidden only the part that absorbed of the unfit is forbidden tomorrow what does this mean this is what it means if they were sufficient to impart their flavor the less stringent must be eaten as the more stringent of them and they require scouring and rinsing and they disqualify by their touch if they were insufficient to impart their flavor the less stringent need not be eaten as the more stringent and they do not necessitate scouring and rinsing and do not disqualify by their touch granted that they do not require scouring and rinsing as for most sacred sacrifices yet they should require them as for lesser sacrifices said Abbe, what does he mean by they do not necessitate as for most sacred sacrifices but they do necessitate them as for lesser sacrifices Rabbi said this is in accordance with our Simeon who Maintained lesser sacrifices do not necessitate scouring and rinsing as for Rabbah it is well for that reason he the Tana teaches sacrifices and Holland or most sacred sacrifices and lesser sacrifices but on Abbe's explanation why do I need two clauses they are necessary for if he taught sacrifices and Holland only I would say only Holland can nullify sacrifices as they are not of the same kind but in the case of most sacred sacrifices and lesser sacrifices it is not so and if he taught about most sacred sacrifices and lesser sacrifices only I would think that only sacrifices are strong enough to nullify other sacrifices but Holland I would say is not strong enough thus both are necessary if an unfit way for touched a fit way for etc our rabbis taught whatever shall touch shall be holy you might think even if it did not absorb therefore it says in the flesh thereof Talmud Mas
Sacrifice of peace offerings of a burnt offering is a burnt offering requires a utensil so all require a utensil what utensil is meant if we say a basin in respect of public peace offerings too it is written and Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins rather it means a knife and how do we know it of a burnt offering itself because it is written and Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son and there it was a burnt offering as it is written and offered him. Up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son of a meal offering as a meal offering may be eaten by male priests only so all may be eaten by male priests only which are thus inferred if the sin offering and the guilt offering surely it is explicitly written in connection with them every male among the priests may eat thereof if public peace offerings that is deduced from a scriptural extension is in a most holy place shalt thou eat thereof every male may eat thereof this teaches that public peace offerings may be eaten by male priests only it is a controversy of Tanaim Talmud Ma Sebekima one infers it from this verse and another infers it from the other of a sin offering as a sin offering sanctifies through absorption so all sacrifices sanctify through absorption of a guilt offering as a guilt offering the photos and after birth inside it are not holy so all sacrifices of photos and after birth inside them are not holy he holds that the young of sacrifices become holy when they come into existence and that we infer what is possible from what is not possible of the consecration offering as the consecration offering the remainder thereof was burnt and there were no living animals among its remainder so all sacrifices their remainder is burnt but living animals are not counted as remainder of the peace offering as parts of a peace offering render pickle and parts are rendered pickle so in all sacrifices where there are parts which Render pickle and parts which are made pickle. The law of pickle applies. It was taught in the very in our Akiva's name of the meal offering as a meal offering sanctifies through absorption. So all sacrifices sanctify through absorption. Now it is necessary for both meal offering and sin offering to be written. For if we were informed this about a meal offering, I might say that was because it is soft, it absorbs. But as for a sin offering, I would say that it is not so. And if we were informed about a sin offering, I might say that is because it is solid. But a meal offering, I would say, is not so. Thus both are necessary of the sin offering as a sin offering comes of Helen only and by day, and its rites must be performed with his the priest's right hand. So every sacrifice comes of Helen only by day, and its rites must be performed with his right hand. And how do we know it of a sin offering itself? Set our his da scripture set and Aaron shall present the bullock of. The sin offering which is his that intimates that it must be his and not the congregations nor of tithe that its rights must be performed by day is inferred from in the day that he commanded etc. That is stated unnecessarily that its rights must be performed with his right hand is inferred from Rabbi Barhanna's exegesis for Rabbi Barhanna said in the name of Reshlakish wherever finger and priesthood are stated the right hand only must be used that too is stated. Unnecessarily alternatively he agrees with our Simeon who maintained where finger is stated priesthood is not required but where priesthood is stated finger is required of the guilt offering as the bones of a guilt offering are permitted so the bones of every sacrifice are permitted Rabbi said it is clear to me Talmud, Ma Sebekim be that if blood of a sin offering is below and blood of a burnt offering is above it requires washing Rabbi asked what if blood of a burnt offering is below. And blood of a sin offering is above does a garment need washing because of contact and here there is contact or perhaps the reason is on account of absorption and here it did not absorb subsequently he solved it that it does not require washing Rabbi said it is clear to me that blood on his garment interposes but if its owner is a slaughterer it does not interpose grease on a garment interposes but if the owner is a grease merchant it does not interpose Rabbi asked what if there are blood and grease on a garment why do you ask if he is a slaughterer you can infer that the immersion is ineffectual because of the grease and if he is a grease merchant you can infer that it is ineffectual because of the blood the question arises only where he is both do we say that he does not object to one but objects to two or perhaps he does not object to two either the question stands over chaptrxi mission at tbolyam and one who lacks atonement do not share in sacrifices for Consumption in the evening and ONEN may handle sacred flesh but may not offer and does not receive a share for consumption in the evening men with blemishes whether permanent or transient receive a share and may eat of the sacrifices but may not offer whoever is not eligible for service does not share in the flesh and he who does not share in the flesh does not share in the hides even if one was unclean when the blood was sprinkled but clean when the fats were burned on the altar he does not share in the flesh for it is said he among the sons of Aaron that offered the blood of the peace offerings and the fat shall have the right thigh for a portion Talmud Ma Sebekim Gemara how do we know it said Reshlakish because scripture saith the priest that offered it for sin shall eat it the priest who offers for sin may eat he who does not offer for sin may not eat yet is this a general rule surely there is a whole word which do not offer for sin yet they eat we mean he who is eligible to offer for sin but lo a minor is not eligible to offer for sin yet he eats thereof rather what does shall eat it mean he shall receive a share therein he who is eligible to offer for sin receives a share he who is not eligible to offer for sin does not receive a share but surely one who is blemished is not eligible to offer for sin yet he receives a share the divine law included a blemished person in the privilege of sharing this every male among the priests may eat thereof which includes a priest with a blemish yet say that every male includes a t it is logical to include a blemished priest since he may eat on the contrary one should include a t since he will be eligible in the evening nevertheless he is not eligible at present our joseph said consider what does shall eat it mean surely shall share therein then let the divine law right shall share therein why shall eat therein that you may infer he who is fit to eat shares therein he who is not fit to eat does not share in it. Reshlakish asks is a share to be given to a blemished priest who is unclean. Do we say since he is not eligible to perform the service and yet the divine law included him, it makes no difference for what does it matter whether he is unclean or blemished or perhaps he who is fit to eat when the sacrifice is offered receives a share while he who is not fit to eat does not receive a share. Said Rabbi, come and here a high priest can offer a sacrifice as in one and but he may not eat nor receive a share to eat in the evening. This proves that one must be fit to eat when the sacrifice is offered. This proves that Arashi asked is a share of public sacrifices given to an unclean priest. Do we say the divine law set the priest that offered it for sin shall eat it and this one too can offer for sin or perhaps he who is fit to eat receives a share. He who is not fit to eat does not receive a share. Said Rabbi, come and here a high. Priest may offer sacrifices as in one and but he may not eat nor receive a share to eat in the evening. This proves that he must be fit to eat. This proves that an ONEN may handle sacred flesh but may not offer, etc. And one and may handle sacred flesh. Surely the following contradicts it in one and one who lacks atonement need immersion for sacred flesh. Said RMI in Aryohanan's name. There is no difficulty here in the Mishnah. He had performed immersion there. He had not performed immersion but what? Even if he did perform immersion, Aninath returns to him for Rabbi son of Arhuna said if in one and performed immersion is Aninath returns to him. Rather, there is no difficulty here. He dismissed it from his mind. In the other case, he did not dismiss it from his mind. But inattention requires sprinkling on the third and the seventh days for our just thy son of Armath and said in Aryohanan's name. Inattention requires sprinkling on the third and the seventh days. There is no difficulty in the one. Case he was careless about defilement of the dead, and the other he was careless about defilement by reptile. Defilement of the dead is genuine defilement and requires sunset. Moreover, even Terimah should require immersion. Said our Jeremiah, this law holds good when he declares, I was on my guard against anything that would defile me, but not against anything that would disqualify me. And is there half watchfulness? Yes, and it was taught even so if the basket was still on his head. Talmud, Mas. Zabakim v. Talmud, Mas Zabakim v. And a shovel was in it, and he declared, My mind was on the basket, but not on the shovel. The basket is clean, but the shovel is unclean. But let the shovel defile the basket. One utensil cannot defile another, then let it defile its contents. Said Rabbah, it means that he declared, I guarded it from anything which might defile, but not from anything which might disqualify it. The matter was eventually reported to our Abba B. Memel, said he to them, Have they not heard what are? Yohanan said he who eats terima of the third degree may not eat terima again but he may touch terima this proves that the rabbis raised eating to a high degree but did not raise touch to a high degree and does not receive a
The proof is that the rabbi said in one and performs immersion and eats its Passover offering in the evening but may not partake of other sacrifices now does our Simeon hold that the law of any at night is only rabbinical surely it was taught our Simeon said in one and may not send his sacrifices now does that mean even on Passover no except the Passover offering but it was taught our Simeon said the designation peace offering Shalem indicates that a man may bring it when he is whole Shalem but not when he is in one and how do I know to include the thanks offering I include the thanks offering because it is eaten with rejoicing like a peace offering how do I know to include a burnt offering I include a burnt offering because it is brought as a vow or as a free will offering like the peace offering how do I know to include a firstling tithe and the Passover offering I include firstling tithe and the Passover offering because they are not brought on account of sin. Like a peace offering, how do I know to include the sin offering and the guilt offering because it says sacrifice? How do we know to include burnt offerings, meal offerings, wine, wood, and frankincense because it says his offering be shalem of all offerings which he brings? He brings when he is whole shalem but does not bring them when he is in one and thus at all events he includes the Passover offering said Arhista. The Passover offering is mentioned and Quran Arshis hate said what does the Passover offering mean the Passover peace offerings? If so, it is identical with peace offerings. He teaches about peace offerings which are brought on account of Passover and he teaches about peace offerings which are brought independently. For if he did not teach about the peace offering which is brought on account of Passover, I would argue since it comes on account of the Passover offering, it is like the Passover offering itself. Hence he informs us that it is not so. Armari said Talmud, Moss. Zabakim, there is no difficulty in the one case the man died on the 14th and was buried on the 14th and the other the man died on the 13th and was buried on the 14th if the man died on the 14th and was buried on the 14th the day of death embraces the night that follows by scriptural law if the man died on the 13th and was buried on the 14th and even on the day of burial is only rabbinical and it embraces the night that follows only by rabbinical law said our ashi to our if so when it is taught our simeon said to him the proof is that the rabbi said in one and performs immersion and eats his passover offering in the evening but may not partake of other sacrifices let him or you to answer him i speak to you of the day of death when one is in one and by scriptural law whereas you tell me about the day of burial when anyth is only rabbinical that is a difficulty of a said there is no difficulty in the one case he Died before midday of the fourteenth and the other he died after midday if he died before midday when he had as yet no obligation of the Passover offering and falls upon him if he died after midday when he is subject to the Passover offering and does not fall upon him and how do you know that we differentiate between death before midday and death after midday because it was taught for her shall he defile himself this is obligatory if he does not wish to we defile him by force now the wife of Joseph the priest happened to die on the eve of Passover and he did not wish to defile himself whereupon his brother priests took a vote and defiled him by force but the following contradicts that he shall not make himself unclean for his father and for his sister when they die why is this stated for this reason behold if he was on his way to slaughter the Passover offering or to circumcise his son and he learned that a near relation of his had died you might think that he may defile himself hence you read he shall not make himself unclean you might think that just as he may not defile himself for his sister so may he not defile himself for an unattended corpse therefore it states and for his sister he may not defile himself for his sister but he must defile himself for an unattended corpse hence you must surely infer that one holds good where the person died before midday and the other where he died after midday once does this follow perhaps i can argue that in truth both refer to after midday but one agrees with our ishmael and the other with our akiba for it was taught for her shall he defile himself this is permissive these are the words of our ishmael our akiba said it is an obligation you cannot think so for the first clause of that paratha was taught by our akiba for it was taught our akiba said he shall not come near to a body to the dead body refers to strangers dead refers to relations for his father he may not defile himself but he must defile himself for an unattended corpse for his mother even if he was both a priest and Nazi right only for his mother he may not defile himself but he must defile himself for an unattended corpse for his brother even if he was both a high priest and a Nazi right only for his brother he may not defile himself but he must defile himself for an unattended corpse and for his sister why is this stated if he was on his way to slaughter his Passover offering or to circumcise his son and he learned that a near relation of his had died you might think that he may defile himself hence he read he shall not make himself unclean you might think that just as he may not defile himself for his sister so he may not defile himself for an unattended corpse therefore it states and for his sister he may not defile himself for his sister but he must defile himself for an unattended corpse Talmud Masabakim B. said both are meant after midday yet there is no difficulty in the one case was before they had slaughtered the Passover offering and sprinkled its blood on his account in the other it was after they had slaughtered and sprinkled on his account our Adabi Mahana said to Rabbah after they slaughtered and sprinkled on his account what is done is done said Rabbah to him the eating of the Passover offering is indispensable which follows from Rabbah son of Arhunah's teaching said Rabbah to him pay heed to what your master Rabbah has told you or Adabi Mahana what was Rabbah son of Arhunah's teaching it was taught the day when one learns of a near relation's death is as a day of burial in respect of the laws of seven and thirty days morning in respect of eating the Passover offering it is as a day on which the bones of one's parents are collected in both cases he performs immersion and eats of sacrifices in the evening now this is self-contradictory you say the day when one learns is as a day of burial in respect of seven and thirty Days morning, but in respect of eating the Passover offering, it is as a day when the bones of one's parents are collected. Whence it follows that as for the day of burial, one may not eat even in the evening. And then you teach in both cases he performs immersion and eats of sacrifices in the evening. Said Arhista, it is a controversy of Tanaim Rabbi son of Arhunah. Said there is no difficulty in the one case he learned about his bereavement just before sunset, and similarly the bones of his dead were gathered just before sunset, and similarly his relation died and was buried just before sunset. In the other case, these things happened after sunset, after sunset. But what has been has been. Hence you must surely infer from this that the eating of the Passover offering is indispensable. Arashi said, what does both the one and the other mean? It means that both on the day of hearing and on the day of gathering the bones, he performs immersion and eats of the sacrifices in the evening. But this. Statement of Arashi is fiction. Consider he the Tana is discussing these, then he should say the one and the other. Hence it surely follows that it is fiction. Now what is this controversy of Tanaim? For it was taught for how long is he in one and on his account the whole day. Rabbi said, as long as he is not buried, what are we discussing? Shall we say the day of death? Does anyone reject the view that the day of death embraces the night following by rabbinical law? Moreover, Rabbi said, as long as he is not buried, but if he was buried, he is permitted. Does anyone reject the implication of and the end thereof as a bitter day? Said Arshi's hate. We are discussing the day of burial to this Arjos of Timur. Then when it is taught, he who learns about his bereavement and he who gathers bones performs immersion and eats in the evening. Whence it follows that as for the day of burial, he may not even eat in the evening. With whom will it agree? Rather explain it thus for how long is he in one and on his Account the whole of that day and the following night Rabbi said that is only as long as he was not buried but if he was buried it is a day without the following night now this was reported before our Jeremiah whereupon he observed that a great man like our Joseph should say thus are we to assume then that Rabbi is more lenient surely it was taught how long is he in one and on his account as long as he is not buried even for ten days these are the words of Rabbi but the sages maintain he observes anyth on his account only on that day itself rather explain it thus how long does he observe anyth on his account the whole of that day without the following night Rabbi maintained as long as he is not buried it embraces the following night now it was stated before Rabbi since Rabbi maintained that the day of burial embraces the following night by rabbinical law it follows that the day of death embraces the following night by scriptural law does then Rabbi hold that anyth at night is scriptural, surely it was taught, behold, this day, etc. I am forbidden by day, yet am permitted at night, but future generations will be forbidden both by day and by night. These are the words of our Judah Rabbi maintained any at night is not scriptural, but a law of the scribes in truth it is rabbinical Talmud. Moss say but the sages made their law even stricter than
How do the rabbis explain these texts? Our Nehemiah explains it thus, wherefore have you not eaten, etc. Perhaps said Moses to Aaron, its blood entered the innermost sanctuary, behold, the blood of it was not brought into the sanctuary within. He answered, perhaps it passed without its barrier. He suggested it was in the sanctuary, he replied, and perhaps he offered it in bereavement, and thus disqualified it. Moses replied, He did they, my sons, offer it, I offered it thereupon. He exclaimed, Behold, the blood of it was not brought within, and it was in the sanctuary, then ye should certainly have eaten it as I commanded, viz that they should eat it in their bereavement, said he to him, and there have befallen me such things as these, and if I had eaten the sin offering today, would it have been pleasing in the sight of the Lord? Perhaps you heard thus only about the special sacrifices, for if you would apply it to the regular sacrifices, you may argue a menorah from tithe, which is of lesser holiness. That it is not so for if the Torah said of tithe which is of lesser holiness I have not eaten thereof in my morning how much the more does it apply to sacrifices which are more holy forthwith and when Moses heard that it was pleasing in his sight he admitted his error and Moses was not ashamed to excuse himself by saying I had not heard it but said I heard it and forgot how do our Judah and our Simeon explain these verses they explained it thus wherefore have you not eaten the sin offering? Perhaps the blood entered the innermost sanctuary behold the blood of it was not brought into the sanctuary within he replied perhaps it passed without its barrier it was in the sanctuary was his answer and perhaps he offered it in bereavement and thus disqualified it Moses replied he did they offer it that bereavement should disqualify I offered it and perhaps ye were negligent through your grief and it was defiled Moses he exclaimed am I thus in your eyes that I would despise divine? Sacrifices and there have befallen me such things as these and even many more yet would I not despise divine sacrifices if then said he behold the blood of it was not brought within and it was in the sanctuary then ye should certainly have eaten it as I commanded this that they should eat it in their bereavement perhaps you heard thus only of the night he suggested for if you would apply it to the day you may argue a menorah from tithe which is of lesser holiness that it is not so for if the Torah said of tithe which is of lesser holiness I have not eaten thereof in my morning how much the more does it apply to sacrifices which are more holy forthwith and when Moses heard that Talmud Moss save be it was pleasing in his sight he admitted his error and Moses was not ashamed to excuse himself by saying I had not heard it but I heard it and forgot but they should have kept it and eaten it in the evening it was accidentally defiled as for the rabbis it is well for that. Reason it is written, and if I had eaten the sin offering this day, but on our Nehemiah's explanation, why did he say this day? He meant that it was a statutory obligation of the day. As for our Nehemiah, it is well for that reason it is written, Behold, this day have they offered, etc. But according to the rabbis, what is the significance of Behold, this day? This is what he meant, Behold, have they offered, it was I who offered the master, said, and the three should have been burnt. What were the three? For it was taught, and Moses diligently inquired for the goat of the sin offering. Goat alludes to Nashon's goat. Sin offering refers to the sin offering of the eighth day. Moses inquired refers to the goat of new moon. You might think that the three of them were burnt, therefore it says, and Behold, it was burnt, one was burnt, but three were not burnt. Diligently inquired why these two inquiries, he said to them, Why is the sin offering burnt, and these others lying now? I do not know which one was. Burnt, but when it says, and he hath given it to you to bear the iniquity of the congregation, it follows that it was the goat of new moon. They said, Well to him, our Nehemiah is consistent with his view, for he maintained that bereavement did not disqualify ad hoc sacrifices. The master said, and they should have eaten it in the evening. They said, Well to him, he holds that the law of Anina at night is scriptural. Another argument, surely Phinehas was with them. They said, Well to him, he agrees. With our Eliezer, for our Eliezer said in our Hannah's name, Phinehas was not elevated to the priesthood until he slew Zimri, for it is written, and it shall be unto him and unto his seat after him the covenant of an everlasting priesthood. Our Ashi said until he made peace between the tribes, for it is said, and when Phinehas the priest and the princes of the congregation, even the heads of the thousands of Israel that were with him heard, etc., and as to the others too, surely it is written, and it shall be unto him and unto his seat after him, etc. That is written as a blessing as to the other two. Surely it is written, and when Phinehas the priest heard that was to invest his descendants with his rank, Rab said, Our teacher Moses was a high priest and received a share of the holy sacrifices, as it is said, it was Moses' portion of the ram of consecration. An objection is raised, but was not Phinehas with them. Now, if this is correct, let them argue, but was not our teacher Moses with them. Perhaps Moses was different because he was engaged by the Sheshan offer. A master said, Moses ascended early in the morning and descended early in the morning. An objection is raised, he may eat the bread of his God, both of the most holy and of the holy of sacrifices of higher sanctity are stated. Why are lesser sacrifices stated? And if lesser sacrifices are stated, why are sacrifices of higher sanctity stated? If lesser sacrifices were not stated, I would say he may eat only of higher sacrifices because they were. Permitted to his are and to them, but he may not eat of lesser sacrifices, and if higher sacrifices were not stated, I would say he may eat only of lesser sacrifices since they are lesser, but not of higher sacrifices. For that reason, both higher sacrifices and lesser sacrifices are stated at all events. He the Tana teaches because they were permitted to his are and to them. Surely that means to Moses said Arshis hate no, it refers to the high places. Bama disagreeing with the view that a meal offering could be offered at the high places. An objection is raised who shut Miriam up. If you say Moses shut her up, surely Moses was Azar Talmud. Moss Sabaki may and Azar cannot inspect plagues of leprosy. If you say that Aaron shut her away, Aaron was a relation, and a relation cannot inspect leprous plagues. Rather, the Holy One blessed be he bestowed great honor upon Miriam in that moment and declared, I am a priest, I will shut her away, I will declare her a definite leper, and I will free. Her he teaches at all events Moses was Azar and Azar cannot inspect plague said Arnam and B. Isaac the inspection of leprosy is different because Aaron and his sons are specified in that section an objection is raised Elisheba had five joys more than the other daughters of Israel her brother-in-law Moses was a king her husband was a high priest her son Eliezer was second deputy high priest her grandson Phinehas was anointed for battle and her brother Nashon was the prince of his tribe yet she was bereaved of her two sons at all events he teaches her brother-in-law was a king thus he was a king but not a high priest the men was also a king this is dependent on Tanaim and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses our Joshua B. Karha said a lasting effect is recorded of every fierce anger in the Torah but no lasting effect is recorded in this instance our Simeon B. Oh, he said a lasting effect is recorded in this instance too for it is said is there not Aaron thy Brother the Levite now surely he was a priest rather this is what he meant I had said that thou wouldst be a priest and he a Levite now however he will be a priest and thou a Levite the sages maintain Moses was invested with priesthood only for the seven days of consecration some maintain only Moses descendants were deprived of priesthood for it is said but as for Moses the man of God his sons are named among the tribe of Levi and it says Moses and Aaron among his priests and Samuel among them that call upon his name why and it says you might argue that the first proof text is written for future generations hence it says however Moses and Aaron among his priests now is then a lasting effect recorded of every fierce anger in the Torah surely it is written and he went out from Pharaoh in hot anger and yet he said nothing to him said Reshlakish he slapped him and went out but did Reshlakish say thus surely it is written and thou shalt stand by the rivers bring to meet. Him whereon Rush Lakish commented the Holy One blessed be he said to Moses he is a king and thou must show him reverence while our Yohan and maintained God said to him he is a wicked man therefore be thou insolent toward him reverse it our Janay said let the of kingship always be upon thee for it is written and all these thy servants shall come down unto me but he did not say it of Pharaoh himself or Yohan and said it may be inferred from the following and the hand of the Lord was on Elijah. And he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab Allah said Moses desired kingship but he did not grant it to him for it is written draw not nigh Halam hither Halam can only mean kingship as it is said and David said who am I O Lord God that thou hast brought me Halam thus far robber raised an objection our Ishmael said her Elisheba's brother in law Moses was a king said Rabbi Allah he all meant for himself and for his descendants does and
Another Barry that taught every male includes a man with a blemish in which respect if in respect of eating surely it is already stated if in respect of sharing surely it is already stated if in respect of a man blemished from birth surely it is already stated for I might think I know it only of a man with a permanent blemish how do I know it of a man with a transient blemish therefore it says every male surely this should be reversed said Arshis hate reverse it or Ashi said after all do not reverse it yet it is necessary for I might argue Talmud Ma Sebakim be he is like an unclean person as an unclean person may not eat so long as he is not clean so may this man not eat so long as he is not made whole hence it informs us otherwise whoever is not eligible etc is he not surely a priest with a blemish is not eligible yet he receives a share moreover it implies that everyone who is eligible for service receives a share low an unclean priest is eligible for the service. In public sacrifices and yet does not receive a share he means who is fit to eat low a minor is fit to eat yet does not receive a share he does not teach this now that you have arrived at this you can say after all it is as we first said if your difficulty is on account of an unclean priest he does not teach this and if your difficulty is on account of a priest with a blemish a priest with a blemish was included by the divine law even if one was unclean when the blood was sprinkled but clean when the fats were burned he does not receive a share hence if he was clean when the blood was sprinkled but unclean when the fats were burned he does receive a share our mission does not agree with Abbasal for it was taught Abbasal said he never receives a share unless he was clean from the time of the sprinkling of the blood until the time of the burning of the fats inclusive because it is said he among the sons of Aaron that offered the blood of the peace offerings and it Fat shall have the right thigh for a portion this intimates that even at the burning of the fat too cleanness is required Arashi asked what if he was defiled in between do we require him to be clean at the sprinkling and at the burning and this condition is fulfilled or perhaps he must be clean from the time of the sprinkling until the time of the burning of the fats the question stands over Rabbi said I have the following discussion as a tradition from our Eliezer son of our Simeon which he stated in a privy you can argue if a priest at Tebulyam came and demanded give me of an Israelite's meal offering that I may eat thereof one the clean priest can answer him if I can repulse you from an Israelite's sin offering though you have a valid right to your own sin offering surely I can repulse you from an Israelite's meal offering seeing that you have no valid right in your own meal offering he can reply if you repulse me from an Israelite's sin offering that is because just as I have a great privilege, so have you a great privilege. Will you repulse me from an Israelite's meal offering where just as my own rights are weak, so are your rights weak? He can answer low. It says, and every meal offering shall be the priests that offer it come offer and eat. If the Tebul Yon demands give me a share of an Israelite's sin offering that I may eat, he can reply, if I can repulse you from an Israelite's meal offering, though I have no privileges in my own meal offering, surely. I can repulse you from an Israelite's sin offering, seeing that I have great privileges in my own sin offering, he can retort, if you can repulse me from an Israelite's meal offering where just as you have no privileges, so have I no privileges, will you repulse me from an Israelite's sin offering where just as you have great privileges, so have I great privileges, he can answer low. It says the priest that offered it for sin shall eat it, come offer it for sin and eat if the Tebul Yon demands give me. A share of the breast and the thigh that I may eat, he can reply. If I can repulse you from an Israelite sin offering, though you have great privileges in your own sin offering, surely I can repulse you from a peace offering where your privileges are weak, since you have rights only to the breast and thigh thereof. He can retort. If you can repulse me from a sin offering where my rights are weak in respect of my wives and servants, will you repulse me from the breast and thigh where my rights are strong in respect of my wives and my slaves? He can answer low. It says it shall be the priests that sprinkle the blood of the peace offerings against the altar. Come sprinkle and eat. Thus the Tebul Yon departs, bearing his arguments on his head with an one and on his right, and one who lacks atonement on his left. Araha raised a difficulty. Let him the Tebul Yon demand. Give me a share of the firstling that I may eat, because he the clean priest can answer if I can repulse you from an Israelite. Sin offering though my own privileges in a sin offering are weak in respect to my wives and slaves surely I can repulse you from a firstling where I enjoy great privileges as it is altogether mine he can answer if you have repulsed me from a sin offering where just as your privileges are weak so are my privileges weak will you repulse me from a firstling where just as your privileges are great so are mine great he can retort low it says thou shalt sprinkle their blood against the altar and shalt make their fat smoke for an offering made by fire and the flesh of them shall be thine come sprinkle and eat and the other refute it thus is it then written and the flesh of them shall be the priests who sprinkle surely it is written and the flesh of them shall be thine which means even another priest now how might he or Eliezer son of our Simeon do this surely Rabbi Barhana said in our Yohanan's name one may meditate on learning in all places except in a bathhouse and a Privy it is different when it is done involuntarily Talmud, Ma Sevakim Amishnah whenever the altar does not acquire its flesh the priests do not acquire the skin for it is said and the priest that offered any man's burnt offering even the priest shall have the skin this means a burnt offering which counts for a man if a burnt offering was slaughtered under a different designation although it does not count for its owner its skin belongs to the priest whether it be a man's burnt offering or a woman's burnt offering the skins belong to the priests the skins of lesser sacrifices belong to their owners the skins of most sacred sacrifices belong to the priest as can be inferred a minority if they acquire the skin of a burnt offering though they do not acquire its flesh is it not logical that they acquire the skins of most sacred sacrifices when they acquire their flesh the altar does not refute this argument for it does not acquire the skin in any instance Gemara. Our rabbis taught any man's burnt offering this excludes a burnt offering of Hippish. These are the words of our Judah, our Jose son of our Judah said it excludes a proselyte's burnt offering. What is meant by this excludes a burnt offering of Hippish said our high B. Joseph it excludes a burnt offering derived from leftovers that is well on the view that leftovers were devoted to public sacrifices but what can be said on the view that leftovers were devoted to private sacrifices as Rabbi said. Elsewhere the burnt offering intimates the first burnt offering so here too the burnt offering intimates the first burnt offering our Abu said in our Jane's name it excludes a case where one dedicates a burnt offering to the temple repair now on the view that the sanctity of temple repair seizes it by scriptural law there can be no question but even on the view that it does not seize it by scriptural law that applies only to the flesh but it does seize the skin in Rabbi. Abu's name also said it excludes a burnt offering derived from leftovers said Arham unto to Arnaman with whom does that agree with our Judah surely he retracted from his view for it was taught six were for votive offerings before burnt offerings brought from the proceeds of leftovers the skins of which burnt offerings did not belong to the priests these are the words of our Judah said Arnim my other say Arsimian to him if so you have nullified the teaching of Jehoiada the priest for it was taught this teaching did Jehoiada the priest expounded is a guilt offering he owed a guilt offering unto the Lord whatever comes in virtue of a sin offering and a guilt offering burnt offerings are purchased there with the flesh belongs to the Lord while the skin belongs to the priest said he to him and how does the master explain it I explain it as referring to one who dedicates his property to temple repair he replied and it is in accordance with our Joshua for we Learned if one dedicates his property amongst which were animals eligible for the altar both males and females are Eliezer said the males must be sold for the purpose of burnt offerings and the females must be sold for the purpose of peace offerings whilst the money obtained for them together with the rest of the estate falls to the temple repair our Joshua said the males themselves must be offered as burnt offerings and the females must be sold for the purpose of peace offerings and burnt offerings be brought with the money obtained for them now even our Joshua who maintains that a man divides his consecration that is only in respect of the flesh but the skin is seized with the sanctity of temple repair our Jose son of our Judah said it excludes a proselyte's burnt offering said our semi be hilted is that a proselyte not a man it excludes reply to a proselyte who died without ears our rabbis taught any man's burnt offering I know it only of a man as burnt offering how do I know it of the burnt offering of proselytes women and slaves because it says the skin of the burnt offering which is an extension if so why does it say any man's burnt offering it intimates a burnt offering which has freed a man of his obligation and thus excludes one which was slaugh
Skin with them the sin offering, guilt offering, and public peace offerings are the priestly dues if they wish they can flay them. If they do not so desire, they can consume them together with their skin. Lesser sacrifices belong to their owners if they desire, they can flay them. If they do not desire, they can eat them together with the skin. But of the burnt offering it is said, and he shall flay the burnt offering and cut it into its pieces. You might thus think that the priests do not acquire its skin. Therefore, it states even the priest shall have to himself the skin of the burnt offering which he had offered, and this excludes a tebul on one who lacks atonement and in one and for you might think that these have no right to the flesh which is eaten, but they have a right to the skin which is not eaten. Therefore, it states it shall be as which excludes one who lacks atonement a tebul and in one and now let the first hand to deduce it by logic that which may be inferred for sure. Scripture takes the trouble of writing it explicitly now how does our Ishmael utilize this text which he hath offered it excludes a tebul yom one who lacks atonement and in one and but let him deduce that from it shall be as our Ishmael is consistent with his view for our Yohan and said on our Ishmael's authority it shall be as is said in connection with the burnt offering and it shall be as is said in connection with the guilt offering as there its bones are permitted so here too its bones are permitted. This must be redundant for if it is not redundant it can be refuted as for a guilt offering that is because its flesh is permitted it shall be as is a superfluous text mission all sacrifices which became disqualified if this happened before they were flayed their skins do not belong to the priests if it occurred after they were flayed their skins belong to the priests said our hand of the seeking of the priests never in my life have I seen skin go out to the place of burning our Akiba observed we. Learn from his words that if one flays a firstling and it is found to be tear for the priests have a right to its skin but the sages maintain I have never seen is not proof rather it the skin must go forth to the place of burning tomorrow the preceding mission teaches whenever the altar does not acquire the flesh the priests do not acquire the skin which implies even though the skin was stripped before the sprinkling of the blood who is the author of this are Eliezer B. R. Simeon who maintain the blood does not propitiate on behalf of the skin when it is by itself and consider the second clause all sacrifices which became disqualified if this happened before they were flayed their skins do not belong to the priests if it occurred after they were flayed their skins belong to the priests this agrees with rabbi who maintain the blood propitiates on behalf of the skin when it is by itself thus the first clause agrees with our Eliezer B. R. Simeon while the second clause Agrees with Rabbi said Abbe since the second clause agrees with Rabbi the first clause too agrees with Rabbi Rabbi however admits that flaying is not done before sprinkling Rabbi said since the first clause agrees with our Eliezer B. R. Simeon the second clause too agrees with our Eliezer B. R. Simeon what however is meant by before flaying Talmud, Ma Sebekimei and after flaying before it is eligible for flaying and after it is eligible for flaying respectively what is this allusion to Rabbi and our Eliezer B. R. Simeon it was taught Rabbi said the blood propitiates on behalf of the skin by itself but when it is together with the flesh and a disqualification arises in it whether before or after the sprinkling it is the same as itself our Eliezer B. R. Simeon maintained the blood does not propitiate on behalf of the skin by itself and when it is together with the flesh and a disqualification arises in it before sprinkling it is the same as itself if it arises after the sprinkling the flesh. Has been permitted for a short space of time, and so it is flayed, and the skin belongs to the priests. Shall we say that they differ on the same lines as our Eliezer and our Joshua? For it was taught, and thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings, the flesh and the blood. Our Joshua said, If there is no blood, there is no flesh, and if there is no flesh, there is no blood. Our Eliezer said, The blood is fit, even if there is no flesh, because it is said, and the blood of thy sacrifices shall be poured out against the altar of the Lord thy God. If so, why is it stated, and thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings, the flesh and the blood, to teach you just as the blood requires throwing, so does the flesh require throwing? Thus you learned that there was a space between the ascent and the altar. Shall we say that he who maintains that it propitiates agrees with our Eliezer, while he who maintains that it does not propitiate agrees with our Joshua about the view of our Eliezer? There is no controversy at all, they disagree in. Reference to our Joshua, he who maintains that it does not propitiate holds as our Joshua, while he who maintains that it does propitiate can tell you our Joshua rules thus only there where there is no loss to the priest, but as for the skin which would entail a loss to the priest, even our Joshua admits by analogy with a fate accompli, for it was taught if the flesh was defiled or disqualified or it passed without the curtains, our Eliezer said he must sprinkle the blood, our Joshua maintained he must not sprinkle the blood, yet our Joshua admits that if he does sprinkle it, it is accepted, said our hand of the seeking of the priest, etc. Did he not surely there are the bullocks which are burnt and the goats which are burnt? We do not speak of what is burnt in pursuance of their prescribed rites, but what when the sacrifice is disqualified before it is flayed and before sprinkling we refer to a stripped skin, but there is a disqualification after flaying and before sprinkling according to our Eliezer B. R. Simeon who maintained that the blood does not propitiate on behalf of the skin by itself or Hannah agrees with Rabbi. Alternatively you may even say that he holds as our Eliezer B. R. Simeon Rabbi admits that there was no flame before sprinkling but there is a case where it is discovered tirfa in its inwards he holds that where it is found tirfa in its inwards if the blood propitiates this may be proved too for it teaches our Akiba observed we learn from his words that if one flays a firstling and it is found to be tirfa the priests have a right to its skin this proves it what then does our Akiba inform us he informs us this is that it is so even in the country our high B. Abba said in our Yohanan's name the Halachah is as our Akiba but even our Akiba ruled thus only where an expert had permitted it but not if an expert had not permitted it the Talmud however states the law agrees with the view of the sages the flesh is buried and the skin is burnt Misha. Bullocks which are burnt and goats which are burnt when they are burnt in pursuance of their prescribed rights they are burnt in the ash depository and defle garments but when they are not burnt in pursuance of their prescribed rights they are burnt in the place of the buyer and do not defile garments Talmud, Ma Sevakim B. If they were carrying them on staves and those in front had passed without the wall of the temple court while those in the rear had not yet gone out those in front defile their garments while those in the rear do not defile their garments until they go out when both go out both defile their garments are Simeon said they do not defile their garments until the fire is burning in the greater part of them when the flesh is dissolved he who burns it does not defile his garments tomorrow what is the buyer said Rabbi Barhan in our Yohanan's name there is a place on the temple mount called Bira while Rishlakish maintained the whole temple house is called Bira for it is said and to build the Bira temple for which I have made provision Arnaman said in Rabbi Abba's name there were three ash pits there was a large ash pit in the temple court there they burnt most holy sacrifices and emirim of lesser sacrifices which had become disqualified and the bullocks which were burnt and the goats which were burnt which had become disqualified before sprinkling there was a second ash pit on the temple mount there they burnt the bullocks which were burnt and the goats which were burnt which had become disqualified after sprinkling while those which were burnt in pursuance of their rights were burnt without the three camps Levi recited there were three ash pits there was a large ash pit in the temple court there they burnt most holy sacrifices and emirim of lesser sacrifices which had become disqualified and the bullocks which were burnt and the goats which were burnt which had become disqualified either before or after the sprinkling. There was a second ash pit on the temple mount there they burnt the bullocks which were burnt and the goats which were burnt which had become disqualified after they had gone out while those burnt in pursuance of their prescribed rights were burnt without the three camps are Jeremiah asked is Lina effective in the case of the bullocks which are burnt and the goats which are burnt do we say Lina is effective only in respect of flesh which can be eaten but not in respect of these which cannot be eaten or perhaps there is no difference said Rabbi this question was raised by Abay and I solved it for him from the following and both agree that if he expressed an intention of pickle in connection with the eating of the bullocks and their burning he has done nothing surely then since intention does not disqualify it Lina too does not disqualify it no perhaps only intention does not disqualify it but Lina does disqualify it come and here you trespass in respect of the bullocks which are burnt and the goats which are burnt from the time they are consecrated having been slaughtered they are ready to become unfit through a tebul yom and one who lacks atonement and
which were burnt and the goats which were burnt if the greater part of them went out through the inclusion of the smaller part of a limb do we cast this lesser part of a limb after its greater part and that indeed has not gone out or perhaps we cast it after the greater part of the animal it is obvious that we do not disregard the greater part of the animal and regard the greater part of the limb rather the question arises where half of it went out through the inclusion of the greater part of the limb do we cast this lesser part of the limb Talmud, Mas Sebakim after its greater part and that indeed has gone out or perhaps we cast it after the animal the question stands over Rabbi Arun recited this passage in reference to men thus five men were engaged on it three had gone out and two were left within what is the law do we follow the majority of those engaged on it or perhaps we go by the animal the question stands over our Eliezer asked what if the bullocks which were burnt and the goats which were burnt were carried out and then brought back do we say since they the carcasses went out they are unclean or perhaps since they returned they returned said our Abu Bimel come and here if they were carrying them on staves and those in front had passed without the wall of the temple court while those in the rear had not yet gone out those in front defile their garments while those in the rear do not defile their garments until they go out now if you should think that as soon as they go out they the garments are defiled then let those who are within also be defiled said Rabban and now is that logical surely we require and after that he may come into the camp which is absent then in which circumstances does our Eliezer's question arise where they seized it with crooks our rabbis taught the bullocks which are burnt the red heifer and the goat that is sent away he that leads the last away he who burns them and he who carries the first Named out of the temple court defile their garments they themselves however do not defile garments but they defile foodstuffs and liquids these are the words of our but the sages maintain the red heifer and the bullocks defile foodstuffs and liquids whereas the goat which is sent away does not defile because it is alive and the live thing does not defile foodstuffs and liquids as for our mayor, it is well as his view agrees with the teaching of the school of our Ishmael for the school of our Ishmael taught upon any sowing seed which is to be sown as seeds which will not ultimately defile with stringent uncleanness require a qualification hitcher so all which will not ultimately defile with stringent uncleanness require a qualification thus the carcass of a clean bird is excluded since it will eventually defile with stringent uncleanness it does not require a qualification but as for the rabbis if they accept the teaching of the school of our Ishmael even the goat that is sent away Two should defile while if they reject it how do they know that the red heifer and the bullocks defile foodstuffs when our Dimi came he said in the West Palestine they said they need a qualification for defilement from a foreign source our Eliezer asked can the bullocks which are burnt and the goats which are burnt defile foodstuffs and liquids within the temple court as without when it lacks going out is it as though it lacks an action or not after he asked he answered it that which lacks going out is as though it lacked an action our Abba B. Samuel asked our high B. Abba according to our mayor can as much as an olive of the nibble of a clean bird defile when it is lying on the ground there is no question when one has it in his mouth there is no question the question arises when one is holding it in his hand do we say since it was not yet taken to his mouth it is as though it lacked an action or not after he asked he solved it Talmud, Mas Sebakim be the fact that it was not yet taken to his mouth is not as though it lacked an action he refuted him thirteen laws were stated on the nibble of a clean bird and this is one of them it needs intention and it does not need a qualification and as much as an egg thereof defiles foodstuffs surely this is in accordance with our mayor no it agrees with the rabbis but the first clause teaches it needs intention and it does not need a qualification and whom do you know to hold thus our mayor and since the first clause agrees with our mayor the second clause agrees with our mayor why say thus each is governed by its own conditions but the final clause teaches cheshito when they go out hence the question whether they defile foodstuffs whilst they are still within just as when they are without or melica relieves it when tearful from its uncleanness now whom do you know to hold this view our mayor then the first and the last clauses agree with our mayor while the middle clause agrees with the rabbis yes the first and the last Clauses agree with our mayor while the middle clause agrees with the rabbis. Our Hamnon is said to our Zerah, do not sit down on your haunches until you have told me this law in our mayor's view. Do we distinguish first and second degrees of uncleanness in the nibble of a clean bird, or do we not distinguish first and second degrees? Said he to him, where a thing defile a human being by touch, we distinguish first and second degrees in it, where it does not defile a human being by touch, we do not distinguish first and second degrees in it. Our Zerah asked our MIB high others, say our Abin Bikahana, as to what was taught when foodstuffs are joined by means of a liquid, they are united in respect of a light uncleanness, but are not united in respect of stringent defilement. Do we distinguish first and second degrees in their case, or do we not distinguish first and second degrees in their case? Said he to him, where a thing defile a human being, we distinguish first and second degrees in it. Where it does not defile a human being, we do not distinguish first and second degrees in it when both go out. How do we know it? Because our rabbis taught elsewhere without three camps is said, whereas here without one camp is prescribed, it is to teach you immediately it has gone forth from the first camp, it defiles garments. And how do we know it in the case of that itself? Because our rabbis taught even the whole bullet shall he carry forth without the camp, that means without the three camps. You say without the three camps, yet perhaps it is not so, but rather without one camp when it says in connection with the congregational bullet without the camp, which is superfluous since it states as he burned the first bullet that prescribes a second camp, when further without the camp is stated in connection with the ashes, which is superfluous since it is already stated where the ashes are poured out, it shall be burned, it prescribes a third camp. Now, how does our Simeon employ this? Without the camp he requires it for what was taught our Eliezer said without the camp is stated here and without the camp is stated elsewhere as here it means without the three camps so there it means without the three camps and as there it means on the east of Jerusalem Talmud, Mas Sevakim so here too it means on the east of Jerusalem and according to the rabbis where did one burn them even as it was taught where were they burnt on the north of Jerusalem without the three camps are Jose the Galilean said they are burnt in the place of the ashes Rabbi observed who is a tanna that disagrees with our Jose the Galilean our Eliezer B. Jacob for it was taught where the ashes are poured out it shall be burnt this intimates that ashes must be there first our Eliezer B. Jacob said it intimates that the ground must slope down said Abbe to him perhaps they disagree whether the ground must slope our rabbis taught he who burns the bullocks defile his garments but he who kindles the fire does not defile his garments nor does he who arranges the pile defile his garments and what is the definition of he who burns he who assists at the time of the burning you might think that also he who assists when they have already been reduced to ashes defile his garments therefore it states and he that burneth them shall wash his clothes when he burns them they defile garments but when they have become ashes they do not defile garments our Simeon said when he burns them they defile his garments but when the flesh is disintegrated they do not defile garments wherein do they disagree said Rabbah they disagree where the flesh is completely charred chapterxii mishnah he who slaughters and offers up without the temple court is culpable in respect of slaughtering and in respect of offering our Jose the Galilean maintained if he slaughtered within and offered up without he is culpable if he slaughtered without and offered up without he is not liable because he offered up only that which was unfit said they to him when one slaughters within and offers up without immediately he carries it out he renders it unfit an unclean person who eats of sacrifices whether unclean sacrifices or clean sacrifices is culpable our Jose the Galilean said an unclean person who eats clean sacrifices is culpable but an unclean person who eats unclean flesh of sacrifices is not culpable because he ate only that which is unclean said they to him when an unclean person eats clean flesh immediately he touches it he defiles it a clean person who eats unclean flesh is not culpable because one is culpable only on account of personal uncle and eskimar as for offering up it is well the penalty is written and the interdict is written the penalty for it is written and bringeth it not unto the door of the tent of meeting even that man shall be cut off from his people the interdict for it is written take heed to thyself that thou offer not thy Burnt offerings in every place that thou seest and in accordance with our Abin's dictum in our Eliezer's name is wherever take heed lest or not is stated it is not but a negative command but as for slaughtering the penalty it is true as stated for it is written what mansoever that killeth an ox and hath not brought it unto the door of the tent of meeting shall be cut off from among his people but whence do we derive the
Both were permitted but offered when they were forbidden for it is said to the end that the children of Israel may bring their sacrifices which they sacrifice with sacrifices which I formerly permitted in the open field this teaches you that he who sacrifices slaughters at Bumath when Bumath are forbidden the rid regards him as though he offered in the open field even that they may bring them unto the Lord this is a positive injunction whence have we a negative injunction from it. Text and they shall no more sacrifice etc. You might think that one is punished for it by Gareth therefore it states this shall be a statute forever unto them throughout their generations this is their statute but not else is theirs rather said Arabin we learned in a minority of scripture interdicted where it did not punish with Gareth is it not logical that it interdicted where it punished with Gareth Robin observed to our Ashi if so let a negative injunction not be stated in Connection with Heleb and it could be inferred a minority from Nibla if scripture interdicted Nibla where it did not punish with Kareth is it not logical that it interdicted Heleb seeing that it did punish with Kareth then he came before Rabba said he to him it could not be inferred from Nibla because the argument can be refuted as for Nibla the reason is because it defiles nor can it be deduced from unclean shirazim reptiles because as for unclean shirazim the reason is because a small portion defile nor from clean shirazim because as for clean shirazim the reason is because the standard of their interdict is very small nor from Orla and Kilaim of the vineyard because as for Orla and Kilaim of the vineyard that is because all benefit from them is forbidden nor from Shabith because as for Shabith that is because it imposes its own status upon the money received for it nor from Terima because as for Terima that is because it is never Exceptionally permitted, nor can you deduce it from all these because they are never permitted. Exceptionally, Rabbah said, If I have a difficulty, it is this when we learned the Passover offering and circumcision are positive commands. Let us infer a negative injunction in their case from one who leaves anything over of the Passover offering if scripture interdicted in the case of one who leaves over, though it did not prescribe a penalty. Is it not logical that it interdicted in the case of it? Passover offering and circumcision where it did prescribe a penalty. Our Ashi said, I reported this discussion in Arkahana's presence, and he told me a negative injunction cannot be inferred from leaving over because the argument can be refuted. As for leaving over, that is because it cannot be repaired. Will you say that there is a negative injunction in the case of a Passover offer which can be repaired if neglected, but can you assume an interdict by inferring a minority for even on the view? That you can punish through inferring a minority, you cannot assume a formal prohibition by inferring a minority. Rather, it is as our Yohanan said elsewhere. For our Yohanan said, bringing is inferred from bringing as in the latter case. Scripture did not prescribe a penalty without formally interdicting. So in the former case, Scripture did not prescribe a penalty without formally interdicting Talmud. Mas Sevakim Rabbah said, it is as our Jonas exegesis for our Jonas said there is inferred from there. As in the one case, Scripture did not prescribe a penalty without formally prohibiting. So in the other case, Scripture did not punish without formally prohibiting. We have now found the case of those which should be burnt within which were offered up without. How do we know the case of those which should be burnt without which were offered up without? Said our Kahana Scripture said, and thou shalt say unto them which means thou shalt say concerning those just mentioned to this Rabbah Demur. Is it then written concerning them? Surely unto them is written, rather it is as the school of our Ishmael taught, and thou shalt say unto them combines the sections are Yohanan said, bringing is inferred from bringing as there it refers to those sacrifices which must be burnt without, so here too it refers to those which must be burnt without to this RBB demurred. When we learned there are 36 offenses in the Torah which entail Karat, surely there are 37 for there are offering up a sacrifice which should be burnt within and offering up a sacrifice which should be burnt without. That is indeed a difficulty now when we learned he who sprinkles some of the blood without is culpable. How do we know it is inferred from what was taught? Blood shall be imputed unto that man that is to include one who sprinkles without these are the words of our Ishmael or Akiba said, or sacrifice includes sprinkling, and how does our Ishmael employ this phrase or sacrifice to divide end? Whence does our Akiva know to divide he infers it from and bringeth it not unto the door of the tent of meeting and our Ishmael he requires that it for teaching one is culpable for offering up the whole animal but not for offering up an incomplete one and our Akiva he infers it from the phrase to sacrifice it and our Ishmael one it is in respect of those sacrifices which which should be burnt within which were made incomplete and offered up without the other is in respect of those which should be burnt without which one made incomplete and offered up without and it was taught even so our Ishmael said you might think that if one made incomplete and offered up without what should be burnt within he is culpable therefore it says to sacrifice it one is culpable for offering up the whole animal but not for offering up an incomplete one and our Akiva he holds that if one made incomplete and offered up without what should be burnt within he is culpable and our Akiva how does he Employ this phrase blood shall be imputed it includes the shechita of a bird and our Ishmael he deduces it from more that killeth and our Akiva he can answer you he requires that to teach one is culpable for slaughtering shechita but not for nipping melika and our Ishmael he infers it from this is the thing which the Lord hath commanded for it was taught what man soever that killeth an ox etc I know it only of slaughtering an animal how do I know that if one slaughters a bird he is culpable because it says or that killeth you might think that I also include one who performs melika and that is indeed logical if one is culpable for shechita of a bird though this is not its correct right within is it not logical that one is culpable for melika without seeing that that is its correct right within therefore it states this is the thing etc and our Akiva he can answer you that is required for a gazerish one now as to what we learned he who takes the fistful and he who receives the blood of a sacrifice slaughtered without is not liable. How do we know it? But once would you infer that he is culpable from Sheshita? As for Sheshita, the reason may be because it invalidates a Passover offering when it is done on behalf of such who cannot eat it, then infer it from sprinkling. As for sprinkling, the reason may be because a Israelite is liable to death on its account. Talmud, Mas Sevakim, be inferred from both combined, but if so, let it not be stated in connection with sprinkling, which may be inferred from both Sheshita and offering up combined. Thus, when you say let it be inferred from Sheshita, you can argue as for Sheshita, the reason is because it is invalid in the case of the Passover offering when done on behalf of such who cannot eat, let it be inferred from offering up. As for offering up, the reason is because it applies to a meal offering too, then infer it from both combined. Rather, for that reason, a text is written to include. Sprinkling to intimate that you may not infer from both combined Arabab said if one slaughtered a sacrifice and sprinkled its blood without according to our Ishmael he is liable to one sin offering whereas according to our Akiva he is liable to two Abay said even on our Akiva's view he is liable to one only because scripture said there thou shalt offer up thy burnt offerings and there thou shalt do all that I command thee scripture thus rank them as one doing right if one sprinkled and offered up without according to our Ishmael he is liable to two sin offerings whereas according to our Akiva he is liable to one only Abay said even on our Akiva's view he is liable to two that being the reason that scripture divided them this there thou shalt offer up and there thou shalt do if one slaughtered sprinkled and offered up all agree that he is liable to two our rabbis taught or that killeth it without the camp you might think that that means without the three camps. Therefore it states or goat in the camp if you thus stress in the camp you might think that even one who slaughters a burnt offering in the south is culpable therefore it is stated or that killeth it without the camp as without the camp is distinguished in that it is not eligible for the slaughtering of most sacred sacrifices or for the slaughtering of any sacrifice so in the camp means in a place which is not eligible for the slaughtering of any sacrifice hence the south side of it. Temple court is excluded for though it is not fit for the slaughtering of most sacred sacrifices it is eligible for the slaughtering of lesser sacrifices Ola said one who slaughters on the roof of a call is culpable since it is not eligible for the slaughtering of any sacrifice to this robber demurred if so let scripture write in the camp or without the camp and unto the door of the tent of meeting will not be necessary what is the purpose of and hath not brought it unto the door of it. Tent of meeting surely it is to exclude the roof now according to Rabbah if that is so let scripture write unto the door of the tent of meeting only what is the purpose of in the camp and without the camp surely that is to include the roof said Armari no it includes the case where the whole of the animal is within but its throat is without if its throat is without it is obvious that one is culpable for to what does a
Curtains according to our Eliezer simply for privacy it was stated if one offers up a limb less than an olive in size but the bone makes it up to an olive are you had and maintained he is culpable Resh Lakish said he is not culpable are you had and maintained he is culpable that which is attached to what a sense the altar is as what is a sense in its own right Resh Lakish said he is not liable that which is attached to what a sense is not as what a sense Rabba asked what if one offers up Talmud, Moss. Zabakim the head of a pigeon which is not as much as an olive but the salt makes it up to an olive said Rabba Parzakia to Arashi is not that the controversy of Aryohanan and Resh Lakish no you may ask on Aryohanan's view and you may ask on the view of Resh Lakish you may ask on Aryohanan's view Aryohanan gives his ruling only there in respect of the bone which is related to the flesh but not in the case of salt which is not related to the flesh or perhaps there is no difference you may ask on the view of Resh Lakish Resh Lakish gives his ruling only there in respect of the bone because if it parts from it the flesh there is no obligation to take it up on the altar but not here where if it parts there is an obligation to take it up or perhaps there is no difference the question stands over our Jose the Galilean said etc Rabbi answered on behalf of our Jose the Galilean as for one who slaughters within and offers up without the reason is because it had a time of fitness. Will you say the same when one slaughters without and offers up without where it never had a period of fitness? Our Eliezer son of our Simeon answered on behalf of our Jose the Galilean as for slaughtering within and offering up without that is because the sanctuary the altar receives it. Will you say the same when one slaughters without and offers up without where the sanctuary does not receive it? Wherein do they differ? Said Zeiri, they differ in respect to slaughtering at night. Rabbi said, they disagree where one received it, the blood in a non-sacred vessel, an unclean person who eats of sacrifices, whether unclean sacrifices, etc. The Rabbi say, well, to our Jose the Galilean said, Rabbi, where the priest's body first became unclean and then the flesh became unclean, none disagree that he is liable because personal defilement involves corrupt. They disagree where the flesh first became unclean and then the priest's body became unclean. The Rabbi's hold we say ago since. Whereas our Jose the Galilean holds, we do not say ago now according to our Jose granted that we do not say ago yet let his personal uncleanness which is graver come and fall upon the uncleanness of the flesh said Arashi how do you know that personal uncleanness is more stringent perhaps uncleanness of the flesh is more stringent since it cannot be purified in a mission is slaughtering without is more stringent than offering up without and offering up is more stringent than slaughtering slaughtering is more stringent for he who slaughters a sacrifice on behalf of man is culpable whereas he who offers up to a man is not culpable offering up is more stringent to who hold a knife and slaughter without are not culpable whereas if they take hold of a limb and offer it up they are culpable if one offered up then offered up again then offered up again he is culpable in respect of each act of offering up these are the words of our Simeon our Jose said he is liable. Only to one sin offering he is liable only when he offers up on the top of an altar. Our Simeon said he is liable even if he offers up on the top of a rock or a stone. Gemara why is offering up to a man without different that it is not culpable presumably because unto the Lord is written then in the case of slaughtering too surely unto the Lord is written there it is different because scripture saith what mansoever what mansoever is written in connection with offering up to that is required for teaching that when two men offer up a limb they are liable if so say that here too it is required for teaching that if two men hold the knife and slaughter they are liable there it is different because scripture saith that man this implies one but not two if so that man is written in connection with offering up to that is required Talmud, Mas Zabakim B in order to exclude one who acts in ignorance under constraint or in error if so there too it is required in order to Exclude one who acts in ignorance under constraint or in error that is written twice then what is the purpose of unto the Lord it is to exclude the goat that is sent away offering up is more stringent etc. Our rabbis taught a man a man why this repetition to include two who take hold of a limb and offer it up and it teaches that they are liable for I might argue is not the reverse logical if two who hold a knife and slaughter are not liable though when one slaughters to a man he is liable is it not logical that when two take hold of a limb and offer it up they are not liable seeing that one who offers up to a man is not liable therefore a man a man is stated these are the words of our Simeon our Jose said that man implies one but not two if so why is a man a man stated because scripture employs human idiom and our Simeon he requires that for excluding one who acts in ignorance under constraint or in error and our Jose he infers that from how being written instead of who and our Simeon he does not attribute any particular significance to Hahu as opposed to who now according to our Jose since in this issue the Torah employs human idiom and the other issue too we must say that the Torah employs human idiom once then does he know that one who slaughters to a man is liable he infers it from blood shall be imputed unto that man he has shed blood this implies even one who slaughters to a man if one offered up then offered up again etc. Resh Lakish said. The controversy is about four or five limbs one master holds that the text to sacrifice it which teaches that a person is liable on account of a whole but not on account of an incomplete one is written in connection with the whole animal the other master holds that it is written in connection with each limb but in the case of one limb all agree that he is liable to one offering only but are you and maintain the controversy is about one limb one master holds that if one offers up without Limbs which were first burnt within and thus became incomplete he is liable while the other master holds that he is not liable but in the case of four or five limbs all agree that he is liable on account of each limb separately now this disagrees with Ola for Ola said all agree that one is liable if he offers up without limbs which were burnt within and thus became incomplete they disagree only where one offers up without limbs which were burnt without and thus became incomplete there one master holds that he is not liable while the other master holds that he is liable others say Ola said all agree that one is not liable if he offers up without limbs which were burnt without and thus became incomplete they disagree only where one offers up without limbs which were burnt within and thus became incomplete one master holds that he is not liable while the other master holds that he is liable now Samuel's father disagrees with Ola's view in its first Version for Samuel's father said in accordance with whom do we replace on the altar limbs that spring off it is not in accordance with our Jose he is liable only when he offers up on top of an altar etc. Our Huna said what is our Jose's reason because it is written and no build an altar unto the Lord are Yohanan said what is our Simeon's reason because it is written so Mano took the kid with the meal offering and offered it upon the rock unto the Lord now as to the other two surely it is written and no build an altar unto the Lord that was merely for its elevation and as to the other two surely it is written so Mano took etc. that was a temporary dispensation alternatively this is our Simeon's reason because as it was taught our Simeon said there is the altar of the Lord at the door of the tent of meeting but there is no altar at the Bama therefore if one offered up without on a rock or on a stone he is liable he is liable surely he should say he is excluded this is what he means therefore if one offers up on a rock or on a stone when both are forbidden he is liable our Jose son of our Hannah asked as to the horn the ascent the base and squareness are these indispensable at the Bumath said our Jeremiah to him and was taught the horn the ascent the base and squareness were indispensable at the Great Bumath but were not indispensable at minor Bumath Mishnah Talmud, Mas Sebekim at Talmud, Mas Sebekim if either valid sacrifices or invalid sacrifices had become unfit within and one offers them without he is liable if one offers up without as much as an olive of a burnt offering and its emirim combined he is liable Gemara our rabbis taught whatsoever man that offered up a burnt offering I know it only of a burnt offering whence do I know to include the emirim of a guilt offering the emirim of a sin offering the emirim of most sacred sacrifices and the emirim of lesser sacrifices because it says or sacrifice whence do we know to include the fistful frankincense incense the meal offering of priests the meal offering of the anointed priest and one who makes a libation of three logs of wine or of water because it says and bringeth it not unto the door of the tent of meeting whatever comes to the door of the tent of meeting you are liable on its account if it is done without again I know it only of valid sacrifices whence do I know to include invalid ones e.g. a sacrifice that is kept overnight or that goes out or is unclean or which was slaughtered with the intention of being eaten after time or without bounds or whose blood was received and sprinkled by unfit persons or whose blood was sprinkled above
Nathar contradictory one refers to actual Nathar, the other refers to such which were left over before the blood was sprinkled, and who is the author of this are Joshua, for it was taught our Joshua said in the case of all the sacrifices of the Torah, of which as much as an olive of flesh or an olive of Halab remains Talmud, Ma Savakin B he sprinkles the blood if there remains half as much as an olive of flesh and half an olive of Halab, he must not sprinkle the blood, but in the case of a burnt offering, even if there remains half as much as an olive of flesh and half an olive of Halab, he sprinkles the blood because the whole of it is entirely burnt, while as for a meal offering, even if the whole of it is in existence, he must not sprinkle the blood. What business has a meal offering here said our Papa this refers to the meal offering of libations which accompanies the animal sacrifice mission as for the fistful of flour, the frankincense, the incense, the priest's meal. Offering the anointed priest's meal offering and the meal offering of libations if one presented as much as an olive of one of these without he is liable but our Eliezer rules that one is not liable unless he presents the whole of them without in the case of all of these if they were offered within but as much as an olive was left over and one offered it without he is liable in the case of all of these if they became slightly incomplete and one offered them without he is not liable one who offers sacrifices together with the demurim without is liable Gemara our rabbis taught if one burns as much as an olive of incense without he is liable if one burns half a pair within he is not liable now it was assumed that what does not liable mean azar is not liable then the difficulty arises why so surely it is hot said arzara in arhista's name and arjara might be abba's name and rab's name what does not liable mean the community is not liable arzara said if i have a difficulty it is this is Rab's statement thereon that here even our Eliezer agrees, but surely our Eliezer maintains that this does not constitute Hatara said Rabbah in respect of Hatara and the Hikal none disagree, they disagree only in respect of the Hatara within one master holds his hands full is particularly meant while the other master holds that his hands full is not meant particularly, but surely said Abbe to him statute is written in reference to Hatara within rather said Abbe in respect of Hatara within none disagree, they disagree only in respect of Hatara without one master holds that we learn within from without while the other master holds that we do not learn within from without Rab observed seeing that the rabbis do not learn without from without can there be a question of learning within from without to what is the solution to what was taught you might think that if one offers up without less than an olive of a fistful of flour or less than an olive of Emirim or if one makes libations of less than three logs of wine or less than three logs of water he is liable therefore it states to sacrifice to one is liable for a complete standard but one is not liable for an incomplete one now less than three logs nevertheless contains many olives and yet the rabbis do not learn without from without rather said rabbi the mission applies to where e.g. one appointed a Talmud, Ma Sebekim in a vessel one master holds that appointing in a vessel is an act that counts while the other master holds that it is not an act that counts rabbi said now that we have said that there is a view that appointment through a vessel does not count if one appointed six logs for a bullock and removed four of them and offered them up without he is liable since they are fit for a ram if one appointed four logs for a ram and removed three of them and offered them up without he is liable since they are fit for a lamb if they the three logs were slightly Incomplete he is not liable or as she said the rabbis do not learn Nisuk from Hatara though it is without from without they do learn Hatara from Hatara though it is within from without in the case of all of these if they became slightly incomplete etc it was asked does incompleteness without count as incompleteness or does it not count as incompleteness do we say since it went out it was disqualified what is the difference then whether there is less or more or perhaps only when it goes out and is wholly existent does it involve liability but not when it is not wholly existent said Abbe come and here our Eliezer rules that one is not liable unless he presents the whole of them rabbis son of our hand objected to Abbe does the master solve it from our Eliezer I explicitly heard it from a master he replied the rabbis disagree with our Eliezer only when the whole of it is available but if it is incomplete they agree with him surely that means even if it became incomplete without no only when it became incomplete within come and here in the case of all of these if they became slightly incomplete and one offered them without he is not liable does that not mean even where it became incomplete without no only when it became incomplete within one who offers sacrifices etc why so surely it interposes said Samuel it means where he turns them over are Johan and said you may even say that he does not turn them over but the author of this is our Simeon who maintained even if one offers them up on a rock or on a stone he is liable Rab said one kind is not an interposition for the same kind mission if the fistful of a meal offering was not yet taken and one offered it without he is not liable if one took off the fistful then replaced the fistful within it and offered it without he is liable Gemara but why so let the remainder nullify the fistful said Arzara Hatara is stated in connection with the fistful and Hatara is stated in connection with the remainder as in the case of the Hatara stated in connection with the fistful one fistful does not nullify another so in the case of Hatara stated in connection with the remainder the remainder does not nullify the fistful mission as for the fistful and the frankincense if one offered one of them without he is liable our Eliza rules that he is not liable unless he offers the second two if one offered one within and the other without he is liable as for the two dishes of frankincense if one offered one of them without he is liable our Eliza rules that he is not liable unless he offers the second two if one offered one within and the other without he is liable Gemara or Isaac Napaha asked can the fistful permit a proportionate quantity of the remainder does it the fistful indeed permit or does it merely weaken the prohibition on whose view is this question asked if on the view of our mayor who maintained you can render a sacrifice pickle through half of the matter it indeed permits it and if on the view of the rabbis who maintain that you cannot render a sacrifice pickle through half of the matter it may neither permit nor weaken it rather the question is asked on the view of our Eliezer but our Eliezer agrees with the rabbis rather the question is asked on the view of the rabbis here does it permit or does it weaken the question stands over mission if one sprinkles part of the blood without Talmud, Ma Sebekim be he is liable our Eliezer said also he who makes a libation of the water of the festival on the festival without his libel our Nehemiah said if one presented the residue of the blood without he is liable Gemara Rabbah said our Eliezer too agrees in the case of blood for we learned our Eliezer and our Simeon maintained from where he left off there he recommences our Eliezer said also he who makes a libation of the water of the festival on the festival without his libel our Yohanan said on the authority of our Menachem Apotapata our Eliezer ruled thus in accordance with the thesis of our Akiva, his teacher who maintained that the pouring of water on the Feast of Tabernacles is required by scriptural law for it was taught our Akiva said and the drink offerings thereof scripture speaks of two drink offerings is the libation of water and the libation of wine said Rush Lakish to our Yohanan if so just as their three logs are required so here two three logs are required whereas our Eliezer speaks of the water of the festival again if so just as there there is liability during the rest of the year so here too one should be liable during the rest of the year whereas our Eliezer says that one is only liable on the festival he however had overlooked our statement in our Yohanan's name for our said in the name of our Yohanan on the authority of our Nehunya of the Valley of Beth or on ten saplings the willow and the water libation our mosaic laws from Sinai our rabbis taught one who makes a libation of three logs of water on the feast of Tabernacles without his libel, our Eliezer said if he drew it for the sake of the feast he is liable wherein do they disagree said Arnam and B. Isaac they disagree as to whether a standard quantity of water is required our Papa said Talmud, Ma Sebekim they disagree as to whether libations were offered in the wilderness Rabbin said they disagree as to whether we learn water libation from wine libation our Rabbis taught one who makes a libation of three logs of wine without his libel, our Eliezer. Son of our Simeon said provided that he first sanctified them in a service vessel wherein do they disagree said Arad the son of our Isaac they differ about the overflow of measures Rabbi the son of Rabbi said they disagree as to whether libations were offered at the Bamath and in the controversy of the following Tanaim for it was taught a private Bama does not require libations these are the words of Rabbi but the sages maintain it does require libations now these Tanaim disagree on it. Same lines as the following Tanaim for it was taught when Yerakum etc. Scripture prescribes the bringing of libations at the great Bama you say at the great Bama yet perhaps it is not so
Will you say the same of the residue of the blood which is the end of the service now if this is correct let him answer him this too is indispensable that is indeed a refutation but now that our Adabi Ahab has said the controversy is about the residue of the inner sin offering but all agree that the pouring out of the residue of the outer sin offering is not indispensable you can answer thus our Nehemiah spoke in the mission of the residue of the inner sin offering whereas that Baritha was taught in connection with the residue of the outer sin offerings if so let him our Nehemiah answer him I spoke only of the residue of the inner sin offerings rather he argued on our Akibis hypothesis mission if one nips a bird offering within and offers it up without he is liable if one nips it without and offers it up without he is not liable if one slaughters a bird within and offers it up without he is not liable Talmud, Mas Sebekin B if one slaughters IT without and offers IT up without he is liable thus it's prescribed right within frees him from liability if he does it without while it's prescribed right without frees him from liability if he does it within our Simeon said whatever entails liability without entails in similar circumstances within when one subsequently offers it up without except when one slaughters a bird within and offers IT up without Gemara is this it's prescribed right surely it is it's inculcating right learn it's inculcating right R. Simeon said etc to what does he refer if we say to the first clause is if one nips a bird sacrifice within and offers IT up without he is liable if one nips IT without and offers IT up without he is not liable we're on our Simeon observed that just as he is liable when he nips it within so is he liable when he nips it without then instead of saying whatever entails liability without he should say whatever entails liability within and if he means just as one is not liable. When he nips it without so is he not liable when he nips it within then he should say whatever does not entail liability without does not entail liability within again if he refers to the second clause if one slaughters a bird within and offers IT up without he is not liable if one slaughters IT without and offers IT up without he is liable we're on our Simeon observed just as one is not liable when he slaughters it within so is he not liable when he slaughters it without then he should say whatever does not entail liability within does not entail liability without or again if he means just as he is liable when he slaughters without so is he liable when he slaughters it within surely he teaches except when one slaughters a bird within and offers it up without said ZEIRI they disagree about the slaughtering of an animal at night and this is what the Mishnah says likewise if one slaughters an animal at night within and offers it up without he is not liable if one slaughtered it at night without and offered it up without he is liable our Simeon said whatever entails liability without entails liability in similar circumstances within when one subsequently offers it up without except when one slaughters a bird within and offers it up without Rabbah said they disagree about receiving the blood in a non-sacred vessel and this is what it says likewise if one receives the blood in a non-sacred vessel within and offers it up without he is not Liable if one receives the blood in a non-sacred vessel without and offers it up without he is liable our Simeon said whatever entails liability without entails liability in similar circumstances within when one subsequently offers it up without except when one slaughters a bird within and offers it up without and now that the father of Samuel son of our Isaac recited if one nips a bird within and offers it up without he is liable if he nips it without and offers it up without he is not liable but our Simeon rules that he is liable you can say that our Simeon refers to that case but read whatever entails liability when it is sacrificed within and offered up without entails liability when it is sacrificed without mission as for a sin offering whose blood was received in one goblet if one first sprinkled the blood without and then sprinkled it within or within and then without he is liable because the whole of it was eligible within if the blood was received in Two goblets and one sprinkled both within he is not liable both without he is liable if he sprinkled one within and one without he is not liable one without and one within he is liable on account of the one without while the one within makes atonement to what may this be compared to a man who set aside an animal for his sin offering then it was lost and he set aside another in its place then the first was found and so both are present if he slaughtered both of them within he is not liable. Both of them without he is liable if he slaughtered one within and one without he is not liable one without and one within he is liable on account of the one without while the one within makes atonement just as the blood relieves its own flesh so does it relieve the flesh of its companion the other animal Talmud, Ma Sebekim Gemara as for sprinkling the blood without and then sprinkling it within it as well because the whole of it was eligible within but if he first sprinkled Within and then offered it up without it is but the residue this agrees with our Nehemiah who ruled if one offers the residue of the blood without he is liable if it agrees with our Nehemiah consider the sequel if the blood was received in two goblets if one sprinkled both within he is not liable both without he is liable if he sprinkled one within and one without he is not liable surely our Nehemiah maintained that if one offers the residue of the blood without he is liable I will answer. You which Tana disagrees with our Eliezer son of Arsimian and maintains that one goblet renders the other rejected it is our Nehemiah to what may this be compared to one who sets aside an animal for his sin offering then it was lost and he set aside another in its place then the first was found etc what is the purpose of adding to what may this be compared the author of this is Rabbi who maintained if the first animal was lost when the second was set aside it must perish and this is what it means this is only if the first was lost if however one set aside two animals for sin offerings as surety one of these was a burnt offering from the very outset in accordance with our Hunas dictum in Rab's name is if a guilt offering was transferred to pasture and one then slaughtered it without a specified purpose it is valid as a burnt offering how compare there a guilt offering is a male and a burnt offering is a male but a sin offering was a female set our high of best and yet it refers to a ruler's goat chapterxiv mission if one slaughtered a cow of lustration outside its appointed place and likewise if one offered without the scapegoat he is not liable because it says and hath not brought it unto the door of the tent of meeting which intimates that for whatever is not eligible to come to the door of the tent of meeting one is not liable on its account as for a robot an animal set aside for an idolatrous sacrifice an animal worshipism. Idle dogs exchange a harlot's hire kill a why I am a tear for an animal cab through the Caesarean section if one offered these without he is not liable because it says before the tabernacle of the Lord for whatever is not eligible to come before the tabernacle of the Lord one is not liable on its account as for blemished animals whether with permanent blemishes or Talmud, Ma Sebekim be with transient blemishes if one offers them without he is not liable our Simeon said if one offers animals with permanent blemishes he is not liable if one offers animals with transient blemishes he violates a negative injunction with regard to turtle doves before their time and young pigeons after their time if one offered them without he is not liable our Simeon said if one offers young pigeons after their time he is not liable if he offers turtle doves before their time he violates a negative injunction one who offers an animal together with its young on the same day and one who Offers before time is not liable. Our Simeon said he transgresses a negative injunction for our Simeon maintained whatever is eligible to come later involves a negative injunction but does not involve Kareth. But the sages maintain whatever does not involve Kareth does not involve a negative injunction before time applies both to itself and to its owner. What is before time is applied to its owner if a Zab or a Zab, a woman after childbirth or a leper offered their sin offering or their guilt. Offering without they are not liable if they offered their burnt offerings or their peace offerings without they are liable if one offers a flesh of a sin offering or flesh of a guilt offering or flesh of most sacred sacrifices or flesh of lesser sacrifices or the residue of the omer or the two loaves or the shoe bread or the remainder of meal offerings or if he pours the oil onto the meal offering or mingles it with flour or breaks up the meal offering cakes or salts the meal. Offering or waves it or presents it opposite the southwest corner of the altar or sets the table with the shoe bread or trims the lamps or takes off the fistful or receives the blood if he does any of these without he is not liable nor is one liable on account of any of these acts on account of Zerath or Uncle Anas or lack of priestly vestments or the non washing of hands and feet before the tabernacle was set up a myth were permitted and the service was performed by the firstborn. After the tabernacle was set up a myth were forbidden and the service was performed by priests most sacred sacrifices were then eaten within the curtains and lesser sacrifices were eaten anywhere in the camp of the Israelites when they came to Gilgal the myth were again permitted most sacred sacrifices were eaten within the curtains and lesser sacrifices were eaten an
Not liable to Karath on their account if one consecrated them when Bumath were forbidden and offered them when Bumath were permitted. They involve a positive injunction, but they do not involve a negative injunction. The following sacrifices were offered in the tabernacle. Sacrifices consecrated for the tabernacle. Public sacrifices were offered in the tabernacle, and private sacrifices were offered at Abama. If private sacrifices were consecrated for the tabernacle, they must be offered in the tabernacle. Yet if one offered them at Abama, he is not liable. Wherein did the minor Bama and the great Bama differ in respect of laying of hand slaughtering in the North Talmud? Moss say became a sprinkling round about waving and presenting Arjuna maintained there were no meal offerings at the Bama priesthood. Sacrificial vestments service vessels a sweet odor a line of demarcation for the sprinkling of the blood and the washing of hands and feet, but time not and defilement were. Alike in both Yamara, what does outside its appointed place mean? Rush Lakish said outside the place which had been examined for it said Are Yohanan to him, but surely the whole of Eretz Israel had been thus examined. Rather said Are Yohanan, it means e.g. that one slaughtered it within the wall of Jerusalem, but let him explain it as meaning that he slaughtered it without the wall but not opposite the door of the Hikal for our Adabi Ahaba said if one did not slaughter it opposite the door of it, Hikal it is disqualified for it is said and he shall slay it and sprinkle of her blood toward the front of the tent of meeting as the sprinkling must be opposite the door so must its slaughtering be opposite the door and should you answer that here Yohanan does not assimilate slaughtering to sprinkling surely it was stated if one did not slaughter it opposite the door Are Yohanan maintained that it was disqualified because it says and he shall slay and sprinkle Rush Lakish said it. Is fit because it says, and she shall be brought forth without the camp, and he shall slay, and it was stated likewise. If one did not burn it opposite the door, our Yohanan said it is disqualified. Our Ashai said it is fit. Our Yohanan said it is disqualified because it says, and he shall burn, and he shall sprinkle. Our Ashai said it is fit because Scripture saith, with her dung shot it shall be burnt. That means in the place that she departs, Borshat to death, there must she be burnt. I will answer you here. Yohanan proceeds to a climax. It goes without saying that if he slaughters it without the wall and not opposite the door, it is disqualified because he removed it further from the sanctuary. But even if he slaughtered it within the wall, so that he brought it nearer, and I might argue that it is fit, he informs us that it is not the master said, said our Yohanan to him, but surely the whole of Eretz Israel had been thus examined. Wherein do they differ? One master holds that. The flood descended in Eretz Israel while the other master holds that it did not descend there Arnam and B. Isaac observed both interpret the same text the son of man say unto her thou art a land that is not cleansed nor rained upon in the day of indignation Are Yohanan holds scripture speaks rhetorically O Eretz Israel how art thou not clean to then the rain flood descend upon thee in the day of indignation while Rush Lakish holds that it bears its plain sense Eretz Israel thou art not clean for did not the rain descend upon thee in the day of indignation Rush Lakish refuted Are Yohanan there were courtyards in Jerusalem built on a rock beneath them was a hollow on account of graves down in the depths there they brought pregnant women and women who had given birth and there they reared their children for the service of the red heifer and they brought oxen with doors on their backs the children sat on them and carried stone goblets which they filled with water and then Returned to their place, said Arhuna, the son of Ar Joshua. They were especially strict in the case of the red heifer. Arhuna refuted Rush Lakish. On one occasion, they found human bones in the wood chamber, and they desired to declare Jerusalem unclean. Whereupon Ar Joshua rose to his feet and exclaimed, "Is it not a shame and disgrace to us that we declare the city of our fathers unclean? Where are the dead of the flood, and where are the dead of Nebuchadnezzar? Since he said, Where are the dead of the flood? He surely meant that they had not been there in Jerusalem. Then, on your reasoning, had there been none of the slain of Nebuchadnezzar there, rather they had been, but were removed. So here too, they had been in Eretz Israel, but were cleared away. But if they were removed, Talmud, Mas Sevakim, be then they were removed. Granted that they had been cleared away from Jerusalem, they had not been cleared away from the whole of Eretz Israel. Other state Rush Lakish refuted Arhuna, and where are? The dead of the flood, where are the dead of Nebuchadnezzar? Surely, then, since the latter were in Eretz Israel, the former two were there. Why say thus each had its own state? Rush Lakish refuted Ar Yohanan, whatsoever was in the dry land died. According to my opinion, that the flood descended to Eretz Israel, it is well for that reason they died. But on your view, why did they die? Because of the heat in accordance with Ar Histah, for Ar Histah said, with hot passion they sinned, and by hot water they were punished. For here it is written, and the water cooled, whilst elsewhere it is said, then the king's wrath cooled down. Other state Ar Yohanan refuted Rush Lakish, whatsoever was in the dry land died. On my opinion, that the flood did not descend to Eretz Israel, it is well for that reason is it called dry land. But on your view, what is the meaning of dry land, the place which was originally dry land, and why does he specify dry land in accordance with Ar Histah, for Ar Histah said in the generation of it. Flood the decree of destruction was not decreed against the fish in the sea because it says whatsoever was in the dry land died but not the fish in the sea on the view that the flood did not descend there it is well thus the ream stayed there but on the view that it did descend where did it stay said Arjane they took the young of the ream into the ark but surely Rabbi Barhana said I saw a sea ream one day old which was as big as Mount Tabor and how big is Mount Tabor forty parasangs its neck stretched out was three parasangs the place where its head rested was a parasang and a half it cast a ball of excrements and blocked the Jordan said Arjane they took its head only into the ark but a master said the place where its head rested was three parasangs rather they took the tip of its nose into the ark but surely Arjane said the flood did not descend in Eretz Israel he explains it thus on the view of Rush Lakish but the ark plunged up and down said Rush. Lakish they tied its horns to the ark, but surely Arhista said the people in the generation of the flood sinned with hot passion and with hot water they were punished, and on your view, how could the ark travel at all? Moreover, how did our king of Bashan stand? Rather, a miracle was performed for it, the water, and it was cooled at the side of the ark. Now, according to Rush Lakish, even granted that the flood fell upon Eretz Israel, surely, however, none of the dead were left there for Rush Lakish. Said, Why was it Babylon called Bazal? Because all the dead of the flood were dumped Nistalel there, and Ar Yohanan said, Why was it called Shinar? Because all the dead of the flood were shaken out thither in Arulajam, yet it was impossible that some should not have cleaved remained Arabab said, Why was it called Shinar? Because it shakes out its wealthy men in Eretz Asherim, but we see that there are wealthy people there, they do not last three generations. Ar said he who Eats earth of Babylon is as though he ate the flesh of his ancestors. It has also been learned likewise. He who eats earth in Babylon is as though he ate the flesh of his ancestors. Some say it is as though he ate of abominations and creeping things. The scapegoat is it not eligible to come to the door of the tent of meeting? Surely the following contradicts it or sacrifice Corban. I might understand even sacred things of the temple repair which are designated Corban as it says, and we have brought the Lord's Corban offering. Therefore it states and bringeth it not unto the door of the tent of meeting. The law applies only to what is eligible to come to the door of the tent of meeting. Hence sacred things of temple repair which are not thus eligible are excluded. I might think that I exclude these which are not eligible, but I do not exclude the scapegoat that is sent away which is eligible to come to the door of the tent of meeting. Therefore it states to sacrifice it unto the Lord which excludes the scapegoat as that is not dedicated to the Lord there is no difficulty the one means before the casting of lots the other means after the casting of lots after the casting of lots too there is still the confession rather said Armani there is no difficulty the one means before confession the other means after confession Aroba and Anirba but this too I may infer from unto the door of the tent of meeting Talmud Mas Sevakim a Talmud Mas Sevakim as for Aroba and Anirba is well it is conceivable that the other proof text is required where one first consecrated them and then bestiality was committed with them but as for an animal set apart for idolatry's worship and an animal worshipped as an idol no man can forbid that which does not belong to him this refers to lesser sacrifices and in accordance with our Jose the Galilean who maintained that lesser sacrifices are their owner's property for it was taught if anyone sin and commit a trespass against it. Lord, then he
Every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes. Moses spoke thus to Israel when ye enter the promised land, ye shall offer votes of sacrifices, but ye shall not offer obligatory offerings. Thus Gilgal in comparison with Shiloh was premature, and Moses said to them, Ye shall not do set our Jeremiah to our Zerah. If so, Talmud, Masabakim be one should even be flagellated to why did our Zerah say scripture transmuted it into a positive command? Perhaps that is only according to the rabbis, but in the view of our Simeon that indeed is so our Naman B. Isaac said within it Gilgal was like without in comparison with Shiloh Rabbi said our Simeon's reason is as it was taught our Simeon said how do we know that one who sacrifices his Passover offering at a private Babylon Bumath were prohibited violates a negative command because it is said thou mayest not sacrifice the Passover offering within one of the gates you might think that it is also thus when Bumath were permitted therefore it is stated within one of the gates I have told you that he violates a negative injunction only when all Israel enter through one gate now when is this thus if we say after midday let him even incur Karath two hence it must surely mean before midday no in truth it means after midday but it means when Bumath were permitted but surely he says when Bumath were prohibited he means when the Bamba was forbidden for that sacrifice but permitted for another before time etc are these then subject to guilt offerings Said Zeiri include a leper amongst them their burnt offerings and their peace offerings and are these subject to peace offerings said Arshis hate learned and not right in the mission according to Zeiri the Tanaim explicitly included it according to Arshis hate the Tanaim did not include it Arhil Kiabi Tobi said they learned it only when he sacrifices it for its own sake but if he sacrifices it under a different designation he is culpable since it is eligible under a different designation within if so let him also be culpable when he slaughters it for its own sake since it was eligible under a different designation within it lacks abrogation to this Arhu not immured is there anything which when slaughtered for its own sake is not fit yet when slaughtered under a different designation is fit is there not surely Talmud Ma Sevaki may a Passover offering though not fit if slaughtered during the rest of the year under its own designation is nevertheless fit if Slaughtered under a different designation, a Passover offering during the rest of the year is a peace offering. Shall we say that the following supports him? Arhilkiah, it was taught you might think that I also exclude a burnt offering which is premature in relation to its owner or a Nazarite's guilt offering and a leper's guilt offering. Therefore, it says an ox implying in all cases or lamb implying in all cases or goat implying in all cases. Thus, he omits a sin offering. Now, what are we discussing if we say when it is sacrificed in its time? Why, particularly a guilt offering, even a sin offering too entails liability? Hence, it must mean when it is not sacrificed in its proper time. And in which case, if we say when he sacrifices it for its own sake, why is he liable for a guilt offering? Hence, it must surely mean when he sacrifices it under a different designation. In truth, it means in the proper time and under a different designation. And this is in accordance with our. Eliza, who maintained we assimilate the guilt offering to the sin offering and he teaches the derived case and the same law applies to the principal case come and here you might think that I include a burnt offering which is intrinsically premature and a sin offering which is premature either intrinsically or through its owners therefore it says and hath not brought it unto the door of the tent of meeting whatever is not eligible to come to the door of the tent of meeting you are not liable on its account but the tent omits a guilt offering now what are we discussing if we say when it is sacrificed for its own sake let him not be liable in the case of a guilt offering to hence it must surely mean when one does not sacrifice it for its own sake disagrees with our Eliza, who assimilates the guilt offering to the sin offering and he teaches the principal case the sin offering and all the more does it apply to the derived case come and here for when our came he said the school of Barlu I taught you might think that I also exclude a burnt offering which is premature through its owner and a Nazarite's guilt offering and a leper's guilt offering etc. Now he the tenant thus infers that one is liable but I do not know how he infers it said Robin the reference is an ox in all cases a sheep in all cases a goat in all cases but he omits a sin offering and what are we discussing etc. What difficulty is this perhaps it is to be explained as you stated in the previous discussion said Arnaman B. Isaac because this teaching of the school of Barlu I contradicts what Levi taught is as to a Nazarite's guilt offering and a leper's guilt offering if one slaughtered them under a different designation they are valid but do not free their owners of their obligations if one slaughtered them before they were due from their owners or if they were two years old when they were slaughtered they are unfit and Ardini answered there is no difficulty in the one case he slaughtered it for its own sake and the other it was not slaughtered for its own sake. Our Ashi pointed out a contradiction between our mission and the Beritha and he reconciled them. One means where he slaughters it for its own sake, the other where he does not slaughter it for its own sake. Shall we say that this refutes Arhunat? Arhunat can answer you. The case we discuss here is that of one who set aside two animals for guilt offerings as security so that one of them was a burnt offering from the outset. Talmud, Mas Sevakim be disagreeing with Arhunat's dictum in Rab's name as if a guilt offering was transferred to pasture and one then slaughtered it without a specified purpose. It is valid as a burnt offering. One who offers up the flesh of a sin offering without is not liable. Our rabbis taught how do we know that he who offers up the flesh of a sin offering or the flesh of a guilt offering or the flesh of most sacred sacrifices or the flesh of lesser sacrifices or the remainder of the omer or the two loaves or the shoe bread or the residue of meal offerings without is not liable because it says whatsoever man that offered the burnt offering is a burnt offering is eligible for offering up so everything which is eligible for offering up on the altar entails liability how do we know that also he who pours the oil on the meal offering or mingles it with flour or breaks up the meal offering cakes or salts the meal offering or waves it or presents it opposite the southwest corner of the altar or sets the table with the shoe bread or trims the lamps or takes off the fistful or receives the blood without is not liable because it says that offer the burnt offering or sacrifice as offering up completes the service so everything that completes the service entails liability before the tabernacle was set up etc our who son of our sat before our and recited the text and he sent the young men of it Children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen unto the Lord said he to him thus said R.C. and then they ceased now he thought to refute him from our mission when he heard him teach in our Adabi of his name the burnt offering as which Israel sacrificed in the wilderness did not require flaying and dismembering whereupon he refuted him from a very though which had a bearing upon the whole of his teaching for it was taught before the tabernacle was set up. Both were permitted and the service was performed by the firstborn and all were eligible to be offered as animals beasts birds male and female unblemished or blemished clean but not unclean and all offered burnt offerings and the burnt offering as which Israel offered in the wilderness required flaying and dismembering and Gentiles are permitted to do thus in these days it is a controversy of Tanaim for it was taught and let the priests also that come near to the Lord sanctify themselves are Joshua B. Karha said this intimated the separation of the firstborn rabbi said this intimated the separation of Nadab and Abihu on the view that this meant the separation of Nadab and Abihu it is well hence it is written this is that the Lord spoke saying through them that are near unto me I will be sanctified but on the view that it meant the retirement of the firstborn where was this warning indicated in the text and there I will meet with the children of Israel and the tent shall be sanctified by my glory by Kabodi read not by Kabodi but by Kabodi my honored ones this the Holy One blessed be he said to Moses but they did not know its meaning until the sons of Aaron died when the sons of Aaron died he Moses said to him O my brother thy sons died only that the glory of the Holy One blessed be he might be sanctified through them when Aaron thus perceived that his sons were the honored ones of the omnipresent he was silent and was rewarded for his silence as it is Said and Aaron held his peace and thus it says of David be silent before the Lord and wait patiently hit halal for him though he cast down many slain halalim of be silent before him and thus it was said by Solomon there is a time to keep silence and a time to speak sometimes a man is silent and is rewarded for his silence and others a man speaks and is rewarded for his speaking and this is what our high Abba said in our Yohanan's name what is meant by the text awful is God out of thy holy places me mikdashika read not me mikdashika but mamkudashika through thy consecrated ones when the holy one blessed be he executes judgment on his consecrated ones he makes himself feared
cannot give birth but on the view that a trifa can give birth what can be said surely scripture said to keep them alive with thee this means those that are like thee but perhaps know himself was trifa whole him is written of him perhaps that means whole in his ways righteous is written of him but perhaps it means that he was whole in his ways and righteous in his actions if you should think that know himself was trifa could the merciful one say to know taken only such as are like thee but do not take in whole animals now since we infer it from with thee what is the purpose of to keep seed alive you might think that with thee meant merely for companionship so they might be even aged or castrated therefore to keep seed alive informs us that it is not so the master said clean but not unclean were there then clean and unclean animals at that time said our samuel be namani and our jonathan's name it means of those with which no sin had been committed how did he know no as Arhisda said for Arhisda said he led them past the ark those which the ark accepted were certainly clean those which the ark rejected were certainly unclean Arabab said scripture said and they that went in went in male and female that means that they went in of their own accord the master said and all offered burnt offerings only burnt offerings but not peace offerings surely it is written and sacrifice peace offerings of oxen say rather all offered burnt offerings and peace offerings but it was taught but not peace offerings save only burnt offerings that is in accordance with the view that the children of Noah did not offer peace offerings for it was stated our Eliezer and our Jose Bihan in a disagree one maintained the children of Noah offered peace offerings while the other maintained they did not what is the reason for the view that the children of Noah did offer peace offerings because it is written and Abel he also brought of the firstlings of its flock and of the fat hell of thereof what thing is it whose fat hell of only is offered on the altar but the whole of it is not offered on the altar say that is a peace offering what is the reason of the view that the children of Noah did not offer peace offerings because it is written awake O north and come thou south this means awake O people whose rights were performed in the north and come O people whose rights will henceforth be performed in the north and the south but as to this master surely it is written of the fat thereof that means of their fat ones and as to the other master surely it is written awake O north etc that refers to the ingathering of the exiles but surely it is written and Moses said thou must also give into our hands sacrifices Zebahim and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice unto the Lord our God he demanded Zebahim for food and burnt offerings for sacrifice but surely it is written and Jethro Moses father in law took a burnt offering and sacrifices unto the Lord that was written after the giving of the Torah revelation that is well on the view that Jethro came after revelation but on the view that Jethro came before revelation what can be said for it was stated the sons of Arhai and Arjashu of Levi disagree one side maintains Jethro came before revelation while the other maintains Jethro came after revelation he who maintains that Jethro came before revelation holds that the children of Noah sacrificed peace offerings this is a controversy of Tanaim now Jethro the priest of Midian heard what news did he hear that he came and turned to proselyte Arjashu said he heard of the battle with the Amalekites since this is immediately preceded by and Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword our Eliezer of Madam said he heard of the giving of the Torah and came for when the Torah was given to Israel the sound thereof traveled from one end of the earth to the other and all the even kings were seized with trembling in their palaces and they uttered song as it is said and in his place all say glory they all assembled by the wicked Balaam and asked him what is this tumultuous noise that we have heard perhaps a flood is coming upon the world for it says the Lord sat enthroned at the flood the Lord sitteth as king forever he replied the holy one blessed be he has already sworn that he will not bring another flood upon the world perhaps they ventured he will not bring a flood of water yet he will bring a flood of fire as it is said for by fire will the Lord contend he has already sworn that he will not destroy all flesh he assured them and what is the sound of this tumult that we have heard he has a precious treasure in his storehouse which was hidden by him 974 generations before the world was created and he has desired to give it to his children as it is said the Lord will give strength unto his people forthwith they all Exclaimed the Lord will bless his people with peace. Our Eliezer said he heard about the dividing of the Red Sea and came for it is said and it came to pass when all the kings of the Amorites heard how that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan before the children of Israel and Rahab the harlot too said to Joshua's messengers spies for we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea wise neither was there spirit in them any more written in the first text whereas in the second it says neither did there remain stand any more spirit in any man Talmud. Ma Sebekim she meant that they even lost their virility and how did she know this because as a master said there was no prince or ruler who had not possessed Rahab the harlot it was said she was ten years old when the Israelites departed from Egypt and she played the harlot the whole of the forty years spent by the Israelites in the wilderness at the age of fifty she became a proselyte said she may I be forgiven as a reward for the cord window and flax the master said and Gentiles are permitted to do thus in these days how do we know it because our rabbis taught speak unto the children of Israel the children of Israel are enjoined against sacrifices slaughtered without but Gentiles are not enjoined against sacrifices slaughtered without therefore each one may build himself a bama and offer thereon whatever he desires our Jacob Biaha said in R.C.'s name it is forbidden to assist them or act as their agents Rabba observed yet we may instruct them this happened with the Frahormai's mother of King Shabur who sent an offering to Rabba with the request offer it up in honor of heaven said Rabba to our Safra and our Ahabi who not go fetch to young men non-Jews of like age seek a spot where the sea has thrown up alluvial mud take new unused twigs produce a fire with a new flint and offer it up in honor of heaven said Abbe to him in accordance with whom do you give these instructions in accordance with our Eliezer B. Shamu, for it was taught our Eliezer B. Shamu said as the altar must not have been used by a layman for secular purposes so the wood must not have been used by a layman but surely our Eliezer B. Shamu admits in the case of Abama for it was taught one text says so David gave to Ornan for the place 600 shekels of gold by weight whereas it is written so David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver how can these be reconciled he collected 50 shekels from each tribe which amounted to 600 in all Rabbi said on the authority of Abba Jose B. Dostai he bought the oxen wood inside of the altar for 50 and the side of the whole temple for 600 our Eliezer B. Shamu said he bought the oxen wood inside of the altar for 50 and the side of the whole temple for 600 for it is written and around the said unto David let my lord the king take an offer up what seemeth good unto him behold it Oxen for the burnt offering and the threshing instruments, Morajim, and the furniture of the oxen for the wood and Rabbah, he can answer you there too. They were new. What are Morajim said, Ulay, a bed of turbul, what is a bed of turbul? Said Abay, a goat with hooks with which the threshers thresh. Abay said, which text proves this meaning? Behold, I make thee a new threshing sledge, Morab, having sharp teeth, thou shalt thresh the mountains, etc. Rabbah, read out scripture to his son and the post texts. To each other it is written, so David gave to Ornan, etc. Whereas it is also written, so David bought, etc. How can these be reconciled? He collected fifty from each tribe, which totaled six hundred, yet the texts are still contradictory, for there it was silver and here it was gold. Say rather, he collected silver to the value weight of six hundred shekels of gold. Lesser sacrifices were eaten anywhere in the camp of the Israelites. Arhuna said, this means wherever the Israelites were, but there was. No camp Arnaman refuted Arunah were there no camps in the wilderness surely it was taught just as there were camps in the wilderness so there was a camp in Jerusalem from the walls of Jerusalem to the temple mount was the camp of the Israelites from the temple mount to the gate of Nicanor was the Levitical camp beyond that was the camp of the Sheshanah and that corresponded to the place within the curtains in the wilderness say rather wherever the camp of the Israelites was that is. Obvious you might say it is disqualified through having gone out therefore he informs us otherwise yet say that it is indeed so scripture saith then the tent of meeting shall set forward even when it sets forward it is still the tent of meeting it was taught our Simeon Bio he said yet another place was there is the women's court and no penalty was imposed on its account but at Shiloh there were only two camps which was absent said Abay it is logical that there was certainly the Levitical camp, for if you should think that there was no Levitical camp, Talmud, Mas Sebekim, this would result in Zabin and the unclean through the dead being sent out from one camp only, whereas the Torah said that they defile not their camps, this
Free will offering could be offered at Abama. What could not be vowed or offered as a free will offering could not be offered at Abama. A meal offering and a sacrifice of Nazi right ship were offered at Abama. These are the words of Armadir, but the sages maintain only peace offerings and burnt offerings were sacrificed on behalf of a private individual. Arjuna said whatever the community and an individual offered in the tent of meeting in the wilderness were offered in the tent of meeting at Gilgal. What was the difference between the tent of meeting in the wilderness and the tent of meeting at Gilgal? When the tent of meeting in the wilderness existed, both were not permitted. When the tent of meeting at Gilgal existed, both were permitted, and one could offer on his Bama on the top of his roof only burnt offering as and peace offerings. But the sages maintain whatever the community offered in the tent of meeting in the wilderness, they offered in the tent of meeting at Gilgal in both places only burnt offering as and peace offerings were offered on behalf of a private individual. Our Simeon said even the community offered only Passover offerings, Talmud, Masavakim B, and statutory offerings for which there is a fixed time. What is our Mayor's reason? Because scripture saith, Ye shall not do after all that we do here this day. Every man whatsoever is right in his eyes. Moses spoke thus to Israel when ye enter the promised land, ye shall offer votive sacrifices, but ye shall not offer obligatory offerings and meal offerings and sacrifices of Nazi rightship were votive sacrifices. And the rabbis, there were no meal offering as at the Bama at all, and the sacrifices of Nazi rightship were obligatory. Samuel said they disagree about the sin offering and the guilt offering, but all agree that the burnt offerings and peace offerings of a Nazi right are votive sacrifices. Rabbi raised an objection the law of the breast and thigh and the separation of it. Loaves of the thank offering operated at the great public bama but did not operate at a minor private bama but he the tana omits the sodden shoulder if you say that they disagree about the burnt offering and the peace offering it is well disagrees with the rabbis but if you maintain that they disagree only about the sin offering and the guilt offering who is the author of this rather if stated it was thus stated Samuel said they disagree about the burnt offering and the peace offering but all agree that the sin offering and the guilt offering are obligatory and so they were not offered the master said but the sages maintain whatever the community offered in the tent etc what is the reason of the rabbi scripture saith every man whatsoever is right in his eyes only a man may offer voluntary sacrifices and not obligatory ones but a community can offer obligatory sacrifices to Talmud, Masib, Kime, and Arjuna, he can answer you whatsoever is right is written. In reference to in his eyes, but at the great Bama one could offer even statutory offerings, but surely man is written and does that not intimate that only a man may offer voluntary but not obligatory sacrifices. Man is written to intimate that Azar is fit the fitness of Azar is deduced from and the priest shall sprinkle the blood on the altar of the Lord at the door of the tent of meeting. You might say it requires the sanctification of the firstborn as originally hence it man informs. Us that it is not so the sages are identical with the first Tana said our Papa they differ as to whether libations were offered in the wilderness. The master said our Simeon said, etc. What is our Simeon's reason? Because it is written and the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and they offered the Passover offering. Now that is obvious, surely then this is what the text informs us. They offered only obligatory sacrifices similar to the Passover offering, but they did not offer obligatory. Sacrifices which were not like the Passover offering and the other it is required for our Yohanan's dictum for our Yohanan said on our Banai's authority an uncircumcised person received sprinkling a tanner recited before our Adabi but the only difference between the great public Bama and the minor private Bama was in respect of Passover offerings and obligatory offerings which have a fixed time said he to him in accordance with whom was this told to you in accordance with our Simeon who maintained the only difference between the great Bama and the minor Bama was in respect of Passover offerings and obligatory offerings which have a fixed time and you must make your teaching refer to a statutory burnt offering as there is also a votive burnt offering for if you would refer to sin offerings is there then a votive sin offering yet let him make it refer to an obligatory meal offering since there were habit he holds that there were no meal offering as at the Bama one day. Came to Shiloh, etc. Once do we know it said our high Abba and our Yohanan's name? One text says, and she brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh, whereas another text says, and he forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent which he had made to dwell among men. And it also says, moreover, he abhorred the tent of Joseph and chose not the tribe of Ephraim. How are these reconciled? It had no roof but stones below and curtains above most sacred sacrifices, etc. Once do we know it said our Eliezer? In our Ashiah's name, because scripture saith, take heed to thyself that thou offer not thy burnt offerings in every place that thou seest, you may not offer in every place that thou seest, but you may eat the sacrifice in every place that thou seest, yet say in every place that thou seest, you may not offer, but you may slaughter in every place that thou seest, said our Jenny. Scripture saith, there shalt thou offer, and there thou shalt sacrifice our Abdimi Bihasa, said scripture saith, Talmud, Mas. Zabakim B and there was taught at the lamenting of Shiloh which means the place which made whoever saw it mourn for the sacrifices which he ate there are about said scripture Seth Joseph is a fruitful vine a fruitful vine through the eye this means let the eye which would not feed upon and enjoy that which did not belong to it be privileged to eat of sacrifices as far as it can see our Jose son of our Hanan quoted and the desire of him that dwelt in hatred this means let the eye that did not desire to enjoy that which did not belong to it be privileged to eat sacrifices among those that hated it, it was taught when they said as far as the eye could see they meant from wherever one could see the tabernacle without anything interposing our Simeon Beliakim observed to our Eliezer give me an example said he to him e.g. the synagogue of Mon our Papa said when they said see they did not mean that one must see the whole of it but that one must see part of it our Papa asked what of a place Whence one could see the tabernacle whilst standing but not when sitting our Jeremiah asked what of a place where if one stood on the edge of the valley one could see it but when he sat in the valley he could not see it the question stand over when Ardimi came from Palestine he said the Sheshan arrested on Israel in three places in Shiloh in Nob and Gibeon and in the eternal house and in all of these it rested on Israel only in the portion of Benjamin for it is said he covereth him. All day all coverings will be not elsewhere but in Benjamin's portion Abbe went and told this to our Joseph said he to him Caleb had but one son and he is not finished surely it is written and he forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh and it is written moreover he abhorred the tent of Joseph and chose not the tribe of Ephraim said our Adabi Mahenna what is his difficulty perhaps the Sheshan was in Benjamin's portion while the Sanhedrin was in Joseph's portion as we find in the eternal house. That the Sheshanah was in Benjamin's portion, whereas the Sanhedrin was in Judah's portion. How compare replied he there the territories of Judah and Benjamin were contiguous, but were they contiguous here? They were indeed contiguous, even as our Hamas son of Arhanan said a strip issued from Judah's portion and entered Benjamin's portion, and on this the altar was built. The righteous Benjamin grieved thereat every day, wishing to absorb it. So here too a strip issued from Joseph's portion into Benjamin's portion, and that is the meaning of Tanit Shiloh. This is a controversy of Tanaim. He covereth him, this alludes to the first temple all the day to the second temple, and he dwelleth between his shoulders to the days of the Messiah. Rabbi said he covereth him alludes to this world all the day to the days of the Messiah, and he dwelleth between his shoulders to the world to come. Our rabbis taught the duration of the tent of meeting in the wilderness was forty years less one the duration. Of the tent of meeting at Gilgal was fourteen years viz the seven years of conquest and the seven of division the duration of the tent of meeting at Nob and Gibeon combined was fifty-seven years thus for Shiloh was left three hundred and seventy less one the duration of the tent of meeting in the wilderness was forty less one how do we know it because a master said in the first year Moses made the tabernacle in the second the tabernacle was set up and Moses sent out the spies that of Gilgal was fourteen years viz the seven years of conquest and the seven of division how do we know it because Caleb said forty years old was I when Moses the servant of the Lord sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land and I brought him backward as it was in my heart and it is written and now lo I am a stay fourscore and five years old how old was he when he crossed the Jordan seventy-eight years and he said I am a stay fourscore and five years old thus you have seven years. For the
to the inheritance which the Lord your God giveth thee to the rest alludes to Shiloh inheritance alludes to Jerusalem why does scripture separate them in order to grant permission between one and the other Reshalakish said to our Yohanan if so let the mission of each second tithe too as for tithe he replied the implication of there is derived from there written in connection with the ark since there was no ark at Nob and Gibeon and there was no tithe either if so the Passover offering and other sacrifices are the same for we learn the meaning of there in their case from there written in connection with the ark since there was no ark these two were not offered who has told you this he replied our Simeon who maintained that even the community could only offer Passover offerings and obligatory offerings which have a fixed time but obligatory offerings for which there was no fixed time might not be offered at either place now animal tithe is an obligatory offering without a Fixed time and corn tithe is assimilated to animal tithe, hence it follows that in our Judah's view, second tithe is offered. Yes, for surely our Adabim and said second tithe and animal tithe were eaten in Nob and Gibeon only in our Judah's opinion. Yet surely Vira divine residence was required. Did not our Joseph recite there were three divine residences visit Shiloh at Nob and Gibeon and at the eternal house here? Joseph recited it and he explained that these were in respect of second tithe and in accordance with our Judah when they came to Jerusalem, etc. Our rabbis taught for ye are not as yet come to the rest and to the inheritance rest alludes to Shiloh inheritance to Jerusalem and thus it says my inheritance is become unto me as a lion in the forest and it says is my inheritance unto me as a speckled bird of prey. This is our Judah's opinion. Our Simeon said rest alludes to Jerusalem inheritance to Shiloh as it is said this is my resting place forever here will I dwell. For I have desired it, and it says, For the Lord hath chosen Zion, he hath desired it for his habitation on the view that rest alludes to Shiloh, it is well, hence it is written to the rest and to the inheritance, but on the view that rest alludes to Jerusalem, while inheritance alludes to Shiloh, Moses should say to the inheritance and to the rest, This is what he said, Not only have you not reached the rest Jerusalem, you have not even reached the inheritance Shiloh, the school of our Ishmael taught. Both words allude to Shiloh, our Simeon, Bio, he said, Both allude to Jerusalem, it is well, on the view that rest alludes to Talmud, Ma Sebakim, be Shiloh, and inheritance to Jerusalem, or the reverse, hence it is written to the rest and to the inheritance, but on the view that both allude to Shiloh, or both allude to Jerusalem, he should say, Unto the rest and inheritance, that is a difficulty on the view that both allude to Shiloh, it is well, rest means when they rested from conquest, while it is. Called inheritance because there they divided their inheritance as it is said and Joshua cast lots for them in Shiloh before the Lord and there Joshua divided the land unto the children of Israel according to their divisions but on the view that both allude to Jerusalem inheritance as well as it means the eternal inheritance but why is it called rest it was the place where the ark rested as it is written arise O Lord unto thy resting place thou and the ark of thy strength on the view that both allude to Jerusalem but that during the period of Shiloh Bameth were permitted it as well hence it is written so Mano took the kid with the meal offering and offered it upon the rock unto the Lord but on the view that both allude to Shiloh and Bameth were then forbidden house and offered it upon the rock unto the Lord it was a special dispensation the school of our Ishmael taught as our Simeon Biohe who maintained both allude to Jerusalem and your token is one man attracted many. Men all the sacrifices etc. Arkahana said they learnt this only of Sheshitah but for offering up one incurs Kareth too what is the reason because scripture saith and thou shalt say unto them which means thou shalt say concerning those just mentioned to this rabbi demur is it then written and thou shalt say concerning them surely and thou shalt say unto them is written moreover it was taught our Simeon stated four general rules about sacrifices if he consecrated them when Bameth were forbidden and slaughtered and offered them up when Bameth were forbidden without they are subject to a positive and a negative injunction and entail Kareth if he consecrated them when Bameth were permitted and slaughtered and offered them up when Bameth were forbidden without they are subject to an affirmative and a negative injunction and do not entail Kareth if he consecrated them when Bameth were forbidden and slaughtered and offered them up without when Bameth were permitted they are Subject to an affirmative precept but not to a negative precept if he consecrated them when Bameth were permitted and slaughtered and offered them up when Bameth were permitted he is not liable to anything at all and the following sacrifices laying of hands etc laying of hands is not practiced at a private panel because it is written before the Lord and he shall lay his hand slaughtering in the north because it is written and he shall kill it on the side of the altar northward. Before the Lord blood applications round about the altar because it is written and he shall sprinkle the blood round about the altar that is at the door of the tent of meeting waving because it is written to wave it for a wave offering before the Lord presenting because it is written the sons of Aaron shall present it before the Lord in front of the altar our Judah maintained there were no meal offerings at the Bama our sheets hate said on the view that there were no meal offerings at the Bama. There were no bird offerings either on the view that there were meal offerings at the Bama. There were bird offerings also. What is the reason and sacrifice them for sacrifices? Zebahim, Zebahim, but not meal offerings. Zebahim, but not bird offerings. Priesthood, because it is written, and the priest shall sprinkle the blood on the altar of the Lord at the door of the tent of meeting. Priestly vestments, because it is written, and they the priestly vestments shall be upon Aaron and upon his sons to minister in the holy place. Service vessels, because it is written, the vessels of ministry wherewith they minister in the sanctuary a sweet odor, because it is written, a sweet savor unto the Lord. A line of demarcation for the sprinkling of the blood, because it is written, that the net may reach halfway up the altar. The washing of hands and feet, because it is written, and when they came near unto the altar, they should wash. Rami Bihama said they learned it only about. Sacrifices of the great Bama which were offered at the great Bama, but no demarcation was required for sacrifices of a minor Bama which were offered at the great Bama. Rabbi raised an objection the laws of the breast and the thigh and the separation of the loaves of the thanks offering operated at the great Bama, but did not operate at a minor Bama. Say they are operative in connection with the sacrifices of the great Bama and are not operative in connection with the sacrifices of a minor Bama. Others say Rami Bihama said they learned it only when the great Bama was essential, but when minor Bama were permitted, even if one sacrificed at the great Bama, there was no demarcation. Rabbi raised an objection the laws of the breast and the thigh and the separation of the loaves of the thanks offering operated at the great Bama, but did not operate at a minor Bama. Say they operate when the great Bama was essential, but did not operate when minor Bama were permitted. Now he Disagrees with our Eliezer for our Eliezer said if one took a burnt offering of a minor bama within its barriers receive it in respect of all things our Zara asked if one took the burnt offering of a private bama Talmud, Moss Sebakim within and then took it out again what is the law do we say since it has entered the barriers of the public bama have received it or perhaps since it has returned it has returned is this not the controversy of Rabbah and our Joseph for we learned if sacrifices of higher sanctity were slaughtered in the south they are subject to trespass now the scholars asked if they ascended the altar must they be taken down Rabbah maintained they must be taken down our Joseph maintained they must not be taken down the question arises on both Rabbahs and our Joseph's views the question arises on Rabbah's view for you can argue Rabbah rules thus only in respect of the altar for what is eligible for it it sanctifies and what is not eligible for it it does not. Sanctified, but the barrier may receive it even when it is not eligible for it, or perhaps there is no difference. The question arises on our Joseph's view, for you may argue our Joseph rules thus only there since it is one place, but here that there are two places it is not so, or perhaps there is no difference. The question stands over that which is certain to rub in one direction, and to our Joseph in the opposite direction was a question to our Janay, for our Janay asked if the limbs of the burnt offering of a private bama ascended the altar and were taken down. What is the law if the fire has not taken hold of them? There is no question. The question arises where the fire had taken hold of them. What then the question stands over it was stated as for night slaughtering at a private bama. Rab and Samuel disagree. One maintains it is valid, the other maintains it is invalid. Now they disagree on our Eliezer's difficulty, for our Eliezer pointed out a contradiction between texts it is written, and he said. Ye have dealt treacherously roll a great stone unto me this day, but it is written, and Saul said, Disperse yourselves among the people, and say unto them, Bring me hither every man his ox,
Blood permitted and rendered pickle at the great and at a minor bamba. The laws of blemishes and time operated at the great and at a minor bamba. The time that har and defilement were alike in both our rabbis taught. How do we know that time operates at a minor bamba as at a great bamba? For you might argue the Torah ordered flesh that was kept overnight to be burnt and flesh that went out of its permitted boundaries to be burnt just as flesh which went out is fit at a minor bamba. So flesh which was kept overnight is fit at a minor bamba but does not the reverse follow from birds of minority Talmud. Ma sebakim b if time disqualifies birds so a blemish does not disqualify them is it not logical that time should disqualify the sacrifices of a minor bamba seeing that a blemish does disqualify them as for birds the reason is because azar is not fit in their case but in the case of a minor bamba where azar is fit to officiate let time not disqualify therefore it states and this is the law of the sacrifice of peace offerings which makes time at a minor bamba the same as time at the great bamba.